What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK, live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Monday, March 18th, 20 and 24, and the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours. On today's show, the brackets are set. The Texas men are a seven seed in the Midwest region of the NCAA men's tournament. The Texas women, a number one seed in the NCAA women's tournament. We'll uh, talk about both of their opening round matchups and both of their paths to a potential deep tournament run. Plus, is it time to press the panic button for Texas baseball? Texas spring football gets started tomorrow. We've got some NFL trades to get into and lifetime Longhorn Scotty Scheffler made history in Florida yesterday. Tons of sports storylines to get into and tons of fun to be had over the next two hours right here on TSU. What's going on this morning, Buck? It is going on. It's a beautiful day, BK. It's going to be nice and cool this morning. You know, a lot of things got shaken up over the weekend with some of this rain, you know. Boy, I can feel my nose is just, it feels like I'm just breathing all kinds of stuff that the rain knocked around, so. But it is nice, crisp morning here. Everything's good. I got some good golf sleep during the course of the weekend. Watching Scotty Scheffler, as I called it, on Friday that he was going to win this tournament. Yes, yes, I said Scheffler. Not Shoffley, Scheffler. Shoffley's right where he always is, second, third, fourth, in the in the hunt, but can find a way to screw it up. So, But Scotty Scheffler winning back-to-back -back players' championships, and I think he's going to – I think he's winning a Masters this year. I he think is. he's winning every tournament this <laughs> he year. He is on fire, man. Oh, my God. He shoots a 64. I mean, he was, what, four shots back of the lead going into yesterday, and then he goes eight under on a Sunday, and he just overtakes not just some jabronis. I mean, there were some big oh, yeah. names at the top of that leaderboard yesterday, and Scotty passed all of them up. He is on one right now. Yeah, his putting is, is fabulous. Obviously, his shot making is incredible. But he's always the ball is always in the fairway. He very seldom has it come out of the rub. He puts the ball in the fairway an awful lot. And now he's got the putter that he wants and he's got his stroke down. I saw him missing. I saw him miss one little close one. Yep. Other than that, this guy was amazing. It was amazing that he finished out uh, the entire match. I just thought, you know, the way his neck looked on, on Friday, it was looking like this guy's about to withdraw. He looks hurt in every swing he took. He had that grimace on him like, Dude, don't hurt yourself. You got some real majors coming up here shortly that I know you want to be a part of. So don't screw yourself up. But but he still he felt a little better on Saturday. He loosened up. And then Sunday he was just right back at it, swinging freely. He oh. was fantastic. He was throwing darts out there yesterday. Oh, yeah. And it was a joy to watch. And you feel for Wyndham Hotels and Resorts Clark. I mean, yeah. that putt on 18 that would have forced a playoff. I don't know how the hell that thing didn't go down. Wyndham Clark must have pissed somebody off over the weekend to uh, not get that one to drop. He moved his ball at some time just slightly. <laughs> done something that the golf gods did not agree with. You know, he had that shot on on the par five when he was there and two putting for coming right off the edge there and just didn't hit it hard enough and it faded out to the right. And, boy, that was for Eagle to tie it right there. Mm -hmm. You know, he had another hole, an extra hole to play. But, man, oh, man, his putting let him down. And his putter had been fantastic during the whole, you know, during the weekend. Yeah. Did you call Scotty Scheffler? I thought you had Jordan Spieth as your winner. Oh, man, I got out for him on Tuesday. Well, mm -hmm. Thursday. No, Friday. I called on Friday. I said that Scheffler was going to win the tournament. Yeah, I think you switched. You went with uh, the other lifetime Longhorn on Thursday, and unfortunately for Jordan Spieth, he missed the cut. Uh, but then you flipped over to Scotty Scheffler, which, hey, he was a huge favorite. But he was a huge favorite for a reason. I mean, that you know, line scared me. I, I, I thought Shoffley had a chance too. He just, he was, I mean, he was, but he had to make too many miraculous plays. You know, he had too many where he missed the green, being the, uh, being the, the grass bunkers and stuff like that. He had to make too many plays because he wasn't in the fairway enough. Yeah. He's scrambling like you on the oh, course. I, absolutely. Yeah. But fun weekend. Congrats right. to Scotty Scheffler, the first ever. Back-to-back -back champion at the Players' Championship. Of course, it's regarded as the fifth major in the sport of golf. About $4.5 million going Scotty Scheffler's way wow. with that performance yesterday. First, man. Yeah, two straight tournament wins overall for Scotty Scheffler. The world number one continues to look the part. And, uh, yeah, he's getting hot at the right time with the Masters just a few 
weeks away. All right. Obviously, the biggest story from yesterday, there were a ton of big stories yesterday oh, yeah. in the world of sports. But of course, yesterday was Selection Sunday. Shout out to Crown and Anchor Pub for hosting our Selection Sunday slash St. Patty's Day show yesterday. Thanks to everybody who came out to see us. It was a fun time, and we all found out together where both Texas teams will be dancing this week. We'll start with the Texas men. Buck, a little bit of a pleasant surprise. I think most Longhorn fans were expecting an 8 or a 9 for Texas, and, well, the committee did Texas one better. The Longhorns a 7 seed in the Midwest region, and, well, we don't know who they're going to play at. They will play the winner of one of the first four games in Dayton, it's Virginia and Colorado State. That game is tomorrow night, so the Longhorns yes. know who they're playing by the time they go to bed tomorrow. But Texas, a seven-seed buck. Initial thoughts on uh, where the committee slotted the horns? Well, I think they gave them a great slot. I mean, I and I and I like the region, as a matter of fact. Glad they weren't in that region where Connecticut was residing and Iowa State and all that stuff. I mean, I think they got a, I think they got a nice draw, you know, for 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 region-wise. And for them, I mean, I, I thought BK eighth or ninth that they would be in. Definitely eight. I didn't think they'd be where they are now. Seven. Yeah. yeah. That's huge. I was saying all last week I thought they were going to be an eight, but you know, people asked, okay, what's more likely, a 10 seed or a seven seed? And I said a seven seed, right? Like I, yes, I figured sure. if Texas was going to be leaning in either direction, it would be higher because of the fact that they played in the toughest conference in the sport this year. They had a lot of quality wins, a lot of quadrant one wins over the course of Big 12 play. So I figured there may be some Big 12 bias. Now, it's funny. We're pretty excited about leaving the Big 12 for a million different reasons, but being in the Big 12 may have helped Texas jump up a seed line this year. And yeah, I'm with you. I mean, a seven seed, you'll absolutely take it. And a potential second round matchup against Rick Barnes, of oh, course, the greatest that. coach in Texas basketball history, but also a known March choker. I mean, look, we're not quite sure what to expect. And and guaranteeing anything with this Texas basketball team this year feels like a bad move. But, hey, you will absolutely take being a seven seed with a chance to go up against regular season Rick in the round of 32. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look around some of these other ones that they could have got after the second game, that would stink. But I like yeah. exactly where they are right now. Yeah. Uh, hopefully they'll play Colorado State. Not Virginia will still play. Virginia still plays some nasty defense. You know? Yeah, they do. They do. One of the top 10 defensive teams in the country, according to Ken Palm this year. They, they don't have much just, going on offense, but. No, they suck. I, I'd actually rather play Virginia than Colorado yeah, State. Absolutely. Um, I know, look, Tony Bennett's a hell of a coach, and coaching matters at this time of the year. Of course, Tony Bennett also left his heart in San Francisco one yes, time. Yeah. Uh, tremendous singer as well. He's a national championship winning head coach. Now, that happened in 2019. Oddly enough, he beat Chris Beard and Texas Tech when Beard was in Lubbock. Since then, though, Virginia has not even won a tournament game. Forget another run at a natty. They have not won a tournament game since that championship in 2019. And you're right. They they suck offensively. They're great defensively, and they can cause problems with what they yes. do on that end of the floor. But they, they actually, according to Ken Palm, were the lowest-ranked at-large team to make the entire tournament. So, you know, obviously they're playing in the first four. They were a bubble team, one of the last four teams in the dance. It's some controversy that they're even in the field of 68. But, yeah, I, I just don't think Virginia's that good. I, I think Texas will be favored against either team, but I think Colorado State just has more talent, and they've got a better resume, in my opinion, than Virginia does. Sure. So I think I'd rather see the Who's on Thursday. No doubt. If I get to pick, but either way, I mean, look, once again, Texas should beat either of those teams. They're the higher seeded team and uh, the Longhorns turned out to be a lot safer in the field than maybe we even thought. And yeah, you said it. I mean, it, they could have been in a much worse situation. Oh, yeah. you know, they're out at, out of Yukon's region. Uh, we knew they probably weren't going to be in Houston's region, but they're out of Houston's region. And we know the Cougars went 2-0 and against the Horns this year, and one of those games was not even close. And once again, I mean, just to not have to face a one seed in round two sure. and to get to go up against uh, Rick Barnes in the NCAA tournament. His team has lost five straight tournament games against lower-seeded teams. 
So that's just that's like we saw it as Texas fans, right? Obviously, Rick Barnes led the Horns to the Final Four in 03, but there were so many years in Austin where his teams had more talent, and he felt like he could have gone to a couple of Final Fours, and they just underachieved in March. That same thing has happened in his tenure at the other UT, the fake UT. So, uh, got, look, Tennessee's well, better than Texas. There are two for a reason. Oh, I was going to say that's a pretty good team, though. Sure, but if you if you get that match, it, it could have been worse. That's what we're saying. It, it could right. have been worse for Texas. And I it think ain't a lot great. Of it ain't great playing Tennessee. It's not great playing. No, no. They're not but a bad team. If you asked me, I mean, of all the ones and twos, which team would I want to play the most? I think it'd be Tennessee. Oh yeah, you don't I mean, want to I, you don't I, hang out with Auburn. Auburn's hot right now. There's some teams that are looking. A little bit different. The North Carolina states of the world, they don't look the same as they did in the middle of the season. They are good right now. Yeah, bad year to be on the bubble. You know, with yes. NC State, with Oregon. Wow. You know, Oklahoma didn't make the cut. They were the first team out of the field. And not that we feel bad for them, but they got no. jobbed by a couple of bid stealers. They can't go everywhere we go. No, <laughs> no, you're I'm right. They, and they, uh, they apparently have already turned down an invitation to the NIT. So uh, they feel snubbed and they had a case to make it to the dance, but they really struggled down the stretch of the season. And it's pretty cool. Obviously, Texas beat Oklahoma in the last regular season game of the year. Uh, that you could argue is the game that kept OU out of the dance, That's right? right? Like if they had won that game, they'd be in right now. Texas would also still be in. Maybe Texas would be an eight or a nine instead of a seven, but probably be a nine ever, the way it looks. Yeah, that last ever Big 12 meeting between Texas and OU on the hardwood. That meant a Texas, lot. Yeah, it, it did mean a lot. It did mean a lot for Texas, and obviously it kept Oklahoma out of the dance. So uh, Texas is in. They're a seventh seed. And, yeah, you look at the region that they're in, that Midwest region. Look, once again, pick Texas to make a run at your own risk. This team has been as inconsistent as you could possibly be over the course of of this season, but man, Purdue, you talk about teams that have struggled in this tournament in the past. I mean, Purdue lost to a 16 seed last year, right? They're the number one seed in this region. We already talked about Tennessee and its struggles in March. Creighton's the number three seed. They're good. Very good team. They've got some talent on that squad, but I don't think they're unbeatable by any stretch. And then Kansas is the four. Kansas played like dog shit in the last month of the year. So like, yeah, you, you look one through four and start thinking about, okay, you know, can, can Texas beat these teams and uh, are any of these teams a lock to make it to the Final Four? I don't think anybody in this region is a lock to get there, and I think this is pretty wide open. If the Longhorns uh, can be good Texas, then maybe they can make it to the second. By the weekend. way, all of a sudden the SEC okay. looks as tough as the Big 12 right now. With Auburn, South Carolina looks good. Yeah, the SEC and the Big 12 both got eight teams in the, the dance. Aggies look good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I still think the Big 12 is better, but the SEC had a great year. They were the second-best conference in the sport, and yeah. it's not going to be easy with Texas going to the SEC, right? It will be easier, oh, no. but that league has gotten significantly tougher over the last few seasons. So. Yeah, they've, they've, put, they've put some um, – I mean, they put – or whether they put some NIL or whatever they've done for basketball, things have changed a little bit in the SEC. Yeah. When it comes to their basketball programs. Yeah. And it's going to get better too yeah. with uh, the new TV contracts coming for football. Like that money's going to funnel through all of the athletic departments and there's going to be more money for these schools to spend on coaches first and foremost. Like for you don't sure. think of SEC basketball schools being able to poach big name coaches away from other leagues, but uh, yeah, uh, the SEC, one of the benefits and really the biggest reason why Texas is making the leap is uh, the financials. The money is going to be there, and it it's obviously been in football forever, but it will uh, trickle down to basketball, too. So looking around the rest of the bracket, Buck, uh, what are your big thoughts? I don't know if you've started filling out a bracket to this point. Uh, yeah. What uh, what stands out to you from Selection Sunday yesterday? Well, I, 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 the Florida team losing – Florida was one of the hottest teams in basketball, and they lose their center. I mean, to a knee. I think it was a knee. He's done. That hurts a lot for them. That that's a big loss for them, especially as well as they're playing. As I said, the big kid from NC State is is a scary dude, a scary tackle playing basketball. You know? Yeah. Oh my gosh, Burns, the big guy. 
Yes, my goodness. Yeah, NC State, and that, that's who Texas Tech drew in the first round. And, well, that's a scary matchup because NC State's maybe the hottest team in the nation right now. They, they are they are physical. Not only is that guy physical, but they have a whole physical group. Um, yeah, they, they do. They play like that dude, you know? It's like a bunch of football players going to the wreck, you know? Did you say that guy's a linebacker? No, I said he's a tackle. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, that guy is an offensive lineman with uh, no, how big he looks. But he's smooth, too. He's I smooth know. with it. It's crazy. He's got handles. I can't believe he's got handles that he gets in the middle and he dribbles the ball and nobody comes from the backside or steals the ball for him. Because he's, I mean, he's, he's a good passer. He's really, really has a great awareness when he's in the paint of people coming at the ball. But he can back you down. It doesn't take much for him to bump you with his rear end and send you underneath the basket. And he's get, he gets a lot of, a lot of layups, a lot of easy shots. And I, I can't tell if he's left-handed or not because he's, he shoots a lot with his left hand because they're all lay-ins, yeah. you know? He was taking Armando Baycott to school yesterday. Wow. And Baycott's one of the best players in the country, right? One he's of really players. He's pushing him down underneath the basket. Yeah. yeah, he's a really good defender too. And uh, yeah, DJ Burns Jr. got the best of him, and a couple <laughs> of DJs on that NC State team. And yeah, they they were the ten seed in the ACC tournament. They beat Duke in their first game. Then they beat Virginia. Of course, the team Texas might play on right. Thursday, and then of course in the final. On Saturday night, they uh, knocked off their biggest rival, North Carolina. So to beat Duke and UNC yes. en route to your first conference tournament title since the 80s, very impressive for NC State. And, yeah, for Texas Tech, you know, uh, Texas Tech's a good team. They earned their sixth seed, but that is uh, not a fun first-round opponent for them. That's going to be yeah, a tough I, out. I think in the um, – I think with, with the kid from Florida getting hurt, that really opens up the door for Shaka Smart and Marquette right oh. now. Yes. Come on. It's the tournament. It's Shaka Smart. You're going to say Marquette's going to make a deep run? I think they are. They were a two seed last year, and they lost in the round of 32 to Michigan State. And you're right. That was a gruesome injury in that SEC title game oh. yesterday. My God, that's – that's one of those. If you were watching, you just turn your head and hope oh, they don't, don't show the replay. Don't show it again. Oh, horrible, horrible. You feel for that young man. But you yeah, for, Florida. You feel for the team thinking, well, let's go. They're either going to go one way or they're going to go to the other. They're going to go, damn, that was gross. Yeah. Or they're, they, they're going to fight back. So they, they did fight hard yesterday, you know, against they the did. great Auburn team. Like uh, Florida's hot right now. And I would have told you before that injury that that's not a team you want to play in the dance. And I still feel like they've got a chance to at least win one game. And if they do get Shaka Smart and Marquette in round two, I, I wouldn't chalk that up as an easy W for, uh, for perennial March choker Shaka Smart. Boy, that's a you know, label that follows every Texas coach, isn't it? Yeah. And for Houston, I watched, I watched them. They look tired. They look, you know, they've got an injury and, but they, but they look tired. They look like, you know, that first year through the, through the big 12, put a lot on them. They had to play some, they had to play every night. They had to play that strong defense. And, you know, they, they play that no nonsense defense, but they look like they're physically a little bit tired right now. Like they're a little drained, but yeah. now you, know, you get a couple of days rest and who knows A&M has really good guard play right now. They're hot right now, but they've got to, you know, that, that game with, with Nebraska is going to be something special to see. That's a fun one. Yeah. It's a yeah. great eight, nine matchup. And you're right. The Aggies, they were a bubble team going into the week. They won a couple of games in the SEC tournament to solidify their spot. And Wade Taylor the fourth, I watched him play in high school a couple of times. The dude really? can absolutely ball. Oh my yeah, gosh! They come talking about that group that can get out and run. Yeah, they really well, boy, they will go. That A and M team was ranked in the top fifteen to open up the that's year. Right. That's what you said. Yes, like they they were supposed to be a lot better than they were, and maybe they're getting hot at the right time. But there's some talent. There's some experience on that group. That's that's a fun yes. matchup because I like that Nebraska team a lot. Fred Hoiberg, speaking of Iowa State, Fred Hoiberg was the coach there forever. Now he's at Nebraska. He's got the Cornhuskers rolling a little bit. So, uh, yeah, the eight nine games are usually fun. They're obviously usually evenly matched as well. That one should be a great one with those former Big Twelve foes. And I think what you said about Houston, like there were a bunch of surprises from conference championship week. Obviously, NC State, we talked about them. Yep. Uh, what happened in the American with UAB stealing a bid was a surprise. Oregon stealing a bid. And there was a lot of shocks this past week. But Iowa State not only beating Houston, but beating them 
Like that? Yes. I mean, Houston was the number one team in the country. And if they won that game, they would have been the number one overall seed in the tournament. And they not only lost, they got embarrassed yesterday. So that says, okay, Iowa State looks really freaking good, number one. And number two, yeah, it's like, I don't know. You know, Houston had such a great year. They won the Big 12 regular season. I got to believe, believe that their coach can wear you down a little bit, too. Oh, yeah. Now you wonder, is that going to, like, impact? Let me ask you, is that going to impact how far you have Houston going? What happened on Saturday? Yes. Really? Yes, it does. Oh, yeah. God, I don't I don't know what to do with that because I was – I picked Houston to win it all the last two years. I was thinking about making it three in a row, and because of that, I'm I'm a little nervous as well. Like, that was – I mean, I think Nebraska or A&M, the way a and M's playing right now, they'll give them a game. That'll, yeah. be, that'll be a hell of a game. Yeah, it could be. It could be. That's a Houston's second opponent, right? Assuming they get by Longwood. Yeah, they're going to get by the Longwoods. You, you, you know, the two best college basketball programs are in the dance this year. Do you know that? The two best, what, Longwood and who else? Moorhead State. Moorhead State, yes. Good we job, all love, Moorhead. We all love Moorhead State. We all yeah. love that. We all and, also uh, love Longwood. Longwood too. Well, oh, you do? You're a Longwood guy? I like to be in that category. Okay. You don't love others, Longwood. No. no. Yeah, okay. You just want to be described as a Longwood. Yes. Just making sure I'm following. Longwood you University. Yeah. The only thing we're missing is Oral Roberts. If we had yeah. them in, yes. then that'd be the uh, the unholy trinity of men's college basketball program names. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, when I watch Houston. And I watched AM. I think AM can beat Houston right now. Really? I mean, there's a lot of teams that can beat Houston. I just, as I said, it's, you know, some certain teams peaked. I think I thought Houston played pretty consistent throughout the year, but I just think they're, they're the brand of defense they play and their coach, I can't just imagine that guy in your ear every second. I watch him on the sideline and he is just, he's nonstop. Yep. It's like sometimes it's stuff, stuff will, okay, coach, we got this. You know, yeah, some coaches like to coach all the time. That dude likes to coach all the time, BK, from the from the first tip to the last, you know, to the last buzzer. He is in your ear. So huh. it just looks like they're tired. I don't know. Maybe they get, you know, and they get a break. So they will they won't have to play early. So they'll, they'll be ready. They may be ready to go. But from a physical standpoint, guys don't just they're – just, they're just not defending as much. They're getting in a lot of foul trouble. You know, they're missing a player. They're, they just don't seem like they're coming off the off the ground like they did rebounding everybody to the everybody to the hoop a little bit. So they need the rest. This is yeah. this is the team that needs some rest. They get that extra day. They don't play yeah. until Friday. And yeah, like, I, I, I think when it's all said and done, I'm going to have Houston in my Final Four. Uh, I still think they're really good. Um, look, the day before that Iowa State game, they beat Texas Tech by like 30. So mm -hmm. they, they they weren't showing too many signs of wear and tear and rust uh, in their first couple of Big 12 tournament matchups. I mean, they beat the crap out of TCU in their first game, and then they beat the breaks off of Texas Tech in their second game. Yeah, so, that was a TCU team that had beat them in the regular season, right? You're right. You're right. So they, they look, Iowa State, Iowa State treats the Big 12 basketball tournament like it's the Super Bowl. I mean, they care so much about that event every single season. Their fans come out in droves, right? They call it Hilton South or oh, yeah. they play in Kansas City. Like, it's amazing. And I've been duped before. Like, Iowa State will win the conference tournament. I'm like, oh, they look so good. I'm going to pick them to make the Final Four. And they, they you know, I don't want to say they always come up short, but they usually don't have the type of success in the NCAA tournament that they do in the Big 12 tournament. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Iowa State, they, they took it to Houston. They held Houston to 41 points. That's the lowest a number one team in the country has scored in a loss since Iowa State, funny enough, beat Wilt Chamberlain in Kansas wow. back in the 50s, Buck. Like, wow. that's how bad it was for UH on Saturday. So, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what. One of my big takeaways, you talked about UConn. I mean, it's it's hard to repeat, right? We haven't had a repeat champ since Florida in 06-07. And in the last like 45, 50 years, we've only had two. Yeah. Back to Duke in the early 90s. Like it is very difficult to repeat. And the committee, you know, UConn's the number one overall seed. And think, all right, maybe well, the committee will hook them up and do them a solid. UConn's in the region of death. Oh, like, yeah. yeah. Iowa State as the two. Iowa State, once again, they're playing better than anybody in the country right now. Um, you've got Auburn. Yes. 
You got Auburn as the four. Like I, Auburn is a top five team in the country according to Ken Palm. You literally have three of the top five teams on Ken Palm in the same region. Like that is. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about the group of death in the World Cup. Like that is the region of death, right there. Are you, I'm sorry, UConn is not making it out of that. Like I, I don't think UConn forget winning a national title. I don't think they're getting to the Final Four. I think that's that's too tough of a region. Uh, and because the recent history of defending champs and how much they generally struggle in this tournament, I, I don't know who I'm picking, but I don't think I'm going to pick UConn to win the East this year. You are, you're, you're expected to be there. Are they going to beat Stetson? I think they'll beat the Hatters of Stetson, the Mad okay. Hatters. Okay. Whose coach is Les Miles, the coach there? Yeah, they, they should win that game for sure. Yeah, I, I think, uh, man, I like Auburn a lot, not just because their coach is a member of the tribe, but uh, like Auburn as a four seed. I, I might have them in my final four, honestly. I think they're good, and Iowa State obviously has a shot to get there too. I mean, that's – San Diego um, State's not a bad team. No, they played for the national championship last year. Who's the uh, – is that the Illinois as the three seed in that one, Buck? You got that in front of you? Yeah. Um, Top left. Illinois is three. Okay. Yeah, they're – I mean, they just won the Big Ten tournament. Too. Like, that is a stacked Certainly region. Good. So, thankfully, Texas is not in that one. Yeah, you got on a bicycle in that region. Oh, no. Yes. He can't play, can he? I don't know if he plays. Does it matter if he plays? If he just shows up, he doesn't have to actually play, does he? Dude, if he just shows up to the Texas game, we're going to lose. I don't care if we're playing those guys. If Boy on the Bicycle just shows up to any Longhorn game in any sport, we're going to blow it. That's how it works. Yeah. You know, that North Carolina region is pretty – that looks like an easy one. Alabama's not that great. You know, Clemson's not that great. Baylor's in there as a three, which is – Arizona's good. Yeah, Baylor's got a shot as a three. Yeah, I kind of think, like, the top half of the bracket is significantly harder than the bottom half, right? And Texas is bottom right. The West region, what you're talking about, is bottom left. Like, I I think you're going to get more chaos in those two uh, than you will in the uh, the top two. But you're right. I mean, North Carolina is the fourth number one seed – I Zay and I were arguing yesterday that we thought Iowa State should have been a number one over North Carolina. It didn't happen. Instead, Iowa State gets stuck with UConn. That sucks. Believe me, ACC and Carolina are always going to get the nod. That's the yeah. Hills will always get the nod. I know. I know. A lot of blue blood programs like that. Especially oh, that's like that rolling tide, not getting the nod in football. Yeah, great call. Great call. So Arizona. yeah, Arizona's pretty good, but I think they've got some flaws. Baylor, same thing, pretty good, but they've got a couple of issues. So. Yeah, that uh, that could be your most chaotic region in the dance right there. Yeah, that'll but, screw up your bracket. That region will screw up your bracket. Yeah, it's going to be fun, man. Obviously, the uh, first four starts tomorrow, and Texas fans will be locked in uh, because the Virginia-Colorado State game to determine who the Longhorns will play on Thursday, that's tomorrow night on True TV. You know what channel that is, Buck? No, I have no clue. Shit, I don't either. This this is the worst part of this tournament is trying to figure out what channel True TV is. It's the only time of the year anybody watches it. Well, we, you and I will be out at Circuit of the Americas tomorrow. We will How be doing that? that. We got to get ready for boogity, boogity, boogity. Let's go racing. Come on now. Are you going to go to the races this weekend? I'm not going to the NASCAR race. No, I go to the, I, oh. you know, I, I go to MotoGP and, um, of course, Formula One. I've been there. I've not been to a NASCAR race here. I've been to a NASCAR race up in Fort Worth. It's a different oh, world, man. It's a different world. It is oh, exciting. It is a party. It's a party before the party, you know? People watching at NASCAR races oh. is second to none. Man, oh, man. You're right. The drinking starts, I don't want to say early, because it starts like three days before. I'm going to say it starts Tuesday. It yeah. starts when we're out there. Oh my gosh! Yeah, there might there's probably going to be some tailgating going on tomorrow. Just folks okay. camped out for the weekend. It's like you know you don't have to do this. This is not a Duke basketball game. You can just show up on Sunday. Uh, no, and they're like, nope, got to be there. Yeah, be excited. Party. We love our friends at Coda. Of course, the Coda text line is open five one two 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 nine three two eight. The Buck and I will be there tomorrow, and Chaos Theory with Double that? R and Wags will be there as well. So. It should be. I'm not sure where they're going to set us up. Maybe they put us on the track. Could you imagine? I don't know. They don't. They don't have anything going on. They're not. They're not getting it cranked out there until probably about Wednesday or Thursday. And you'll hear the sounds, and they are loud now. NASCAR's. 
you think Formula One is loud? Wow. Yeah, it's it is loud. They sell earplugs for a reason at uh, at oh, those races. You can get those tickets to NASCAR at Coda at SentexTickets.com. Yeah. Don't forget Absolutely. about that. He's got plenty of those ready to go. Yes, he's getting and, ready. He's getting ready for uh, what's dude's name that's coming to the Moody Center and Justin Timberlake. He's getting ready for that. JT. JT's coming. Are you going? Uh no, but I may be sending my wife and her. Two daughters to that. Yes, I don't I know. Thought you I were going to go by yourself. Oh no, I can't go. I can't do it. You can't go with them. It's a little more normal if you go with wife and her kids, right? Yeah. You know who else is coming? Um, Super Bowl guy. Usher. Usher's got, I, Usher's got two days there, I believe. JT's got two days there, two nights. JT, yeah, JT's got two days. Wow. Uh, a, a buddy reached out, asked me if I could. Or if I wanted to go to JT with him, what do we think about that? Kosher, not kosher. Uh I think at 30, you can say it's okay. Because then okay. you can look back at 60 and go, damn, did I really go with this dude? Two yeah. straight guys going to Justin Timberlake together. Is that kosher? Yeah, well, there are gonna be lots of women there. There will be lots of women there. That, that all man, just like going to a, a very nice bar and listening to some good music. That's all. Mm -hmm. A little more expensive than a bar, I think. Right. Yeah. A really. little, little more frowned upon than uh, yeah. just going out to a bar with a bus. $22, $23 a drink there. Yeah, oh. it's it's a costly event, but that's okay. Yeah. Good entertainment. Sure. Plus, there'll, be, there'll be lots of beautiful women strolling the place. Yeah, you know, the girls, will go, girls will go with the girls there. Oh, of course. Yeah, there'll be plenty of beautiful women. I don't know. Like, I feel like JT is fans of all ages, too. Yes, he right. does. Oh, Some yeah. concerts, like you think of like, I don't know, One Direction or Jonas JT Brothers. Usher will have that that kind of crowd, young and old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's just people, people of all ages. So you can't just exactly guess what the clientele will look like. But I would say predominantly women going to both of those shows. Yes, lots just, of sc and screaming, dude. Justin That's the Timberlake one that you, it's hard to get over. It's it's when the mom starts screaming to get you. Oh, I can't have screaming people yeah, at the concert. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. They'll be screaming. Are you a are you a guy who sings all the words when you're there too? Yeah, I just try to shut up and just kind of flow with the music a little bit. Remember, I went to Andrea Bucelli, and the dude beside me was trying to sing it, all the songs in Italian, and I was like, "Hey, I didn't come here." I mean, eventually I had to turn around and say, "Dude, I'm like, listen, you're right behind me. I don't I don't want to hear you sing. I'm coming to see this guy sing. Yeah. I want to hear him. I don't want you trying to trying to be some opera singer, which you're not." Hey, buddy, put the Rosetta Stone away, all right? Oh, yeah. Get off Duolingo. You don't know Italian, so he shut doesn't. up. He doesn't, but he was, you know, from the last album that he heard from him, he thought he had a couple of those. It was like the Step Brothers or whatever it was. That, yeah. that, I'm like, dude, stop it, please. Mm. I got a nice seat right here. I don't want to hear you the whole time. The Step Brothers scene at the Catalina Wine Mixer. Where Will yeah, Ferrell that's, yeah that's, that's what I had behind me, BK. I'm like, wow. Oh, uh, no. Did you tell him to shut up? I turned around and gave him that look like, shut the F up, you. Yeah, you can't sing every word to every song. No. And, he, and, and there was just one song. It was like all of them. I'm like, you don't know this song. What do you just, why don't you just hum? If you hum, it's okay. And if you sing... Like just kind of sing to yourself, you know. Yes. Like you don't need to sing so loud that the entire section can hear you. They're not there for you. They're there for the artist. No, no. This dude it was. They were everybody in our row was there for him. Oh, should have called security and gotten that dude escorted out. Oh yeah, throw him out. Throw him out. You would have uh, done the rest of the crowd a solid. Yeah. Believe. Only thing I, I when when I was there for. Uh, I believe I could fly. That was when I went to see that dude, R. Kelly. That's oh, yeah. That, that was like two weeks ago, right? No, dude. That was, no, that was when I first came. That was 30 years ago. It oh. seemed like. That's when I first came to Texas. I did kind of sing along with that one. That was hard for anybody. Everybody was singing along with that one. What was the uh, clientele at that show? God, I'm not sure I want to know. It was, it was basically women. Hopefully. I mean, 95%. Hopefully of age women. Yeah, yes. Okay. So they, were, Kelly, they, and they were screaming. R. Kelly I mean, didn't go home with anyone from the crowd. 
that night. He might have gone home with someone's daughter from the crowd, but yeah. he didn't go home with anybody in Boy, the stands. He was, and he he was talking about talent. Man, could he sing? Dude, it's yeah, he's got some jams, man. Like, wow. I, people people judge you if you listen to R. Kelly these days, but the guy can sing. Oh, yeah. You know, where do you draw the line? Like Michael Jackson? Can I not listen to Michael Jackson anymore in the Jackson 5? I I'm love always, Michael Jackson. I'm always listening to the Michael Jackson and Jackson I, 5. I used to love hanging out with him as a kid. <laughs> I bet you did there. I bet you there at Never Never Land or whatever. Uh, uh, would, you ride, would you ride the ponies there? Right. Oh, man, it was great. Bet the monkey. I was a little careful. sore after hanging out with him, but it was a, a ton of fun. You know, Kanye West, like, I can't listen to Kanye West anymore. I feel like I'm not supposed to. I don't know what to do anymore. All these famous people are getting canceled. It's making it tough. You know what you do? You listen to Taylor Swift, you're always, everything will always be okay. Oh, that's it? That's it. Okay, yeah. That's, yeah, that's she's, No scandals for her. The only issue she ever has is breakups. That's it. But then that's when she releases her best music, so... I don't know if you can call those issues. Yeah, they're still together. Remember I said that thing was about to come to an end? Still together. You would know if they weren't together, believe me. Be the number yeah, one story on Sports Center, not, not the NCAA tournament. It would be the fact that Taylor and Travis are broken up. Yeah, I haven't seen anything. It seems like they're just still going going strong. All good. All good. All right, before we uh shift gears here, we got more Texas hoops to get into. We'll talk about the women's team. Getting a oh, number yeah. one seed in the dance. We got to give some love to Vic Schaefer and company. But before that, Buck, how about a sponsor shout out? Our good friends over at Texas Orthopedics. If you're seeking that specialized patient focused orthopedic care, contact the experts and our friends at Texas Orthopedics. Their physicians offer comprehensive surgical and non surgical orthopedic care for children and adults, spinal care, sports medicine, joint replacement, uh, trauma care, rheumatology, and even more. Dr. Christopher Danny, Christopher Stockton. Our dedicated orthopedic surgeons there. Their goal is to get you right back into good health and that great quality of life that you deserve. T Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. And for more information, folks, go to TXOrtho.com. If you are hurting and you're getting towards the end of the road and you've tried everything else and you've got to get that knee replacement, Definitely talk to Dr. Christopher Danny at Texas Orthopedics. Absolutely. Great guy as well, and he will take care of you. Oh, Trey's not complaining. Trey must have, he must have hooked him up because Trey has no more complaints about that hip problem that he had. I think you're right. Which is a good thing. That is a very good thing. So he can continue his uh, semi, semi pro volleyball career. Sand, sand castles and stuff that they build. Oh, is that what he's doing? He's making snow angels in the sand? Yes. With his boys, Maverick and Goose. <laughs> oh, yeah. Slapping each other on the ass. Oh, oh great. yeah. A lot of shirtless sand volleyball out there with Sweating Trey Elling the third. Yep. Sweating. They call him. You know, yeah. you know what Trey's nickname is on the court? Sand? Whatever. What is it? Sand Ellinger. No. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little off right there. Yeah. Ellinger. Really? That's hilarious. All right. Shout out to 7-Eleven as well. I went to 7-Eleven the other day. Didn't go in. I made a mistake. I just got some gas from my car, but they've got fuel for the car. They got fuel for you as well. Love 7-Eleven. The best selection. Absolutely. Of prepackaged snacks and drinks, but of course, you can get their famous Slurpees. You can get the Big Gulps. You can get the coffee. If you're on your way to work this morning, got a case of the Mondays, need a little pick-me-up, you can get uh, the hot or iced coffee there. At 7 Eleven, they've got the donuts, the pizza, the wings, the rollers. It's ridiculous how much they've got at 7 Eleven. And speaking of ridiculous, if you download that 7 Eleven app, sign up for the Seven Rewards program, you're going to get ridiculous discounts and deals all year long. Go see our friends at 7 Eleven. They're all over the place. We're not going to tell you where they are. You know where 7 Elevens are. Just get in your car and drive any direction. You're going to yes. find them. You're going to find 10. To hell with that. Uh, love our great friends at 7-Eleven. Yeah, big shout out to the folks over at Leaf 290 in Monterey Oaks. They have everything that you need for your landscaping supplies. They are a landscaping supply service, and they are the absolute best. I've been going there for over 25 years. Uh, they have a location also at Spring Ponds up north. And, folks, when it comes to anything that you need for your gardening or your lands landscape, please go ask those experts there. You can do it yourself. You can run off to Lowe's and uh, wherever you want to go and pick up stuff. But ask the folks what will fit 
your particular landscaping area, uh, north side of your house, south side, east, west. Uh, I go to there and I talk to them about, here's where I want to plant on this side of the house. Will these plants survive over there? Nope, too much sun. You need a little bit more shaded area. They will give you the load down. Plus, they have all the plants, the roses, the shrubs, trees, you name it. They got the fertilizers just for you. Have you killed your plant yet? I haven't checked in a couple of days, so I don't know. It was, it's been pretty wet. It should be uh, fine, right? The, like I watered yeah. it last week, and then it rained over the weekend. So. It's all right. It'll dry out over the next couple of days, DD. Mm -hmm. It's going to be dry. So, oh. by the way, DD, oh, did you get the folks to the game like I did on Friday and Saturday? No problem. Um, I did send you some showers on Sunday, which, yes, there were some showers. There were some on showers Sunday. on Sunday. So yeah. Remember, somebody had asked Friday, can I go to the game tonight? And I said, of course, you go enjoy your Friday evening. And I think everybody did. And you also were right about Saturday because yes. our guy Michael C. went out to the Austin FC match on Saturday, and he was asking you for a weather forecast just go. to make sure uh, that game was going to be okay. And sure am enough, I, am I almost back on top of my on top of my the king of the castle? You're getting there. You're warming up a little bit. You know, you're 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 in first place in the Big Twelve, but you haven't clinched a spot in the conference championship game yet. Maybe Dee Dee's off a of vacation now, and she can focus back in on her weathering. Hey, she's got a side job too, all right? The economy's hurting. <laughs> By America, you can't just be a meteorologist anymore. Not many weatherers out there like myself, but, you know, she can take a break, go off vacation a little bit. But me, I'm a man of the people. I'm about trying to make your weekends pleasant. And I think if, for the most part, you got it. But that rain, we need it. Now, when that, when that stuff came on Saturday, was it Saturday morning? Or was it, no, Sunday morning? Well, Sunday morning. Okay. Wow. Once again. Some of the Thunder Boomers almost shook me out of the bed. I mean, it was – that stuff was loud and proud. I mean, that rain was coming down. I was wondering if my hillside – kept looking up to the hillside, wondering if it was going to be in my backyard there for a second. That must have been a statewide thing because I was visiting the folks in Galveston, and it I, I got woken up Saturday night into Sunday by yes. some crazy storms. So Lots uh, of light. It, it, light. It's needed. Every time it rains, like in the spring, I'm like, shit, this is the last rain we're going to get for six months. So I'm, you know, I'm hoping we get a little bit more at some point before it gets ridiculously hot. Cause we know that drought and those hundred degree it's coming. days are coming. Yep. Yeah. I mean, we're going to get some, we're going to get some April showers. Okay. You know, and, and I'll tell you what's looking good is the blue bonnets. Oh yeah. I saw some folks on the side of the highway taking some pictures there. Blue this, bonnet. Is a, this is a blue bonnet year. I may have to go ahead and take one of my famous blue bonnet pictures oh, with my God. chaps, assless chaps with my little gun, with my little 22. Broke back Bucky. <laughs> I need to go and take that shot again. Mm -hmm. Yes, I need to get into the blue bonds. Except for the snakes like the blue bonds. I need to know if that's really true. Nobody's told me if that's true or not, that the rattlesnakes like the blue bonds. Because I'm not going there with assless chaps and sit back and have a rattlesnake bite. Yeah, please. Anywhere. Okay. Anywhere. A, a, a bite to... from a rattlesnake would not feel good anywhere. No, no. You don't through, want that the, thing. through the jeans, through the pants leg. No, thank you. Slithering inside. Yeah, I've you know, I've been bit by a snake before. You know, all snakes bite, you know that, right? Sure. They all bite. It's just some of them don't some of them don't bite hard, and some of them bite hard with fangs. I was gonna say, and some of them are venomous and some of them are not. Yeah, the so. little garter snakes, if you mess around with one of those, they'll turn around and bite the living crap out of you. What's the uh what's the snake saying? Once you go black, you never go back. <laughs> Red and yellow kill a fellow. Oh, yeah. oh shit! I wasn't even close. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, oh no. no! It all tastes the same to them. So wait, red and yellow kill a fellow. If the red and the yellow touch, you're dead. If yes. the red touches the black, you're okay, Jack. Yeah, yeah that's what, right. Jump back, what, Jack. Jump back, Jack. So you're well, you're dead either way. No, no. The 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 yellow the the red and yellow is the one that kills a fellow. The other one. You have snakes that, and you got to go out of your way for a coral snake to bite. You almost have to put your hand in its mouth. Your finger has to go up like underneath a rock, BK, and you touch something, you yeah. touch it. You don't walk the path. They don't jump up and bite your coral snakes. Their mouths are only so so big. So it's almost like you put, it's like coral snakes, kids get bit by those because they're so pretty. Like a little kid will, you know, pick one up and think, oh, isn't this pretty? No, that's not pretty. You know, you have to go out of your way to get bit by a coral snake. You have to be sleeping, and that coral snake 
gets into your sleeping bag and you reach down and put your finger in its mouth. Oh. <laughs> I'm not trying to touch random snakes like you are. <laughs> That's your thing in your spare time, then be my guest. But I don't snake, uh, snake toucher. I don't swing that way over there, snake no, toucher. This, let me just say, with the water that we had on that on Sunday morning, a lot of these snakes will be coming out of their little hibernation, out of their holes. That water will pull them out. Rattlers and copperheads and snakes like that, they'll come out now and try to bask in the sun a little bit. So yeah. be careful. And as I said, if you're if you're doing stuff in your garden, have your stick with you. Bring a stick with you. Don't like stick your hands underneath something. You know, even if you've got gloves on, stick mm -hmm. your hands in pots and stuff like that. Because I'm silly like that. I just will reach in a pot just to get stuff away. But I've learned since there was a lady who got bit by a rattlesnake at a uh, Home Depot. If I get bit by a rattlesnake at Home Depot, it's going to be Bucky Depot. That's what's happening there. <laughs> You're going to sue and get them to change their name? <laughs> to Buck Depot. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, she was inside the Home Depot and she got got? Yeah, well, she stuck her hand into a into a you know a plant that was in a pot, you know, stuck her oh. hand in there, and that rattlesnake was just cozied up inside of there. I think it bit her into, like, the thumb. Oh, she may have no. lost her thumb. That's tough. Yeah, that's tough. I'm So take your stick with you. So dig around in places. Before you go stick in your hands or – or raking things, stick or have a stick in your hand. Just to pin that son of a gun on, just to reach underneath there. Don't stick your hand in there. Have your have your stick in your hand when you're walking around. Yes. Make sure your snake is in its proper place, but bring a stick. Yeah. Okay. A little pointed stick will get them. It'll just move them. Now I'm not there to beat it to death. Now I will once I see it, because I'll go crazy if I see one. I'm not I'm that guy that if I see a snake. I got to chase it down. No, but I, I would snake. I, all snakes to me are, are are deadly snakes, and I don't really. I just kind of shoo them out of the spot. Rattlesnakes, I, I kill. Other snakes, if I don't know what they are, I just shoo them away into another spot. Doesn't sound like you're scared of snakes, then. I'm not really. I'm not. I don't have a. I don't have a fear of snakes. Yeah, I don't either. But... I've only seen on my property. I've been here four years. I've seen one rattlesnake, and it was a baby. The ones that are stupid, they'll bite you and bite you again because they don't know. Do you ask him? Oh, I got rid of him in a hurry. Yeah. yeah. I guess you're supposed to, right? Like, part yes. of me is just like, I'll just go the other way. But if you see no. one, it's probably for the best that you kill it if it's on your property. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You don't shoo that dude away. I know he's there to eat rats and stuff like that. He's not there to bother you, actually. But mm -hmm. if you shoo him and he goes to another spot that you show up at, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you you see him once. It won't be the oh, last yeah. time you see him, right? No, you'll see him again. So no, I and I got a lot of stone. You know, I live on this hill here. I got a lot of stone. Mm -hmm. But of course, Arnold Ziffel next to me with the farm over there, there are all kinds of little creatures that want they want the eggs, they want the feed that you feed the chickens with, they want the chickens, they want the goats. I mean, I live I live out here in Green Acres beside me. There it is. How about that? I think our guy CB sent this, but he he photoshopped the crying. Is that the crying Jordan meme? Oh no! Those spots even... right there. As a matter of fact, that spot right there is uh, <laughs> where um, that's Hamilton Pool Road. That spot, those beautiful blue bonnets aren't there anymore. That's made. That's the road now. Hmm. They've gotten rid of that stuff. There's not much land on Hamilton Pool Road any longer. You know, that's what they called me at the uh, Texas-USC game a few years ago. What's that? Hamilton Pool. Oh, really? Very nice. That's a good one. That's a good yeah. Dr. Hamilton Pool. That's a classic. Yep. You've done the Brody Lane bit. You've Brody done Lane, the Will yeah. William Cannon bit. William Cannon was the best. That yeah, works. That's, 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 the works most, real. that's the most realistic one, right, William Dr. Cannon? Dr. William Cannon? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Proctologist? Yeah, very good. Oh, yeah. oh, that's what you did? I was a baby doctor. Yeah, okay. You're more of an OB Gen guy. That's yeah. that's what it was. Oh, I had the, you know, I got that outfit all set up for that pick too. But then the next one I had one with my little 22, my Henry rifle. Yeah. Except for I'm afraid to pull out a gun just on somebody else's property now. Yeah, don't be pulling out anything on somebody else's <laughs> No, for sure. We can get you in some trouble now. So we got all the right. as a number one seed. How about that? Yeah, how about that? Let's hear from Vic Schaefer here. Yesterday, Texas women's basketball was announced as the number one seed in the NCAA women's tournament. They are in the – God, it's so weird. They don't do east, south, midwest, and west like the men's do. 
Texas women is the they're the number one seed in the Portland Four region. So they have two regional spots this year. Uh, two of them are in Portland, and two of them are in Albany. And Texas, if they win their first two games here in Austin this coming weekend, uh, they will head up to Portland for the Sweet 16 and hopefully an Elite Eight game as well. But yeah, the Texas women, a little bit of a surprise, right? If they were going to be a two seed, we knew they were going to be the top number two seed with the season that they had, coupled with the Big 12 Tournament Championship from sure. last week. But uh to a pleasant surprise, they were named a number one seed. Here's Vic Schaefer talking about that yesterday. This is March Madness. You want to be one of those four teams up on the up on the board that has the one next to you. That's a it's a great accomplishment. But now you have to set that aside and now go to the next accomplishment. My message to them is, ladies, I want to play six more games. That's my thought. That's my focus. One game at a time, but. That's our goal right now in that locker room is six more. There you go, Vic. Get after it. Let's go. Yep. I wouldn't hate that. All right. You got to win six to win a national championship. And obviously you have to play six to get to the national championship game. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's awesome. Texas, a number one seed. It's it's going to be tough. But generally in the women's tournament, you don't get the chaos that you get in the men's tournament. I mean, the, no. the cream usually rises to the top. The higher seeds usually go pretty far. And for Vic Schaefer, he's made it to two elite eights. He's never been a one seed at Texas, but he's made it to two elite eights at Texas. The next step for him is to find his way to a final four. So you do that. You obviously get to hang a banner at Moody Center. And now if Texas gets to the final four, they're probably going to have to play undefeated South Carolina, who, of course, is the heavy favorite to win the national championship because they're undefeated. But, hey, you can cross that bridge when you get there. Just finding your way to the Final Four would make an already incredible season for Texas even more special. Do you have to face Kim Mulkey at any time? Uh, well, they're not in the same region as LSU. Okay. So I'm trying to see where LSU is. LSU. So the only way Texas could play the love of your life, Kim Mulkey, is if they met in the – Met in the national championship game. They're on Ooh. opposite sides of the bracket. So very slim odds. LSU's a three seed. So, you know, they won it all last year uh, with uh, Coach Crazy on the sidelines. They've, Coach Crazy. They've got, yeah, that might be too nice. Coach Psycho feels like a more apt name for Cruella de Mulkey. Uh, you know, you don't want to count her out ever. No. But, yeah, it's very slim odds that uh, the Longhorns and the Bayou Bengals will be playing in this women's tournament, much to your chagrin. Congratulations to Coach Schaefer and, and the ladies. That's a good deal right there. It is. And the men, congratulations to, you know, RT2 and that gang for getting where they are right now. That's that's good. I, I think they're they're seated just where they should be. Yeah. I, once again, it. I, I don't know what to expect from them. I don't know what to expect from them in game one, you know, except for I expect them to win game one. I don't know about game two. I don't know if they get to a – I don't know if they get out of game two, no right. matter who. I just I just don't. I well, think even Virginia with the defense can defend them. So I don't know if, the, if they can, Virginia can score enough, but I just don't know. Where to get, you don't know. It's, yeah, just, don't know. it's just really weird. Here's the bad news for Texas. Um, I was pretty thrilled seeing a seven pop up by Texas's name. Yes. I was pretty mortified seeing that they would have to play a play in team. I brought this stat up last week and I'll bring it up today. And it's a little scary. They've had the first four bit for 12 tournaments now, right? They expanded from 64 to 68 12 years ago. Yep. In 11 of the 12 tournaments in the first four existence, at least one of the first four teams has gone on to win an actual game in the actual NCAA tournament. Once again, they've had the first four 12 times in 11 of those years one of the first four winners has gone on to win an actual game in the round of 64. Yes. To advance nope. to the round of 32. So that's that's scary right there. And it's usually not the 16 seeds, right? You got those two play-in games involving 16 seeds. It's right. never them. It's the 10s or 11s. They usually win a play-in game. They ride the momentum from that win onto the actual tournament, and they find a win in the round of 64. That's obviously Texas and the only team going up against one of those play-in teams, but – 
And for me, when I'm filling out my brackets, I usually pick both of the play-in teams because I know one of them is guaranteed to win, damn near guaranteed to win. So I'm going to pick Texas, of course, and hope that the, that play-in stat continues with the other matchup. But it is scary. Once again, that, that play-in deal, you're thinking, all right, that team's going to be tired. They've got to go through a lot. It's a short rest. And then, boom, they play one game in Dayton, and then they got to fly somewhere across the country to play just right. two days later. That should benefit Texas, who has gotten a rest for more than a week. But yeah, they've had know. their rest now. Yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, the, the, the first four has uh, been kind to those teams playing in the first four. Yeah, I mean, I I, I like the – you know, I, I do like the fact that they have rested. I didn't like the way they got beat by K-State at the end, but you know what? It's one way or the other. You go in there, if you beat K-State and you still don't win the championship, that's no good either. You know, you're wasting the day of getting rest. But now now one thing we know, they have, they've had their rest. They're not going to get any more. It's just it, they, this is a team that should be ready to go. They should be fresh and ready to go. Yeah, it turns out that K-State game did not matter at all, right? No. Like I, I think if Texas beat K-State, they still would have been a seven. Now, if they, if they beat K-State, then beat Iowa State, and, you know, maybe even beat Houston, they would have been higher than a seven. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I was worried, yeah, the loss to K-State, all right, they'll definitely be an eight, but apparently they had done enough in the regular year to where the committee deemed them worthy of a this seven. This committee loved this conference. This conference was tough. They did, except for OU. They left OU out. Which, like I said, we can't take OU every place we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. But obviously, bid, bid stealers are the reason Oklahoma didn't get in. And they don't want yeah, anything yeah. to do with that NIT. They don't want anything to do with that national championship, national invitational championship banner. They don't want it. No, thank you for calling it what it's supposed to be called. Don't call it a national championship. All right, don't make me relive that bit. Protect we have that. We have that that's on our resume. That's the low. That's the lowest point in the history of Texas men's basketball. Not the loss to Abilene Christian as a three seed a couple of years ago. And if you tournament. gave that to the Aggies, they would milk that for all it's worth. They would, and that's why it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem. It's a problem winning a championship. See if I can pull this up real quick, since you're making me relive the nightmare that was the NIT. Make them winning. all relive that. Yeah, we got to make everybody else suffer too. That's our goal today. No Abilene uh, Christian in there, though, right? I have to deal no, with that. No. Here you go. There it is. Champions. Now, that's actually – that's that's the clean one. That's after they cleaned it up. It originally said national champions, but they put the NIT logo instead after I think the public just freaked out and started – Don't ever do that it. again, really. Yeah, embarrassing. Okay, here we go. So you don't expect Shaka Smart to go very far with with Marquette? Hmm, they the are Pope, pretty. Is the Pope stupid. Catholic? They are good. Is Marquette Catholic? They are there's, good. There's part of it. I can't get the oh. whole screen in there, but yeah, it did say national champions there when Texas. Won don't think for one second I'm not taller than that little guy. That's right. You're not taller than Shaka Smart. Of course I am. How tall is he? Like five seven? Yes, my my chin hits the top of his head. And this is you walking into your house the other day. <laughs> no. You ain't taller than five seven. Come on. I am five nine and three quarters. No. I've been measured. I've been to the doctor's office enough to understand that they have a nice system there. And I take my shoes off. There you go. Didn't Shaka's you went back to back with Shaka one time, didn't you? Didn't you guys yes. actually stand next to each other to try yes, to figure out was who taller. was taller? Oh, C B knows that I'm taller. He's the only guy that really knows that I'm taller. Than he and Charlie Strong. I've been with I've been in numerous bars with Charlie Strong, believe me. I'm mm -hmm. taller than that cat. Yeah. You both have the same haircut, though. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Smart's got a little bit more hair than you. You know, he was bald for most of his Texas tenure, but he's uh, been growing out the lettuce a little bit. It, you know, since he get back, since he's gone back home, he's grown out some of the lettuce now. He's got so. that oh, he's got that fro going. He looks so stupid with what he wears on the sideline. I think the hair also looks kind of ridiculous. But the um, the He's polo playing days. Well, the polo over the long sleeve shirt is such a bad bit. He looks like a child on the side. Like I, I can't take this serious. Mom dressed him. Yeah, look if if he if he won at Texas and he wore that, then I wouldn't. I'd probably still dunk on it, but I wouldn't hate it as much as I do now. Yeah, like who who wears that? Who dresses like that? Who at dresses? that age? 
Who dresses the little fella up like that? Oh, my God. Yeah, it does look like his mom picked out his clothes the night before and left him <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> left him at the end of the bed on the floor. Yeah, this is what you're wearing tomorrow, sport. <laughs> don't you wear, don't try wearing anything, but when I leave you there, sport. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm not going to have Marquette going deep because of Shaka Smart, but – uh, they've got a shot. They've got a shot. I, I really like that Florida team, though. And Florida's actually going up against the other first four winners. So Florida's the seventh seed in the South. They'll play the winner of uh, Colorado and Boise State, which that first four game happens on Wednesday. Um, I, I think Florida could beat Marquette in round two. I really do. That's a battle-tested team. Center, I don't know. They're without their center. Yeah, he's a backup, though. He's not like one of their best players. I mean, he's, he's a lot he, of minutes. Yeah, yeah, about 20 a game. I mean, he's solid. Like, I, you're right. That's going to be a loss for Florida, and they lose some depth on the front line. And uh, Marquette's very good. So you want all hands on deck to go up against a, a number two seed anytime you play them. But uh, th thankfully for Florida, it's not like one of their best players, not an irreplaceable guy. So I still think, yeah, if they uh, squared off against Marquette in that round of 32 on Sunday, they could maybe find a win. Hell, we'll see if Marquette even gets by Western Kentucky. Pretty good. One. You seen uh you That's know what their mascot good. is, right? Who, Western Kentucky? Yeah. Are they the Hilltoppers? They are the Hilltoppers. They got the weirdest looking mascot, I think, in uh in all of college sports, though. So we go with the screen share here on the YouTube. See that thing? That's worse than the Syracuse Orange. Just I mean, a what little do you yeah, that's, that's way worse than the Syracuse Orange. I don't know what is that a bird? Uh, it's a hilltopper, man. It's like a piece of red shit to me. I don't know. I don't know <laughs> what do you do? What do you do if you're uh, walking in a dark alley at night and? Well, are you talking about getting up and running? That scared yeah. the hell out of me if I saw that thing. That's what you're doing. I don't even like the like school it. colors. Come on, get away, get away from me with that thing. It's like a Teletubby, a red Teletubby. Yeah, that thing will be uh, at the NCAA tournament here in a couple of days. And God, many, there was a whole – go ahead. Let me ask you, how many uh, games for the ladies in Austin? One or two? Two games. Two games? Uh, hopefully two. I mean, they've got a – they played Drexel, a 16 seed, on Friday. Out of Philadelphia. And, and out of Philadelphia. And for those curious, uh, there's only been one – 16-1 upset in the history of the women's tournament that happened back in 1998 when uh, Harvard upset Stanford, nerds. Uh, but yeah, if Texas wins, they will play the winner of Alabama and Florida State. That's the 8-9 matchup in Texas's region. But that game will also be in Austin. So yeah, that's, that's how it works. You get to, uh, If you're a top four seed in the women's tournament, you get to host your first and second round games. Longhorns obviously being a one seed, they get to host two games at the Moody Center. So, hey, sentextickets.com if you want to be in the building this weekend, you can get those tickets at sentextickets.com. And then, yeah, if Texas is able to make it to the Sweet 16, they will be headed to Portland, the men playing in Charlotte. Well, they're going to pack the house for those two games. Oh, yeah, they should. I mean, they deserve it. They deserve it. It's kind of a cool part. Like, I, I get why the NCAA men's tournament doesn't do it, right? Uh, there's money to be made, and they sell a ton of si tickets at those regional sites that they have across the country. Yep. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a cool bit. Like, it's a nice reward. You know, you get to play some postseason games at home. If you have a really good year, you're That's rewarded right. with the higher seed, and then part of your reward is that, uh, yeah, you get the chance to actually host some tournament games in your own gym. The universities make some money. Obviously, you get that home court advantage. It, uh, it's all good. Speaking it's of all good. Uh, speaking of making some money, Scotty Scheffler made four million dollars. That was that was the purse yesterday for the winner. Four and a half. Four and a half million. Four and a half million. Wow. I know. Just for one weekend of work. All right. <sighs> I'm spending too much time looking for this thing that I clearly can't find right now. Sorry about that. That's amazing. Four and a half million. That's we've jumped there in the last five years, like you know, from a million and a half to two, and from two to four. Well, we know who to thank for that oh, oh not wait. your people my people the saudis no. <laughs> we gotta hey. thank the livers that doesn't happen without live golf that was a big response by the pga right they saw how much money live was throwing around and they're like we got to start upping our purses a little bit to keep our players here 
It was very exactly. nice not to have any of those guys in their shorts playing this weekend. No, they would have been more comfortable though if they if they were, you know. That's can their you loss. Imagine, can you imagine music jamming at number 17 at the par three when those guys are trying to hit the ball? The PGA yeah. guys. How many of those guys? I saw I saw Wyndham resorts and hotels come up short on 17 on Saturday. Dude, he was 20 yards short. How oh, great. Dude. How great would it have been if you had just club music going on when Wyndham Clark missed that putt on 18 to force oh. the playoff? <laughs> you got guys on a boat in the background. Oh, just, my it's, God. It's, you suck. Been- you suck. I mean, dude, come on. And then he was giving it the double fist pump because he thought it was down. I, like, oh, I did, oh. too. I, everyone thought it was in. It was not. It circled the cup. It circled the cup. Yeah, it's – uh. He pissed somebody off. Like you said, he moved his ball earlier. Somewhere around the line in three days, he did some move maneuver that he knew he he got away with. But the golf gods, they don't let you get away with that. There it is. This is the picture I was looking for. This guy got that thing. The hilltopper got topped at the game over the weekend. Wow. How great of a still shot is that? (laughs) Really? (laughs) Look at the face, too, on the mascot as she's like (laughs) bending down, right? In front Perfect. of him. Perfect. That, hang that in the Louvre right there. That is as good as it gets. I feel like taking a thing of lettuce and throwing it in that thing's mouth, you know? <laughs> That's what you would want to do? Just run up and shove a big head of lettuce in its mouth. Ugh. It looks like a broccoli eater. Th- yeah, th- that thing would eat anything, I feel like. it's <laughs> oh That mouth is massive. And we are talking wow. about the mascot, right? Not the... Yeah, I'm talking about the, the mascot, yes. Okay, just making sure here. Let me get a let me get a slightly better shot here. This one's got the bottom cut off, so it looks even, even raunchier here. Since <laughs> you couldn't uh, you can get on your regular porn sites, huh? Hey, this is what happens in March Madness, baby. This is why they call it madness. You get stuff like this going on at these games. All right, you now you mad- told me that Saturday that we had one of our listeners go to the FC game. That did, did they happen to win a game this week? No, they uh, they refuse to win. It's uh, it's an interesting strategy by Austin FC this season. They are protesting wins. They are seemingly boycotting the win column this year. Have they not won like a game a away, away either away and home? They, they don't they have, have a win. They have played four matches. They only have one loss. They have three draws. They have That's three ties. No, to me, they have three losses. Well, they have four losses because they do have one loss, and then they have three ties on top of that. So, by your metric, yeah, they're zero and four right now. Yes, and they lost the opening match to Minnesota two to one, and since then zero zero two two and two two. Wow! They tied uh, Philly, your guys, on they, Saturday at Q two Stadium. They tied the Liberty Bells or whatever they're called. Uh, the Union, I believe, is. Uh, mm, I you're see. always more of a Confederacy guy, though. I heard. There you go. No, that just doesn't from, make any I sense. Born, I was born in South Philly. That's true. <laughs> that is true. Uh, yeah, Austin FC drew over the weekend again, and we'll see if they win a game. Maybe they're just going to tie all thirty of their matches this wow. season. Maybe, maybe that's their uh, their strategy. There's a bold one there, Cotton. All right. Uh, before we get back into some of the other sports, we got to talk to Texas. Ba- uh, talk some Texas baseball. Sadly, we also have spring football tomorrow, and we'll let you hear from Rodney Terry momentarily he was uh interviewed by cbs sports network last night also did a little press conference right after the texas watch party for selection sunday down on campus yesterday we'll let you hear from rt in a moment but uh before all of that stuff buck how about a sponsor shout out say hello our good friends over at sue patrick say hello to jay williams and sue patrick been going on since 1975 they got that incredible selection of longhorn apparel collectibles accessories and even more They've got tons of Texas-themed items there and gifts, of course. And, of course, a wide variety of men's and women's clothing. I wore my little PJs, Kiss Me, I'm Irish. I did have those. I wore those the other day that I had on. There you go. Did you go out in public with those? No. I just went around the house and flashed by the window. That's it. They offer offer free shipping and online, uh, of course, orders over $49. And, of course, free curbside pickup. And there's always parking at 5222 Burnett Road. While you're there, say hello to Sue, and of course, say hello to Jay Williams. While you're there too, I have my wife loves her freaking whatever jelly cat. 
And I got her, I got her the dad gum. I got her the carrot jelly cat to go along with the bunny cat jelly cat for Easter. Mm. It's a thing now. I, you know, I've got to get, I got to keep giving them to her. I mean, damn. Uh -oh. I start that madness. You know, yeah, I'm telling you, you shouldn't have bought one. Now that you bought one, you've got to buy a hundred of them. And she doesn't, obviously, she doesn't want the, 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 the themed items with the, you know, football, the kicky soccer thing. She wants all those weird things like the duck, you know, the turtle, Mr. Turtle. She likes those. She's got them in her office on the shelf. I was going to ask that's, what that's she what does. That's what you do to those. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of getting my little 22 Henry, putting them up on the fence. Ba bing, ba bang. You know what I'm saying? A little target practice? Oh, why not? You're going to shoot, shoot the jelly cats? <laughs> Come on, Just man! Shoot stuffed animals. What are they? What are they gonna? What are they for? I I don't know. You gotta ask your wife. I'm not buying the jelly cats. You gotta ask her why she keeps asking for them. You know, got one for my grandson. A little football. He was more interested in the scissors that he got for his birthday. So I don't know. Scissors. I, why you did got I him scissors for his birthday? Why well, you know he's four years old, so he gets those little round scissors, not the pointy ones. He gets they get the round scissors. You know, the little round ones. But they cut stuff. That's the very, worst gift ever. What? Scissors? He was very intrigued by a pair of scissors. Yeah. He's going to run. Does he want to run with scissors? That's his bit. It's the round plastic ones. They're not like real. They can't cut you. You can't cut your finger with that. But why? Barely get what? through paper. I don't know. Someone who bought him that? Who knows? One of his relatives got him that. Just strange. <laughs> that is, I've never heard of anybody being gifted a pair of scissors for their birthday at any age, let alone four. What do you what do you think of the jelly the jelly cat football? He just kind of looked at it and went, "Hmm, what do you do with it? If I throw this, I'm going to get yelled at. If I punt it, that's a problem. Oh, how about if I just sit it right here? Yeah, I mean, you could throw. It's a stuffed animal. You can throw that thing. It's not going to break anything, right? It's not a real football, and it's not a stuffed animal. You can't call the the soccer one or the foot. You can't call those animals." Even yeah. though they're jelly cats, they're all that's their name. Their formal name is jelly cats. So it's a football. Is it a jelly football? No, it's still a jelly cat. Yeah, I don't know. They got them at Sue Patrick, though. And their people are buying those like mad. Like crazy. Yep. Online yeah. too. SuePatrick.com. Of course, they got the great longhorn gear. The hat the buck is rocking is the Sue Patrick hat. Their number one seller. Yep. They've got uh, the on field baseball caps. Uh, I don't know if you want to be. Looking like the Texas baseball team right now. Goodness gracious. But they got the polos, the golf accessories, the the access, they got belts, they got steering wheel covers, car yes. covers, of course, the great selection of ladies' clothing as books. well. Books, trinkets, Amazing. tchotchkes, all that stuff. They got them for you at Sue Patrick. Love Sue Patrick. Yes, indeed. Big fans. Love old stat beer as well. The best beer that you can find in the history of the known universe. Had me a couple of old stats this weekend celebrating. St. Patty's Day yesterday. Altstadt is perfect for any occasion. It's a German-style beer brewed right here in the heart of the Central Texas Hill Country out there in Fredericksburg. Easy to find, though. Wherever you buy your beer, all over Austin, Houston, Dallas, wherever you are in the state, you can find Altstadt beer. They've got a bunch of different brews as well, something for every single beer drinker out there. You're going to find one that you love. I'm like the men's warehouse guy. I guarantee it. There you go. Way to go. And, I, of course, we love our good friends at Big Hat. Of course, I'll be drinking the mocktails. While you're slamming down all stats, I'll be drinking the mo margarita mocktails. Yep. All those great ingredients in there, ginger, orange, lemon, lime. I'll be tasting those bad boys without the alcohol, over ice. This, this drink I put over ice. My Jack Daniels back in the day, why waste the ice? I'm wasting the ice on this mocktail. It is delicious. Get them at 34 Wine and Spirits, H-E-B. Now you'll you're gonna start finding some of those at our 7-Elevens too, it looks like. Yep. But they've got yeah, it is a tasty drink for sure. Love the folks at Big Hat. Absolutely. Love all of our great sponsors here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. By the way, before we get back into tournament talk, I keep forgetting to mention we are doing a bracket challenge. Our Texas nice. Sports Unfiltered Bracket Madness is open. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a link in the video description below. If you're listening on the app, just go to our Twitter account, at TS Unfiltered. It's the pinned tweet. All you have to do is search us, and you will find the tweet with the link to enter right there at the top of our Twitter page. Uh, it's completely free to join. You'll get to compete against all of your favorite TSU hosts and all of our TSU listeners. And, of course, we're going to have prizes. 
Right? That's a given. Absolutely. Somebody gives out more prizes than we do here on TSU. So free to enter, a chance to win some great prizes, and once again, a chance to compete against all of your favorite Texas Sports Unfiltered hosts. We uh, are excited about this one and hope all of you join it. One bracket. That's the rule. You can only enter one bracket into our contest. We're not we're doing in six and we're not doing eight brackets. We don't do that shit. I'm a believer in one bracket. You get one bracket every year. You know, I hate when people like they fill out 10 brackets and then the one that does best, they're like, yeah, that was my serious one. Oh I yeah. I've had a couple of other ones just for fun, but like, that's the one, Oh, really? the one that you did the best in is the serious one. How does it work like that every year? You didn't tell I'm me that before the tournament started, but after it's over, you're telling me that was the one that you cared about, the only one that you cared about. Now you get one sheet of integrity, as I like to call it, one bracket. Yeah, That's and if it. you're if you're in a ma- want to make some coin, go bet us. This yeah, is where bet us does a great job. When folks start calling them up like me, instead of just you know getting on their computer, and if you have questions, go bet us right now to get that opportunity to make yourself a little bit of coin right now. Absolutely. Now, I'll be making you some corn after today. Yeah, we need some. I, I, I forgot to ask you on Friday for your gold star locks of conference tournament weekend. We didn't get any. We need some Iowa State, Iowa State. I would have you given you Iowa State. Oh, okay. Sure I would have given you would. Hey, UConn. I yeah, okay. NC State for sure. Yeah, yeah you, would have, you would have picked the 10 seed in the ACC tournament to win the tournament, huh? Yeah, when they're playing with Tyron Smith playing center. My God. Yeah. What a must. Speaking of Smith, good job, Cowboys. Good job. Yeah, we can get really? into the NFL here if we Steve. want. Uh, the Cowboys wow. continue to do absolutely nothing in free agency. And, and then they, lose people. Yeah, they lost another key cog to their 12-win team from a season ago and a guy who's been a key cog for all of their success over the last decade. Tyron Smith, future Hall of Famer, one of the best offensive linemen in football, even at his age. He yes. signs a big money, one-year deal, but pretty big money deal with the New York Jets. So the Jets are revamping their offensive line to try to make sure that they can keep Aaron Rodgers upright. Aaron who? Aaron Boone? The vice president, the future vice president of our country, Aaron Rodgers. He yeah, hasn't played any football. He's playing football. What are you saying? He's going to be in office next year? No, he's not going to be in office. He's just going to be on the campaign trail during the season. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out what the hell is going on there. But a good pickup by the Jets. I mean, we know Tyron Smith's injury history, but even last year, he got hurt, missed a couple of games. But when he was on the field, he was one of the best left tackles in the game. So the Cowboys could have used him. Uh, The Cowboys now need a left tackle. They might use their first-round pick on an offensive lineman. Most mock drafts have the Cowboys taking an offensive lineman with that uh, 24th overall selection. But to me, if you're all in, if you're trying to win now, you're giving Tyron Smith a one-year contract. We're not talking about a three-, four-, five-year deal. A one-year deal, you couldn't have gotten that done? Come on, guys. For the guy who's been with you the entire time, yeah, that doesn't – that's that's not all in right there. That's that's – that's silliness. I know I talk about that guy being hurt half the season, but man, oh man, you can't let that guy. And you're going to keep some of these other knuckleheads. And you're going to let that guy walk on you. You're talking about a piece on your offense. That's a huge piece. That's the backside of your quarterback. You know? Yeah. yeah. And Tyron Smith played 13 games last year. Wow. So he, he's going to miss. Like he never plays 17 games anymore. But once again, he's incredibly effective when he's out there and, I'll take 13 games of Tyron Smith over whatever the hell else the Cowboys are going to trot out there at left tackle next season. Man, I'll tell oh, you man. that right now. So good pickup by the Jets. They continue to have a pretty strong offseason. And, uh, well, things continue to go downhill for the Dallas Cowboys. And let's not uh, forget to remind everybody that Jerry Jones said he was all in a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the Cowboys he was all in. Least- he can he pick it? Uh, wow. No, I don't, I don't know if that would help. Uh, boy, the Cowboys <laughs> – okay, the Cowboys looked even stupider than they usually do over the weekend because of some of the trades that happen. So, yes. yeah, you had a little musical chairs with quarterbacks. Justin Fields is no longer a Chicago Bear. Uh, thankfully, we can put that conversation yeah. to bed. There's so many people like, oh, the Bears are going to stick. No, they were never going to stick with Justin Fields. That's no. been obvious for months. I don't know why people thought that that wasn't the case. Justin Fields got traded for a sixth-round pick. He's going to Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh traded Kenny Pickett to Philadelphia. So the Eagles have a new backup quarterback, and if 
I, like, look, Jalen Hurts is clearly the starter, but he was bad last year. I guess if he's and bad he, and, he's, and he's hurt now, you got to still got a home state guy right there. Yeah, yeah. Pickett going from Pitt, where he played college ball, obviously to Pittsburgh in the NFL to Philadelphia, and he so wanted he out. He wanted out once they got Russell Wilson. He said, "I want out." Yeah, it was weird. Like I think people were expecting maybe a quarterback competition yes. in Pittsburgh, but apparently Mike Tomlin told Kenny Pickett that uh, Russ is going to get the first team reps. I don't know if he like said Russ is the starter, but he's like uh, Russ is going to get the first team reps in practice, and I think that was enough for Kenny Pickett to say, "Yes, I don't want to be yes. here anymore." So Pickett goes to Philly. Interesting move there. The Eagles have a new backup, but obviously the bigger deal is you know the Steelers getting. Justin Fields. And here's why it makes the Cowboys look bad. The Steelers only gave up a sixth to get Justin Fields. Now it turns into a fourth if Justin Fields plays 51% of the Steelers snaps next year. So if right. Russ gets hurt or if Russ sucks and he's cooked and Justin Fields takes over, then that draft pick can be as high as a fourth going back to Chicago. But for right now, it's a sixth round pick that Justin Fields went for. The Cowboys gave up a fourth rounder for Trey Lance. Justin Fields has played he, three years in the league, and he's done yeah. some good things. Like Teams still believe he can be a franchise QB in the NFL. Trey Lance, like, the, the Niners gave up a million picks to go get that guy, and they're like, shit, we don't want him here anymore. We'll get rid of him for Mr. Irrelevant. The Cowboys gave up a fourth-round pick for that bust, and the Steelers only had to give up a sixth for right. a guy that, once again, I don't, but a lot of people believe he can be a starting quarterback in this league for a long time. Way to go, Jerry. He's all in. More ineptitude from the Cowboys front office and more reason why you should have no faith that Dallas is ever going to do anything as long as Botox man is above ground. Well, I, and it's a and it's a good move for for Pittsburgh. You know, they got that's that's a cheap deal for both quarterbacks that they got. They'll put pressure on Russell Wilson, you know, to perform. If he doesn't, now you've got you got Justin Fields. If Justin Fields is successful now. You got a quarterback for a long, long time, a young guy for a long time, but it does put the pressure on Russ. Yeah. I mean, he was going, he was going to have pressure with Kenny Pickett there, so he's going to have to. He, he'll have to be better, and maybe there's things you can do with both quarterbacks there. You know, yeah, with that offense. Yeah, you could you could have some packages with Justin Fields, right? Sure. I mean, run first. He's obviously good enough to throw the ball, but his strength is that he can run and yes. You know, Russ can't move the way that he did. Even when he used to move, he wasn't the type of athlete that Justin Fields is. So, no. yeah, you could you could rock both quarterbacks next season. But uh, you're right. I, I think it's both great moves by Pittsburgh. Very low risk. I don't know if the reward's going to be that high because I don't think Russ is that good in 2024. And I'm not a huge believer in Justin Fields. But, look, the Steelers, they're never bad enough to draft a top quarterback. That's right. And, like, they need a quarterback. So this was their best option, and hell, they got two pretty solid options. So, yeah, to, to get Russ for 1.2 mil or whatever it is and then to only give up a six for Justin Fields, and he's still on his rookie contract, so they're not paying him that much. Like, that's that's good moves by Pittsburgh. It is. They're doing. They're They're all in. They're all in. Yeah, yeah, more than the Cowboys are. That's for damn sure. I mean, everyone's more all in than the Cowboys are. The UFL teams that are about to start playing are more all in than the Cowboys are right they're, now. Not only are they not getting players, they're taking away key position guys on that offense, which you need that you need to protect your quarterback since you're going to end up paying him. Yes, you are. You're going to pay that guy at quarterback, and now yeah. you're taking his left tackle away from him. It's like th those are bad moves to me. Yeah, well, they already lost their center, Tyler Biotish, in free yes. agency to Washington. Now they lose Tyron Smith, so that's two offensive linemen that are gone. The starting running back, Tony Pollard, is gone. Uh, the third receiver, Michael Gallup, who you know had a disappointing year last year, but he got released officially over the weekend. So, yeah, you know you're you're always supposed to be trying to help your quarterback, and the Cowboys to this point in the offseason have done nothing to help Dak Prescott. Yeah, that group's going to have to draft a wide receiver now. Yeah, I think so. Uh, probably a day two pick, mm -hmm. uh, unless they, you know, there are still free agents out there. Feels foolish to even talk about the Cowboys in relation to any of those available players, but there are still guys out there that the Cowboys could sign if they wanted to. But if they don't, then yeah, I mean, they need an offensive lineman. They need a defensive lineman. I still think they need a linebacker, even though they signed Eric Kendricks. Um, 
They need a running back still. They need a wide Man. receiver. They need a lot. And they're just literally sitting on their hands watching every other team try to get better. And they're just standing idly by, chilling. It's all yeah, good here. Stephon Diggs sounds like he he wants to get out of Buffalo. He's he's going to be bitching and moaning and complaining, but he can't come to a team like the Cowboys. Cost too much, and him with C.D. Lamb and C.D. Lamb's mom. I can't even imagine if Stephon Diggs got there and caught a bunch of balls. C.D. Lamb's mom would go nuts. So that would be that would that's misery for the Cowboys. Plus, they can't afford it. I love Stephon Diggs in Dallas, I mean, but they can't afford it. I don't know. I like he's making a lot of money, but. Sometimes, like we saw Amari Cooper get traded for a fifth. Like sometimes, like Stefan Gilmore got traded for a sixth. Like it, you never know. Good players, if they're causing all sorts of problems and if they're supposed to make a lot of money, like teams are willing to get rid of them. Hell, Justin Fields, he got traded for a sixth. We were talking about that guy going for a second. He got traded for a sixth. So there's a chance if the Bills are tired of Stefan Diggs' crap, and there's a lot of crap that comes along with them. They could be willing to ship him out of town. There is a lot of crap to go with that. They got too many drama queens on their teams as it is. I know. And it's like, what do you do? I mean, Josh Allen, you want to keep his number one target there. They already lost Gabe Davis in free agency. So, like, if you trade Stephon Diggs, then you're really shorthanded at wide receiver. But Yeah, I think, that, I think for the Bills, they have to – that little window of opportunity. I mean, as long as you have that quarterback, your opportunity is there. But the window of opportunity with the group that they have right now – I think that's closed. They're going to need new receivers. They're going to need they're going to need a lot of newness offensively, defensively, and possibly at head coach too. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they've tried it, and it feels like they're trying to run it back again yes. in Buffalo, and hoping at some point it, it's going to be enough to get over the Kansas City hump because the, the Chiefs have been a thorn in their side. What the Cowboys don't need is they don't need any more locker room drama. They need to get down to you know. Oh. That's all Jerry cares about. More headlines for the yeah. Cowboys? Yeah, he needs that. Yeah. And I always said, hey, that if you go there, you know that's what you're going to get. Fight through that. If you're a professional, fight through it. You're going to get paid. And if you're talented, your team's talented, win the games. Quit the bullshit. Regular season, win the playoff games. you got enough talent to win those. So you know what you get when you go to the Cowboys. You know, yeah. even Dalton Schultz says nothing like that place. But you're getting paid for it, you know. Yeah. Get, over, get over all these little weird things and just go – you know, I know what the culture is there. The culture is they're a great regular season team, but when it comes to the playoffs, I don't know. I I don't know why the culture changes during the playoffs. You know what I'm saying? You know why? Because the teams are better in the playoffs. Teams are better in the playoffs. Yep. And there's some sort of mental block that's there with the Cowboys right now. Because yeah, not only are the teams they play better, but hell, they they hang with good teams in the regular season. They beat a couple of good teams in the regular yeah. season. And then I don't know, something just clicks in, in the postseason. They just they don't know what the hell well, they're, they're gonna doing. have to replace Michael Gallup. I mean, he's not much yeah. to replace from since he got hurt, but yeah, no, they need a receiver. And and yeah, look, so. Stefan Diggs, that's a big upgrade. I don't think the Cowboys will do it because that would require them actually doing something. Um, but I would take it. You got Trayvon, his brother's already on the team. Yes. Maybe that could calm him down a little bit. I mean, Trayvon's a bit of a diva, he's not Stefan level annoying, but no. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's potentially scary having both of them in the same locker room, but maybe yes. Trayvon could tell Stefan, like, dude, shut up. Go play ball here. Stop making this about you. He is All the right. older brother. The older brother's the defender, right? No, Stefan is the older brother. Oh, that scares me when the oldest one is the one cutting up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I just think that for, for them, yeah, I mean, he's a great player. And I just think he's a he's just a pain in the side to to what's going on there. I I throw ball, you catch ball. I throw I think, to you a lot. You catch ball, not a lot. You know what I mean? I, I think Diggs is staying. He just he he's got that Aaron Rodgers to him. He wants people talking about him, right? No one's talking about Aaron Rodgers right now. So what's he gonna do? He's gonna run for vice president of the United States. Stefan Diggs ain't that crazy, but everyone's talking about all of these other free agents, all of these other trades. No one's talking about Stefan Diggs. So what does he do? He posts a bunch of cryptic tweets over the weekend so people start talking about him like there there are certain guys who just love the attention all the time and when other people are getting the attention it's not just a football thing you see this in real life all the time there are attention seekers out there and if they're not getting what they want they're going to do something about it and that's stefan Diggs right now so i don't think he's going anywhere probably owed too right. much money and like you said it feels like the bills are just trying to roll with what they've got 
Wow. Um, and he's a, he's a part of that right now. So, hey, that could be a landing spot for A.D. Mitchell. I've seen a couple of mock drafts that have Adonai Mitchell going to Buffalo late in the first. Why can't he go to Dallas now? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think the Cowboys will spend a first on a receiver. They got they got bigger issues. They do need a receiver, but you know they they need offensive line and defensive line and linebacker more. Well, they definitely so. need offensive line help now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, I I wouldn't be mad if Ad Mitchell was drafted by the oh, Cowboys. Hell no, you would. would be awesome. You're talking an upgrade from Michael Gallup, the way Michael yeah. Gallup limped around for the last two years. Yeah, it's an upgrade over Cooks too. That makes Brandon Cooks your number three receiver. Man, if you if you bring Ad Mitchell in town, but uh, yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think that's to, going to happen. They got to protect the quarterback and they got to stop the run. Yep, yep, they've got good enough wide receiver play. Well, what I didn't mean to do is I didn't mean to pull you away from college baseball and that unbelievable Texas Longhorn team. I did that, got you into the NFL, but I got <laughs> I need to go back. What happened this weekend? Who was the group that they just? Can we be? Can we get the girls' volleyball team to play Washington? No, no, no. Right. Stop! Don't schedule Washington in any sport, ever. We have to beat them in something. We got to put them on our schedule when we go to the SEC in some sport. How about track and field? Nope. I know we're better than them in track and field, but I still don't want to play them. I know we're better than them. We're better than you're everybody. Afraid of Washington now? I'm, I'm afraid of Washington now. Like you're afraid of Texas State, which is ridiculously dumb. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I'm afraid of Washington now because I was hoping the baseball team would be able to avenge, you know, the last two bowl game losses for Texas. And instead a Washington team that came into town four, seven and a one. That's how bad they are. They effing tied in baseball four, seven and one. They come into town and take two of three in Austin. So all the good graces that David Pierce had built up from that series win in Lubbock last weekend. Yes. Now it's back to fire David Pierce because you just lost to a shitty team in your own backyard. Washington, that was their first series win of the season. That's what I kept the rain away from, that? Yeah, I wish I wish you brought more rain. We, we, need, we needed three rain outs instead of what we saw. And Texas barely won yesterday. They tried to blow it yesterday. They got lucky because of the curfew rule that they've got in college baseball. The game got delayed an hour and 20 minutes or so because of weather. And then, yeah, there's a curfew rule for teams that are traveling. So they only played eight innings yesterday. And Texas gave up two runs because the bullpen sucks. It was four to one going into the eight. The Longhorns gave up a two-run homer. It was four to three. And thankfully, the game ended right then and there because if that game went to a ninth inning and you needed the bullpen to get you three more outs, I'm not sure they would have been able to do it because they suck. So well, David, what, I mean, is the starting pitching must be okay. I mean, I'm looking uh, at this. The starting pitching must be okay. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it was fine over the weekend. Like, Friday night was a huge disaster. LeBaron Johnson was great. Six innings, gave up one run. He left the game. Texas had a three-to-one lead. Looked like they were going to coast to a nice Friday night victory. Bullpen comes in. They give up six runs in the seventh inning. I mean, all three of the bullpen arms that Texas brought in in relief of LBJ gave up multiple runs. Wow. So, that's the issue. Uh, Saturday, Ace Whitehead in relief did a great job. He pitched seven innings, gave up just one hit uh, to preserve a Texas win. And the only, or excuse me, that was not a win. That was a loss, but he was great out of the bullpen. They didn't get enough from the starter in that one. But that was the one bright spot for Texas baseball over the weekend. But yeah, I mean, it was, it was a disaster. This is a 10 game homestand that the Longhorns are in the midst of. Uh, I, I wanted them to go eight and two at worst. Like, they're better than, I thought they were better than all the teams that they're playing right now. And, well, they're 2-2 two and two in this 10-game homestand right now. they got Air Force coming to town for two games starting tomorrow. But I just, I, you know, I don't feel great about this Texas team going up against you're not, you're talking about pitching defense and offense, too. They're not hitting the ball either. Yeah, I mean, the, the offense has been great for the most part this season. But, you know, they scored 3-3-4 three, three, and four in these three games. So that's, you know, that's not enough. Uh, for the most part, the offense has been fine. But yeah, this weekend it was all it was all bad for Texas, and they they lost to a bad team. They dropped two of three to a bad team. So easy solution: stop scheduling Washington in any That's sport. Your solution now: no more Washington. Even nothing. In volleyball. No no volleyball. No track and field. Nothing. Swimming and diving, track, volleyball, tennis, all of our great sports. I don't want any part of them because they're going to beat us. Doesn't matter wow. how bad they are. Doesn't matter if they even have a team. They'll find a bunch of students on campus and start a team and beat Texas in something. 
Wow. They're, they're bad juju. Anytime We're talking about the Huskies here. Purple and gold come to town. That is We're bad. We're not talking about Alabama. We're not talking about Georgia. We're talking about the we, Huskies. We can beat Alabama. <laughs> we can't beat Washington. We beat Alabama last year. We should have beat them two years ago. We're like eight and two all time against Alabama. We can't beat Washington in any sports. Even baseball, we can't beat them. That team's not even going to make the tournament this year, and they came no. into the position. Yes. Watch, they'll be a number two seed. No, they won't. We just got uh, awful. So That was supposed yeah. to be the start of a nice weekend, too. Yeah, it was, supposed to be, it, it was one of those, like, what's our motto? We don't complain about series wins. So if Texas took two of three, we would have been like, right. all right, they won a series. That's fine. But th this was a team you should have swept. This was a team you should have swept, and instead – not only do you not do that, you can't even take the series against them. And so you almost lost yesterday. They had yeah. to get, get them on a flight and get them out of town. They had the, to get them out of town. The curfew rule saved, you know, curfew saved me a couple of times for making some bad decisions. The curfew rule saved Texas yesterday. Wow. Usually hate curfew. Curfew came in clutch. That was the best player for Texas baseball the weekend. The GD curfew rules. Wow. It's so, David, David Pierce. That's that seat's going to start warming up a little bit. Yeah. Well, if you look at uh, the website twitter.com, commonly known as X, the seat's already scorching hot for David Pierce. And he made the decision to be his own pitching coach. Yep. And the pitching continues to blow chunks. <laughs> Just heaving him up, huh? God, I've not I've not used that expression in a long time. Blow that, chunks. They're blowing chunks out there. At UFCU wow. Dish Falk Field. So the good news is that's not a conference series. That's right. Bad news is it's a bad team right now. They're a bad team. I mean, they're like. Who do we got on a Tuesday we can beat? Who we mean? They're not playing Texas State. Please don't tell me they're playing. They don't even grab that group to play. No, they already lost to Texas State once. They will play them two more times this year. Oh, boy. Texas is 11 and 8 on the season. Uh, Air Force, two games. One tomorrow, one Wednesday. The salute to service. Does okay. that mean we have to lose to show our respects to the troops? That would be the thing to do, right? Yeah. Huh? Do we support our troops? The Girl yeah. Scouts and the military? I don't know. I'm and I always hate I always hate playing the academies, dude. I, I don't like rooting against them. That's not fun. No, you're right. These guys are heroes, man. And and I think last year was it wasn't the year they had that damn picture and pitcher and catcher who was like a first round pick. A couple of years ago, oh, Texas actually that played that guy. Yeah, Paul Skeens. Yes. He transferred to LSU and yeah, was on the national yeah. title team last right. year. But, yeah, he was the number one pick in the draft. So, yeah, I don't I don't think they have a Paul Skeens on the roster right now. But They um, don't need yeah. one. Uh, no, they don't. I mean, you and I could maybe go out and beat this Texas baseball team right now the way they're playing. Amazing. Wow. Yeah, it's 11-8 uh, and eight on the year. Uh, the new – polls come out today of course there's 400 college baseball polls and i think they're all released on mondays texas ain't going to be ranked in any of them and they shouldn't no. be anywhere close to the top 25 in any of them i thought after that tech deal that they were really going to get it going i thought they'd catch fire a little bit here yeah i did too i did too and once again they are uh going up against maybe the weakest part of its schedule right now with these 10 games at home against you know 10 teams that probably won't make the tournament this year and they're just two and two through these first four um so disappointing stretch for texas baseball and yeah they've got to uh they've got to turn things around here yeah that sucks when you change and the boss becomes the pitching coach and he's still the boss and you've made the decision i'm going to make a change and that change is going to be me we we talked about it like you increase the warmth of your seat when you do yeah. stuff like that because you know if the pitching was this bad People would still be mad at David Pierce because he hired the pitching coach. It's like, oh, you bring somebody in to be the pitching coach. Well, you made a bad hire. You can fire that guy, and it's fine. Right. But when you, when you are the pitching coach, can't fire yourself. Everyone's going to look at you. The pitching's the problem? Coach, you made the decision. You parted ways with the pitching coach last year who had Texas in the top 10 in the country in earned run average. You made that decision to shuffle up the deck with your coaching staff, and you made yourself – the head honcho and now the pitching staff sucks so literally he drew a target on his back like a jelly cat target practice he drew <laughs> one on his back and 
yeah, that's why he's getting as much heat as he's getting, and it's it's deserved. Win your conference games, coach. Yeah, yeah. Go get well, yourself got- a Big Twelve championship on the way out, like everybody else is. They got plenty of year left, but uh, boy, eleven and eight is not what anybody had in mind. No, through uh, these first nineteen games. All right, before we get back into a uh, March Madness and the bracket that came out yesterday, I should say yeah, the bracket man. that came out yesterday. Buck, do you have any more? Yeah, I got to tell folks about relax the back. I'm sitting in my chair and I sat in my chair an awful lot watching golf this weekend, and I've got that comfort that I needed for my back. You know, I've. I needed a healthier approach to the weight. I was sitting around. I was sitting around in that, of course, the the old couch over there, the ice cream sandwich that just, you know, in between I sit on it, it just kind of folds up. And I got back this weekend and said, you know, I'm going to sit in this relaxed back chair that I've had for all these years. Even though it's a chair, it's a desk chair, it felt great. And relaxed back has all those different types of chairs for you. They've got all the, you know, they've got the zero gravity recliners, of course, the adjustable mattress sets they have for you, Tempur-Pedic. Uh, pillows. They've got it all just for you. They've got two great locations in BKs at the Hill Country Gallery across from Whole Foods and up in North Austin at the Gateway Shopping Center across from the Container Store. This weekend, live pain-free like I did with Relax the Bag. Yes, indeed. Quick shout out to Cabo Bob's. You know, the Texas baseball team couldn't win a series, so oh. we don't have a gift card to give away on their behalf, but the softball team swept BYU over the weekend, which means we will be giving away a $50 Cabo Bob's gift nice. card. That's right. We'll do that tomorrow. Oh, yes. yeah. The randomizer will come out tomorrow morning during this show. At some point between 8 to 10, we will be giving one of you a $50 gift card to Cabo Bob's, the best burritos in the game today. Also, shout out to Olipop. Somebody, oh, yeah. Uh, somebody hit us up about Olipop. Uh, Longhorn Bears local 7-Eleven didn't have Olipop. Talk to the folks here. Yeah, ask him. Our guy Ashish, who runs the a few 7-Elevens by us, he's stocked, always stocked with the Olipop. And you can get it at H-E-B or Target or Whole Foods, Costco, Walmart, wherever you buy your groceries if you can't find it at your local convenience store. But Olipop is a game changer. I was with my folks over the weekend. They were drinking some Olipop, the there strawberry vanilla flavor. It's great tasting. Vanilla. Great tasting soda that's actually good for you. Uh, it's incredible what they have done. I'm telling you, every time you drink Olipop, you are helping your digestive health, and you're also going to enjoy what you are sipping as well. And it's a game changer. Once again, it's something healthy that doesn't taste like dog shit. I, I don't know how they did it, but they find a way. They found a way to do it. Get you some of that Olipop. And also, how about a word from our man, Tom McKay, over at Audiovisual Consultations. <laughs> Hi, this is Tom McKay with Audiovisual Consultations. Today's home electronics can be a bit daunting. My company has spent the last 36 years making sure they are not. For those of you who have not experienced our services yet, we'd like to invite you to give us a try for all your home electronics needs. We carry all the major brands of televisions and stereo equipment at prices you can't find in stores. And we come to you. There's no need to leave your home to find great pricing and incomparable service. No traffic and experienced sales geeks or pushy showroom tactics. We believe in having some fun and dreaming big. Do you have a dream for your home entertainment? Let us know. We can make it come true. And we are always there to help after the job is done. We cultivate clients for a lifetime by treating everyone like their family. No, not those family members. I'm talking about the ones you actually like. So relax, hug your kids, make love to your wife, and smile. Then, when you have a moment, give us a call at 255-8678. That's 512-255-8678. Or online at avconsultations.com. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. BK, did you say that the St. John's, did they not make the field? Boy, they were playing pretty good basketball at the end. I think I muted myself. Sorry about go. that. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, they, they didn't make it, huh? St. John's did not get in. They got screwed. They should have been in there. They were the top-ranked team on Ken Palm to not make the NCAA tournament. Wow. They were number 25 on Ken Palm, and they didn't get in the field of 68. Uh, Rick Patino, legendary coach. I don't know if this is the NCAA punishing Patino for some of the shady stuff he's done in the past, or that guy has been punished a few times by the NC2A for some – rules violations so maybe this is the ncaa saying hey here's uh something from the past we didn't forget yeah uh, we didn't they, catch you on some of this but we got you now yeah, they they, sh- they should have been in man they should have been in and i don't were they one of the first four teams out 
I don't even know if they were regarded that close by the committee. Yeah, the Big East got host. Providence didn't get in either. I thought Providence had a strong case to uh, I did to make too. the too. And Seton Hall, did Seton Hall get in? I don't think Seton Hall got in either. So, yeah, I don't know. The Big East is usually regarded as one of the best. And this wasn't their best year ever, but no. I, I figured, you know, they had a one seed at the defending champs in UConn. They had Marquette. And there were some good teams in that league. I figured they'd be able to get more in the dance. But Villanova's not in. Villanova's not in. No, Villanova should not have been in. They they sucked. It was a joke. St. John should have been in. St. John should have made it. Yeah, St. John should have made it this year. So, uh, yeah, has a big storyline. No love for the Big East this year. Oklahoma, once again, the first team out. Don't feel too bad about that. I don't either. The best part is they're keeping their coach. Border Mosier has not done a very good job there in Norman. As I'm grateful that they're keeping him around. He was flirting with DePaul for a little bit, and I guess they got a new deal worked out or something to keep Porter Mosier around at OU. And I think most OU basketball fans are about ready to move on because it's been a pretty underwhelming era for him. Is that three years for him now? I think it's like four or five years. Wow. Yeah, and he was the coach at Loyola of Chicago oh, yeah. when, when they made the Final Four, and they had Sister Jean oh, dropping yeah. 30 a game. That's yeah. right. You know, that broad's still alive. Yes, she is. What is she now? Like, she's over 100. That's over 100. Sure. I think she's the oldest acting nun. That's still. She's just acting? She's not a real nun? No, she's working. Okay. A hundred. She's the oldest active. Active. 104 yeah. years young. Sister Jean. 104? Would you? No. What are you talking about? <laughs> would I? What am I? Wood, Woodlong? Longwood? Yeah, uh, you did say you like to be associated with Longwood earlier today. What a team. That Longwood. team would eat so bad, Longwood. Yeah, they're playing the Houston, so that's a – And Stetson. Yeah, Stetson's playing UConn. The Stetson Hatters into the tournament for the first time in school history. Uh, in Moorhead State, I can't. I think they're playing Illinois. So Yeah, St. Yeah, John's. That's how you didn't get in because there's Moorhead State's in and the hey. Stetson's. We all need more head, okay? So that's that's not a bad thing, all right? We will take that. We need more um, hats, too. More hats. More hats, absolutely. You want to hear from Rodney Terry, Buck? Yeah, let's hear what Coach is saying. All right, we got a couple of cuts from Rodney Terry. Of course, Texas named a seven seed in the Midwest region. A pleasant surprise for Longhorn fans. I think uh, we were all expecting an eight or nine. Texas getting a little bit of love from the committee this year. They are a seven. They will play the winner of Virginia and Colorado State. And one of the first four games, that first four game is tomorrow. The Texas matchup against the winner of that game will be on Thursday, 550 Central Time. So you get to listen to TSU all day long, and then boom, nice. you get to uh, watch the Texas game right after. I'll be in Vegas this weekend. For You're headed to Vegas, making those plays for next year already. Oh, my God. I'll be making some futures plays, but I'll also be keeping the lights on at the casino. There you go. Keep the lights on, man. I will be donating lots of cash. There you go. The Vegas Strip this week. Another hotel, right. thanks to BK. Yep, I got y'all. Uh, RT, we'll uh, we'll start with this cut. He was asked about making the tournament and being named a seven seed. I got excited about this time of year. This time of year, we don't ever take it for granted uh, that you're going to be playing in March Madness. We're super excited about, about getting a chance to uh, – Continue our journey together. This group here has come a long ways from the start of the season to where we are right now, and uh, I think they're still hungry for more. You know, doesn't want this journey to stop. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't want the journey <laughs> to stop either. Um, I hope that they're hungry for more. You know, I, I just I'm at the point now where I don't really put any weight into anything Rodney Terry has to say because I he, he he keeps a pretty even keel for the most part. He's got a lot of coach speak to him. Okay, he's a coach. That's fair. Sure. But like, I don't know. There's nothing Rodney Terry could say that is going to inspire me with a bunch of confidence that, oh, this team can make an Elite Eight run like they did last year. You mean him telling you that they're one of the top teams in the nation won't do it for you? No, no, because I have eyes. <laughs> and I've watched them all season long. So I know they're not one of the top teams in the country. So there's nothing he could say that would just, yeah, like – Make me feel that this team has a great shot. Now, could they make a run? Sure. I'm not saying yeah, they can't. Game one will be very important to see how they, you know, if certain guys can get themselves together and just, you know, this is like, this is a new season, you know? Yeah. 
It can, is. They, can they change some of their fortunes in the way they've – can they be consistent? Can they all be consistent together? That's the no. problem. Yeah, we know the answer to that, right? You know, it's can they play well enough on one night to win one game? We'll, we'll, we'll start there and then go on. Right. But this this is it. I mean, Zay and I were talking about this yesterday, Buck, and you and I may have, may have touched on this last week. I, I hate saying this because I'm such a college basketball crackhead, right? Like, I'm an addict. I watch – a ridiculous amount of college hoops all year long. Yeah. A lot of people are just now uh, I'll watch in March and that's it. I watch it all season long. And I hate, I hate how diminished the regular season is, right? I hate that fans only care about the NCAA sure. tournament. It, it kills me. I want people to watch more college hoops, but at the end of the day, this is all that matters. Like it, it doesn't matter that Texas is a seven seed. If they go to the elite eight, then you better give RT his flowers. Like everyone's yes. opinion of Rodney Terry should change for the better. If Texas makes it to the second weekend. Now, if Texas loses on Thursday, okay, your opinion of Rodney Terry should be a little bit worse than it is right now. So, like, March is all that matters in this sport. I mean, last year you had a, you had a nine seed in the final four. You had two five seeds in the final four. Now, nobody below a five – okay, nobody below an eight has ever won a national championship. But you've got – like, it's very rare that it happens where a team wins a national title, but you don't have to win a national championship for you to feel good about Rodney Terry. No. Like, what he's done to this point in the season, okay, you, you have an opinion on him right now, but when you're a coach in this sport, your legacy is determined by what you do in this dance. And if Texas makes it to the second weekend, we're talking about a program book that has not been to the second weekend in consecutive seasons in 20 years. If Rodney Terry's the guy who's able to lead them over that hump, then you got to give him his love, man. It's as simple sure. as that. So that's that's where wins, it is. He wins two games. Yeah, you take it. That, yeah, that that means. I mean, they they have a shot, but yeah, for me it's, but for me it's game to game. It just that's how it goes. They can play like crap and then win the second game. They can win the first one playing crappy and blow out the team in the second game. That wouldn't surprise me either. None of it surprises me with this team. There's not enough consistency to say that I'm pretty sure this is a six-point win, this is an eight-point win, it'll be somewhere around there. I just always think of them playing. It's a dogfight. Yeah. Here's here's where I'm at. Here's where I'm at right now, and I got some research to do on Virginia and Colorado State, and I'm obviously going to watch the game tomorrow night like we all will. Mm -hmm. But, I, like, here's what I think Texas is going to do. I think they're going to play incredibly well on Thursday. I think they're going to win that 7-10 matchup, and I think they're going to win it by, like, 10 to 15. So every Texas fan is like, shit, we just look good. We just won a tournament game by double digits, and now we get to play Rick Barnes? Like, uh, we got a shot here. And then Texas will resort back to inconsistent Texas, and we'll get blown out by Tennessee, and it's like, ah, shit, why do we buy in? Why do we think this team was actually going to put two really good games together? We've seen it all year long, how up and down they are. Well, I'm no, not thinking can... they're going to win that game no matter what, how they win. Tennessee. The I, I just don't think they get by Tennessee. Too much talent on that Tennessee team. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they'll be a dog, of course. Tennessee's really good. I, I think they're, in terms of talent, a top five team in the nation. If they had a better tournament coach than Rick Barnes, I'd probably have them in the final four. Yes. But I'm just saying, if Texas wins, there are going to be Longhorn fans who are like, ah, Rick Barnes in March, we can beat that guy. He's prone to lose to lower seeded teams. He's done it five years in a row. Like, there's. There's going to be people who say that if Texas gets by Thursday, but I just feel like they're going to get all of our hopes up and completely crush them this weekend. Yeah, then as I said, they everybody has to, everybody will have to play well together. I mean, the big man will have to play real big. Shedrick will have to be really important from this point on as a big man, as a defender. BK, he'll have to be good, and even that that bit of offense that he's come up with, you know, in the second half of the season. You need that too. You need him to be at his best on all fronts, offense and defense. Once you get to tournament play, yep. He just he can't just be. Oh, he was great in defending. Sorry, he only scored a point in the game. No, he's got to score a point. He's got to. They all have to be really good. They got. They all have to in order to win at this part of the year. Everybody has to be good. Yeah, I, yeah. I, we've only seen everybody good at, at a couple at a couple times. You know. I don't even know if everybody has to be good. Like, if everybody's good, then okay, they, they could really do something special here. But can we get can we get some guys to be good? <laughs> can we that's get all. Three that's guys? like three. Ace Smith and Sue. I think are going to be good, but can we get yeah. some like just a, a few of the it's other guys? The other guard, the guy who scored that, that one day scored thirty. 
Can, we, can, can two to three of Tyrese Hunter, Dylan Mitchell, Brock Cunningham, Caden Shedrick, IT Horton, Kendall Weaver, can two or three of those guys bring it? Because if they do, then Texas can win a game or two in this thing. But how are you supposed to feel good about that happening? Because the last time we saw this Texas team, I mean, it was IT Horton had a good game. Dylan Mitchell had a good, like, 15 minutes. But everybody else, blue no. chunks. We go back to that one again. Oh, they can't blow chunks here. No chunk blowing, please. No. Please. One more from RT. Uh, this is tough. You know, you don't know who you're going to play. Like, Texas is at a little bit of a disadvantage because every other team not playing a play-in team has a few extra days to scout one opponent. Texas obviously has to start scouting two, and then well, tomorrow night they'll find out which one they really need to hone in on. But here's RT talking about how you plan for playing a team in the first four. Well, I think you can look at it both ways. I think uh, we still get a chance to continue to work on things. We have to continue to, to put ourselves in the best position no matter who we're playing as well. Uh, this time of year, you're still trying to play your best basketball and you're trying to work on things you need to continue to get better with. Um, I, I, we're taking an approach. We're going to watch both teams and uh, prior to them playing, and uh, and then we'll obviously see the outcome, you know, that night in terms of who we're actually playing. Yeah, I think he's right. I mean, you got to work on the things that you guys haven't done well, you yeah. know, on a consistent basis. So you got to get your guard. Tarvis Hunter has to be good. He has to be better at this time of the year for them. Because I don't know if he comes back again because this is kind of your last – this is it. He has yeah. to be better. He has to be the best uh, of the guard play right now. We know what we're going to get with Ace He's going to get his somehow, some way. Uh, whether he's on or not, he's going to take his shot. So the ball's going to be on the rim. Who's going after it? Dylan Mitchell going to play like an NBA player? Or is he just going to be like another guy that, oh, maybe he needs another year before he goes to the league? I mean, what, what are you going to get? This is where he should be playing his best right now. Yeah, this is point. where he, he wanted to play his best. This is yep. this everybody's going to be watching you. Everybody not, watches you now. Excuse me, Buck. It's not just legacies here, right? It's money. Sure. Like, yeah. If Dylan Mitchell puts together a couple of good games, he's not going to be a lottery pick or anything. But like, he okay, he he could get drafted. Like after this season, if he goes pro, I'm not sure he's getting drafted in the two round NBA draft. But if he goes for 14 and 10 and oh, yeah. 15 and 11. In two tournament games, then all right, like he has maybe played himself back into that conversation. This so, is money yeah. for Dasu, also, no money matter where he plays. Yeah, yeah, Dasu is, uh, you know, celebrated senior night. His his college career is coming to an end, and he's got a chance to be a draft pick in the NBA. I think he should be. Uh, it doesn't have the athleticism or the potential that Dylan Mitchell does, but yeah, Dylan Dasu, chance for him too. I mean, Tyrese Hunter at this point, he's probably coming back. He's got one more year. He can come back if he wants, but. If he gets hot and helps guide You're Texas right. on a deep run, like it's uh, it's it's contract time for everybody in college basketball. But there are a couple of candidates on this Texas team who could earn themselves some cash. Well, even even Shedrick, I mean, he can earn himself some cash. He's a big man too. This this is this is where he has to show his the offense that we we have been seeing from him has been okay. It's more than we saw in the beginning of the season. I'm fine with him the way he's playing, but he can't take a step back now. He can't all of a sudden play the way he's been playing, and then all of a sudden play the way he played in the beginning of the season. We can't see that now. You know, yeah. we see the best of him now. Best of everybody. That's, that's yeah, the you're hope. Right. Best of everybody. You're absolutely right. Hope. And it was like, oh, maybe this team is playing its best right now. He kind of felt that way going into Kansas City, and then the K-State game happened, and it's like, I, I just I don't, right know what, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to believe. Uh, just, yeah, pick Texas to make a deep run at your own peril because they'll let you down. That's usually what we do. Texas basketball. All right. Quick sponsor shout out to Covert B Cave. Yeah. Do a quick live read for Covert B Cave, their newest state of the art dealership. Of course, the Covert Auto Group has been around since 1909. If you live anywhere in Central Texas, you know about the Coverts. Covert B Cave, their new state of the art facility. How about this? Three dealerships featuring seven different brands. They've got everything the best selection of new and pre owned cars, trucks, and SUVs. Of course, the best service, fantastic people out there. They treat us like family. They're going to treat you like family every time you go see them as well. And, Buck, what do they say about the prices? Uh, nobody beats a covert deal. Not now, not ever. Best selection, best service, best prices, at all. Best, best car dealership in the game. Love our friends out at Covert B Cave. And also some love to Jack Allen's Kitchen as well. 
If you're looking for an awesome dining experience today, go to Jack Allen's Kitchen. Hey, go watch the tournament at Jack Allen's or at Cover 3. You're not getting work done. You That's can pretend, right. But open up the laptop, act like you're doing shit. You ain't doing shit. Go get a great meal. Go get some beer. Go enjoy the tournament at Jack Allen's Kitchen or at Cover 3. Uh, two of our favorite places to eat. Two of our favorite places to catch games here in the Austin Head on area. out to Anderson Lane to say hello to Brad while you're out there. Yes, be rad. Calling the shots at the Anderson Lane location. Great dude. All right. I see the fellas, Buck. Who's hanging out? We got double R and Wags. You got all right. Well, that, well, I've got to get ready to go and instead of messing with you two guys this morning, but I got to get some stuff from you. Uh, I got to get stuff from both you guys for NASCAR stuff because I know Wags is right in it with NASCAR too. We MTD, need- I'm not. As, I'm not as into the pulse as Rodney is here, man. He's well, his, nobody he is. But, always revved up, man. Well, you don't know anything about basketball, so I'll take your word on NASCAR instead. <laughs> <laughs> How's that, Rodney? I'll talk to you later today, my friend. Hey, just All right, man. The just ball ball ball. All right, buddy. Later. Take care. He says, "Yeah, buddy, you ain't getting an invitation. You yeah. might be there as the help, Wags." That's what he said. What's up, BK? How you doing, man? I don't know if y'all saw that, but there was a mysterious figure walking in the room Bucky was broadcasting in. You could kind of see it in the reflection of that Texas flag poster yeah. hanging behind him. I just assumed out. that was Miss Joyce. That wasn't Miss Joyce. I don't, I don't, I don't think it was. The Chupacabra. Maybe it's it, the Chupacabra showing up. I don't know what that was. And then he, Bucky, said, he said he, he had to go. He said he had to go. Something's What's going on over there? He was talking about touching snakes earlier today. Now I'm wondering what he was getting at. Is the God, medicine was, woman over there? Oh, Dr. Quinn. Ooh. Dr. William Cannon out Hob- the door. Javi and the Javi and the medicine woman might be doing a little bit of crazy <laughs> oh, stuff. Oh man. God. I'm good though, guys. How are y'all doing? Everybody all right? Doing well, man. Oh, it's man. um it's good to be home, but it's you know, I wish I was still away. You know, like you can't beat the comfort of your own bed, that's for sure. You can't beat the comfort and privacy of your own house. Um but man, there's guys. I I mean, I can't believe I'm about to say this, and maybe it's just because it's the first time I've ever been there. But there's something. Florida's fantastic. Like, I, of course, I didn't see like Florida man or an, or a random Florida. I didn't have a random Florida altercation that you re, that you read about. It was just nothing but sunshine and paradise, man. It was it was pretty it was pretty great. It was pretty special, man. Um, and of yeah. course, it was spring break too, right? So uh largo was a it's it's affordable it's not exactly thrifty right but it's a it's it's affordable but it's it's pricey enough to where the kids the college kids aren't going there for spring break so i mean it was it was just it was exceptional man it was yeah it was needed it was needed That's, that's kind of the funny thing as we get older we start finding places you know like it's it's like tracy and i we we'll occasionally sneak off to Rockport or North Padre. And it's like, yeah. you know, it's very low key, you know, yeah, there, there's quiet. no stupid shit going on around there, man. And and it's like, it's just, it's just good to get away. It's just good to get away. And, 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 and wags, I'll talk about it. I've got a travel story. I was supposed to be out today and I was trying to, I was trying That's to right. fly out of, I was trying to fly out of Austin on Friday to get to um, Panama city, as a matter of fact, to drive over to Kinston, Alabama for some work that I had uh, to do with racing America. And I, and I couldn't leave. I, I don't know what the weather was doing in Houston and mm-hmm. then down that coast, but they, they would, they, they postponed the flight five times and I'm sitting there and the bar tab is just climbing. And climbing. <laughs> you were at yeah. the, you were already at the airport too. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Well, that's, yeah. I'm sitting there and it's, and it's like delayed. And, and then finally, I think it was, it was probably about eight o'clock and it's like, um, okay, the flight has been canceled. You can't get to Florida. I mean, the weather's horrible. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, I can't get to Florida. Now I'm concerned. How am I going to get to round rock? <laughs> I've been, I've been sitting here all day. Tracy, have to come, Tracy, have to come get you. Did you call a, uh, did you call Uber? I Ubered. Yeah. Uh, Ubered. I figured. Yeah. 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 You ain't going to piss her off like that. <laughs> <laughs> She already no. took you one way. She ain't taking yeah, you the other way. She ain't taking you back. <laughs> she, already, she already had plans. She's you know? already yeah, like, shit. Ty Reynolds coming over, days. Rodney. You ain't coming over. Yeah. Yeah, right. And now it's like, fuck, you're home all weekend? Yeah. Oh, shit. I well, had a few days off. There, there that so, goes, man. But anyways, anyway, I know I appreciate you having Stu come on here. And, and oh, yeah. It was a good time, Friday, man. It was fantastic. You guys do a great job. Suplex Stu and Sideline Stu and um, Circle Stu. I don't know. I mean. That's Squared start. circle stew. So I don't know. What, I mean, anything <laughs> stew, man. He's just really great at what he does, man. So I'm not sure circle starts with an S, but I could be wrong on that. I don't know. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I love where I went to school. It did. <laughs> yeah, Shoot. some places it might. No, no. Cir- good circle gets here. the square. I'll there tell you, you classic. Uh, yeah. What was that? That was a. Uh, I can't remember the damn. Yeah, can't remember that so, game. So BK still all good tomorrow for Coda. Uh, I know that we yes. had. Uh, okay. Oh no! Wait. Now we're going out there to drive tomorrow, right? No, we're just doing some shows <laughs> out there tomorrow. I don't know. Maybe they'll let us drive on the track. I'm not sure. I'll ask. I got a call with him a little bit later today. So, yeah. uh, so no, tell him, you, you say, hey, so Wag said that you guys said that he could get on the track and just carve it up. They could put us in the that, go-karts. They have the go-kart on? track outside. Tell they them I already uh, authorized it. They could yeah. let us race the go-karts. You, you, got, you guys will have that. media credentials, so we can do whatever we want, I think. That's how it works. That's how, that's how that does work. As long as you've got the credentials, you're accredited. Shit. Yeah. All, all right. They Looking forward take- to that. I'll uh, I'll bid y'all adieu so y'all can talk hoops and whatever the hell else y'all have planned. Have a great Later, show, man. Be Later, good. man. My guy. Welcome, welcome, welcome back. Well, I guess I'm welcoming back myself. But yeah, I yeah, never dude. left. <laughs> yeah, I always, I'm, I've always left. I'm never here. As a matter of fact, even when I'm here, I'm never here. Um, welcome to Chaos Theory on this wonderful Monday. It's good to be back in the saddle. Myself and Double R, my co-host, Double R here. Um, on Chaos Theory, Texas Sports Unfiltered. If you guys are mobile, make sure you're hitting us up on that code of text line, 512-222-9328. Make sure you're hitting us up on our socials. I'm at Not The Fake Wags. Rodney's at the underscore, or excuse me, the Rodney R, and then on Instagram at the underscore Rodney R. And then I'm at the Wagner Wire on uh, Instagram as well and all other social media platforms. It's just so nice to be back and see your face. Um. Uh, it, it sucks because I mean I did think that you were going to be out, man. That's so uh, it's it's kind of a really good, a really good surprise to have you back in the saddle. I thought maybe Tuesday was when the boys would be getting back together and the band would get back get back together. But hell, man, starting off strong on a Monday, my guy. Well, and I and I hated that. That's why when we were texting last night, I, you know, I know that you talked that that Justin was was lined up, and man, I hate that because I I've been Look, on that side before where it's like okay. I, I'm he knows the deal. He's a he's a professional broadcaster, man. Yeah. He knows how it is. Yeah, no, absolutely. But uh, Wags, I'm, I'm really glad that 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 you you got away. Um, you, you got to go do some cool stuff. I mean, want to get away? You wanna no, get it's away. cool. I, I don't know if anybody's been to Florida or not either. Um, like Florida's <laughs> fantastic, man. Uh, it's great. I mean, of it's... course, I was like I was at the very southern tip of Florida. Like you don't. I, I didn't really have that many people around me. The most interaction that I had was at Miami International Airport. And yeah. by the time you got your rental car and got out of there, hell, I wasn't talking to anybody. Uh, that was kind of the worst part of the trip, honestly, was just getting out of the airport. Um, of course, bumper to bumper traffic on a on a Wednesday. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was well, that was brutal. But other than that, man, it was paradise. You know, I, I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people talk about you know with 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 Florida or whatever. They they kind of have that. M- nostalgia to them and the mystique and all this other shit but i mean there are a lot i mean i spend a lot of time in pensacola uh i go to fort myers i do panama city i do new smyrna uh, i mean th- there's a lot of different places over there to where i mean it really is a cool spot i mean it really is a cool spot to go and there's lots of cool i really love pensacola i mean pensacola is a really cool spot where you no, can take it Pens- is pensacola bayside uh P- pensacola is like right when you get into florida dude it's like uh no, you're that's panhandle that's panhandle dude, it is right there it's like Boop, that's your first drop right into there. Um, it, it's Florida's really different. Cool. Florida, Florida is different. It's that's, definitely different. <laughs> different. That's, it's that's definitely. I, I advise different. anybody that has not been there to go there. I, I definitely think you'll have a good time. Um, everybody goes to Destin, Florida, a lot. We were not a lot of that. We did that. You know, that was flood, You know, my, my wife said that's probably going to be flooded with a whole bunch of college kids or whatnot. So we just decided to go to, to Largo or whatnot. I wanted to drive all the way down the west. Um, yeah. I think we're going to go to Marathon next year. Yeah. In, and stay in marathon uh for the the keys or whatnot but it it's fantastic it's great to be back it's great to to read all your all's asinine comments here that goes with our asinine faces on this wonderful chaos theory monday man uh we got some things to talk about there was a lot of uh nfl news that went down when i was out a lot of college basketball to talk about texas getting the seven Dude. Seventh heaven, we got a seven seed. What the hell is that? I was expecting a nine, honestly. Uh, Oklahoma, not even in the. I I thought I knew basketball, but um, Oklahoma apparently did not uh, make it to the dance. We'll talk a little bit about that too. I think that's kind of a little bit of an ultimate snub. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm sticking up for I'm sticking up for the, the opposition for our our rival here. Um, I think damn sure they had a, a decent season or a good enough season to to get in um they're 
their pedigree was, or I, I would say that their resume was just as strong as ours. Um, or no, I mean, I'm clearly, you know, we got the head to heads or whatnot, but yeah, I, I think anybody that was in the big 12, I'm not trying to make this an sec yep. thing here, but, uh, anybody that's, you know, in the big 12 and, and struggling and battling back and forth and able to put up somewhat of a closer, uh, dominant or i wouldn't say dominant record but a winning record as opposed to somebody that's just kind of like just floating away in in a conference built by the sisters of the weak and unscrupulous yeah uh, i don't know i just i don't give that that much credit and that much uh slack or whatnot anyways yeah. um yeah we got a lot of nfl to talk about as well uh i was completely wrong about everything with justin fields or we blew that uh, one didn't we Sheesh. boy uh, i gotta tell you right now though uh th when i thought the bears were like the bears fleeced the seahawks and then they turn around and get or no they got fleeced and then turn around and fleece the seahawks anyways i thought the deal with justin fields going over to pittsburgh absolute disaster for justin fields and anybody that owns justin fields in fantasy football so to speak you're probably trying to get rid of him. I'm going to tell you to pump the brakes on that because Russell Wilson probably starts maybe one or three weeks and then Justin Fields kind of takes over. That's how I that's how I think it's all going to figure out. But anyways, Bears, you had a complete chance to set yourself up with uh, a tremendous offense for four to five seasons. Uh, yeah, you would have had to make a deal and get something done with Justin Fields, but, but you're putting all of your money into Caleb Williams and you heard it here right I'm telling you right now I don't think Caleb Williams is the best quarterback in the draft no, no I don't man. I think I, Bo Nix no. is the best quarterback in this draft I uh, you I, you can call me crazy maybe I got too much of the Florida Sun maybe I was talking to too much of the crazy Floridians or whatnot I'm telling from what I've been reading and what I've looked into over the past break over the past couple of days I think Bo Nix is the best quarterback in this draft. I don't think this draft quarter. I don't think this quarterback class for this draft is that special. I think it's very overrated. I think there hasn't been that great, that great of quarterback play at the level. But you're just seeing the lack of scarcity, uh, or excuse me, you're seeing scarcity with the quarterback play. And you know, it's almost like that season where they had Baker Mayfield pop off, Sam Darnold pop off. Uh, Josh Rosen pop off and then Josh Allen. I mean, that's kind of the, the vibe of this quarterback class, right? Where Baker Mayfield and well, no, I guess Sam Darnold is, is somewhat relevant. He just kind of signed his little contract there. Um, he had Darnold out to, to Minnesota, man, score or sc skull or whatever they, they say there. So, yeah, a lot of, a lot of things going on with the quarterback here. So I don't think you invest that much into Kayla Williams. Of course, maybe I do have too much sun. I don't know. I think well, you could have gotten so much more for that haul, man, for first overall, dude, and you let that go away. Of course, you guys know what I wanted to happen for Caleb Williams and the Chicago Bears. I'm not I don't have I don't have any skin in Chicago. All right. I don't have anything invested in Chicago. This is just what I thought was the best idea or the right idea, the right move for their front office organization. Completely gone to shit. Yeah. I mean, it really is. And and I think but I'm happy to tell you I'll eat crow. Well, and look, I mean, you guys know I am not, I have not been on this Kayla Williams thing. I mean, yes, exceptional athlete, special talent, but I, I just don't think, I just don't think that you're going to get what, what everybody thinks this is going to be. I, I mean, this everybody's is, on the same speed. The speed's a little bit different up in the, it, up in the NFL, man. Sure. Shit is, you know, Trevor Lawrence was, a, was a no miss and he hasn't been bad. He hasn't been bad, but he hasn't been what we thought he was going to be. Um, and, and he went to the AFC South, which was pretty damn weak at the time. Um, and, and he still has struggled right there. But I really think that when it's all said and done with this quarterback class, it, it is going to be maybe a Bo Nix, maybe a Michael Penix. It's going to be one of these guys that isn't Drake May. Jaden Daniels, I got to tell you. I, I, I think Jaden Daniels is maybe the one um, th that well, could be. Th Magic that Man could be the ATX. One. If Bo Nix is, is Herbert at best, what the hell is Caleb Williams? What's your comp for Caleb Williams? Um, I'm 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 serious. I'm I'm very curious. Like honestly, I'm, you you know that everybody's the in here touting this dude as the next uh, Patrick Mahomes. The the comp that I've thought about the most with Caleb Williams, and, and I mean, I, I I hope that I'm not like ruining this kid's career when I say this is is RG three. Uh, remember when RG3 came in, I, I mean, kind of, you know, the mobility and so forth, but I mean, just fragile, 
fragile. And and what did in RG3? He didn't have a lot of pieces around him, and he, he winds up playing in that shitty FedEx field, you know, that ended his career. And, and that's kind of where I'm thinking, to, to where it's like, you know, one to two year thing right here. So I think for Caleb Williams, you better haul in the money while he can, because I, I just I just don't think he's sustainable. And I just have not I'm, bought into the dude. Um, like I said, I'm willing to take a bet right now with anybody on this station. Um, yeah. Bo Nick will have yeah. a better college or will have a better NFL career than than Caleb Williams. So I'm yeah. willing to take a bet right yeah. now. And, and, and the thing about it right here with, with what went down with fields, I, I think a lot of that was, you know, once the tampering period started and we started getting agreements in place and quarterbacks started moving around, whether it be a backup, a bridge, whatever we want to call it. I think once that started happening during the week, that's where that quarterback market shrunk so much for Chicago and Justin Fields with what they'd be able to do for him. And, you know, that they, they said, the, the, the Bears said that they wanted to do right by him and 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 they took a loss. I mean, they obviously took a loss right there because a six round pick. I guess it could become a fourth round pick if, if he gets fifty one percent of the snaps. But it's um it's one of those things. But the landing spot for him, and I totally agree with you. I don't I don't really see Russ is is gonna groom him. You know what I mean? I think it's gonna be a matter of Justin Fields needs to go in there with Najee Harris with with everything that they have there and just go win the job and just go win the job because I take him over Russell Wilson right now. By far, by far, right now, I'm with you. I look. I'm just my thing with Caleb Williams is when when someone refuses to do anything or refuses to run, refuses to throw, refuses to do anything of that matter. My first question is why? Like, what 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 do you have mm -hmm. to hide? If you know you're the talented mm -hmm. sensation, yep. if you really do, you think it's going to hurt your draft stock if you throw? Like, yeah. what my my only question is why? Um uh that's 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 usually the first thing well, do you think you're you're good enough you're that much better to where you don't have to throw like sorry that so me right there in sports psychology it's telling me okay little flags going up here what, you know what what's the actual deal here um look he's coming from a system that he knows he's been very you know comfortable in with lincoln riley can he find a way to replicate that system at the pro style level uh, also, I just mentioned, you know, the speed of the NFL is up on par, you know, not on par. It's uh, um, it's way higher than it is in the damn collegiate level. It's, it just is. It's it's a faster league, man. The NFL is, man. Everybody's everybody's almost an All-American. You're getting everybody's best out there on Sunday. You're not getting, you know, any vulnerable uh, vulnerabilities in the secondary or anything. Right. I think with Caleb Williams stepping into a professional quarterback position i don't know if he's going to actually be ready like everyone you know thinks he's going to be i'm sitting here thinking that bo nix is probably the most experienced going in this because of all the reps that he has i also think that the landing spot for uh caleb williams if he does go to the bears with this type of uh move that they're making one they should they should sure up their offensive line uh they they just they they thought I thought they were making some moves in the front office that were kind of going that route, and then they go and do stuff like this. So I, if, yeah. if it appears that I that I'm clueless and too much Florida sun, I'm telling you right now, I'm going out on a limb and I'm saying right now that Caleb Williams will not be better than Bo Nix. Bo Nix no. will have a better professional career than Caleb Williams. And, and I'll just book in the whole Caleb thing. And and look, guys, I, I know people get frustrated that I'm beating up on the dude. But when it comes we're to the... We're not beating up on him. We're being real. Like, everybody... I don't see how anybody's beating up on Caleb Williams that's, when he's counted as thing. the number one overall uh, quarterback in the next in the, the next coming of Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I, I mean, and the whole thing is, I mean, going into that system... I mean, and it's just the, the, the little intangibles like you're talking about. The whole thing with not wanting, you know, medical exams. And 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 at one point we heard wanted stock in the franchise and all these different things. And and I was listening yesterday to Shea Cornette uh, on ESPN. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the difference. I heard them talking on ESPN yesterday and they were talking about, well, he probably already has the playbook. So they're kind of jump starting him. You know, they're going to have him in for 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 me or, 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 or to meet with him. He'll have his pro day, by the way, Texas pro day coming up this week. Yep. And and then and then here was the other part. Here was the other part that, that just really they were talking about. And it's very likely that they're probably even going to be sending him listings on property so he can get his home in Chicago. God damn. You ain't that good, brother. Right. right, right. You, you ain't that good. I mean, who are you, Lincoln Riley? 
<laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, I don't know, dude. I just, I'm just not bought on it. I'm glad for Fields. It's going to be a, a better landing spot for him. I think it'd be better if Russell Wilson wasn't there. He's going to get his playing time. But how do you not, how do you not avoid a quarterback controversy if you're Mike Tomlin with these two dudes in there? I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. Um, with Pittsburgh, so it's going to be like uh, I, I'm pretty sure that somebody's whispered sweet nothings into Justin Fields' ear and said, "Hey, man, uh, we know how this Russell Wilson move is going to work. Uh, Russell's Russell's going to come in here. He's going to demand the starter. He's a prima donna. Hold on tight. Um, try and wait this thing out. And if you know within three or four weeks after we give." Um, you know, Russell a little bit of his due and, and let him throw too many interceptions, you will be awarded the offense or you'll have a chance to lead the offense. That's how I think this is going to go. Um, Zidic Williams is just a different guy. I don't know. Rodney, you're, you take, you, you take over then Rodney, you got this. Okay, Williams go is just a different guy, um, different generation. Heard that his dad is acting as his agent, whatever. That sounds a lot to me like Kyler Murray. That's, yeah. that sounds exactly like Kyler Murray, Dave. I ain't got time for it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, I mean, it's little things like that, but that's, a, that's a really big thing. Uh, Coda text line, right? Rockin' Diamond S Ranch. Who cares about the draft? This is a college town. Let's talk about this great baseball team we got going on. <laughs> we can skip that if you want. We can come back to it. We can circle no. around to it. We can, no. we can round third and touch home on that son of a bitch. No, I, I don't really even want to talk about that, but, but I mean, seriously, this is, I just don't like talking about, sad times and losing time right right this is this is a lot more intriguing i mean we can talk about the texas the you know match up here maybe at the bottom of the hour you know getting yeah, into the i think that's how about the ladies time. how about the I ladies that's a better time to sing it sure rodney we can talk about women's sports all you want well, wait a minute wait a minute you know it's i monday. love women's sports it's monday we can't we can't do monday. misogynistic monday we're not allowed as a matter of fact that's against right. the station it's in the code it's not against it's the, the station code. it's against the channel it's or, in the it's handbook against the radio show here chaos theory yeah i can't talk to any women on mondays we're just not allowed to do that that's wednesday um, <laughs> that's a complete joke we say that tongue-in-cheek of course we can talk female sports um but yeah right now though let's talk about the men's college basketball all right the number ones unc purdue houston uh and uconn the, clearly these are the sheer number ones even though i think purdue's probably the weakest one out of all of them right there um, were you shocked at all that Texas got the, num the number seven? First off, I mean, we got to talk about the Big 12 championship. Uh, dibs to the Cyclones there. I think this is their si no fourth time, fourth time in 10 years that they've won the Big 12. It's either fourth or sixth. I got to get that stat down. I'm pretty, I'm going to go with four just because I, I think that's what I read over the past two days was four out of 10. Um, but yeah, Cyclones able to take down the pack, uh, the pack, the big 12 championship here uh, for college basketball gets them a little bit more of a bump there for their, uh, their selection. Um, anyways, though, Houston still retains the number one and rightfully so uh, one of the most dominant teams in all the land here, Purdue, UNC, and UConn will follow in suit, be the other remaining ones in the bracket. Rodney, anything on that? Uh, you know, it. Um, for one thing, I, I was really surprised the way Houston got steamrolled uh, by Iowa State. I mean, I really, really didn't see that one coming. But I, maybe that was a culmination of just what we talk about—a gauntlet of a schedule to where finally it's like you know you kind of you just kind of run out of gas. You know, like that, like the Cowboys said, maybe they were unmotivated uh, in that one, but. Um, in well, the sense that it, I was, I mean, I think both teams were in, but oh, Iowa yeah. oh, probably yeah. needed Iowa State probably needed that one way more than Houston. Oh yeah, the the good thing is for Houston, it didn't affect the you know the number one seed right there. I do think though, uh, now that the that the bracket is almost entirely filled out, I mean, I do think that they are probably the most vulnerable number one seed out of all of this. Um, I was kind of looking Houston's at, the most vulnerable. It kind of seems like it to me. Just kind of seems like it to me. I mean, I think the UConn, uh, what is at the East? I mean, I think that's the gauntlet. But I just think that that Houston, um, I don't know, man. They looked awful flat. Um, and I kind of thought when I saw it with Purdue, I'm like, okay, maybe they're giving Purdue a little bit of a solid right here because they can't get their shit together and get past the first round. Uh, because I, I think their path maybe I mean, none of them are easy, but I mean, maybe a little softer. I, I don't know. But 
I was very surprised to see the Texas number seven. I mean, when that popped up, I mean, I, I totally thought that it was going to be an eight or a nine. I'll, I'll bet TC. I, I mean, if it gets there, I'll bet TC you could give Purdue a, a nice little test. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I mean, but that's one of those early exit teams. And that's why, you know, a lot of folks looking at the Texas matchup and it's like, OK, uh, are, are you going to win, you know, the 7-10? Are you going to be able to win that game? Then you get to play Rick Barnes in Tennessee. It's like, well, Rick Barnes is an early exit also. So this is kind of where you where you don't want to get in here and, and you don't Tennessee want to didn't look good. in the. In, I mean, they struggled in the SEC uh, they did. or semifinal rather. Um, yeah. Yeah, that they really did. And, and that's why I think that that all of this, that's where this I'm hoping that what we see with the Texas mindset. And by the way, I think it was that final uh, conference win uh, over Oklahoma that just knocked Oklahoma out. I mean, they, they got destroyed. Um, and I think Texas actually took care of that for them. But what I'm hoping happens right here is that is that Texas goes in, and this is you know we talk about body of work and all the different things. Wags, it's a brand mm -hmm. new start, right? It's a brand new start right now, dude. It's a brand new start. None of that shit really matters anymore. You got yourself in. Here's your path, and damn, your path is a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Uh, not not simple, but it's a hell of a lot better than I thought it was going to be. Purdue's not getting to the Final Four. No, Purdue's not getting past Kansas. Like, like if, if that happens, I think Kansas beats Gonzaga. Gonzaga's not the strong team that they usually are. Um, usually, Gonzaga has their way with the with the WCC, right? Usually, they're out there and just dominating. Um, you know, St. Mary's might give them a run every now and then. Uh, but usually, Gonzaga has maybe one loss, two losses. Uh, Gonzaga struggled a little bit this year in the regular season, which tells me that I don't think they're going to make that much of a dominant run like they usually do uh, in March Madness. Uh, one, I don't sit here and watch Gonzaga night in and night out or, yeah. or the WCC. So I'm, I'm just uh, I can't I'm not an expert on that, um, but I, I'm pretty good with logic. And my logic tells me that they won't get past Kansas unless, you know, some type of miraculous matter for the for the Zags or whatnot. Anyways, I don't think Purdue gets past Kansas. I think Kansas actually represents that. Um, we talked about it all year. Purdue's just not fast enough for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they got some decent guard play, perimeter play, but usually you guys know that when they need to, to battle it out and bang it out, they're going to do it with, with Edie down low. Um, I, again, and I think TC, I think TC is a squad that can, that can actually knock out Purdue. Like I just said not too long ago, man. Uh, Purdue rebounds well, or excuse me, uh, TCU rebounds well. Um, and, and they're a lot quicker. They're a lot quicker than Purdue. So I, I think yeah. that I think guard play is sensational and it will take you very, very, very far when you're in the tournament. We all know that from experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and that's going to be the, the question for, for Texas is, is what, what team do you get that inconsistency thing? Uh, and I love Texas something that, a scary seven, Rodney. I, I agree. Be, like, I mean, they're probably, I, I, I don't think they can beat Tennessee. I don't, but I mean, they can make a push. I'd like to see that matchup go down. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I think they can make some noise. I, I think if you're able to get if you're able to get past the first weekend, I mean, you you like we said last week, Wags, you you've accomplished a lot right here when you look at shit realistically. It, it, let, let's go back to let's let's just kind of re rack and restack what we've been saying for the last three months. I think the expectations here were just a little too high. We're just a little too high, and here's I think an opportunity where like we're. We're just saying this is where Rodney Taylor can can go in here, or Rodney Terry. I'm sorry, can can go in here and 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 do his best coaching of the season. Go in there, make this team consistent. I mean, let's have let, let's have that reliable third guy. Let's have that third guy. Let's let let's let him go in there and make some noise. It's this not going to happen. I'm going to I'm going to be spoiler alert right now. That's not going to that. That's just not going to happen. Well, we're not going to we're not going to get a consistent third guy. The third no. guy might show up. We just don't know who it's going to be, and we don't know when it will be. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. for sure. That's exactly right. And ba back they'll, to they'll Rob, maybe they'll show up maybe for you know a couple of sequences in the game, and then sure yeah. enough, hey, there it's back to two people. It's back to Ace Miss and and the Sioux. Uh, I can't you know I, I can't stress that enough. Like if if Texas really wants to make a run at it, they. Weaver's got to be aggressive. He's got to be going to the cup. Hunter has got to be, uh, you know, very fluid with the ball as well. He's got to be a facilitator, but he's also got to be able to get at least 10 points, man. Um, or just, just distribute, get in there, get, get your guys, 
drive to the cup and get your defense to road get the opposition's defense to rotate over to where you can dish it off and get an easy bunny at the basket. I mean, it's I, yeah. I, again, I say this thinking that you know basketball just sounds and seems so simple, but we struggle to do some of the basic things in basketball at yeah. or this yeah. team appears yeah. to do. So it so. seems like it. I'll tell you uh, just a couple of things, just kind of a couple of nuggets that I noticed right there, man. The Big East, what, what is three, three teams? Is that what the Big East had in there? I think it was. I thought, I thought they were kind of, um, kind of, well, Mark that? yeah. Um, uh, let, let me look. Uh, the, uh, who did they have? Uh, Connecticut. Uh, shit. yeah. Marquette, Creighton, you've got them. I thought they'd have more than that in there. I thought there'd be more than that. I don't know. Where are you going with this? Uh, I, I think I was looking for five teams out of the Big East. And I think, oh, they got okay. and I think yeah, like Providence. Providence got hosed. I mean, I think that was a bunch of bullshit. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Marquette, Creighton, and UConn. I was thinking at least five out of the Big East. So so that that was surprising. That was surprising to me. Um, I didn't think they'd get. I didn't think that the Big East would have that much representation. Honestly, I thought yeah. you know even though Providence played strong going up against Marquette and looking good in the Big East tournament, I didn't think that that gave them enough of a resume boost to get into March Madness. Of course, I mean I I could be wrong. That was just my opinion. Yeah. Um, and I, again, I don't think the Big East is that loaded either. Um, uh, you got maybe three or or four, uh, maybe four teams mm -hmm. that could make a run and make a representation at this thing uh, for their conference in March Madness. So yeah. I think they did get it right. Um, clearly, you know, UConn is is the stud of, of that conference and stud of that squad. We'll see how far they go. Uh, I Look, if you want to look at my early bracket, man, I got UConn in the finals. Um, I, I don't know how you – I don't know how you don't. They're one of the toughest teams out there. I'd like to see Kansas sneak into this thing and, and make a make a steal – um, but I don't know. I'll, I'll reveal my brackets here in, in a few days or actually hey. tomorrow after I, I, maybe I'll do it tonight because the first, the first four in are tomorrow. So I guess I'm going to have to reveal my bracket tonight. And speak, speaking of brackets, you guys don't forget that we Make are, sure you get it in. we're playing right here with Texas sports unfiltered. You guys need to check it out, uh, down below in the description, uh, the bracket challenge right here with Texas sports unfiltered. Um, you can play against us. I mean, we'll all be having our brackets. Not that we're you can win. You can win stuff. Yeah, you're gonna win stuff. You're gonna win stuff. Check it out. The tweet is p uh, is pinned at the t uh, at the ts unfiltered x page. Go right up <laughs> to the top right there. Boy, that's a lot right there. That is a lot to say right there. Totally um, great. So you guys, you guys fill the bracket out. Let's play. Let's challenge one bracket. One bracket, like uh, like BK was talking about this morning. One bracket, you can't sit here and do like ten of them. All right? Yeah, yeah. You get one three. shot. You get one shot. Sal, this is surprising. I thought you were a Red Storm dude. I always thought that you were a St. John's guy, being up from New York and shit. Of course, that's why you don't. That's why we don't assume, guys. That is why we don't. Everybody, that you know, you don't know why I'm a Giants man. Yeah, I'm not even from New York. I'm a Giants yeah. fan out of ignorance. Out of yeah. ignorance. I think I've told that story one too many too times on here. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. we'll be going over to we'll be going to Baltimore football here soon, man. The Giants just the Giants got it all figured out. Drew Locke coming into town. Oh shit. All figured out. And, and it, I guess it was right made there, clear to Drew Locke that it was Daniel Jones's team coming in here. Yeah, the, by, we paid 160 for Daniel Jones, so clearly he's the starter. But you have a chance. You have yeah. a chance to beat him. Yeah, we'll let you play. We'll let you play. So, yeah, uh, to answer Rob's question, yeah, I guess we will be the pregame before round one because we'll be on at 10 uh, on Thursday, and they fire off like at 11.15 is when those first games start. So, uh, yeah, we're we're going to kind of be the header going into that one right there uh, to get everybody fired up for that. But seriously, uh, pl play play with us. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. But, you know, what do you think of the Aggies ride here? Uh, Nebraska, um, and then maybe a date with Houston if you can get past – that eight nine matchup there for the Aggies uh, in the South. Uh, the Aggies surprised me. I thought the Aggies had a really good tournament, man. Of course, they Dude, needed. I, the I agree, showing, man. Right? You kind of talked about it too, like going into it. The Aggies got to make a, a crazy run going into the SEC tournament, and they did. Um, not just you know win, small victories or whatever. They had victories over top programs in mm -hmm. this in in the college landscape, man. I mean, hell, Kentucky, seriously. My guy, man. Um, look, little brother could could make a splash, and they're probably going to go a lot further than, than big brother this year in the tournament. 
Yeah, I think yeah, somebody I, I saw that pop up. Could Texas make it out of the first round? Um, it, de it depends on who they get. Uh, if they play Virginia, <laughs> Tony Bennett usually puts a good squad out there, man. Um, yeah. and Tony Bennett's a really good coach when it comes down to X's and O's. I would not want to go up against Tony Bennett. Yeah. Um, by, by the way, one hell of a singer, too. By the way, I'm just oh, saying, that's right, kidding. yeah, no, no doubt Bennett. about it. Different, the different best Tony Bennett, but, um, but no, um, also Boise, uh. Boise State and Colorado, like that's that's another good matchup right there that Texas could could flail against. Um, we'll see, we'll see. They they're going to play one of the tens. Um, I would rather than play Colorado State out of all four of these schools, uh, or Boise State rather out of all four of these schools. Um, but uh, that that is a good question. Will they survive and get out of the first round? I think they do. Um, I, I would. I don't think they get any further past Tennessee though, if that is the case. Yeah. And that's just, you know, that's just the thing that we've been talking about. Like I keep saying, it's like, we, we don't know what to think. I mean, we don't know what we're going to get. I mean, it'll, it'll be pretty obvious there in the early stages of that game, which Texas team we're going to get. I mean, and you know, like the guys we're talking about this morning as well. I mean, the one thing that, that, that I, I guess it does concern me a little bit is that you're scouting two teams right now. Uh, you're going to play one of these two, you know, where a lot of these other groups are going in and you know who you're going to play a and knows they're going to play nebraska so they're scouting that we're over here it's either or i mean i don't think it's that big a deal but I'm i not, just don't with this team i just don't know wags i just i don't have any confidence dude <laughs> no, i'm not even worried about competition. i'm worried about us like if you t you got to exactly. handle business you got to handle your own business first before you get you That's can take it. care of any of the opposition right but That's you want to plan accordingly great how about you plan to get a third shooter or a third score how would you plan to get you know decent ball flow and decent you know distribution um Plan for consistency, even though that never happens. Try and make something, uh, you know, try and lay, you know, lay a foundation down to where you have actual, you know, uh, fluidity and, and uh, a point guard that gets to the cup and a point guard that distributes the basketball. You don't have your, your shooting guard, you know, with so much being so uh, you don't have so much of a ball dominant shooting guard. And I get it. Like that's that's Ace Miss's game or whatever. But I mean, hell, get the ball in, in Hunter's hand. Let him you know, work some magic yep. or, or not even, it doesn't even have to be Hunter. Whoever, whoever, who ha, whoever has the ball, don't settle for a perimeter shot. Try and get to the damn basket. Try and force the defense into some bad spots and get them into uh, foul trouble. And then maybe you'll get some actual team assists. It's pretty mm. damn simple. Basketball is so easy when you really break it down, man. It just, you, it feels like the, it feels like the Longhorns are overcomplicating things. Uh, and, of course, yeah, and, and when you don't, when you don't, win on the rebounds Rodney when you don't win wow. the we the rebound battle you're not gonna you're, you're not gonna get anything uh past any any basic uh shit Rodney if you can't do the basic stuff you're not gonna get it yeah that's a whole thing and 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 you don't win the rebounds I mean even Excuse, I get I get upset talking about Texas basketball even, it's, been, even, it's been frustrating watching this team all season long and, and even in some of the better wins that we've had this year Wags you still don't fucking win the rebound battle <laughs> it's like geez Louise so uh, you know I don't know um, that's a staple. That's a staple of success, right there. For yeah, basketball. you got to yeah, win. The, you yeah. you got to be able to to no win the boards at least at least on one night or one yeah. or two nights. You know yeah. what I mean? I mean, I think it's, you know, for, for folks scouting Texas, I mean, you're going to put a lot of pressure on Desu. You're going to try to get him into foul trouble. Um, then, you know, Max Asmus becomes a catalyst and then, you know, is somebody going to step up and be the third guy? Yeah. You know, so I mm -hmm. think it's a pretty easy recipe right there, but again, um, you know, this is where, oh, I mean, it's a clean slate. It's a clean slate. Go in there. Just try to be consistent. Try you know what? I was, I was state. Iowa State could make a run at this thing. I, yeah, I would stay out of this two position. They could, they could fly, man. I mean, Illinois, Illinois might give them some some noise there, but I mean, damn, dude, I, I see Illinois coming out of it over BYU. Yeah, and well, then I, I've heard. And BYU. Then, I mean, they got they got to get past UConn. Yeah, yeah, but that will be that will be the tail of the tape right there. B BYU was kind of mentioned, and I think somebody alluded to it right there. Yeah, Jack. Thank you, Jack. That uh, BYU could be a, a sleeper team. I'm thinking about NC State. NC State, to me, I think is one of those. Uh, I think NC State played. Might be a sleeper. I, I think NC State played way. I think they just played way out of their league uh, in the ACC tournament. There's, um, there's no way in hell they should have beat Duke. There just there is. I mean, certain teams get hot at, at a certain reason, or or at a certain time rather. But it also you, you kind of play your magic out. 
You know what I mean? And I think yeah. NC State's magic is as is going to play. I don't think that they're going to make the crazy run that they made in the ACC uh, yeah. tournament. That that one hell of a run for the Wolfpack for sure. Um, but I think I think they're going to lose a lot of steam, especially. Um, I don't know. Then I, I say that, but then they could also get some good rest for their legs or whatnot, and then recuperate, and then have, uh, you know, have their players, you know, come off firing all cylinders like they did in the ACC tournament. Um, I, again, you guys all know me. I, I've I sat here and preached this. I think the ACC has been watered down for a couple of seasons now. Uh, the really only two studs that you get out of the ACC are the Blue Bloods, which is North Carolina and and uh and Duke. So yeah, well, and and I saw. Um... I think yesterday after the loss there for North Carolina. Terrible, terrible regular season. Gonzaga's got a down year. Down mm-hmm. year Longhorn Bear. They didn't do not they didn't do anything in the WCC. I think there was I think some folks were actually surprised that North Carolina got the number 1 seed. Um I mean I wasn't. I mean again, I mean when you go back and you look at Saturday, I mean I think if Saturday is any indication of what we're about to start getting Thursday, Friday, you know, up and through the first weekend right here. I mean, you had all these number ones that went down. I mean, UConn was the only one that won, uh, you know, uh, of the number one seeds in these conference tournaments. So if that's any precedent in, uh, into what we're about to get into, Wags, man, th- this is going to be this is going to be some crazy shit right Who's, here, man. The weakest, we can agree that the weakest one is probably Purdue, right? Purdue, yeah. Who's yeah. the strongest one? Oh, man. I, 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 UConn. I mean, I, I seriously uh, think see, this is UConn I, to lose. I want to say I want to say UConn or Houston. I know I, I I can't. I'd love to say Houston just because of how much I've seen Houston, yeah. right? Um, tons of shooters for UConn. UConn's got lights out shooters. Uh, they can also rebound just as well as anybody on the court. Now, the matchup will be in the front court for sure with these two squads. If the hypothetical happens to where we see mm-hmm. Houston versus UConn here, um, big athletic forwards for uh, for UConn or excuse me for for Houston going up against um, some de- a decent front court for uh, UConn as well, right? Also, you're going to see the sh- the shooting sensation from UConn. Uh, you'll see the perimeter play there. I think they do have the. Uh, I think they do got the check mark and the, I guess, the advantage over Houston there in, in terms of perimeter play. UConn's also deep. They're 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 pretty damn oh, yeah. deep. Oh, yeah. Um, they were able to get some really good minutes in that Big East this year. So, um, hey, Huskies can Huskies can make a, a move at this thing. That's what I think this is is going to go down. I, th- I think it's going to be a Houston UConn matchup here. I hate to be all chalk, man, but um, guys, uh, like. You know what you get on the floor, man. And I've I saw Houston play top tier basketball all season long this year. I think maybe the one little step up that they had, the one little miss up mishap that they had, was up in Fog Allen, and it's tough to win up in Fog Allen. Well, and, and the thing with with UConn, I mean, it's a, it's a thirty one and three. I know to repeat is a bitch. I mean, I know all of that, but man. This team right here. I mean, look at their look at their record against top twenty five teams. I think they were seven and two or eight and three or whatever it was i mean very very this is kind of falling back to the whole body of work right there i mean this is where you have to figure with with this bunch that they're coming in here loaded and and again yeah i mean they, they may stub their toe but it, it it just really seems like to me that that they are on a path right here it's going to be hell to stop these guys wags i mean they are just they are just damn good they are just oh, damn good and uh, i did lose a little confidence in houston i really did that was i, did. I didn't expect I did. that kind of loss but you know, look at the team we follow. <laughs> we I don't know. I'm, I'm telling you. So Longhorn Bear, my thing. Yeah, they might have won in you know the or they might have lost in the WCC final. But i have also they lost seven games this season, right? And usually, um, you don't see that out of Zags. You see maybe one or two losses, right? Which and, and uh, I'm not paying attention to the WCC, you know, like most experts are or whatnot. But it, just from simple logic. If you're not as dominant as you are in the regular season with a, you know, when when, when the WCC is usually watered down, like you, you might get a little bit of a hiccup or a little bit of push from St. Mary's or another school like that. I, I was Like I was saying earlier, right? If you're not as dominant as you are in the regular season, I don't expect you to be half of what you are in March Madness, especially if you're coming from w, or from the West Coast Conference. I just, I just don't. That's kind of, yeah. that's how I put my logic um and 
and how I deduce what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I'm not, I mean, again, I'm not an expert on the West Coast Conference or the Zags. So, well, take that for, for and I think all the that. Thing, Dan Hurley, um, after, after the bracketology show on ESPN yesterday, last night, whatever it was, uh, there, there was a quote that he said, and I think this is so important with all these teams and, and really relates to Texas. And this is what concerns me about Texas. Quote, there's so much depth in college basketball these days. This time of year comes down to who plays the best to their identity, end quote. And that's where with our team, with Texas, it's like, what's their fucking identity? High-pressure high high pressure defense and create points off of turnovers. Yeah. Um, don't yeah. get, don't allow your team to get into a half-court set. And um, you sure as hell can't get into a half-court set because you only got two people. Um, yeah. So make sure that you can just score off the fly. Um, that's it. That's it. That's it. Uh, New that's season. New season. Don't allow the team. Don't allow the other team to get a rebound. <laughs> and, and, and I think, yeah, no shit. And I think that's the other part of it is because text, like, like we said at the beginning of the show, Wags, it was like, I mean, we thought eight, nine. Fuck. At one point, I thought ten. You've kind of been gifted a little bit right here, so go take advantage of this. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice little gift. Advantage. Yeah. <laughs> speaking of that, speaking of being gifted, if you need to be gifted. Well, not gifted, but if you were looking for a new car, truck, or SUV, there is only one place to go. It is our friends at Covert Bee Cave. How about a great word from our friends at Covert Bee Cave? Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert Bee Cave. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. 1909, the Covert family, covertbcave.com. That's right. And you guys know um, it is probably a good idea to call audiovisual consultations up right now and get the setup of your dreams. We've got March Madness right around. I mean, hell, we are. March Madness is on our doorstep. It's upon it's us. Here, we are here. It has already arrived and you're late. All right. 512-255-8678. That's abconsultations.com. That's the number. Go to the website, too, at abconsultations.com and see the gallery of projects that they've done over the past 35 years in setting the standard in audiovisual automation in the Austin Central Texas era, era, area since 1988, as a matter of fact. Um, you will get an idea of what you want in your house. If you don't want it, look at the website, like I just said. All right? Look, if it's two TVs or if it's four TVs like BK has, you might want your own little dream theater downstairs like I have. It's all deadly, man. 512-255-8678. That's abconsultations.com. Get it ready for March Madness. It's right around the corner. Yep, absolutely. Speaking to Tom McKay on the code of text line, 222-9328. All of you can be a part of that as well. UConn repeat is my prediction. If they lose, I have no interest in the tournament. The Hurley family should go into the College Hall of Fame for so many reasons. That's some good points there from our man, Tom. But it, Usually it, usually he gives it to you straight. It's hard to repeat. Doesn't... It, it's going to be hard to repeat, but but this is where you. I don't you know. I think they this. got a shot at. It. I, I think I, UConn. I, I think They're UConn has, does have a shot. Um, yeah. They got a they got a complete uh, complete squad. Um, my favorite clearly is just Houston. It's uh, and a lot of it is honestly coming from my heart. Um, well, you've seen Houston, them. Dude. I mean, you've seen them a lot. I mean, that, yeah, that's, I've, I've seen them a lot. I've, I've I've I've. I yeah. don't feel like I'm rooting for them, um, but I I guess I am. If if. Texas isn't going to be able to take this thing down and cut the nets down. I would like to see the Houston Cougars do this thing. And I think it's it that that's the beauty of this with March Madness when these when, when these brackets come out and everybody's filling out all these brackets is that you're going in here and you're probably deeply rooted or you know like all of us. I mean, we are obviously rooted and invested in the Texas Longhorns, but we we see Houston, we see a lot of Big Twelve teams at least twice a year unless we're checking them out, uh, you know, with random games and Baylor and all these other schools in Tech, but. When all of this starts, it's like you really don't have any idea what some of these teams are, are are capable of or what their strengths are. I mean, other than reading stuff and maybe going back and watching whatever. I mean, but that's where. But, but it's a crazy it's, time. It's usually, who's 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 got the best guard and how and how you know how deep is this team? You know, that's yeah. usually that's the number one. That that's the two questions that I ask when I when I break a team down going into March Madness. Do they got really good guard play? And you know, how deep are they? Can yeah. they re? And, third can they rebound yeah yeah it, it's it's really like those are the that's the trifecta of of the recipe for success in basketball for march it, madness at least yeah yeah and and it really does come down to right now 
who goes into this UConn's tournament. UConn's defense is so fucking like UConn's team defense. They're so they're good. They're just really good. There's not a weakness on that bunch. I mean that that that's that's the whole thing. But you know that that's where I mean this is who's playing the best in March. I mean I mean who's playing at at at, the, at, at their capability of of playing the best basketball. That's a lot of times what happens with this, and that and that's the cool part about this is I guarantee to you. I mean we can talk about BYU or NC State or whoever with sleepers. There, there's going to be you know there's going to be teams that are going to come up and sneak up on people. I mean it happens all the fucking time, and that's the beauty of this. And and to sit here and watch it. I mean, Thursday, I guarantee you Thursday, Thursday, how many of these are going to be busted every fucking year, (laughs) every fucking year, 11 o'clock Slater games. Boom. My bracket is busted. I'm out X amount of dollars. If you're gambling on that shit and look like I'm not, I'm not trying to, to get too far ahead, but get to the, or to do like a hypothetical final already. Cause I'll, I'll break these down once we get to the final four, but you can't tell me like, like Newton and, and Spencer, uh, going up against um, Cryer and and her yeah. like that's yeah. and Shed rather like that's going to be one hell of a, a backcourt breakdown like that's going to be a really good matchup man um it's just something it's something that I hope really comes to fruition because I think it's going to be the best matchup in college basketball Houston yeah. versus UConn yeah I think and that it's a game it's a matchup that we all deserve we do not deserve Purdue Purdue does not deserve to be in there. Well, um, and, and that's Wags. That's a cool part about this because we can. I mean, that, man, I would love that. I'm contest. just not a Zach Eady fan. I'm just not. I'm, I, I'm I not. Would, I would love that game. But the whole thing is, I mean, so many of these, you, you start looking at this and you're like, okay, if this happens and this happens and this, and then it it, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't. I mean, that's that's the coolest part. That's the coolest part of this shit. My guy. Um, what? Let's talk about autograph real quick before we get out of here. Oh, absolutely. Got to tell you about the great folks over at Autograph. Hey, if you want to get rewarded uh, for listening to us, that's the Sports Unfiltered Chaos Theory all day. We're live and local, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Our friends at Autograph, co-founded by, um, what do we say, Senator or Congressman? What do we call it? Congressman Brady. Tom Brady are redefining the fan experience by letting users earn points for acts of fandom they take every day, like listening to this very channel. The Autograph app gives you access to your favorite Longhorn content in one place and offers rewards like tickets, exclusive merchandise, and more. So, you're already listening to TSU. You might as well earn points and get rewarded for it. Head over to the App Store and search Autograph, Google Play, Apple Store, whatever it is. You can download it for free today using the referral code TSU, as in Texas Sports Unfiltered, TSU. Use that uh, referral code right there. You can also find a link right here in the YouTube description as well. Fandom, at its best, it's Autograph. It is at its best. You can get my autograph. You can get Rodney's autograph. How about that? And you can basically wipe your ass with it because it ain't going to be worth it. Yeah, it ain't. It ain't. We're not like Bucky that has Taylor Swift handwritten letters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, so back to vacation real quick. Yeah. Um, I, I don't I don't know how well I'm embracing this, <laughs> but I'm, I'm finding myself doing older activities. And when I say by older, I'm not, not, not like like geriatrics playing shuffleboard not too not <laughs> not that bad but i was playing pickleball like and, and katie and i are getting pretty big in the fucking pickleball man um i i i was terrible at tennis i and, and i didn't i never had the discipline for tennis and you know usually when people would throw me you know hit me a damn tennis ball i'd try and square up and hit it with both hands like a Not damn baseball oh it. god you know no. what I mean? Deuce 40 my ass. You know what I mean? <laughs> Love your deuce. You know, I'd just be you know, nothing but stupid. I never gave tennis a chance. Yeah. So, let's just say that. I never gave tennis a chance. Um, we uh, Besides, like, my friends and I, we had a, a, a funny gym teacher by the name of Tilbury that we just made fun of, like, all the time. That was a tennis coach. And I don't know. Like, you just. You didn't play tennis if you were where I'm from. You just didn't do yeah. that. You played football. You played baseball. And that's another thing, too. Like, tennis coincided with with uh, baseball as a spring sport, so you couldn't play – and lacrosse, so you couldn't play uh, two sports uh, yeah. for some reason in, in Maryland. You weren't allowed to be a, a two sports per season athlete, or at least in Frederick County or whatnot. So nobody played tennis. But anyways, um, we tried picking up tennis, you know, growing up and as we got older or whatnot, and um, – it, it just 
it's too big of a court maybe for my wife and I. And one, it just doesn't, I don't know, it's just not there for me. But pickleball, my guy, pickleball, for some reason, I'm having so much fun playing this stupid little sport. Uh, and maybe, like maybe, it's forcing, maybe it's forcing me in the old age a little bit too fast. I don't know, but it's no. a lot of fun. I'm meeting a lot of good friends with it. And um, there's some really good-looking talent. Talented people. Talented Shockingly people. good-looking, talented people um in pickleball uh that looks like a lot i i, I want to try that I, I think that that's i mean and that's all i need if is you guys haven't tried it yet I, I i encourage you to give it a shot you know what what it's, i enjoy what i still enjoy playing i've enjoyed playing this all of my life is i mean i know now you got pickleball and then now you've got uh what's the bean bag uh what are they called cornhole bags. Bags. We, it's, it's bags here yeah we call yeah. it bags 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 sorry dude i love playing horseshoes Man, yeah, throwing shoes. That's, that, it's it's that stuff is like my that. it's favorite little thing to out do. In the yard and stuff, you know. Oh man, you know? that active. I love that throwing shoes. You don't, if you don't use it, you lose it. Double R. That's right. That's right. Playing washers, all that cool stuff, man. I, I love playing those games like that, man. See, I never, I never tossed washers until I got down here. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. that. I didn't know the washer tossing was a thing. That's it's. I saw that at one of the tournaments that we held on, man. That was that was pretty cool too, man. That thing's a bitch because that 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 PVT is like the size of the fucking washer, and it's like you try to throw that thing, and it's like oh man, and you know it's a, it's like bowling. You know, the longer you do it, the more you drink, the better you get at it. Yeah, so and that's, that's the thing too. Of, like I was having, I was sitting there drinking my little uh, drinks with umbrella with my little umbrellas <laughs> in there. My um, what was it called? It was called the Tropical Dream or what? It tastes like oh, it had like banana liqueur in it as well. It was uh, so damn good, man. And I'm just. I'm hardly even moving on this pickleball. I'm just sitting here. Hey, great job. Great job, Monroe. Yes. Just don't <laughs> oh, spill man. the drink. Don't. Oh, I didn't spill the drink at all. I, I was, spill the I'm drink. a professional. One, one, of my, professional. one of my cycle instructors, She uh, when, when she does a particular ride, um, she's like, okay, martini glass, you're not moving enough to spill anything. She's Can't like, you got it. Gotta, Got to hold that. Can't spill it. But uh, seriously, dude, that that that's some cool stuff right there to get away like that. I got to tell you, dude, I had never until we went to to Louisiana for the for the for the game in January. I never had a hurricane. I never had a hurricane. Really? Yeah, never, never. Well, I mean, I don't think you have a hur. I don't think you can have a, an official legit hurricane unless you're there, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. H had it. Yeah, like you can and say you've had a hurricane, hurricane, but you can't really say you've had one unless you've been to New Orleans. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And and boy, that one day I had a bunch. My wife was like, "How many of the things you had?" And of course, that was the day that I woke up the next day and was trying to do the show with you. And hell, I couldn't see straight. I saw four <laughs> wags on the screen. <laughs> it's like, all right, this is going to be a good show right here. This is going to be a good show right here, man. But that. <laughs> So how was how was the drive? No, you flew. Be back. you flew. You flew right to Florida. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So did did, did y'all have did y'all have any flight logistical? No man, no rules? gators on the on the highway going down there or anything like that either. I, I tell you what, I did get. I was out trying to walk in the clouds out by the beach um, uh, when the sun went down or whatnot. Everybody was going away, and I was trying to find myself in a nice little isolated spot. Yeah. Uh, yeah to walk in the clouds i mean you can you can shop down there you can buy um weed legally but you can't smoke it in public um or you can't consume uh marijuana in public or whatnot um so i was trying to make myself in a secluded area find and a place to piss all i all i kept thinking was the my wife's words in the back of my mind was hey you know alligators and crocodiles will come up and get you here on the shoreline if you're not too careful that's why we couldn't bring our dog down you know yeah. and leave her unattended because the gators will just come up and get you so as i was that you know getting everything ready getting the festivities ready or whatnot I, I i didn't see a gator i didn't see one but i heard a whole bunch of stuff and of course it was dark so i couldn't you know the light was low um but i didn't have like a fucking survival knife or anything so i had to get the hell out of there man <laughs> No. I got a little bit of scared, you know. What I mean, got a little bit of scared. I ain't scared of you, Gator. I ain't scared of you. Well, yeah, so, I, I so took off, my guy. I had to go back another spot to walk in the clouds. Speaking of that, all you people, because I know when I was driving in from Houston last week, you people, oh, I dro I dropped that one. All of you people that are doing your blue bonnet pictures right now, oh. be careful. I mean that that grass snakes. is high in those blue bonnet snakes. 
dude, I saw it. It was Texas Wildlife. Uh, I don't know, something. They, they posted on, on social media the other day. And they, like, walked into a blue bonnet patch where all these all these blue bonnets were. And it's just like you start seeing. Foo, foo, foo. Yeah, the heads just pop up. Yeah, I'm man. like, uh. <laughs> so that's uh, the one thing I did notice when we got back to, um, on Sunday is how much the blue bonnets have blossomed in the past oh, week. The dude, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. Uh, CB, when I say you people, that means uh, that means I'm fitting to preach. I'm fitting to preach. And that that's your PSA right there, man, because that I don't think there could be anything worse than sitting down in that thing and like, like a rattlesnake bites your ass or bites one of your nuts off. And it's like, do rattlesnakes, do they, they don't nest in blue bonnets, do they? I don't know, man. Uh, I, I think they like to hide mate, it. I think, it, I think blue bonnets might be where snakes mate. And I'm not making that up. Um, it's something that I heard. So no. I didn't some, make it up. I some probably. folks that I see stopping off the side of the road to do blue bonnet are, mate, are mating in the blue bonnet. Like they're mating in there. I'm like, come on, get us. Jeez, Louise. Yes. Yeah, Best so picture of all time. Bucky in the blue bonnets. <laughs> oh God. That actually needs to be a band. Bucky in the blue bonnets. Yeah. We'll have to have that again. We'll have to have that again. Uh, right, my God, any, uh, unseen brand. Do we miss anything for sports? I know we only really talked about a little bit of free agency wrap up for NFL and, uh, um, and March madness. Wags. I touched on it. T Texas baseball. Um, they oh, yeah. moved the series to Washington. Um, not a very, uh, LeBaron Johnson looked pretty good on Friday. He went, went, but but still, you go to the bullpen and you run into trouble there. And that Washington team's not very good. Uh, I mean, um, this is this is something for David Pierce where he's going to have to figure, figure out. out. Um, yeah, yeah, this is a softer part of the schedule, man. I was kind of expecting that we would see um, a little more production than what we're seeing right now. So it's, it's going to get a little warm there for him, I think. Wait, you think David? You think the seats getting warm for David Pierce? Well. Not in the sense, not in the sense from the administration, but the fan base. I think the fan base okay. is going to be, you know, calling. I mean, because you hear, I think David Pierce, I think he is secure for yeah. a good a, a couple of years. I, I am, I am fine with David Pierce as a skipper. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. But I think it was one of those situations to where he inserted himself as the pitching coach, to where now with with some of the pitching struggles, to where the fan base is like, well, wait a minute here. Anyway, um, one way to get over it, start winning games. Start winning That's games. That's it. It's pretty easy. Yep. It usually helps. What's up, Jeff? How are you doing, man? I'm good, man. Yeah, not a great weekend for the baseball team, but you know, baseball is one of those sports at Texas that more, way more so than basketball, it, it, and, and probably for the diehards, even more so than football. The expectations are so high. Because that's what history tells you you are. It's baseball you, yeah. I mean, it's not good enough to get to Omaha. You got to go to Omaha and do something. Right. So, yeah. you know, da Can't David, be too Pierce, barbecue. Yep. David Pierce had, you know, the the, the, the athletic department wasn't in a good spot when he was hired. And it's easier for me to tell you probably who who did turn, I mean, who did turn out in that job. Like, who, who didn't turn it down? Yeah. Uh, Pat Casey. Tim Corbin, Kevin O'Sullivan, John Savage. I mean, you just go down the list. Uh, damn near every coach in the country of note turned that job down. And David Pierce took it. He's won a couple conference championships. He's been to Omaha three times. Uh, got him to the semifinals one year. But I said this at the beginning, for better or worse, he's the pitching coach. And if they were going to struggle, it was going to be on him. If they were going to be good, it was going to be on him. I, it, it's much more of a work in progress than I thought it would be. But hopefully – the good that comes out of this Washington series is maybe, maybe they found something with Ace Whitehead, who's I've heard struggled a little bit behind the scenes and has kind of had to work his way back. And that's the LBJ dude, right? Or not LBJ? Yeah, um, Glenn Glenn Pass. Glenn Pass. Uh, yeah, Glenn Pass. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, and with Max Grubbs, Max Grubbs is another guy that David Pierce has liked to stuff. You know, they made some adjustments in the offseason, and he's been hard on he's been hard on Max. He really has. I mean, there was an I think it was the uh, oh man, it was one of the midweek games. I think maybe the, the St. John's game or maybe the Cal Poly game. You know, Grubbs only went out for an inning, and I asked I asked Coach Pierce afterwards, hey, "Did you want to extend him?" And he said, "Well, I wanted to, but you know he." His, his sinker, he kept getting it up and, and wouldn't get it down, and I just didn't like the way he was throwing, so we pulled him. So he's been hard on Groves. But what those two guys gave him, I'm not going to say that those guys should just be your Saturday, Sunday starters, but 
man ho- hopefully it's a step in the right direction build and build with it no i'm with you i'm with you man yeah. all right gents yeah. uh, i hate to cut you guys off a little early man but i gotta get ready for a meeting though it's, no, it's go for it, yeah. monday we yeah. know that so meetings on monday as well so you guys have right a great on. day man it's good to be back on texas sports unfiltered and we'll see you guys tomorrow take care wags see you wags yeah rodney it's uh <laughs> uh you know on our board we've got a few baseball diehards over at the, on the horns 24 7 message board and a couple of them were like, hey, in case you guys didn't notice, Baylor, who's supposed to be one of the worst teams in the conference, just beat Tech in a yeah. series. And that's who's coming into this fought this weekend. Yeah. So it's not gonna get it's not gonna get any easier. I just I my big thing, Rodney, is it's not so much the here and now, the what have you done for me lately. But I look at the trajectory of this thing Where and it's going? kinda yeah. It's it's bizarro Texas right now, right? Like as long as David Pierce is the head coach, I don't worry about them finding run support and being able to produce and produce at a high level. My thing is, and it's really weird for you to say this about a Texas pitching staff, are they going to be able to acquire and or develop the kind of power arms they're going to need to compete in the SEC mm-hmm. on a week on a week in week out basis? And I, and that's right now. It's not trending in that direction. The trend doesn't look good right now. Yeah. And then and then now you got to get into the nitty gritty of okay, why is it trending down? Are you misidentifying something in recruiting? Is there something wrong in the portal? Is there something wrong with the way you're working with guys? Like what is it that's there's something's amiss? And and what is it? You got to identify that. Yeah, and that's super important because I, I do look at texas baseball in that exact manner to where it's like okay where where is the path where where are they going where are we going Mm -hmm. and that that really is the concerning thing to me and 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 you do have to look i mean because we've talked about when you make the move to the sec i mean that that's going to be a massive that's going to be a massive shift right there that you're making it and it's like okay i'm concerned about what's going on right now for the reasons that you're talking about but how is it going to be corrected and 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 what and and who or, or what and that's and that's where I really think at this point that, that there's a lot of, you know, within the fan base, within the fan base, because you said it, the expectations are so high around here, Jeff, when it comes to baseball. I mean, this ain't basketball. I mean, when folks no. are going on about Texas basketball, I'm like, look, come on. So, I mean, how's it going to be corrected and where are you going? That's that's kind of the big picture that I think you have to look at with this club. I mean, the, the expectations are it, it, Texas baseball to me is uh... – I mean, if you wanted to compare it with a football with a football program, it, it's kind of like Oklahoma football. Mm-hmm. I know it's going to make some Texas fans mad, but yep. kind of like, oh, you won a conference championship? That's nice. What else did you do? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, that I didn't realize this, Rodney. Kind of off subject, but I was reading some stuff on. Uh, yeah, I I keep uh, I just keep an eye on what's going on north of the Red River because you know you, that whole keep your friends close, your enemies closer bit. Right. I didn't realize that OU as a program is currently in the midst of their longest national championship drought. Hmm. 24 years. Wow. Or 23 now. It'll be 24 this year. But 2000 was when they won the national championship. Bob Stoops' second year. They haven't won one since. I mean, they've been to those championship games. They were 03 against LSU, 04 against SC. Yeah, Yeah, that 08 game against Florida, the game Texas should have been in. But I digress. But no, man, you know, I'll say this, though, Rodney, and CB, look, CB mentions it. Mike Perrin got destroyed for how the coaching search went post-Augie. I, I like Mike Perrin a lot. Mike Perrin and I have never had a crossword with each other. I've, I've respect, expressed a great deal of respect for him whenever we met with each other. But that's what happens when you have an interim AD conducting the search. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yep, exactly. somebody who's never it's like, hey, you've never conducted a coaching search. OK, other than replacing Eddie Reese, here's the hardest job to replace in the athletic <laughs> department. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Have at it. Have yeah. at it. Interim. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 the shitty part right there with Mike Perrin and that whole deal. Jordan joins us, gentlemen. Um, I will bid you adieu. Uh, don't forget Chaos Theory, um, 10 to 11 tomorrow. We are live at CODA following the morning show. Uh, looking forward to that. You guys have a great show. Good afternoon. Break down some basketball, boys. See you, Rodney. It's uh, it's Jeff. It's Jordan. It's only an hour. Jordan, I, I just got to get this off my head while it's top of mind. So we are talking about Mike Parent hiring David Pierce. Have I ever told you about the, the nuances of that coaching search? You haven't. You haven't. <laughs> Uh, Dustin McComas and Kendall Rogers were a little closer to that than I was, but I was still getting a good deal of information, but that's how you knew, you know, a coaching search at a place like Texas is not going according to plan 
when everybody has a healthy amount of information about what's going on. Like you think about it, man, the hires that CDC has made, whether it's been Vic Schaefer or Edric Floreal, hell, especially Sark, uh, Chris Beard, those things happened where there wasn't a ton of like concrete info up until like the day things happened. And that's because mm-hmm. there was one guy running the search, at least in terms of the athletic department, and nothing got out. But, man, that baseball search, I remember there was a day where I got it on pretty good word from somebody at, at the university, somebody in the UT structure, pretty high up, that their top two targets, and I forget when what order guys had turned the job down. But that their top two targets, they were, oh, it was after Kevin O'Sullivan had turned the job down. Kevin O'Sullivan from Florida. Because initially, I was told he was, you know, maybe their top candidate. He turned it down. And I reported, like, on a Saturday, like, around lunchtime on a Saturday, that Brian O'Connor at Virginia and John Savage at UCLA, that's where the search was shifting. Man, within, like, an hour Brian O'Connor puts out a message that says, I'm happy at Virginia. I'm staying here. I'm not entertaining any other jobs. And then it was later that night that John Savage was said something. He posted something like, it's always flattering when people see your work, but I'm happy at UCLA, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man, y'all can't be all willy nilly with the information with this search, man. It's just tor- like, I've got to report what I'm told. But if y'all, man, it's the, the flow of information is a little too free right now. You're torpedoing your own search. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't even know with I don't even remember that that search to be honest. I just remember <laughs> David Pierce getting announced and um I mean I don't to be honest, I don't remember the Texas fan base's reaction. I don't even I, you know me, I don't tune into baseball, but it is interesting nonetheless, um, especially like to think that with how things are kind of ran nowadays, um, in the athletics office with you know CDC and the rest of those guys that I don't know. It's almost unfathomable thinking about that, you know, happening in today's age in 2024. Just like, yeah. I don't know. I mean, hey, for, for all the Texas fans, like you, you gotta, you gotta give yourself a pat on the back every now and then. Like the, I mean, the whole, the whole football program, obviously, but you know, the direction, the whole athletics program has gone in. And also yeah. just like, again, like that, that whole situation, that whole search would seem kind of unfathomable nowadays. <laughs> Dude. The same thing is like, like could you imagine like us stressing about the school we cover potentially losing to Kansas and football this upcoming season? Like that seems unfathomable almost. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's uh man, it, it's kind of like the man, the search to replace Mac, that was the one where I, I thought during that whole deal I was gonna have a nervous breakdown during that thing. Like I really thought like my my mental health was not in a good spot because I ended up, my wife and I, I was, we're grinding on that thing, man. And you know, that was the Steve Patterson S show, Mr. (laughs) Blended 6%. And I remember getting a call that a plane had, a plane was landing at the executive airport, you know, the executive airport in Pflugerville kind of out by Coda, like out there on the, on one thirty. I got driven call. past it a couple times. Yeah, I'm. Well, I'm living in San Marcos at the time, and I was taking a nap because I worked all week. My wife and I are getting ready to go to a Christmas party, mm-hmm. and I get a call that says there's a plane flying in from Louisville, landing at the executive airport in 30 minutes, and you need to be there to catch it on the runway. I said, "How the hell am I going to get from San Marcos to the executive airport in 30 minutes?" And it was like, I don't know, but you better find a way. So I hauled ass and right as like right as I'm pulling into the to the airport, to the airstrip, there's a van driving out and it's dark and I can't see who's in the van. So I had missed it by about, I don't know, probably five, 10 minutes. But I'm pretty sure that was Charlie Strong coming to Texas to to interview for the job. So you followed the van. Is what you're saying? No, no, man. I was so, I was so like just despondent. I'm like, all right. I'm like, I at least gave it an effort and at least saw a van, but I have nothing else, nothing else to report on 
on that. But man, Charlie was a candidate. Jimbo Fisher was a candidate. Jim Mora, Jim L. Mora was a candidate. I forgot somebody else was in that. Obviously, there was the Nick Saban stuff. I'm trying to remember if there's that was so long ago, but that was one man. It, it, everybody, that's how you know things are bad in the Texas athletic department when everybody has a source and they're all pretty much saying different things. Like, as a Texas fan, I think no matter what site you follow, and I've always said this about us at Horns 24 7, which by the way, right now, if you get over to the site, if you're not a member, it's a really good time to check it out right now because we got 50% off VIP yearly memberships. And uh, so, if you're not a member, that covers you for the next year so, and to get half off your sub. So get over there and check it out. But I've always said, Jordan, you know, if you're – thank you, Evil Kill Switch. That's my guy right there. James Franklin was – I think James Franklin and Charlie Strong were the two final finalists, at least in Steve Patterson's mind. And I know there was people on the board of regents that had different different opinions. I know but, you, you talk pretty highly of James Franklin nowadays. I'm assuming that's who you wanted. You know, um, believe it or not, and I'm not going to go revisionist history. Oh, um, wait, he wasn't. Was he at Penn State yet by then, or was that when he was? Where he was, was he that, again? That at? was his. That was his last year. Uh, the 2013 season, I think he was at Vanderbilt. I think one more year. Okay. Let me let me let me double check that real quick. It's not going to take me long. I've actually got. I've learned to keep Wikipedia pulled up on off when I do this show. James Franklin's last year at so he yeah that was his last season at Vanderbilt and it was clear somebody he was going somewhere he was leaving somewhere because the dude won nine games at Vanderbilt you should get a medal for that um yeah for real but anyway uh yeah James Franklin no I didn't want James Franklin uh truth be told and I'm not gonna go revisionist history and try to you know spruce up something that I said back then and you could probably go find my writings on the site. I wanted Jimbo Fisher. <laughs> I wanted Jimbo Fisher because Florida State was about to win a national championship. They were recruiting at an insanely high level. I mean, you go look at the NFL talent on that 2013 Florida State roster that won the national championship. A lot of draft picks on that roster. Uh, at the time, at the time, Jimbo had a reputation of being kind of a quarterback guru and we didn't know then obviously what we know now and, and texas had texas had an offensive identity crisis at the time like it's you went through this, this stuff the last few years of mac where it's like you you changed your offensive ideology every year like we want to be a yeah. downhill running team no now we want to be you know we want to be kind of this like almost like a hybrid spread offense no now we want to be uh you know, this offense, there is no identity. It's freewheeling. It's free-flowing. And it's now we want to be like the Oregon of the South. It's like, dude, figure out who you want to be and go be it. I just felt like they needed somebody that had their own system that could mold, that could come to Texas and install an offensive, offensive identity. So, yeah, I really like James Franklin, but I it, James Franklin was kind of choice two for me. One was Jimbo Fisher. Yeah, I'm with Evil Kill Switch. It kills me to admit that now. Because even then, man, it wasn't until obviously when Florida State won the national championship, you weren't hearing stuff. But even like when Jimbo left Florida State and some of this stuff came to fruition, there were a lot of Florida State people saying, man, AM fans think they're getting Jimbo Fisher like 2012, 2013, 2014. That's not the Jimbo Fisher they're getting. They're getting a Jimbo Fisher that's living high on the hog and is fat and happy and has pretty much put his career in cruise control. And is doing this money grab to go to AM. And yeah, that's pretty much what it looked like. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like I I think it's fine to admit, you know, <laughs> fault in that that was your number one choice. Uh I think a lot of people since uh, you know, we've gotten further and further from that 2013 or 2012, whatever year it was, that Florida State won the national championship. People are starting to realize that uh Jimbo's a little Jameis merchant. You know what I mean? Like, hey man. I don't know. Like, uh, I heard, I heard Feinbaum say it one time. Feinbaum put it perfectly. He said, What's the difference between Jimbo Fisher and Gus Malzahn? Jameis Winston. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Simple as that. It's the truth. And, like, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it it's, uh, that's honestly pretty damn good. And, you know, it's so funny. Like, Thinking about like what you said, like everyone looks at 
how he won a national championship, but also at the the level they were recruiting, right? And how much talent they had, how much NFL talent they had. Mm-hmm. Like, think about the LSU team, right? The 2019 LSU team. Yeah. Everyone's in the league. Everyone got drafted pretty much. They won every game. Yeah. <laughs> and Ed Orgeron, nobody wanted to hire him, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like, it's crazy to think whenever, man, whenever we get these hot teams, these hot programs that could be, they were down a couple of years. Now they're back and man, they're really popping. You know, they got a lot of NFL guys. So they're running everyone off the field. They're winning that. He's competing for it. Mm. Uh, and they got this young coach whose contract's coming up soon. You know what I mean? Like who's yeah. going to get them? We got to start thinking like, okay, <laughs> maybe this guy might actually not be what we think it is. He just like, basically won the lottery one year in recruiting and signed eight dudes that kind of have no business really being there or that everyone else completely messed up on. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Or in LSU's case, a lot of those guys are state of Louisiana. I think Texas has the best, is the best football state. I think Louisiana might produce better athletes than than Texas, though. If that makes sense, I think I think the upside with Louisiana kids is a, is, is higher. I'm not going to say a lot higher. Better better job of explaining it than I did. Yeah, that's and, and kind of what I was trying to say. And that's not like a blanket statement, but man, <laughs> I can't. I'm going to go out on a limb and say there aren't many high schools in the state of Louisiana that have facilities on par with like. You know, I've been to Spring Westfield. I know what they got. Jordan, you you know that facility out of Lake Travis. And Lake Travis is not uh, – it's nice, but it's not – you know, I wouldn't put it like in the top one or two percentile of facilities in the state. I mean, you, like you go out to Alito, that's – whoo, man, they got some facilities. But, yeah, nobody in the state of Louisiana has got anything like that. Yeah, I mean, look, Westfield at the school, that not a – Amazing part of town. Westfield's facilities really aren't much, but the, the stadium they play in is what you're talking about. Um, but that's no, have, you been to their, have you been to their weight room? I've never been in the weight room, but I've yeah. went and caught them like practicing outside and stuff. Like the practice field's times. not. I mean, it's just like kind yeah, of. Yeah, that's why I was. That's why I was just like, what are we? <laughs> no, man, you go like yeah. into their weight, and I don't know. It's been a minute. Like Cor- Corby Meekins was still the head coach when he gave me a tour of that place because they just. It was like a year or two old, and this was probably like 2000, I don't know, 2010, 2011. And mm. so it's, been, it's been about 10 years, but it was like a year yeah. or two old. And and I, I'm like, man, Texas didn't have a facility that nice at that point. I mean, it was like yeah, two-story well, gimmick with the weight room, and you got the, yeah. the clean platforms built into the floor, and training room is top of the line. I'm like, damn, I'm like, this is, there are Division One schools that don't have stuff this good. Yeah. Um, what I was saying though, like, man, that LSU, that that 2019 year, like, all those guys are pretty much the same class, and all of them came from the state of Louisiana. So, I don't know, maybe uh, it was a down year for scouting teams in the in the recruiting industry or something, man. But like, there there's so much of just getting lucky in, in the success of the sport that no coaches will ever admit, or fans, or other people. But I mean, it, it's such a huge spark. All it man, it, it just shows if you get that one. I mean, dude, look at look at Auburn. I mean, when Malzahn was the OC at Auburn with Gene Chiswick, dude, <laughs> look look what Cam Newton in one year did for that program. I think they were eight and five Chiswick's first year, and I think they were eight and five a uh, year after Cam, and then three and nine or whatever, and then Chiswick got fired, and, and they're an undefeated national champion the one year with Cam Newton. And it's not like they had terrible players around him. But same thing with like Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow on that LSU team. I mean, you get Jameis at Florida State and uh, Cooter mentions it in the chat. And and this is one of those kind of controversial takes that I've heard Texas fans spout over the year. I mean, over the years, you know, where's Mac Brown without Vince Young? I don't know, but it just shows you where how far a truly special transcendent talent can take you. Yeah, I mean, it might just be because it's, you know, the the head coach that was running everything when I was, you know, watching him growing up. But, I mean, Mac Mac has more than VY, you know what I mean? He, yeah. he has he has Ricky, some said Benson, uh, some Colts. You know, they had some say, success yeah. with 
I don't know. You know, max, you know what I mean? Like max longevity, max good years. There, he, he had a much longer shelf life than Gus Malzahn or Jimbo Fisher. And also his, I don't know about his prime, but like the window when he was, I don't know, like non senile, I guess is a <laughs> word to the, not, not senile, like. <laughs> Like non when the window where the fan base of the school he was at didn't want him fired was much bigger than the yeah. window for the other guys is what I'm, you, what I was trying to say. You know, the, like what? before before he pissed everyone off by making some stupid decisions, or before all those guys pissed people off, it took Matt a lot Mac a lot longer to piss those people off than it did Jimbo or Miles on. That's what I'm trying to say. So. If, uh, but yeah, I didn't mean I. I just, man. Every I, time I think of Mac now, even though the majority of my life he was coaching at Texas, every time I think of him, I just think, man, when he used to be on TV between Texas and, and when he took the North Carolina job again, and it's like they'd have so much goddamn makeup on him, and and it's like every every camera's nice nowadays, every TV's nice nowadays, and it's like. Why is 85-year-old Mac Brown's face, like, in 4K this close to my TV? Like, it's not – I'll tell you, you know what, what I mean. Though, like, come on, man. I got to I, I got to hang with Mac. We did a walk-off from his press conference to the convention hall at coaching school. And it's the first time I've really spent time around him uh, since he left. I, we we crossed paths briefly if he was, like, at, at, at UT for something or one time we passed each other. I was covering for our Oregon site. I was covering the TCU Oregon uh, Alamo Bowl, and the, during the, at the end of the 15 season, and Mac was doing ESPN radio, and I'm going like to get I you know set my stuff down. I'm going to get something to drink, and I'm going there. And Mac is coming from there, and we pass each other, and there was no ill will or anything. He shakes my hand, does the half hug, and I think Max Olson. Yeah, Max Olson was standing next to me, and he, he greets Max and. uh Matt goes, it's a little bit better than the last time I was here, which of course was his last game against Oregon, where he did, you know did the walk off and was done. So we had a good laugh. We had a laugh about that. But I, I spent time with him at coaching school, just a little bit of time. And man, he just like mentally and physically, he, he's obviously older, but just seems to be in so much of a better place than he was at the end of Texas, where it was you just, uh, I mean, it, it it couldn't have been fun for him because. It was his own doing that led to the downfall, but you're you're in such we have to win mode that you made a lot of mistakes that it took the program years and years and years to recover from. And then you compound that with a not so great hire right after him. You know, it's yeah, it's that's why I think, you know, say what you will about uh, Tom Herman. Tom Herman made the Texas job at least from an infrastructure standpoint, I'm not talking about the mm-hmm. roster, but from an infrastructure standpoint with facilities and everything else, Tom Herman kind of, what's the right word I want to use here? He kind of fostered that job to where it was a much better job when Sark took it than when Tom took it. That is a good point. Um, and actually, I mean, not in terms of the roster, but just in terms of the athletic department, the infrastructure, everything was there. Sark didn't have to worry about all the ancillary stuff of, am I going to get this facility? Am I going to get this? Am I going to get that? Whatever. If it wasn't already there, it was on the way. And, you know, we've seen Sark as a much better roster builder than his two predecessors. Yes, he has the advantage of the portal, but. Jordan, you, you've seen this, man. His, the, the recruiting staff, the job that staff does, I mean, it's it's night and day how much better this staff is. Oh, yeah. So um, you made a great point about, you know, Tom Herman getting the facilities ready, basically, for <laughs> getting them warm for Sark and ready yeah. for Sark. Um, do you want to transition into a little bit of recruiting? Because I have yeah. a decent point. Yeah, well, I, I'll uh, I'll just say this too in, in closing uh, to to wrap that up. I was talking about Horns twenty four seven, how we got our fifty percent off of VIP subs, yearly VIP subs. So get over there and check it out if you haven't done that already. If you're not a member, uh, sign up. You won't regret it. I I, I understand there there are plenty of people, and I, I love our people at Horns twenty four seven that are ride or die with us. 
all the way, 100%. But even if you're if we're not your number one go to, right? If you uh, you've been in Orange Bloods forever, or you're an inside Texas person, or whatever, man, as long as we're one of the places where you go for your Longhorn information, I'm good with that. And I feel like we do a good enough job. Uh, our information, our intel, our writing, our insight, it's as good or better than you'll find in the market. So go over there and take advantage of that. But I say that, Jordan, because I was talking about, you know, going back to what we were talking about with the coaching searches and how much better everything is now. Um, as Texas fans, that's how you know when your athletic department's in a good spot where, you know, the ins- the the true the true inside info, it seems like it's slow to trickle out. And on coaching searches, you're not hearing much. And, man, I don't remember anybody, you know, the last few coaching searches, I don't remember anybody really getting out in front and reporting a whole lot. It was just like kind of get little kernels here and there, and then boom, 48, 36 hours out, whatever, everything starts to come to fruition. So um, it's never been a better time for Texas fans to have options on what they, what kind of content they view or, or, and, and absorb in the market. But as long as Horns 24-7 and Texas Sports Unfiltered, as long as those two outlets are a part of your consumption of Longhorn news and information and entertainment, then that's all. I, that's all I can ask for. So, yes, Jordan, let's go ahead and get into recruiting. I don't want to. <clears throat> the stampede is packed because you and Hank were at Under Armour Houston yesterday, and I don't want to spill all the beans from that are in the stampede. And I know you guys will have more articles and things like that that'll trickle out. The one thing I wanted to start with, though, Lance Jackson, let's start with just the the easiest guy to talk about because he's committed. Lance Jackson's a guy that we've talked about. Is he going to be an edge? Is he going to be an interior guy? Is he going to be just based like a four-eye technique type guy? I don't know, but it sounds like he impressed the hell out of everybody yesterday down in spring oh yeah so i don't know i always think it's kind of funny um i don't know i'm not trying to talk trash at all but like i travel a lot for for my job i I see these kids a lot in person so i always think it's funny at these big showcases when the other media is there and they're like wow lance jackson's really good (laughs) and it's just like Dude, you've wrote about him like 20 times. Have you never went and watched his film or whatever? You know what I mean? Like, have you? Yeah. This is your first time seeing him in part? I don't know. So, for me, I wasn't surprised at all. Uh, he, he, like Evil Killswitch said, the kid is a freak. He's been a freak. I mean, he was throwing like 88, 91 on a mound as a freshman, right? Like, that, come on now. You know what I mean? And he's 6'5, 225. Like, those, those type of guys don't grow on trees. Everyone's always going to talk about, um it's 263 look i think we have him let me see what we have him at um and we'll we'll have his verified weight whatever it was on sunday tomorrow we have him at 65 245 um yeah. but he did look significantly bigger from a weight perspective and not only did he look significantly bigger it was great weight or good weight not not the bad weight you don't want to see it's a good weight you do want right. to see um but yeah we'll we'll just get into it i'll run through uh, guys, we saw in Houston this weekend. Well, also, well, real quick, is there is there anything else you want to add to Lance Jackson? Yeah, I was just gonna get into him and start with okay. him. Go ahead. Um, yeah. But so the first thing that I found super interesting, just talking to him before you started going through drills, I always talked about how he's a really good baseball player, uh, plays pitcher for for Pleasant Grove, and uh, up until this off season, was actually playing a pretty busy travel baseball schedule where he do select or whatever. AAU is called for baseball. I don't know. I'm not. I'm yeah, very it's, casual it's, baseball. It's just fan. a like ball. Yeah. Okay. Probably. Um. But so damn good baseball player. And within the last month, Texas actually told him like, "Yo, if you want to play baseball here, like, we can do that for you." Um. And David, David Pierce will t- he'll take he'll take a six six power arm. Yeah. So uh, as things currently stand, he is looking into potentially playing baseball in Austin as well. Um. Not sure. If he would be a pitcher, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not sure what is his main position in baseball. I just do know that, like, I think the fastest he's been clocked this year was like 91 or 94. Like, he and the, the highest he's ever thrown is like a 96 or something like that. But okay. I don't know if he's like a legitimate pitcher or if he's like one of Pleasant Grove's best options for pitchers. Hey, like man, that. if you're if you're throwing in the 90s, you're 
they'll 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 let you look. I mean, they'll they'll take a look at you on that mound. Um, yeah. But with, with with Lance Jackson, you know, it's interesting. We've talked about how difficult it is, and the guy I'm going to ask you about next, and we can get into some of the other guys from there. Um, you know, the the baseball football double dip is insanely difficult to pull off. I mean, we saw like even guys like. Patrick Mahomes and Jameis Winston, the guys that were clearly good enough to play baseball at an elite level, couldn't really dive all the way into it. So at what point, at some point, you've got to really make the decision. I got to go one or the other. I do know Deuce Robinson was a guy that the Texas staff, the baseball staff, was was more than happy to let Deuce Robinson play baseball because he was he's an elite baseball prospect. Uh, but he just, you know, ended up at uh ended up at SC. But man, when you talk about baseball prospects, I saw I think it was Dustin McCombs posted it from oh, his yeah. five tool account. I, I saw, speaking of five tool too, I saw some of Jonah Williams playing outfield, throwing 88, 89 off the mound, swiping bags, raking a little bit. Do, do we have do, do college football coaches have to worry, Jordan, if Jonah Williams is going to make it to camp? Because we talk about like his brother Nick was a what was Nick a second round pick, third round pick by the Phillies out of high school. Mm. Uh, I, we just talked about this the other day. I forget where Nick. Yeah. Was I think it was second round. But mm-hmm. I mean, are they are they going to have to worry about whether or not he's even going to make it to campus, or if he's going to be drafted high enough and get the kind of signing bonus to where pro baseball is just going to be way too enticing for him? Yeah, I mean, I've. I've, I've probably written about that part of the recruitment more than anyone else in the industry. Yeah. Um, because I mean, for about a year now, uh, he's had all the, the top offers, but, um, you know, I have a, a source down there in G County hooking it up. Um, and pretty much since he got the top ones, it was like, look, obviously a great football player, but he might not even play football. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like what? <laughs> and it's, he he also plays baseball as well, and this would have been last spring. So him in spring of his sophomore baseball season, he's looking at getting picked round two, round three, round four, immediately out of high school for baseball. And I was like, "Wait, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, what do you mean?" Because yeah. I I know that MLB can draft out of high school, but like that doesn't happen that much where it's baseball and football and they're that good, at least in the state of Texas. Cause usually someone would have got them fully football by then. Right. Especially yeah. at a school like Galveston ball where historically they've shat out NFL talent. So, you know, it, it's a really intriguing recruitment. Um, but yeah, there, there's a very high chance. He doesn't, I, I don't know about very high. It's still being thought out, um, but it, it's definitely a possibility. I don't think it's yeah. off the table at all or, you know, a done deal at all. Um, definitely a possibility. And back to Lance Jackson, uh, we asked him, you know, what do you think about maybe playing baseball at Texas as well? He said he's still thinking about it. Um, and, you know, when he makes up his mind, he'll let us know. I don't expect him <laughs> to play baseball, honestly. He's a really, really, really straightforward kid, um, a yeah. lot older between the ears than uh, he, he comes off or than his age, I guess. Um, for example, like one of his commitment quotes is like, you know, you have offers from everywhere. What made you want to shut it down and commit to Texas in January and not June or something? Yeah. And he said, well, I basically was just like, this is where I know I'm already going. So I might as well just commit and get right. out of the way with. And like kids don't talk like that, but it's because he's been a pro's pro. He's been getting recruited since the seventh grade year. And he's so much more mature than the rest of these kids that. He doesn't want to deal with all the bullshit, all the, you know, social media likes or whatever. He's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's he's chasing something else than most kids. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And I think Texas fans will love that. He's also, you know, incredibly locked into his commitment Uh, His OV to Texas for the June 14th through 16th weekend is going to be the only OV he takes. He said pretty much every school has realized where he stands with Texas and has given up on him. Um, The only two still hitting him up is A&M and Arkansas. But. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you know, consistency with those two schools has really started to die down the further we've gotten away from yeah. his initial commitment. Um, so it's, before- it's funny, Jordan, we talk about you know now with the portal, finishing second in a recruitment has never been more important. But I, man, for for PK for Pete Wachowski losing a recruit 
has probably never paid off more than he didn't get Landon Jackson, but the relationship he formed with the family get, got him Lance at Texas. So that's he didn't get he didn't get Landon to go to Washington, but he's got Lance at Texas. So I'm sure he's not gonna complain about that. Yeah, and I mean you really have to give a lot of props to PK as well because PK met Landon and Lance multiple times in person. Yeah. But they never visited Washington. <laughs> and it was because they had an official visit booked. And then y'all remember what happened in 2020? Right? Yeah, COVID. Because I, I had a long talk with someone about this yesterday at the camp. Like the fact, can you imagine wearing a mask anywhere, everywhere you go? You know, but oh, we'll man, leave that for another show. No, but oh. that, that's we're we're at we're at portal time where you know the 21 and 22 class, especially the 21 class. A lot of those guys committed to school sight unseen because you could you couldn't take a visit. Yeah, um, but so yeah, they're supposed to go out to Washington do an OV. Uh, Huskies are very much contender, and then COVID hit, and it was basically like, all right, it's down to the schools that are within, <laughs> you know, a three hour radius or whatever it is. Right. Um, so that kind of cut Washington there, and then just to answer some questions before I start running down the rest of the guys. Why is Byron Washington catching passes during seven on seven? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I saw that too. Um, uh, so that seven on seven team, they're called like the Doughboys or some shit. I don't know. They uh, Their whole thing is that they're going out and getting like these linemen offensive and defensive with offers, and then they make a seven on seven team out of them. Um, so it's funny because it's just like big fat dudes running around catching touchdowns, yeah. but like – like there's no tournaments where it's only offensive and defensive linemen playing that, so they're getting smoked versus whoever they're playing. So they don't have like the seven on seven version of the fat man relay at track meets. Mm -mm. Nope, they don't. But um, it like on Byron Washington, if hold up, let me double check this actually before I say this. Um, uh, I'll just answer real quick while you're doing that. Joshua asked, did you just had the best rookie in the history of the NBA play home games on UT's campus and you didn't cover it? Um, well, LeBron didn't play at Moody Center, did he? Well, okay, I didn't say that, but I, I saw that. I wasn't gonna say like we are horns 24 7, not Spurs. Yeah, and I get the I get what you're saying, but like that's I don't, I don't, I don't know. Cover. Like, do you want us? Whenever George Strait comes and performs at Moody Center one day, are we going to – I don't know. You know what I mean? But for Byron Washington, though, go to his profile on 24-7 and check where the crystal balls are because I deleted my Texas one um, a month ago. Um, Look, we all know who he is, what type of player he is. He's like 6'8 and 400 pounds. Mm -hmm. Texas um, – Look, I'll be honest, man. There are offensive linemen that are much, much better than them, higher on the board that Texas is in a great position for. Um, and if you can't understand what I'm saying, that's on your fault. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, at this point, I would be incredibly surprised if Byron Washington ends up committing to Texas. Um, I didn't report about this when I deleted the crystal ball however many weeks or months ago, whatever that was. But, you know, I, I'm always trying to do right by the kids. It's the right thing to do. I'm not going to go out and report this is why the crystal ball is getting deleted. Yeah. Most of y'all are adults and can figure it out. Um, but, yeah, and then Antoine said, I'm going to continue to say the top receiver board should be DeCorian, and Kelshawn, Kalik, and Emmanuel Choice. Uh, top two guys are DeCorian and Jamie French for sure. Um, after that, I'd say it's probably uh, DeCorian – or not DeCorian, sorry, my bad, my bad. Kelshawn, Kalik, Emmanuel Choice, uh, Dalen McCutcheon, uh, Marcus Harris, Andrew Marsh. Uh, I, I'd put all those guys and then in, in like a secondary group. Or if those guys, if those guys wanted to call Texas right now and commit, Texas would let them. They'd let them post it too. Um, so Emmanuel Choice is very much a take and and is is towards the top as well. Um, so by yeah, the way, so speaking you, of Jamie French, I've already caught Hank doing it. I don't think I've caught you doing it yet. Jamie French with two Fs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, because, I mean, you look up Jamie French with one, you it's impossible to find anything on him. So, um, but, yeah, it, it makes it a lot easier, though. And I actually saw him at the na National Combine, and he was super, super fun, great player, was by far the best receiver there. So, um, yeah, I think he would fit what Texas does amazingly. But at the same time, I 
It would be very surprised if Jamie French isn't going to commit to Ohio State like by the end of the summer. I said so. it before. I said it, I'll say it again, though, man. It, it's nice when the program you follow has an offensive system that elite wide receivers want to come be a part of. Oh, yeah. And elite quarterbacks want to be a part of it. Hey, real quick, speaking of elite quarterbacks, mm -hmm. uh, Dia Bell, the uh, quarterback from American Heritage down at Fort, Fort Lauderdale, the uh, 20, 2026 quarterback, 6'2", 195, uh, son of uh, uh, former NBA star Raja Bell. I can call Raja Bell an NBA star, right? Yeah, I mean, was in the league 12 seasons, named twice the all-defensive team. Yeah, so Dio Bell is Raja Bell's son. He's actually in Austin right now, going to visit. He'll be, on, uh, he'll be attending spring practice tomorrow, so... Mm. Hank, Hank our, our our boy Hank South just dropped that on the uh, flagship message board at Horse Twenty Four Seven. Well, awesome. Um, and then yeah, I guess I'll keep running through other guys from Under Armour Houston. So I kind of talked about Jonah um, a little bit with you know how the baseball element of the recruitment is you know still in play um, for him in terms of the recruitment. I'd say you know there's crystal balls in for Oklahoma. I'd say they're the leader. He's he's far from making a decision and. <laughs> You know, knowing him and how much he loves the whole recruiting process, I'd be pretty surprised if Jonah Williams isn't picking up a hat on signing day or something like that. Yeah. Like that. That's very much what I see happening. Um, and while I think Texas will probably be a hat on the table during that ceremony, whenever that ceremony does come, uh, I I got to take the field versus Texas in this one. Um, it's just he, he hasn't been to campus in a while. He's coming down – uh, early April, so not that he doesn't have anything scheduled, but his other schools have they're they're in front of Texas, and it's not that Texas yeah. has done a, a bad job with him; it's just schools have done a better job with him. Um, and how also, much that, though, Jordan, how much of your reluctance, how much of you taking the field, has to do with the fact that, like you said, it it's going to take a while for this to play out, so there's no sense in trying to yeah trying yeah. to put somebody in, in the trying to well, establish a pecking order right now. Yeah, well, so it, I mean, it seems like there's a pretty clear understanding that it's going to be Oklahoma, Texas, Texas A&M. Really, those are the main three, to be honest with you. Or actually, no, Ohio State, Ohio State, and that's like the main four. And then on the outside, you'll have like LSU, uh, USC, and Oregon. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if Tennessee or Missouri one of those schools makes a makes a push um, and, you know, potentially gets an OV from him in the season. But uh, but yeah, so that's that's Jonah. And man, like Texas was recruiting him at linebacker. He was like, I am not a linebacker. I'm not playing linebacker or he didn't say I'm not playing it. He's always said I'll play whatever coaches want me to play, but I don't want to play linebacker. I prefer not to. Um Safety was where he wanted if he was going to be on defense. Uh, he was trying to tell everyone that we need to rank him as a receiver and that he wants to play receiver in college, and we laughed it off because it's like that's not what's happening. No. <laughs> um, now Texas is recruiting him at safety just like pretty much every other school in America. Um, but, you know, they did it six months a year later than everyone else did. And, you know, also Oklahoma, a big part of why they're where they're at in his recruitment right now is – the baseball program, like not that Oklahoma's baseball program is cream of the crop, but like they're amazing at selling dual sport athletes at Skip Oklahoma. I, don't, I, I, I really don't know what it is, but at Oklahoma, they can sell the F out of doing two sports with one of them being football. Um, they've had a lot of success of, of landing those guys over other schools where it like it's a done deal that that kid's going to play two sports. Kyle um, Murray played a little baseball at OU. A, a humongous reason of OU getting Taylor Tatum, if not the main reason, was because of how they were able to set everything up with the baseball program. Yeah. And I think, honestly, a year from now, I think I could be saying the same thing for Jonah Williams if that's where he ends up, just because that's the only school that's really – not that schools haven't taught baseball and had him around the baseball program. That's the only school that's actually recruiting him as well for baseball. It has a plan on how to do both. Yeah, and is or, or yeah, yeah, my bad. Not that other schools aren't recruiting for baseball. Yeah. They're the only school that's consistently communicating with him each week, e multiple days a week about right. baseball. You know, um, uh I like I remember the the both staffs were so flexible with Kyler and I think man, when Kyler 
I think when Kyler was there, I don't will skip the pitching coach. I think Pete Hughes might still been the head coach, but I remember Kyler for a three game series in Austin. He played the Friday game, flew back to Norman to play in the spring game on Saturday, then flew back to Austin for the Sunday game. Like he did, he did two sports in one weekend. So oh, that's, yeah. that's how that's how flexible at the time they were. Granted, two different, you know, Skip's still there, and uh, it's not Lincoln Riley anymore. It's Brent Venables, but. Oh, you does have a history of allowing that kind of flexibility. And for an athlete like Kyler Murray, why the hell wouldn't you? Yeah, and, like, I know everyone will scoff at it, but, like, Brennan Thompson. Like, when Brennan Thompson first went in the portal, I was, st- like, straight up told he's going to Arizona State or Oklahoma State. OU was mentioned, but they were not – no one really gave them respect. Yeah. Three days later, it's an OU graphic, and all the Texas fans are like, well, he sucks anyways. And then some are like, but, but – right? Um, well, here's, but, here's my thing. how did they how did OU pull that off? They sold him on dual sports better than the other schools, and he was, you know, yeah. he's a Spearman kid, too. I'll say something, I'll say something to that effect, though. Wide receiver mm-hmm. is one of those positions that, as long as Steve Sarkeesian's the head coach of Texas, I'm not going to worry about Texas recruiting quality wide receivers. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, I wasn't really disagreeing with <laughs> no the, I, the Texas fans I was yeah. mocking. Oh yeah, so, um, but uh, but yeah, and then who's another guy we talked to that that's pretty much the the current story for Jonah? Uh, Andrew Marsh is in a very similar boat with him, where where he loves the recruiting process. Marsh will still name like twenty schools whenever you ask him who's standing out. Which yeah, so he's been doing for. Go ahead. So well, well you, you know, in in the stampede, there's stuff on Kelshawn Johnson. Mm-hmm. I know Antoine mentioned a couple of these names: Kelshawn Johnson, Kalik Lockett. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you got Andrew Marsh. Um, if you had to kind of power rank these wide receivers, throw DeCorey Moore in there also, even though he wasn't there yesterday. What, not, I'm not talking about where they are on Texas board. How would you rank them? Of uh, what are we? What are we? What are we going off of? Who just I think would have the best? Just in terms of who you think, who you think the the best? You say call it where you would rank them if you had if if they said Jordan, uh, we're gonna let you handle the wide receivers in the top two four seven for this update. Rank these guys: Kelshawn Johnson, Kalik Lockett, Andrew Marsh. Um. I mean, Kalik, Marsh, Kelshawn, DeCorian, if he's in that group, he's definitely one. But they're they're all they're all for you like top what top thirty type guys in the country. Top forty. I mean, I think we have look, <laughs> I've kind of told my Xavier Worthy story story for Kelshawn, I think. Mm-hmm. Um I think we have Kelshawn now. He's still somewhere in the hundreds of our top two four seven, I believe. Yeah. It's really hard to project a kid who comes from a, a small school system that's <laughs> stronger than ever, faster than everyone, and is just running past people. It, it's hard to do it, and also because the fact that Hitchcock has played in a four-team district the last two years and has had to play, you know, an outlaw schedule pretty much for the most part, where they're playing a bunch of t- tiny private schools where it's. <laughs> Yeah, look, kids look, that look, I, you, you know what I mean. You're using the old school term, talking about an outlaw schedule. What you, man? I've come on now. I've been around, but uh, <laughs> but, but Kelshawn, kind of really hard to project just because interesting frame, very similar to Xavier Worthy, more compact build than Xavier Worthy, similar track profile to Xavier Worthy, but plays in a small kind of low level area system. Um, and again, he's been the fastest person in Hitchcock G County, the 409, since he probably came out the womb, or at yeah. least in his class, his grade. So hard to kind of get an accurate read of how I feel about him. I thought he was really good yesterday, Under Armour versus some of the top guys. I mean, he's just so incredibly smooth in and out of breaks and just so explosive, too. Um, and you know, it, I think Texas, Penn State, USC, AM. Uh, Tech, I think Oregon, you know, that, that's kind of been his group for a long time. Um, but, that's, you know, you talk. Know, th- what you mentioned, though, real quick, that, that's the big thing when I was out on the road covering recruiting and helping evaluate prospects. 
that's the big thing I looked for with track guys that played mm-hmm. football, especially receivers. It, if a guy was real stiff, you know, like you can tell that probably probably wasn't going to translate too well. Oh yeah, to the field. But if he's fluid, if you see that explosiveness, that's why you know it, it's great if a guy runs a sub ten seven whatever. But mm-hmm. does that guy does he jump? Yeah, can he you know, move like, this way too? Yeah. <laughs> can he do? Can he do other things? You know, a lot of people can run real fast in a straight line, but you know, can you run real fast in a straight line after you you know make a catch in traffic and then put a foot in the ground and get up the field? Oh yeah. So um, yeah, Kelshawn, uh, he's had the same group of schools for you know a pretty long time now, but. Uh, talking to him, people close to him yesterday. Um, I think Texas and USC are going to be the final two going forward. Um, Lincoln Riley and his offense, that's kind of what stands out to him. And, you know, same thing could be said for Sark and Texas. Um, you know, the Xavier Worthy comp, he also loves that, you know, actually hearing it from the Texas coaches and not some dude named Jordan Scruggs, too. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, the, hey, he remembers who was first to say it. So, um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, and, you know, if you're going to ask me who I like between Texas and USC, for sure, Texas. Um, kid from Hitchcock, small town. You know, it, it's funny because I'm going to contradict myself here a little bit, but those kids usually want to stay in state, all right? The only one I can really think of that's come from a rural area and has basically said F you to all the in-state schools, so, like I want to leave, was Darwin Barlow from – Newton. New, yeah, I was about to say, is somewhere southeast Texas, Newton, USC. So um, that's kind of how I contradicted myself. But I mean, I don't know, man. Like Hank and I honestly might be getting close to crystal balls for for Kelshawn. That's we're starting to feel pretty good about him ending up in the Texas class. That's interesting, man, because there was a time, especially when I was growing up, you know, probably the mid '90s, where kids from kind of that that Gulf Coast kind of the outskirts of Houston, you know, Hitchcock, Angleton, you mm-hmm. know, even all down to Texas City, Lamarck, place like that. Those kids typically, and then even if you got into like, you know, especially like Lufkin, Jasper, Newton, up that way, those kids historically went to A&M. Like when A&M oh, yeah. was really good, those kids went to A&M, but then Texas got really good, and it's not, A&M still got their share, but more of those kids started going to Texas and I think, you know, all it took was a, all it takes is a couple of guys to have good experiences somewhere. And kind of like we talked about with the whole DISD deal, the guy that changed DISD recruiting, I think was Christian Scott at Skyline. I was like, oh, yeah, you can go to Texas and have, you know, have a positive experience and whatnot. I think once you've got a couple of those guys, at least from the area, from some of those small towns, I think that helped Texas a lot be able to at least say, hey, we got this guy from such and such place. You know, he had a really good time at Texas. We think Texas is for you, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. Um, And then, man, who are some other guys I want to make sure to talk about since we only got a couple minutes? Um, Jakeem Stewart, he's a number four player in the 2026 class. Uh, He's a defensive lineman at St. Augustine in New Orleans. Same high school as former number one player, uh, Leonard Fournette. Current Leonard Fournette. Is he in the league still? Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's with uh, Tampa. That's right. Damn, I, it's kind of – I don't know. But anyways, uh, Jakeem Stewart, St. Aug kid, actually talked to uh, his – Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Leonard Fournette was with the Bills last year. Yeah, that's why I was like, <laughs> huh? Um, But, no, talking to a uh, source close to Jakeem Stewart – Going to come in next week for a visit. Also going to try to see a and uh, while he's in town. Obviously a huge deal. That's the number four player in the 26 class. But uh, not trying to negate the importance or the impact of this potential visit. But, I mean, Stewart is one of the best traveled kids in the country. He visits every school in America um, and pretty often. And he's at – He's been getting recruited since, like, the seventh grade, so he's been making, like, junior day visits and game day visits since, like, literally the eighth grade. So this isn't his first time at Texas. It isn't his second or third time either or his fourth. Um, I believe it's his fifth or sixth. And, again, he's a sophomore. So, you know, going to be interesting to see what this trip, how it's different from the others with Kenny Baker now, you know, being the one who he's going to go sit and talk with in the office, not Bo Davis. 
that's certainly going to be important because um, Jakeem and his circle, uh, very tight with his trainer, who has trained every single top defensive lineman that's come out of Louisiana like the last 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Whenever you train every top defensive lineman out of the last 15, 20 years, you're going to have kids play everywhere in the nation. And when you do, one of those schools is going to be Alabama. One of the coaches he trusts more than any other coach in America is Bo Davis. That's why he was so happy that another one of his kids, Melvin Hills, was able to get, uh, go to Texas, get to Texas, and play for Coach Davis. Is because he knew what Coach Davis was going to do for him. Yeah. Um, he also likes uh, Kwi Kwiatkowski as well. He likes the whole D line staff. And um, man, I'm blanking on his name. The, the D line assistant, uh, Taj James. Taj James is the name. He even highlighted him. Um, and th that that whole D line group is strong, but you know he's like, man, Bo Davis is my guy. You know, Kenny Baker, I think he's cool, but you know it's going to be important this weekend. You know, seeing how this will impact us with Texas in the future. Yeah. Elite. To wrap elite all level. that up, though. To wrap all that up, though, and I wrote it this morning. I would be absolutely shocked if Jakeem Stewart doesn't sign with LSU and end up at LSU. In state kids. At Louisiana, that are coveted and wanted by Louisiana are like impossible to pull. And yep. also, like, there are just so many things going on in Louisiana, especially like just the, the back doors recruiting that'll never ever be reported. But LSU will make sure he doesn't leave the state, if you know what I mean. I, I um, just, man, I've Texas, heard I've heard way too many stories, man, about when you get when you get high, high level prospects especially from the southern part of Louisiana, pretty much from Baton Rouge on down. Mm -hmm. And it, it is so hard when push comes to shove at the end of the day for those kids to say no to LSU. Oh, yeah. And also, like, you have everyone in your whole life that's ever been around you pressuring you to go there, too. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And but, like, <laughs> I, I – if I was coaching D-line at LSU, I think I'd get you Keem Stewart. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, LSU, I, I mean, it's far from a done deal. Like, the, he says he likes every school in his top 15 evenly when you ask him to list standouts. Right? So, yeah. um, <laughs> with, with LSU, they really gained a lot of – or not momentum, because, again, I've always kind of felt this way. But they really gained some steam whenever they hired Bo Davis just because I knew the respect level that – um, Jakeem and Jakeem Stewart's trainer had for Bo Davis and how important that was in recruiting kids to Texas with Bo Davis and now recruiting kids to LSU there. But, like, I don't know, man. J J it sucks that I'm saying all this, you know, because, again, he is the number four player in the country. And, like, this is – there have been – I don't know. I don't know how many total kids, but in this job, you know, there's – there are kids you look at and can easily say, like, that's an NFL body. That's an NFL body. But there's only so many kids you can look at and say, like, that is 1,000% an NFL player. Yeah. 1,000%. Um, the main one that comes to mind for me, the first one that came to mind for me was Garrett Wilson. Jakeem Stewart is one of those guys. He is one of those guys. And it's not just the he's an NFL player. It's like the – that will be a first rounder. And I know that's obviously what our whole company is projecting him at as a number four player. But like you can really have confidence in some of these guys, some guys it's really hard to. Jakeem Stewart is a guy I have a lot of confidence about, you know, as long as he stays healthy, getting selected in the first round. Like that's not a year three type of cat or a four year type of cat in college at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh real quick, CB asked in the chat. Texas pursuit Andre Stoyakovich now that he plans to enter the portals for basketball. I, it, it's way too early to say because I, I mean, look between Cam Scott, Trey Johnson, depending on I mean if if, if Tyrese Hunter comes back, you know whatever your guard group looks like, you know Max Asmus is moving on, but Kendall Weaver comes back, you got to wonder at some point. Okay, how many guards slash wings do you need like are you just going to be overloaded i just think it's way too early to say until rt gets a better idea of what guys are going to do i was kind of shocked though with stoyakovich he only shot 32.7 percent from three 
as a freshman at Stanford. So that's, I mean, I know the kid was using McDonald's all American top 30 ish player in the country. Texas did one of them. I think Texas finished second. To, yeah. Texas did finish second to Stanford in that race, but not, not, a, I, th- I think that would take tape breakdown to see like, okay, are the shot mechanics there and shots just aren't falling? Is there something you can change with a shot, whatever. But that to me is the big one. I, I would have expected better than 30, 32.7% from three. Like Tyrese Hunter shot better from three this year <laughs> than Andre Stoyakovic. Yeah. Then I don't want to watch that guy play basketball. Then if Tyrese Hunter is better than you at something, <laughs> Stay away from the the college basketball team. I'll watch about once because they're both at, they're both at one point one threes made per game. Uh, Stoyakovich attempts three point three per game. Tyrese is at three point two. Tyrese shooting thirty five percent. Stoyakovich is at thirty seven uh, thirty two point seven. So I don't know, BK. That's tough, man. You you've you've done work uh, kind of scouting high school kids and looking at, and, and and doing some work. I know your stuff with Texas top one hundred. It's tough, and I know Bill Self has talked about this. Kids, he he might recruit a guy like Devontae Graham is the the example that I've I've heard used for Bill Self guys over the years. Guys may not shoot a great percentage from three, like an AAU baller in high school, but they can look at things like shot mechanics and feel like, okay, that guy's going to shoot a pretty high percentage. So with Stoyakovich, the the three point percentage doesn't give me warm fuzzies, but maybe. Our team and staff looks at the tape if they want him and say, no, we feel like the shot mechanics are there. They'll fall. We can we can take him. I like jeans, Jeff. I trust the jeans for Andre Stoyakovic because his dad's one of the best three-point shooters in the history of the NBA. So when it's football, when it's basketball, when it's baseball, it doesn't matter the sport. I am always taking a chance on somebody with the same bloodline as a professional athlete father or a grandfather or even uncle. I'll take my chances with that too. But yeah, I would, I would absolutely uh, take a flyer on Sayakovic, even though it was a pretty subpar freshman year for him. But Stanford was a mess too. Yeah. So, they just fired uh, their coach and that's, they probably should have fired him a couple of years ago and their whole athletic department is in the big sports. I shouldn't say their whole athletic department because they dominate all the Olympic sports, but they've they got they've got some things. About. Yeah, they've got some things to figure out in uh in the big ones for sure. Hey, and and don't forget to mention BK, that's former Mavericks great Peja Stoyakovic. NBA champion Peja Stoyakovic. Damn right. Come on. Big time player on that 2011 team. We had, we had somebody in the chat earlier wondering why we didn't cover the Spurs uh, at Moody Center this weekend. Um, Wemby did make some history last night. Pretty fun to watch. I think first player ever to go 30, 15, five and five on 50 plus percent shooting in a game. So they beat the Nets. Congrats. Big win Spurs fans. Any win, I guess for them is a big win these yeah. days. It, uh, well, it was Josh our, our, Mavs, our Mavs are beating the defending champion Nuggets and yeah. going to make the playoffs, but congrats Spurs on your win over a horrible lottery team <laughs> in Brooklyn. Good job. We're talking about him. Wemby's a monster. He's he's so much fun to watch. Ivan Drago's cousin doesn't still own the Nets, does he? He sold them a while back. <laughs> I believe so. Yeah. Russian guy. It's well done. Uh, yeah, Joshua asked in the chat, uh, we, you just had the best rookie in NBA history play home games on UT's campus. I'm like, I didn't, I didn't know LeBron was on campus this weekend. Hmm. Oh man! I didn't yep. see Michael Jordan. I didn't hear Michael Jordan was on campus this weekend. That would have been cool. Yeah, he would have been, he would have been gambling on something if he was. <laughs> you, Selection he, Sunday would have been right then. It would have been easy. There you, you go. You have that in common, BK. I think you. If you ever met Michael Jordan, there'd be some common ground to reach real quick. Yeah, I feel like I'd be want to. I'd want to be done with that conversation about thirty seconds in. Uh, but yes, I, I drop a gambling thing. Problem is, I, the first thing I would ask him is, "All right, tell me why you really left to go play baseball." Even though I know the answer, even though it was an under the table suspension handed out by David Stern, I would still ask, and I would look for that proof. Why do I feel like you guys would recreate the Billy Madison? hamburger scene and bet on throwing pickles against a plexiglass window to oh. see who won the race. If you uh, guys put money down on that. Is that Big Daddy? Yeah. Big Daddy? Yeah. That was Billy uh, Madison. 
That was right before they found they went and found a uh oh yeah a nice piece of S. Yes, yes, indeed. I was thinking about the ketchup spit scene from Big Daddy. <laughs> How close that can get to the ground. Nasty. Trey, are, you, are you happy to be done with South by Southwest? Oh, I can't hear Trey. <laughs> he just said, God damn it. I can't hear it, but I heard it. <laughs> yeah. You get good at lip reading in this business. We're just yeah. watching sports. A Yo, lot, what the what is CB talking about, Jeff? Do you know anything about that? About Michael Jordan? Oh, yeah, Jordan? Michael Jordan played a charity game at Texas State in the summer of 98 the hell was he doing in San Marvelous? And why was the charity game there? Like, I, I know you said it was a charity game, but why was it? How did uh, they get Michael Jordan, too? Probably because Strahan was big enough, and it's not like the Irwin Center. You, you think about it, you didn't have, like, HEB Center or any of those other venues. I, he, he had a golf tournament somewhere in Austin, I think maybe Barton Creek, mm-hmm. and then did the charity basketball game at Texas State. Because, I mean, Strahan can hold, I don't know, seven, 8,000, whatever it is. Yeah. And I'm sure I'm sure that I'm sure the the rent for that building wasn't all that expensive. Shit. Yeah, you Michael us <laughs> for free. Yeah. Take that. So yeah. Well Trey, we'll are you good now? Tomorrow. BK, you need me to hang out for a sec till Trey gets the uh audio. Uh, yeah, out. if you can, that'd be yeah, great. Can, Jordan, you can go ahead and punch out. All right. We'll we'll do it Dope. tomorrow. Hey, brother. Well, uh, wait, what time is practice availability small, Jeff? Do we have it yet? Yeah, so the uh, practice window will be at uh, 9 a.m. So 9 to, I don't know, like 9.20, 9.30, whenever they yell. Chat. Whenever, Chat. Yeah, whenever Sark yeah. starts yelling for us to get out. Got could it. be, could be 15 now. minutes, could be a half hour, who knows. Okay, dope. Yeah, just no. wanted to make sure, but yeah, we can. We can't hear you. Uh, but just wanted to make sure because I'll I'll for sure be back in my parents' house by the time practice and all that's over for the show. Okay. So yeah. Awesome. Uh Wednesday, BK, we might be missing her. I don't we haven't we don't have time to pro day yet. So Yeah, we'll have to uh, we should be good for the show. Yeah, I, I assume would... we'd be good. Cool. But just tell so, me up. Well, TV we'll see y'all tomorrow. All right. You guys take it easy. Take care. Take good boys. There they go. It's only an hour. Now it's time for the award winning midday with Trey and BK and back in his home studio with, I believe, a new computer. The great Trey Elling the third. What's up, big dog? Rookie fucking mistake by me, BK, on top of just dropping my computer in the middle of Congress and having it break and be completely useless until I can get it replaced because thankfully it's still under warranty. I did not have it backed up all that well. And so in getting a new computer, that requires me to re-download certain apps or programs, remember all the passwords that I have for various websites, and yes, get the audio and video hookup correct once again. I thought I had the audio right, but there was one little thing that needed to be tweaked. But yes, here we are now. New computer, because of my... Dumbass thinking it was a funny idea to broadcast in the middle of Congress. It would have been a great idea had I not dropped said computer, but dropping the computer renders that as a just a far-fetched hypothetical. Well, I like your story, but what really happened is the government caught wind of you storming the Capitol, or at least thinking about storming the Capitol, and they sent somebody out there to smash your computer as punishment for that. They said, you already did this once on January 6, 2021. We can't have this happen again during South by Southwest. So uh, they sent a goon out there to uh, take care of your computer. That's the real story, if I'm not mistaken. Joey, I wish I could blame it on the weed. Sadly, it's not the weed's fault. It is my own dumbass outside the box thinking fault. Mm. I would ask if you were watching the hub, but we know you don't do that. So, Nope. Was it- was it during a show when he dropped it? That was last week. I don't know why I can't remember. Yeah, it was. It was as we were talking to Justin Wells last Monday, which, by the way, we'll be speaking with him again here in the next 15 minutes. I'm just now remembering. Mm. I confirmed that earlier. So the everything that you texted me, yes, we'll get to some of that. And then we'll also be talking to Justin about some of it, too. There but I know it was in the middle of talking to Justin. He thought that I had gotten hit by a car on Congress for the 10 minutes until I was able to get back on my phone. That was probably a terrifying 10 minutes or an exhilarating 10 minutes. Depends on how Justin feels about you. I'm not sure. It depends on the week. I think that he was, he was concerned because he's just a good human. He was concerned that another human 
got horribly injured, even if they were doing something to stupidly put themselves at risk. There you go. All right, Justin will join us here momentarily. Of course, Texas spring football gets started tomorrow. We'll talk to Justin about that. We'll get some updates on the recruiting trail. We might ask him a question or two about Texas hoops as well. Hey, speaking of, I am recording an interview with Chris Del Conte here in uh, just a little bit more than an hour or so. So Sick. my question for you and the people, and I'll ask Justin this one too, is if you could ask Chris Del Conte one thing right now, what would it be? Uh, I've got why are the jerseys? I want to talk about, but I'm always open to ideas that may be better than my own. Why are the jerseys different shades of orange? And not, no, I'm not doing that. I'll joke with him about it, but I will not ask that of Chris Del Conte. He has to face that question far too often. Why is the music the way that it is at all of our sporting events? Play songs that I like instead of songs that other people like. That's actually, even though you're joking, there is an idea there because the music has been blaring these last few seasons. And I'm not just saying that as somebody who is going middle-aged to old and screaming at the clouds to make less noise. Like it is entirely too loud to where it is deafening. So maybe I'll ask them if they've had a conversation about lowering the volume a couple notches. Um, is David Pierce going to survive this season? Hmm. I will probably end that conversation right then and there. Uh, yep. Not going to do that one. I thought about asking something to the effect of, what would you consider to be overachieving for the Texas men's basketball in this tourney? Mm -hmm. But he's also really good at eluding questions like that that really put him on the spot, so that might just be a waste of time. Yeah, I like that. All right, we'll ask the people. The code of text line, 512-222-9328. If you're watching on YouTube, the live chat is always open. Hit us up if you could ask CDC one question. What would you ask? I'll think of something more serious over the course of the show. Although, yeah, I wish he'd let me have the aux. I'm getting tired of DJ Mel and that bullshit at the basketball games. I'm oh, switching things know what up. You're talking about, mm, it's probably for the best. <laughs> All right, uh, Texas basketball, Trey. Both brackets came out yesterday. Congrats to the Texas women. We'll spend a little more time talking about the men today, but the Texas women. A number one seed, a bit of a pleasant surprise. The Longhorn women taking home the fourth number one seed in the NCAA women's tournament. They are the one seed in the Portland four region, which that doesn't make sense, but they don't do the directional bit like the men's do. They've got two regionals that'll be played in Albany, two regionals that'll be played in Portland. So if the Longhorns win their first two games at Moody Center this weekend and they advance to the Sweet 16, they will be headed to Portland to try to win a couple of games to make it to the Final Four. Uh, hell of a year for Vic Schaefer. They, of course, won the Big 12 tournament last week in rousing fashion, and they get rewarded with uh, a number one seed. So congrats to the Texas women, and hopefully – Vic Schaefer can't get over the hump. He's been to two Elite Eights at Texas. He has yet to make a Final Four here. It's been two decades since the Texas women have made a Final Four. Trey, that's the hope, is that the Longhorns can uh, take care of business and find their way as one of the last four teams remaining when this thing is all said and done. Yeah, being a one seed is a great position to be in. I feel like the women's side of the sport, since they did get the March Madness moniker finally, which was a long time coming, and the NCAA refused to do for whatever reason for all these years, up until either last year or this year, I feel like we should streamline some of the other uh, linguistics surrounding the tournament. So we're not naming cities necessarily, but we are going west, east, midwest, southeast, whatever, whatever the other, uh, whatever the other two are there. But instead, I guess in the meantime, we're going with the Portland Four. It sounds like a a group of hooligans who are looking to shut down a city block in Oregon. Yeah, or just like an orgy group or something. Like Dirty Mike and the boys, they just call oh. themselves the Portland Four now, and they go into, like, unlocked cars and just get it on, you know? And I don't doubt for one second that there are multiple hobo groups in Portland that do that sort of thing. Yeah, I'm with you. And it's weird that they have two regionals in one city and two in another. It also feels kind of disrespectful to the ladies, right? Like two of the oh, regional spots. That. What? Yeah, so there's Albany 1 and Albany 2. So you'll have, what, 
eight of the Sweet 16 playing in Albany, New York. Fun place to be, I'm sure. Huh. And then you've got Portland three and Portland four. So the other eight teams, which is where Texas would be if they get past this first weekend, will be playing in Portland. So I don't know. Interesting thing there. I'm assuming that is a an attendance thing, like an attempt to boost attendance Gotta before be. you actually get to the final four, but it also does seem like a little bit of a stretch too. Like what about the possibility, and you can take a cue from Texas basketball, going to the Moody Center and lowering the total number of seats. You don't always necessarily need to be playing in a place that has fifteen to 16,000 seats. Sometimes that can be too many. You can find a spot that caters to more in that eight to 10,000 range and the people who are paying for tickets are guaranteed better seats as a result, and and you make the ticket a, a hotter item, I guess, then maybe that's the best path forward. But they're trying mm-hmm. things right now. I don't fault them for that necessarily. I just think that if they're playing at the – is it the Rose Garden? Is that where the Blazers play? I think uh, it's changed. It's the same building, but Moda Center now maybe. Okay. So if they're playing it at that arena, that's yeah. just too many seats for – uh, women's regionals, even if you are combining regionals now. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to think they could sell. I assume it's all one ticket. You get to watch like all the games with just one ticket, so maybe people will stay after their team plays and they'll watch the other teams. But I think your hunch is right. It's all attendance-based. I mean, that's why like the first two rounds are at home gyms, right? The Texas women will play the round of 64 and assuming a round of 32 game here in Austin, the top four seeds in each region get to host the first two games. So uh, that's, you know, they, they can't sell out regional sites like the men's tournament can, but still an exciting women's tournament. I mean, Caitlin Clark, she's bigger than any player in men's college basketball right now. Like people are going to be locked into her. Obviously, Texas fans are going to be locked into the Longhorns to see if they can get to Cleveland here in a few weeks and uh, plenty of storylines for the women. But uh, yeah, there's a notable difference, a couple of notable differences between the women's tourney and the men's tourney for sure talked about the women pleasant surprise that they got a one seed for the men pleasant surprise that they got a seven seed i think most longhorn fans were expecting an eight or a nine and the longhorns got a little bump they are the seven seed in the midwest region and their opponent is well we don't know good luck finding true tv between now and tomorrow night to uh, uh shit i hadn't the, seen that yet the worst part of the freaking tournament is trying to remember what channel true TV is. And yeah, these play in games actually affect Texas this time because yeah, the Longhorns will get the winner of Virginia and Colorado state, which is uh, one of the two play in games tomorrow. Texas will play its first tourney game Thursday afternoon. I think five fifty central time. So you'll be able to watch TSU all day on Thursday. And then boom, right after the, uh, right after us, the game will come on. So it's Virginia or Colorado State in round one, Trey, and then a potential matchup against Rick Barnes and Tennessee. The Volunteers, the two seed in the Midwest region. They got to get by St. Peter's. St. Peter's is a 15 seed, made it to the Elite Eight three years ago. So maybe we shouldn't chalk up an easy Tennessee win. But uh, your thoughts on the potential two opening weekend games for this Texas basketball team? Makes me a little bit nervous having this team go up against a squad that is playing in that play-in game because we've seen examples from the past where this play-in game can serve as a sort of vault and helping whichever team wins to gain some momentum and actually make it through that next round, if not making it past the first weekend altogether. But then again, I think if Texas is able to play its game, assuming that Dylan DeSue is healthy, then I feel pretty confident about them winning on Thursday. And I know a lot of people are penciling Texas in to beat Tennessee and Rick Barnes and postseason Rick Barnes in the round of 32. To be honest, I don't know enough enough about this Tennessee team, but if they're good down low, that's going to be a problem for this Texas basketball team. Whoever they end up losing to will likely have a pretty solid post presence down low, if not a couple of guys who are are pretty good at that. Yeah, you brought up the first four thought and i've got a number to back up your point the first four has been in existence for 12 years in 11 of those 12 years a team that won their first four game went on to win a game in the round of 64 so that is a scary thought now you've got three other first four games 
Uh, two of them involve 16 seeds. Pretty rare that you see a 16 seed go on to beat a one seed after winning the play in. Although that did happen last year with Fairley Dickinson. They were a play in team and then they beat Purdue in a 16 1 upset last year. But yeah, more often than not, 11 out of 12 times, a team that has won a play in game has gone on to win an actual game in the NCAA tournament. So I'll tell you what, Trey, I'm not going to pick against Texas for round one in my bracket. Hold on a second. Did you just say 11 out of 12? Yep. 11 out of 12. Holy shit. Yeah. So literally my strategy every year is pick both play in teams because one of them is going to win almost guaranteed. So Florida is the other seven seed that is going to play the winner of what is it? Boise state and Colorado. Mm. So I guess, you know, the Texas game will be first. If Texas wins, put a shit ton of money on the other play in game on Friday. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, that's usually my strategy when filling out a bracket is picking both of the play-in teams because, once again, it's it's damn near 100% that at least one of them finds their way into the round of 32. That is wild. I'm a little bit surprised that they have the Colorado State-Virginia winner playing two days later. Like, you think that you could schedule that to where they would get maybe an extra day considering the travel that's required and, and get settled and get a tiny bit of rest before playing that round of 64 game. But clearly the NCAA is not going to be doing the play in teams any favors. I mean, they're in that play in game for a reason. So why would you uh, do them even one solid after they win that first round game? Yeah, it's all for TV, right? I mean, they've got two play in games tomorrow. The two winners will play on Thursday and then they've got the other two play in games on Wednesday and the winners of those games will play on Friday. So, yeah, you would think it's an advantage for Texas, right? Going up against a team that already has to play a game, and it's a tough game against a seemingly evenly matched team. It's a tournament game. Those take a lot out of you. And, of course, you talked about the travel. Like, Texas is in Charlotte. The playing games are in Dayton, so you're not going super far across the country, but still you're having to get on a plane and travel, and you're playing another tournament game against a good team just a couple of days later. So, yeah, you know, on paper, when you try to rationalize things, it would feel like Texas and Florida would have the advantage. But once again, I, they, it's a vault. That's the word you used. I'll, I'll use springboard. It somehow, some way has been a vault slash springboard for uh, these first four teams. So, uh Potential scary thought for Texas there, but I like how the Longhorns match up against either of these two teams. I'd prefer to go up against Virginia. Like I know Virginia has a national championship winning head coach in Tony Bennett. Uh, I know how good they are defensively. I know they're battle tested coming out of the ACC. I just don't think they're as good as Colorado State. I just think Colorado State's a better team. So I think the better matchup and the easier opponent is Virginia. Uh, but I would still pick Texas to beat Colorado State if that ultimately is what uh, what we get on Thursday night. Okay. I see our man in the waiting room. Looks like he's ready to go. Our favorite segment of the week. We go now to the unsponsored YouTube guest line. We got to work on that mm -hmm. to bring on our man, Justin Wells of Inside Texas, InsideTexas.com, and, of course, the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. Joining us for his weekly spot, Jay Wells. What's up, brother? Gentlemen, always a pleasure. There's a lot going on this week, man. There's, yes, a there lot, there's a lot to dive into today, man. I don't even know where to get started. Where do you want to start? Uh, you know, it's 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 your it's your it's your world. I'm just paying the rent. So you just throw them at me and I'll I'll do my best to to take some good cuts. We got basketball. We've got recruiting. We got football. Spring ball starts tomorrow morning. Um, there's a lot on the docket. What are you thinking? Let's start with the basketball team since that's what we were just discussing. Texas is a seven seed. They've got to wait to find out who their opponent is until tomorrow night. It's going to be Virginia or Colorado State with a possible rematch with Rick Barnes and Tennessee looming in round two, assuming both of those teams, both UTs, take care of business. Uh, what did you think about where this Longhorn basketball team is slotted and what do you think uh, a realistic uh, ceiling is for them right now? I know we talked about this a couple weeks ago. It feels like winning a game would be a, a decent year for this team. What would you consider to be a good year for Rodney Terry and crew? Hey, if they win one game in this tournament, I'll consider it pretty good. If they get to the Sweet 16, that's a success, guys, especially with this roster. And with the way that going through the Big 12 they had to with the non-conference, just kind of the ebb and flows of the season, 
I think a Sweet 16, if these guys are able to make it, that that's a success. And that's coming off an Elite Eight where you were virtually 10 minutes from a Final Four last year. That being said, I was a little surprised <laughs> by that seven seed. I I was especially the way they 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 bowed out early in the Big 12 tournament. I just thought, okay, this is a nine or a ten, maybe a play in. This is going to be this will be a little more difficult. Now they get to play the winner of a play in, and it sets up a very very juicy potential second round matchup with Rick Barnes and the Tennessee Vols. And so I, I you know what. <sighs> I don't really know what to expect, guys. I'm not going to pretend to know much about Virginia and Colorado State. I think Bennett is still the coach at Virginia, and I think he's one of the best in the country, bar none, uh, especially defensively. And, and their offense is deliberate, and you know they don't make mistakes. Now, granted, they don't score much, but they play really hard. But I just, I, I'm, I was surprised, guys. I did not see a seven seed coming. I think the committee really viewed the Big Twelve in very high esteem. In, in that regard, and not to mention they get a seven and then Oklahoma doesn't even make the tournament. And then you had some people griping about, well, you had the, the those those casual play, you know, tournament wins that 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 eliminate teams. Just but, well, you know what? It's been like that forever. Don't yeah. gripe about it now. I like that. It gives it gives those conferences meaning and, 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 and stuff to fight for. Like give them give them a shot at it. New Mexico. New Mexico might make a run, guys. OK, like it, it, I think the tournament's going to be a blast. Texas at number seven was a little surprising. Really not sure what to expect from Virginia or Colorado State. But I'm just I hope they get past round one to the round of 32 because I want to see a Tennessee Texas matchup. I think Rick Barnes deserves it. I think Texas fans deserve it. Uh, that guy should get a lot more credit than he than he has. And, and so, yeah, that's my basketball summation right now. There we go. Yeah, you always love going up against Rick Barnes in March. They don't call him regular season Rick for nothing, Jay Wells. And it's mm. five tournaments in a row where Rick Barnes has lost to a lower-seeded team. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that if we do get the UTVUT matchup in round two that you should bet the farm on the Longhorns. But uh, these are the types of games that we saw Barnes underachieve in Austin for a number of years in the tournament. He has continued that pattern of underachieving at Tennessee, so could be a uh, I don't know. Could Maybe be an that's easy what one. Barnes needs to get over the hump. Yeah, playing some old friends from Austin, Texas. Maybe that that's what gets Barnes to the Sweet Sixteen, or vice versa. Maybe Rodney Terry turns it on and wins a couple games, kind of out of nowhere, and and then they make it to the Sweet Sixteen. It's going to be interesting. If there's one place in the world I'd like to be today, that's Las Vegas. I've heard that place is unbelievable when it comes to the NCAA tournament. I'm going to admit this to you guys right now. I'm not doing a bracket this year. What? I've, I've decided I'm 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 not anti-bracket, but you're a communist. I can't pick winners, man. Oh. And if I go chalk, it's going to be nothing but 10 seeds in the Sweet 16. And so the truth is, I think Houston's the best team in the country. I think UConn could probably give them the best run. Now, what Houston did against Iowa State, man, that is yeah. not what you want to see going into the tournament. But I know what Kelvin Sampson has down there in H-Town, and I know how good they are. So I would probably pick Houston to win the title. I have a lot of family, a lot of friends that attended Houston, that go to Houston. I have a nephew that actually runs track at Houston. So I'm not going to do a bracket because I'm not throwing that mojo on my family. I'm not mm. doing it. That's, I have my reasons. Yeah, I, I don't like them, but hey, to each his own. We still love you, Justin. All right, I'm going to ask you as we shift over to football here, and I'm so happy that spring football is actually upon us, and I know you are too. I'm going to ask you to make a prediction. You're, you or somebody or you and somebody on InsideTexas.com is going to be writing a recap tomorrow from day one of spring practice. Multiple. Give me a, give, give me a couple of guys that you think will stand out. Like who – are you going to be writing about tomorrow from the first day of Texas spring ball? Because they turned that many heads. They impressed that many people. Woo. BK always bringing the questions. Um, that's a good question. I'm going to be looking right. I'm going to be looking at Cam Williams tomorrow or Tuesday. Yeah. Tomorrow for, for, for at right tackle. Texas wants him to take that spot. 
and and, and they have every intention of, of they're not going to give it to him. He's going to have to go take it. Still got to drop a little weight. Still has to get his protections down. Still gets gets beat by those speed rushers on the outside. But but Cam Williams is is the next guy up. And so I want to write about Cam. I want to see what he can do. Now, granted, these are half shell. They're not hitting. So the first few days is going to be just basically get knocking the rust off, going through the motions. I want to see what Cam Williams looks like coming into his third season on the offensive side. I want to see – I'm going to write about these receivers. I mean, they don't have a lot of size, but my goodness, they have a lot of speed. I mean, at every single spot, it's, it's no longer – it is the – that's the norm in Austin. I want to see that on the offensive side. On the defensive side, I want to see where Trey Moore is. Is he a jack behind Sorrell or is he on the other side? Is he playing some will in the dime? Like, we'd heard so much good stuff about Trey Moore. I want to see kind of how he acclimates to, to playing at this next level or higher level, rather, coming from UTSA. And Andrew Makuba, where's he going to be? Where's John A. Barron going to be? We know he's been working out at corner some. I don't think that's going to be his position in the fall. I think they just love to have his versatility and the ability that he can play corner. But they already have two really good ones in Terrence Brooks and Manny Muhammad. And I'm not in the I'm not entrusting Jalen Gilbo with the nickel role just yet. Now he he's flashed a little bit last year. He's done really well in winter conditioning, but Barron knows that spot. Barron and Michael Taft know star like the back of their hand. And so I'm curious how much Barron's going to be running at corner. Who's going to be backing up star? How much they know? I mean, goodness gracious, I can almost go through every position. There's a lot of stuff I want to see this week, guys. Mm. Justin, as far as the defensive line is concerned, Texas obviously has to replace a ton of talent and experience on the interior with Byron Murphy and Devondre Sweat. Now a little bit more than a month from – finding out who their NFL team is going to be. Who do you think is most up to task in proving that they deserve the most minutes on the inside uh, as we are about to embark on spring ball? The two big the two big guys you really want to assert themselves are Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton. Last year, they were the first guys off the bench. They, 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 they provided 20 to 25 reps a game, which is exactly what that Texas defensive front wants to do. They want to rotate guys. That way, Sweat and Murphy were only getting 25, 30 snaps a game. That 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 keeps them fresh, keeps them healthy, and it it, it provides a much better product in the fourth quarter. So I want to see Vernon Broughton and, and Alfred Collins step up and take those jobs. Tia Savea may have something to say about that. The Arizona transfer that followed Johnny Nansen's a guy that I think you're going to have to pay closer attention to. I think he's one that's. People, some people think, oh, he'll just be a backup. Well, he doesn't think like that. And he doesn't have the production in the last two years that thinks like that either. So that's another guy to step up. The one guy I think I would love to hear glowing remarks about is Sadir Mitchell. Yeah. You take one defensive tackle in that class. Granted, he's bigger than every other defensive tackle you could have taken in that class. You know, he, he, he could, uh, be disguised as a large human on the offensive line if he needed to be. He, he fits into that mold. But look, Sadir has every bit of upside you want at that position. He is large. He's in charge. When he is on, he is tough to block. And he's only he's going into his next his, his second year. And so for me, I think, you know, of being able to be on the field. So for me, I would love to hear Sadir Mitchell's name. If, if we're hearing about Sadir Mitchell – the defensive line issues, I think, will become less, less of a problem in 2024. I'm with it. Justin Wells of Inside Texas joining us here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. Jay Wells, what about the running back spot? You know, we got a glimpse of life after Jonathan Brooks at the end of the season. We saw C.J. Baxter. We saw Jaden Blue. Uh, Jarrett Gibson coming in, five-star freshman. Is that, an, is that an open competition? Is that, you know, C.J. Baxter started his freshman year as the starter? Is he the guy? Is that going to be open? What's What should we expect from uh, the running backs over the next month or so? Ultimately, this is where Tashar Choice is going to have to, to to do some work. You know, he inherited Rashawn Johnson and Bijan, and I think that was kind of an easier year. And then last year, you, you really saw him assert Jonathan Brooks. You know, he, he knew that they had something special there, and Brooks just took it and run. I mean, he became the home run guy. Yeah. You know, we, we, we thought they were going to lose all those all that home run ability. Jonathan Brooks said, no, nah, I got it. 
So who are you going to replace that with? Well, honestly, I think it's going to be by committee. But how's that going to be ordered? You know, C.J. Baxter was the starter going into week one last year. And I think ideally they would love for Baxter to step up because he's the big back. Yeah, I know Gibson's, you know, thicker than he was in year in the last couple of years. But but C.J. is your big Cedric Benson-esque type back who can run between the tackles, who can get to the outside, who can just do a lot of good stuff. That being said, Jaden Blue has made himself a has made himself a smack dab in the middle of this conversation simply because he's probably a top three fastest players in the program. And last year, when they put him on the field, he produced. There was no lagging. There was no setback. If anything, they might have gotten more playmaking ability out of Blue than they actually did Baxter. Now, granted, Baxter was injured a little bit off and on last year, but it's going to come in as a committee. I think Baxter is going to be the first guy that we see in, in the line for drills. And I think Blue is going to be second. And I think they're going to tell both of them, look, be Bijan and Rashawn. Make it work. You're both going to be needed. They're both going to be handed the ball a number of times. You know how much Sark really likes that thousand yard back to have in every class? I'm not sure they have one of those in this in this in this in this season. I think they have two guys that can get to 750, mm. which would be, you know, an aggregate aggregate and just as good because obviously you're keeping them fresh and you're keeping them healthy. And then you got Savion Red. Like they're gonna find a package of place for that guy. Now, he was listed at 240. And I swear, every year Red has been on this roster, he gets bigger. God. And we always say, well, maybe he's too big. Maybe he's not going to play as much. And we're wrong. <laughs> he winds up finding the field. Jared Gibson and Christian Clark are going to try to get a couple carries back there if they can. But this is C.J. Baxter and 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 John and, and uh, Jaden Blue's show. I think it's going to be a one-two punch. I think you're going to hear great things about both. One day, Baxter's going to be your better back. The next day, Blue is. I think Texas fans should just settle in right now on it's a dual committee. These are the two guys. It's going to be Blue and Baxter, Baxter and Blue, the killer bees. Just rely on those guys because at some point, they'll separate. Either yeah. Baxter will break out, Blue will break out. Something, something will separate to where one will get a few more carries than the other. But I got to tell you, I think Baxter is going to be the incumbent. I think they want him to jump up and take that job. But, you know, he, he's a big kid. At the same time, Jaden Blue can catch the ball out of the backfield. Jaden Blue in space is an absolute terror. And we know how much Sark puts an emphasis on speed on offense. Yeah, nobody should be surprised that these coaches want C.J. Baxter to be the dude. He started over Jonathan Brooks at the beginning of last season. He earned that starting spot in the fall camp over Brooks, mind you. I, yeah, I, look, you're you're the expert here. I'm, I'm just a guy who watched Brooks play the previous season and was uh, scratching my head that he wasn't getting more run. Right. So I completely understand your sources said that, but uh, yeah, that's it'll be interesting. I love that you guys did report yesterday. You just talked about this. Savion Red, 240 pounds. It's not like this dude is like 6'1 or 6'2. He's on the shorter side as well. Is he basically just gearing up for more of those short yardage packages like what we saw out of him last season? You know what? I, I think his body's predisposed to going in that direction. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he can help it. Now, yeah, I, I, I mean, extensive training and, and, you know, healthy eating and dieting and things of that sort could hold him back. But you know what? We said the same thing about red. I remember red, last year, first practice of spring camp, red was like number six or seven in that line, that drill line. And often that tells you where they are on the depth chart or the early depth chart rather. And so we thought, man, red's going to have to work his way back in this lineup. And he did. He, he actually slimmed down throughout the summer, got, got back and got back in a little bit of shape. And wind up having a, a nice package of plays because I'm gonna tell you something, nobody plays harder. Him or Trey Wisner, those are probably the two hardest players. I mean, though they're it's a hundred percent all the time. And I think that's why they love Savion because he is such a competitor. But uh, 240? I mean, I'll say this. I was at Under Armour uh, high school recruiting camp yesterday in Houston, and I met Brandon Jacobs. Remember the running back from the New York Giants? Yeah, sure. And you see him from a distance. And you're like, okay, that guy played in the NFL or somewhere in college, and he was probably a defensive lineman. I mean, he is massive. And then you meet, you go up to him, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is Brandon Jacob. 
This dude played running back. My God. You know, just massive. Yeah. I don't think Savion Red wants to go down that road <laughs> because he's not as big as Jacobs, but 240 at some point, some point you're going to have to put the coats down and the honey buns down and pick up some fruit, drink some more water, and get down to a nice slim trim 225. Yeah, that's why it was a bummer to read and hear just now that Cam Williams still has some d bad weight that he needs to take off. Like, now is the time for him to be completely locked in on that stuff. And if he's not, as we've talked about on the show in the past, there are other guys who are ready to jump up and take that starting right tackle opportunity. There are guys that watched Tavondre Sweat and Christian Jones last offseason who went through a, a full body transformation. And they're and they they're seeing how they did in the senior bowl. They saw how they did the combine. So they picked up where those left guys left off. If Cam Williams jumps on in that boat and does the same thing, I think Cam's your right tackle week one. If he doesn't, this line's gonna look different. You could look at Hayden Connor going out to right tackle, even though I don't like his arm length, which Cole Hudson would be, you know, perfect at left guard. You've also got Trevor Gooseby, who could be a future left tackle. He's the backup for Kelvin Banks. He's already flashed. He might be the best of that 23 group, could play some right tackle. And you got Brandon Baker, the five-star out of modern day, who has the most athletic upside of everyone. So if you're Cam Williams, just turn around and look over your shoulder because you got guys chomping at the bit. And if you don't get where flooding these guys need and want you to get, you're going to get left behind. Mm. J. Wells recruiting question. We asked you a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week, about DeCorian Moore, five-star receiver from Duncanville, the LSU commit. I saw earlier today on IT, you posted an update on Kalik Lockett, another five-star receiver in the state. Uh, how are you feeling about Texas being able to land one, perhaps both, of the two top receivers in the state of Texas for uh, the class of 2025? I feel good. I mean, I really do. And I, and I tell you that because – Texas isn't pushing hard on any of these guys. They're letting the product speak for itself. And, you know, Sark always plays the long game anyway. But give Chris Jackson a ton of credit. He's been able to, to really, you know, he's, he's working off the development of the last year of a lot of those receivers, especially the young guys, Jonte Cook, DeAndre Moore. We knew what Worthy and Mitchell had and Whittington had. Now, DeCorian Moore's recruitment, it doesn't start till November. It's fun to watch. going to be fun to watch him play. He's going to stay committed to LSU for, for a while, but that recruitment doesn't really kick off till November, and I love where Texas stands there. They're going to make a final push, and I, and, I, and I like their shot. Then you got Khalid Lockett, who, I mean, if I, turn, if I left the recorder on long enough, it, he, could, he could film a promo for the Texas wide receiver room. I mean, he essentially told me, who wouldn't want to be a part of this? And what's funny is I talked to a lot of the receivers yesterday that are Texas targets. Only Lockett knew the depth chart top to bottom. Lockett goes through each guy. He said, well, I, I know John Tay, we play with Texas Flex. Been watching DeAndre Moore. We know what Isaiah Bond can bring. He came from Alabama. Matthew Golden's a speed dude out of Houston. Lockett's doing his homework. Wow. And I, and I think that it's a twofold. I think Texas is doing a good job selling, and I think Lockett's buying. I really do. And so I love where Texas stands with those two guys. I love where they stand with Andrew Marsh, who might be the number three receiver in the state. I love where they stand with Marcus Harris, who's a top 10, top 15 national guy out of modern day. And so, you know, they're, they're recruiting guys in two different tiers. And I think if they can, I think the number's three, maybe four at that position in 2025, if they can get a couple of those top guys, a Marsh, a Marcus Harris, a Kalik Lockett, and then push for DeCorey and more late, Chris Jackson will have made his check for the 2025 <laughs> class. I love it. Justin, I do have uh, one more question for you. This is going to be another curveball, but you knock these curveballs out of the park. I am going to be interviewing Chris Del Conte here in less than an hour, a conversation that people can hear on these airwaves tomorrow at about 3.50. It serves as a perfect 20 minutes so I can go pick the kid up from school. Uh, if you could ask Chris Del Conte one thing, what would that be? Oh. Chris Del Conte, one question. Oh man. Oh man. I, I have like 10. Hmm. I have like 10 questions. He already answered the grass. When are we getting grass at DKR? I think he mentioned what 25 or 26 at the earliest, something like that. Yeah. That would probably be my first question. My next question would probably be, 
Yes, I've got it. Can you please talk to the playoff committee and tell them to stop? <laughs> Just pick a number. Yeah. And let's roll. Stop. Because I have a feeling by 2032, it's going to be a 64 team playoff. And it's going to be a disaster, just like basketball. I think I think the Big 12 commissioner had mentioned that like a week ago before the Big 12 tournament that he wouldn't mind a 76, 78 team uh, tournament in, in, in NCAA. This isn't a participation trophy thing, guys. Stop. Give everyone the parameters so they know what they need to do to win. They know what spot they need to get in so they can get in the playoff. If they're going to be in the hunt, if they're already in, what days they, you know, if I was Del Conte, I'd say, can you call somebody at the playoff committee? Just make a call, send an email, text message, hook them up with a DM, maybe Instagram story them, something, and say, stop, <laughs> pick a number, and let's roll with that number. Oh, it's too yeah. much, guys. We're expanding before we even started expanding, right? Like, we can't even and see they're gonna what's going to expand well. on that expanding. Yep. Uh Last thing for me, not really a question, but I would like for you to respond to a comment we got, Justin, from <laughs> Mike Torres. I always thought Jay Wells was black. What, uh, what say you on that one? Yeah, you know, I, I get that a lot. And my first comment is always the same. I apologize to disappoint you. <laughs> I, am, uh, I, I am a, I'm a white boy from East Texas. Uh, I'm a mutt. You know, I've got a lot of English, Dutch, Native American – you know, I'm 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 a I'm a <laughs> I'm a melting pot in and of itself. I am not black, but that's okay because I don't need to be. I just need to be Justin Wells because we're all brothers. We're all brothers and sisters from the Lord, and so we we just all come in different shapes, colors, and sizes. But sorry, Mike, to disappoint you. This must <laughs> be your first time to watching because I get that a lot from parents. I, it never ceases to. It's crazy when I get it from parents. Wow. And, and what's funny is these YouTube shows we've done over the last year or two and the interaction with you guys, more people are get, are noticing that. And, and I know, look, I'm sorry. I'm not Leonard Washington. I am not Dave Chappelle as much as I would want to be. <laughs> but I don't think you want Dave Chappelle covering the Longhorns recruiting anyway. So I think it's a win-win. Yeah. I love I that so. car. That was my Dave Chappelle uh, invitation <laughs> for you guys. Somebody tagged me this morning in a tweet. It was a it was a picture of a, a, a sonogram of a, of a baby, you know, kind of moving around, flopping around. Someone tags me and goes, is this what Eddie Murphy looked like on uh, Rick James's couch? Mm. <laughs> flopping around. Yep. It's like it always comes back to that. The Chappelle show was one of my favorite things of all time. I listen. The first two seasons are some of the best television you will ever see. I think those things will stand for a long time. They're just funny. I love when something happens with Chappelle, with Rick James, with Leonard Washington, any of those characters he played. They all they'll tag me and stuff just so I can see it. Honestly, that's part of the, that's the funnest one of the funnest parts of it. Yeah. All right, my my last question now. I'm going to ask it in the voice of Dave Chappelle, Justin. What are your expectations with whatever's happening at Texas Pro Day here in a couple of days, J Dub? Oh, oh. That was brutal. <laughs> um, oh. But you had the right tone. I know. Right tone. I, I've got to work on it a little bit. I've never tried it out loud before. So uh, Yeah, that, that might be something you try in front of the mirror when we do this <laughs> next time. Um, <laughs> the expectations are I want to see some of these younger guys, some of these less ballyhooed guys. I want to see Christian Jones assert a little bit. I want to see Ryan Watts climb a little bit. I'd love to see Jordan Washington or Jordan Whittington run. Yeah. I want to see him work out. I want to see him run. I want to see him go through some drills because is I think it, he gets, is his hamstring healthy enough. Hopefully, that's the plan. Mm -hmm. That's the plan. But you know, with with Whittington, sometimes it's it's hit and miss. And so I would love to see Jordan Whittington do enough to be in that conversation to get a phone call when the draft's over. I would love to see that. And so honestly, Texas Pro Days haven't been that big of a deal in the last eight to ten years. You know, they're sporadic draft picks from here and there. This year, it's actually going to be a party. 
There are going to be all 32 NFL teams there. You're going to have a ton of guys for Texas that are there. They also understand they're going to be back next year because they're going to be a ton of more guys going to the, to the combine from the Texas program and probably in 2026 as well when you start talking about Anthony Hill, Manny Muhammad, Derek Williams, Cedric Baxter. It's going to get ridiculous. What I want to see is I want to see Whittington throw it. I want to see him work out. I want to see him you know, get on that board, get in the NFL conversation, I want to see Ryan Watts climb up a little bit because I think he can run with his size at safety. You know, he he has a he had the cover skills, but you know, safety is going to be his NFL position. But ultimately, I, I'm I'm curious to see what the 40 times look like because for some reason the 40 times in the bubble seem to be a little bit better than the 40 times everywhere else. Mm-hmm. And it's like that at a lot of pro days. Don't get it twisted. Most there's a lot of home cooking when it comes to to when it, when they when they host these pro days, but I just think I, I I think it's cool that it's relevant. I think it's cool that Joe Cook has got to go there, and we've got we're going to get good content because this there, there's a lot to talk about there. I think the downside is going to be I don't expect some of these higher end guys to do a lot of work. I really don't. I don't think Byron Murphy and Adnan Mitchell and Xavier Worthy have anything to do or anything to prove. They'll just be there to, to cheer on the cheer on their, their teammates and their friends. But yeah, my expectations is it's it's an expectation now. Whereas eight or ten eight last eight or ten years, it really wasn't. Now Texas has a, a chance to, to. I mean, they've already got four or five guys that are going to go early in this draft. Why not add a couple more with a solid pro day? And another guy who gets to showcase his skills, even though he will not be in the draft until the following or after the following season, is Quinn Quinn Ewers. He's Mm -hmm. the guy who's going to be throwing the football to the wide receivers. You know how smart that is? You know how smart Sark's like, you know what? I'm going to give you a taste. It's it's like he's like the corner pusher to the NFL guys. I'm going to give you a little taste of what you're going to come back to look at next year. Because Quinn Ewers is throwing the ball phenomenally. I can't wait to see what he looks like in the spring. Him and Arch – Everything we hoped would happen with those two quarterbacks pushing each other, getting closer, learning the playbook, relying on each other has happened. And that in and of itself is, I think, the foundation for Sark's success now and in the future. Great news. Great news. Y'all make sure to follow Justin on Twitter at JustinWells2424. Check out Inside Texas and InsideTexas.com. And, of course, the Inside Texas football YouTube channel as well. Jay Wells, it's our favorite part of the week, brother. Love you and uh, look forward to talking next week. Gentlemen, always a pleasure and nothing but love. Thank you, Jay. Yes, sir. Justin Wells, every Monday around 12, 15, 12, 30, right here on Trey and BK. Good stuff as always. And good call. Quinn Ewers will be uh, the quarterback for the pro day tomorrow. So a little audition for him as uh, he enters what is likely and hopefully his final year as a college quarterback in Austin. All right, quick sponsor reads, AV Consultations, 512-255-8678. If you want the home TV setup of your dreams, if you want multiple screens on a wall like I have, if you want a home theater room, if you want a patio TV setup, whatever, AV Consultations can get it all done for you. They're the best in the business, and they've been in business since 1988. Just give them a call, 512-255-8678. Altstad beer, the best beer in the world. Had a few Altstads yesterday on St. Paddy's Day. Hopefully you did too. Whatever the occasion, your good times are made better with the greatness of Altstad beer. No impurities, no regrets. Trey, any uh, sentiment for our friends at Big Hat? Do you have your script? I can pull it up pretty quickly here by going to BigHatSpirits.com. They did not create the cocktail in the can, but what they've done is made it better than anybody. They do that with a variety of flavors and real ingredients while minimizing the bullshit. That means real alcohol, real kombucha, and every cocktail in a can while also having no added sugars. They're all gluten-free as well. They are uh, no syrup, non-gluten, non-GMO, BPA-free, 100% natural, real spirits with flavors like ranch water, jalapeno ranch water, the margarita, prickly pear paloma that blackberry smoke the texas mule and yes for you non-alcohol fans the margarita mocktail that bucky talks about in the morning go to bighatspirits.com to find out more info you can also check out all the legends that they are uh, identifying on their cans and maybe most importantly because right now you're probably pretty curious where can i get these big hat spirits these cocktails in a can Uh, Go to the top of the webpage, scroll down just a little bit. You'll see a map of Central Texas. On that map, a bunch of big hat logos. Click that logo that's closest to you, and you will find 
the place where you can easiest get or uh, get easiest. Wow, I just had a stroke there. Where you can get Big Hat Spirits, that cocktail in a can. Yes, indeed. Shout out to Big Hat and also uh, very abbreviated where are we at in society, but uh, not abbreviated word from our great friends over at Pest Wrangler. Hey, it's Steve from Pest Wranglers, and I don't know of a single mosquito that owns a home with a backyard, but they sure like to hang out in your yard and make you miserable. Pest Wranglers can fix that for you. Our mosquito treatments are designed to kill adult mosquitoes as well as keep mosquito larvae from developing for up to three weeks. Use us all summer or just once before that big party. No contract, no hassles, no blood-sucking mosquitoes. Check out our reviews and see what others are saying about Pest Wranglers. Pest Wranglers, effective, reliable, affordable. Online at PestWranglers.com. Where are we at in society today? Right, it is your regular look at stories that show we as a people are headed in the wrong direction. Very occasionally, I will bring you a story that provides a sense of optimism. It has us all saying to ourselves, hey, maybe we as a people are starting to figure something out. Sadly, today is not that day. Gosh, we're right at one o'clock right now. So I think I'm just going to give you people a preview of what's coming up on tomorrow's Where We At in Society because it's been about a week since I've had access to the stories that I've been bookmarking and clicking and emailing myself links of, and there are a lot mm-hmm. new stories that should have us more concerned about air travel. PK, I know you are taking a trip to Vegas here in a couple of days. Be wary, my friend, because we have more planes that are having parts fly off, forcing emergency landings. We have 50 people being injured on another flight thanks to a strong movement on a Boeing airplane. And over in Asia, a plane veering off the flight path after both pilots fell asleep just before takeoff. No disrespect. So those three stories coming up tomorrow on Where Are We At in Society. Oh, Those are all coming on one day? All on one day. So we may need to carve out a few extra minutes for tomorrow's Where Are We At. I don't know if I want to. I mean, I do want to, but you're right. I'm getting on a plane on Wednesday. I don't know if I want to hear these a day before I fly somewhere. Not good. Oh, my God. A large movement? What does that even mean? I don't. I know what a large bowel movement is. I don't know what a large movement on an airplane is. All right. We've heard emergency landings from bowel movements in the not too recent past, but ah, uh, I guess that cool. means that the plane probably dropped a significant distance, causing people to fly all over the cockpit mm. and end up in their neighbor's lap or maybe a row or two behind them. So yeah, we'll we'll find out the details tomorrow. I'm looking forward to this actually. I mean, as terrifying as it is, just based on my timeline this week, but uh, it's been a while since we've had good airplane stories, and those always make for great content. And I get to recycle some of the great headlines and stories you find in the morning with Bucky, and he always gets a kick out of them too. So this uh, this will make for some great stuff. And God, I. You know, I've had some crazy flight stories. I think I told you the story one time where I was on on a plane and the woman in front of me was basically having a panic attack. And it was a grandmother. She was with her grandchild and she was absolutely losing it to the point where we were basically consoling her for the entirety of the flight. And there was a, a woman servant like hugging her the entire time. A woman servant? Yeah, I don't know. Bucky calls it. Huh? Like a geisha? <laughs> no, I didn't see if the feet were binded, but no, it's no. Bucky calls the male flight attendants manservants. I wasn't sure if that applied to the ladies. Oh, you mean the uh, the cocktail waitress in the sky? I got gotcha. you. Yes, or the stewardess, or the flight attendants, or the cocktail waitress, or the female servant. I don't know what I'm supposed to call them these days. There, there's no universal word for what they do, but. That's that's the craziest thing, which I feel like it's crazier than a lot of people ever experience on a flight, but I haven't had an emergency landing or anything, knock on wood. Yeah, this is a horrible situation. I guess I'm sorry to be sharing it, but it's my worst experience on an airplane, so it unfortunately is what it is. I was going to Hawaii with a friend and... It was mid-flight between San Francisco and Maui, and we were literally halfway through this flight. So we're halfway, 
We're, we're no no closer to one than the other. Somebody suffered a massive heart attack on the flight. Mm. And we're over the water too. So there's there's nowhere we can emergency land. So we had wow. to get all the way to Maui first. And then this person was obviously um taken off the plane. They I don't I don't know whatever happened to the person. It was it was awful. Like I was so like I was so sad. Like the family members that were with him, they were obviously crying as you would expect somebody to do so when something so traumatic happens and you just felt terrible for the family, but it was a helpless situation. Oh, Other than the medical that. professionals who were on board who could try to help tr- stabilize this person, like it was just like basically having to sit through the the next two hours of this flight to do anything about it. Probably the longest two hours of your life. Dude, it was a it was a long two hours for me. I can only imagine how long that two hours was for his family, for the uh, people that he was with. They have CPR and anything? Like was it anyone? He like he did get wheeled out and there there was a mask over his face. God. I don't know how you handle that situation if the person actually dies on the flight. Like you make it seem like they're still alive as to not create more trauma for anybody else who is on that flight and who is uh, a passive observer of everything that's going on. Do you make it seem like that person is still alive, even if they've deceased or the hope is, is that he was actually still around and they were able to stabilize him. And yeah. he was, uh, his life was saved once he actually got to a, a, a hospital or a medical facility. No update. I got, I don't know how you'd get in touch with everybody who was on that flight. And maybe it's, you know, no update because the news was bad kind of thing, but God, I, I would have really wanted to know that would have been like affecting my whole trip. Like, did this guy make it or not? Yeah. I, it definitely, cro- it still crosses my mind, but it's like, where, where do you even begin trying to figure out information like that? Yeah. Cause yeah, there's medical sure. privacy that comes into play too. So it's not like I could call United and say, Hey, what happened to the guy who had a heart attack on my flight? Yeah, yeah. Call him today. It was like four years ago. I'd like to know, uh, like which which guy, which time? It was like twelve or thirteen years oh, ago. Yeah, hey, back in the uh, the the early 2010s, there was a guy that had a heart attack on a flight from SFO to Maui. Uh, do we know if he made it through that? <laughs> uh, he did, but COVID got him a few years later. That's uh, that's the word on the street. Yeah, tough. All right, I see the fellas. Oh. Quick story. Anyway, Cooter says an American Airlines flight he was on two weeks ago, the door handle fell off of the door that closes the cabin. It just fell the fuck off. Hmm. That, what, what do you do? If to land the flight, how do you get off? Well, how do you get off the plane? Hmm. Hmm. Look who it is. Back from his trip to Michigan where he was filming Michigan practice in advance of Texas, Michigan next year. <laughs> the great Chip Brown, Chip and Zay. Gentlemen, what's going on? Drove right by the big house this morning. There we go. And got on a flight at 6.15. Yeah. And made it without any of the drama that you fellas were just talking about. No door handles fell off, no heart attacks, not even a crying kid. Wow. I woke myself up snoring. Full it's uh always, full, it's always full bad. flight. Was it full flight, or did you That's have like cool. a okay? I was about to say you hit the jackpot if you had all that stuff plus like a roadie yourself or something like that. Had that on the way out, not on the way to Austin. Chip was the airport a shit show with all the people leaving town from South by Southwest. Yes. Yeah. And, and it was horrible going out last week. Like you go to the remote parking spots and they're like, do you have a reservation? I'm like, no, they're like, well, you can't park here. <laughs> I'm like, I need a reservation to go to fast park and relax. I'm not very relaxed right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm driving all over the I had to park at the airport. I had to pay the ooh, you know, the gunpoint prices. Hmm. Oh yeah. But that's on me. I didn't realize when you go to the airport during spring break, you gotta have reservations Jeez. at the parking spot. They wanted they wanted me to pay $21 a day. I was like, yeah, that's not happening. 
I'll park my car on the side of 183 before I pay $21 a day. I'll take my chances in the damn shoulder of the highway. See if anyone just blows blows up my car while I'm gone. God. Man. That airport is in desperate need of expansion. We we do always reserve at park and zoom, but that's because we had that one situation that you did where we were completely shit out of luck and had to pay an arm and a leg at parking closer to the airport. But if you ever take a ride share from that airport, just be ready because they've moved where ride shares can pick you up now to where it's, it's not a mile walk. It feels like it though. If you've got a bunch of luggage with you, like you've got to go into the parking garage and it's a pretty significant walk to actually yeah. get there. I know and where you're, it's just a complete shit show when you do get there. It's just a couple different lines of ride shares. So good luck finding the car that's supposed to be picking you up. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's become a, it's become just a mess. It's Hartsfield, mini Hartsfield. Mm. All right. Last thing, Trey, I'm asking this on your behalf, even though you didn't ask me to ask this. Uh, Trey is about to speak with Chris Del Conte mm. on, yeah. an inter- on an All interview right. that will air tomorrow afternoon right here on TSU. Let's go. Uh, if you guys got to ask Chris Del Conte any question, what question would you ask him? Hmm. Mm. Bring back the jetpack, dude. We need him <laughs> back. Going to the SEC. Bring- <laughs> Let's get the jetpack, dude. Let's have tryouts and have somebody that's actually capable of doing it to where they're not dying or flying in the stands, something like that. It could work. It just has to be done well. It could oh. work. You know, he went to UC Santa Barbara. And that's like the prettiest campus I've ever seen. Yeah, even their city college is a beautiful campus. I mean, the guy was a high jumper. I don't think he was married in college. So maybe, you know, how much were you pulling? (laughs) (laughs) Fuck. What? That will that will help. CDC, yeah. how much ass were you pulling at UC Santa Barbara as a track star? First student question. athlete at UC Santa Barbara, for God's sake. <laughs> First question, Trey, right off the bat. Yeah. Grew up in a children's home in New Mexico. You don't think he was overjoyed to get some freedom and woohoo? Mm. How about I combine the two questions? You were a track star at UC Santa Barbara. Did you ever pick up any chicks that had jetpacks? <laughs> Uh, okay okay here's one be honest what did you think from your perch at tcu when old um what did he asperger's patterson pulled out the jetpack man yeah (laughs) what was your initial reaction No, this is a real one. No, no bullshit. Ask him when the TJ Ford statue is being built outside the movie center. You know what? I am going to ask that. I'm going to ask that. Ask him when the Connor Lambert statue is coming. Too. <laughs> my right. kid, my kids are signed up. We're we're going through the process of signing our kids up for uh, summer camps right now, and my kids. I think it's two weeks out of the summer are going to be at the Brandy Perryman shooting camp. Yes. In Cedar Park. I'm so excited. I'm like, you guys don't realize how good a shooters you're about to be. Yo, that is a rite of passage for an Austin area kid. If you go to Brandy Perryman camp, yo, you're there, man. Now, Brandy's ganged a few LBs. Don't let, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. He's definitely not that same playing weight that he was under Penders. But when it comes to land and fly, oh, man, one of the best. That's his kid, Gavin, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, man. Let's go. Awesome. Maybe uh, Gavin and some other Texas players will be helping out. How far are you taking Texas in your bracket? You're asking CDC that? Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> What's that? That's him. Yeah, that's another good one. Yeah, he'll say, and then and then you can, and then he'll say, "Hey, the women, <laughs> <laughs> the women are looking good." Yeah, I'm taking the women. Oh, oh man, 
Goodness. All right, fellas. Chip, great to have you back. Zay, great job at Crown and Anchor yesterday. And we will uh, see you all tomorrow. Have a great show. All right, fellas. All right, have fun with CDC. Thanks, guys. Hey, in the immortal words of Judy Brown, happiness is a choice. We're happy to spend some time with us, Chip and Zay. It's March Madness Monday, Zay. I mean, people are tuning in from all over the world to hear what you have to say about March Madness Monday. And unlike Oklahoma, both the Texas men's and women's team are safely in the NCAA tournament. The Texas men are a seven seed. And will uh, they get a mystery guest. They get the winner of a play-in game between my son's Colorado State Rams. See that towel right up there? There we go. And Caden Shedrick's former team, the UVA Cavaliers. Zay. We got a lot to we got a lot to catch up on. Of course, spring football starts tomorrow. We will get yes, sir. In, but your thoughts on March Madness Monday. Well, first off, welcome back, man. Glad to have you, you back. Glad that you're safe and sound. And yeah, great week. One of my favorite weeks in all of sports. Every year you wait for this time and see which team could hoist that natty in 2024. But yeah, as usual, my bracket, no confidence in it. Went through it, finished it this morning. I'm not one of those guys that goes back and makes a lot of changes before, you know, Thursday. I kind of like to be set in stone and I feel good, but I don't feel good. And if you're the Texas Longhorns, hey, you got to feel pretty good being in the Midwest division and you know, it's it's doable. It's doable. You know, you talk about Virginia, you talk about Colorado State. That's going to be a hell of a game tomorrow at 8 p.m. Obviously, all Texas fans should tune in to that. But, yeah, both of those teams got some really good players that could hurt Texas, but Texas has some advantages against both of those teams. And you think about the Horns, where they sit at the seventh spot, and you think about teams that didn't get in, I mean, it says a lot that a road winning record in the Big 12 and think about all the close games that they had. Louisville, last second shot. Cincinnati, last second shot. Baylor, last second shot. <laughs> like the Horns, man, they better take this in and understand how close they were to being the if team. Carol like Smith would say, living on the edge. Yeah, living on the edge. Damn right. So I like where they're at. I mean, the committee's petty. Like, if you don't think the committee's petty, if you don't think this stuff's strategic, I mean, going to Oklahoma, I, I told you with Texas when Dylan DeSue got hurt in that Baylor game, if things would have went completely downhill and Texas loses out, they would have been just like Oklahoma, a team that doesn't have their best player and JV on McCollum that might be right there on the bubble. But the committee's going to look at that and say, okay, are we going to put a team that – they might be deserving, but their best players out, so they're not going to put out a good product. Or we got North Carolina, who actually stole a bid this year by winning the ACC tournament. They have to be in. That's just the rules. Like that was Texas, like you said, Aerosmith right there, living on the edge. So yeah, man. I mean, Porter Mosier has missed the NCAA tournament three straight years. Hmm. He is, he's, he's in asbestos underwear right yeah. now. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. So, and yeah, Kansas, Texas. Kansas got beat by Cincinnati by 20? Jayhawks? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Big 12 tournament? Yeah. I mean, no Kevin McCullough, no Hunter Dickerson. So, how healthy are they? Like, I got them losing first round against Stanford. That's easy. 413, Sanford, Sanford physical, man. They got big African brother down at the center. I want uh, you know how uh, I feel. Uh, hey, you know how I feel about the motherland brothers. Hey, is the connoisseur <laughs> of big African brothers. Yo, find them. Rodney Terry, once the season's over with, fly to Africa, 
head to the Congo. Yeah, hit up your boy Royal Ivy. That's coaching the African team in the Olympics. Let, ask him, yo, you the plug, Royal. Let me know. You got a plug who's over there. Yeah, I just give me somebody over six ten. We'll work with him. Coach, he don't speak no English. It's okay. We'll work with him. Coach. He needs new pair of shoes. Okay, we'll get it for him. <laughs> you know, I need them brothers that be playing barefoot. Them rough brothers that come over to the states and will take everything in because they just happy to be there. So they gonna give you everything they got. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, Kansas, I definitely got them getting upset. But back to Texas, you get a good draw. You get a real good draw. Like Tennessee getting blown out by Mississippi State. We know Ricky. Ricky, this time of the year, as you say all the time, Chip, he tightens up. He, he tightens up like a Chinese food takeout bag. He tightens up. So, hey, I like them chances. Now, again, Colorado State, Isaiah Stevens, he ain't no punk. You know what I'm saying? Virginia, Reese Bickman, he ain't no punk. They got that shooter, Isaac McKinley, that dude, 44% from the three-point line. Like that's gonna. I hope that's a three-overtime game tomorrow. Yeah. That's what Texas needs. I, you that's need a three-overtime slobber knocker, guys diving on the floor, guys diving in the stands, just hair pulling, all types of stuff. You need oh, that yeah. type of game. Those dudes need to be exhausted after they have that trip from Dayton to Charlotte for that Paramedics. game. Paramedics get called in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you need all that. You know what I'm saying? So Texas is in a good spot. Like, again, you move on to the Sweet 16. Somehow you finesse your way against Rick Barnes and the Volunteers. Creighton? Hey, I like Creighton, but they're beatable. You're right. in the same region as Purdue. We saw Purdue lose to Wisconsin. Like, their guard, Braden Smith, the point guard, he a little gimpy. He ain't 100%. He needs this week from losing in the Big Ten tournament and, you know, now playing at that number one seed that they got. Like, they're beatable. Dylan DeSue, Zach Eady, you bring Zach Eady outside the paint, you don't want them problems. He does not want them problems. So this is the weakest region in the tournament. And, I don't, again, the committee's petty. It makes no sense whatsoever that Iowa State is in that number two spot in the East with UConn and That's Auburn. It's nuts. That bracket is ridiculous. You got the Big 12 Conference Tournament Champion. You got the SEC Tournament Champion. And there's another Conference Tournament Champion in there. Yeah, Big UConn. 10. You said Big 10? Yeah, and Big 10. Yeah, Big 10, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, just, I don't know what they were doing. Like, the, they said that Iowa State's schedule was so weak in the non conference that they're getting penalized now opposed to North Carolina getting that last number one spot, which North Carolina, they play Kentucky and they always play those big games and stuff, but you lose to a team in the S or excuse me, the ACC championship that wasn't even supposed to make the tournament at all. Like North Carolina state needed that ACC championship tournament win to even make it, which Texas tech look out, Texas tech. This, this might be it. Cause North Carolina State is a bad matchup for the Red Raiders. Like, I like that 11-6 seed. That's money for the North Carolina State. Like, you know, you got to pick or you, you got to try to be strategic as you can. Look at as many upsets possible. Those 6-11s, those 7-10s, those 4-13s, you know, those upsets. There's at least one or two in every bracket every season. So that Texas Tech one, North Carolina State, I love North Carolina State this past week. Man, they were playing some good ball. And I went back and watched that Virginia game where they needed that last second shot to go to overtime. Again, Virginia, they're pretty solid, man. They're pretty solid. They match up pretty well against Texas. And if they get past Colorado State, I think Colorado State's the better matchup. You don't want to play a national championship coach in Tony Bennett because we know who has the advantage there. I love you, Roddy Terry. We know you, family. But sorry, Tony Bennett has taken a lot of guys who are out the league now. Like he put guys in the league. Ty Jerome, out the league, basically. Kyle Guy, see, out the league. Did you see Caden so, Shedrick's reaction? I didn't like that. I, I didn't like the reaction very much. Very kinda, Ryan Watts. I mean, not Ryan Watts. Very uh, Terrence Brooks. It gave me those vibes. It gave me those like, why are you putting your head on hand on your head? I don't. 
<laughs> like I, I, I didn't like that. But hey, I wanted, I wanted to see him stand up and go, yeah. That's what I'm saying. I want like, to I be need like, an Arsenio Hall fist pump or something. Yeah. Like that's that. I, I didn't like it. We're about to tear these mfers up. Yeah. Instead, we got. <laughs> Come on, Caden. Very, very Terrence Brooks S. Yeah, I didn't like it at all, but whatever. He he's not okay. a starter. It don't I matter. Was, I was out last week when Texas got stomped in the second half mm. by K-State. And we talked to Dylan Dezu today. Dylan Dezu. Guy is awesome. He's the MVP of this Texas basketball team. He picks up two quick fouls like 30 seconds apart at the, you know, 1830 mark and has to come out of the game. And that's when K-State starts to, you know, come back from this 10 point deficit. Texas goes three of 22 shooting three of 22 through the first 15 minutes of the second half. Zay three of 22. That's hard to do. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And they just, and Dazoo's off the court because he's got three fouls. I thought Rodney should have put him back in when that bleeding was happening the way it was happening. But then he comes back in and he picks up his fourth like almost immediately. But this team is so dependent on Dylan Dazoo, it's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I, I I literally tweeted that after the game. I said Dylan Dessou can't can't get in the foul trouble in this tournament. He he just can't. And BK had a really good point yesterday on the selection show at Crown and Anchor, say, talking about Rodney Terry trusting Dylan Dessou if he gets into foul trouble in the first half or even the second half because. Hey, you might have to Olay guys defensively if you're Dylan Dessou. I mean, it's smart on the other team. If he gets into foul trouble and Rodney Terry decides to leave him in the game, you obviously keep going at Dylan Dessou to see if he could pick up another one to hopefully get him out the game. So Dylan Dessou might have to be smart and you might have to throw some double teams to help him or he might have to Olay some guys because he's just too valuable offensively. You just mentioned three for 22 in that second half during one period of time, and that's awful. And, you know, you think about Tyrese Hunter, who stood out in that three for 22, 0 for 7 from the field, 0 for 3 or 0 for 4 from the three-point line. Like, he was awful. And it doesn't really make much sense coming off of that Oklahoma game where he had 30 points going into Kansas State where he doesn't make any shots from the field. Like, Tyrese Hunter has to be good. He's the X factor for this team. When Max Acemas and Dylan Dessou are getting all the attention, the one person that could create for himself and others is Tyrese Hunter. So hopefully number four could step it up and, you know, really showcase his skills because no matter which team they play from this playing game in Dayton, the best player on those teams are point guards. For Virginia, it's Reese uh, Beckman. And then for Colorado State, it's Isaiah Stevens, the Allen kid. Both of those guys are the best players of the team. They lead the team in assists and points. So that's your matchup. Now, if I'm – Rodney Terry, I put Kendall Weaver on either one of those guys, which they're going to start IT Horton. Like, you don't change it up now, but Kendall Weaver, IT Horton, you're on a sh- quick leash, bro. Quick leash. If you're mucking up early, get his ass out the game and put in Kendall Weaver. So, to start the game, the matchup's going to be on for Tyrese Hunter. He's going to have that matchup with one of those two point guards, whichever one wins and advances, and that's a tough matchup. Both of those guys could really go. They're the anchors for their ball club. So Tyrese Hunter, hey, man, this is going to be a heart game for you because you got to be good if Texas wants to advance. And obviously Dylan Mitchell has to do his thing, Brock Cunningham, Caden Chedrick, Kendall Weaver, et cetera, but – Tyrese Hunter is the X factor for this team if they want to have success because he is capable of scoring. He's capable of getting guys involved with his assist. And not everybody on the team is capable of doing that besides Ace Miss and Dessou. Am I the only one who hates IT Horton in the starting lineup? No. 
I don't like it much either. You know, I just I, don't, he just doesn't. He just doesn't give you enough. He doesn't. I don't care if he scores twenty. He doesn't. The well, that's the thing. Like when he's what does well scoring, they still lose. Right. You know that? Right. <laughs> and you know, Kendall Weaver's minutes are going down again, and it's like, you know, I don't know. I mean, he played um, Weaver played well coming in off the bench against OU, but I don't like it. Yeah, uh, I got on RTE pretty hard that Wednesday after that loss against Kansas State about Kendall Weaver only getting 10 minutes. And, look, that was the game where you sit down Tyrese Hunter. You know, you, you got to trust, and that's RTE's afraid to do that because, again, Tyrese Hunter is so capable of creating. Kendall Weaver doesn't have that in him at times. Sometimes Kendall Weaver could be very one-dimensional and defense first, and we know he's not going to hit that outside shot at all. So if you're ready for his cut, he's pretty easy to stop, especially if you have good defenders that can play Dylan DeSue at times straight up and Max Aceman straight up. So I – Rodney Terry, he gets a little nervous about when the Sioux and Ace Miss are getting covered so much, who else is going to create? And that's why he, he'll have IT Horton in the game at times because IT Horton, even though his shot doesn't go in that much, he can get it off. <laughs> that's what, like he can create at times. They put him in an ISO play against Kansas State and he took his man off the dribble and hit the jumper. And I was like, okay, IT Horton, I see you. But, again, he's just so inconsistent, you can't rely on that. Like, Kendall Weaver's not even looking for that type of game. Tyrese Hunter, he could do that. When we saw it against Oklahoma, he could do that. It's just he's so inconsistent. So, you're sometimes – you're going to have to sit – IT or, excuse me, Tyrese Hunter on the bench. Like, that's okay. And have Kendall Weaver and IT Horan in at the same time with Max Aceman and the Zoo or Mitchell, Brock Cunningham. Like, it's okay to sit Tyrese Hunter at this point. Like, Kendall Weaver has proven that you could do that. Like, IT Horton has proven enough if he's cooking like he did against Kansas State, you can leave him in. But if Tyrese Hunter ain't doing shit for you like he did against the Wildcats back in the Big 12 tournament, sit his ass down. Sit his ass down because he's hurting your team. You know, and that's that was one of those moves where you're like, RT, you got to have a better feel for the game, my guy. You got to know that tonight just ain't Tyrese Hunter's night. It don't matter what he did against Oklahoma. Tonight's not his night. Put Kendall Weaver in because you know what you're going to get with him. You know, you, you know what you're going to see if just switch it up. Try something different. Ten, ten minutes for Kendall Weaver is unacceptable. I, I don't care what's going on. Ten minutes is unacceptable. He has to have at least over 20. And sometimes he gets into foul trouble too. But again, he's one of those guys to where it's okay if he gets his third foul. That's fine. You know, like that's, that's fine if he gets his yeah. third foul. Like that you got to trust your guys at times that they're still going to be able to give you production, but deal with that foul trouble. And I, I, think, I think RT doesn't do that. Enough. I think, I think this situation makes, RT looked like a hypocrite because he's talked all year about defense, 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 defense. We're at our best when we play our defense. And who sets the tone better than anyone in terms of the top of your defense, your yep. perimeter defense, Kendall Weaver. Like Vic Schaefer talks all the time about Rory Harmon, Rory Harmon. She sets the tone defensively. She makes everyone else defend, play tougher on defense because they see her literally at the top of the key turning people over, steals, one woman fast break. That's what Kendall Weaver is capable of doing. And now you've kind of dampened his flame a little bit. And the, your whole season turned around. You, you were losing to Central Florida and West Virginia because Kendall Weaver was nowhere in sight and IT Horton was out there playing Ole defense. And his defense has gotten a little better, but not much. <laughs> and he goes six of nine, and RT's acting like he's going for 81, you know? I mean, it's like, I don't get it. It's like, RT, what what do you stand for? Yeah. You say you're about defense, but you're leaving in the guy who all he can do is shoot. And even when he goes off, he usually gives up 
at least that much on on defense. I just don't get it. But you're right. I mean, in this instance against K-State, he should have sat Tyrese Hunter down, which is just unfathomable. I mean, I just had written a story with quoting Tyrese Hunter about it's March. It's March. It's March. It's time to get down to business. And you're like, oh, this team's about to play their best basketball because now you've got Tyrese Hunter. Caden Shedrick was doing well. Caden Shedrick, that dude was a no-show Yeah, against K-State. It was like, where the hell did you guys go? You just got here. And to, to give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, Kansas State was desperate. They are playing for their tournament lives. They obviously yeah. didn't make it because they got absolutely smoked by the Cyclones the next day. But it's just they wanted it more that game. And, yeah, again, Rodney Terry, sometimes that his feel for the game is just not there. Like, they're going on the run. Kansas State is. You're fouling your ass off. Go back into a zone. Play right. a little bit looser. Figure out where Tyler Perry is because he's their only shooter. Everybody else, you'll live with shooting the three. You'll get those slow contests off. But other than that, Tyler Perry's the one you got to worry about. So wherever he goes, somebody could go with him in a matchup zone type of situation, but stick right. to your zone principles. He didn't even try that. He just stayed in that same man to man and they just continued to foul, which you got to, if the refs are calling it that way, you have to adjust to the officiated. Yes, we could bitch about the refs all we want, which they were bad. Some of those calls were very suspect, especially the Dylan DeSue ones. The one where he dove on the floor, that was dumb. Dylan DeSue, you can't do that shit. That was so stupid. But yeah. other than that, very suspect. But still, you got to let your team know, hey, next time out, we're fouling too much. They're calling it tight. We got to play better. Back off a little bit. Or go zone so you can naturally back off, but keep Tyler Perry – on the radar, like you right. can that, that those things right. just for a couple of possessions, just for a just couple of possessions, up. like just maybe a four minute span, switch it up. Like you can't just keep doing the same thing, like adjusting to the adjustments. We talk about it with Steve Sarkeesian, we talk about it with Ronnie Terry, you talk about it in every sport. David Pierce, he's been struggling with it. You, with what's that team? On the other side, makes the adjustments to counter what you're doing well. You better adjust to that. That's coaching. That, that, yeah. That's what it is, man. That's what you're getting paid millions for. Yeah. So when it doesn't happen, it's frustrating because, again, you know how much talent is on this team and they're, what they're capable of and how they look when they're playing really good basketball. And going into the tournament, you're just – Okay, they got a good draw in the Midwest division or Midwest region, it being the weakest one, but still the inconsistencies, the roller coaster ride that we've seen all year long, you don't know which Longhorn team you're going to get. And that's what's scary. Well, and as soon as the zoo goes out of the game, they're settling for threes. Mm -hmm. It's Hunter and Horton jacking up threes, you know, and they were nine of their first 13 shots of the second half were threes. And K-State's five of their first six made baskets were layups. So it's like Kaluma started going off because Dazoo's in foul trouble. Yeah. And, and who, just, who was he taking off the dribble? Oh, Dylan. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Who, who Jerome Tang and those guys went in the locker room and said, hey, 23 don't want to guard. Go at him. Just go at him. I yeah, he looks like he wants to guard. He ain't really trying to guard. Go at him and see what happens. Kaluma was like, "Hi," right. and then he went on. Like, that, that was such a throw. weird game because D. Mitch is six of six and scores thirteen points and played no D. Like if you if you go to the analytics, it is it's an I. T. Horton special. He scored thirteen, but he gave up fifteen. Yeah, and that's that's yeah. They gotta. I don't know. If if Rodney Terry is coaching the defense and Frank Haith is coaching the offense, they've got to get tougher on Dylan Mitchell. They got to demand more from him. And I, I I thought it was a miss not bringing him off the bench again. Like Brock Cunningham, I don't give a damn if his senior night or not. That should have showed you something. Brock Cunningham is still knocking down shots with that broken finger. Like, you can't say that's a thing. Still knocking down shots with that broken thumb. 
about like, that? How about that? How tough is that guy, man? Say what you want about him being a dirty player and stuff. That dude is an absolute warrior, man. Yes. Like, I, I, don't, I can't tell you how difficult it is to shoot a basketball with a bum thumb. Like, I, that's just – you're thinking about it every time it, you know, you release it. And it's like, it's not even a thing for him. So why start, you know what you're going to get out of him. You know, you're going to get that toughness and that heart, like, and defense. Like Brock Gunningham is a solid defender. Sometimes he'll get overmatched because he doesn't have the athleticism as some of these guys. But as far as being in the right spot, and then he'll get reputation fouls called on him, which that sucks. Hopefully that's not going to be a thing in the tournament like it was last tournament. But come on. Like, it, that, it's right there. Like, you saw like, an example. And Dylan Mitchell had a good game. So that's not it. Like, you're, you don't have to be worried about him being checked out because he's depressed and he's not starting and this and that. Like, him and IT Horton, that's, that, that shouldn't be things. Like, those guys, it's March. If you're not here, if you're bitching because you're not starting or you're you know, psychologically not there because you're not starting, you're coming off the bench and you think, oh, I've been starting my whole life. Ever since that, I was playing YMCA ball in the third grade, I've been starting. This is all I know. Bullshit. Bullshit. Yeah, your, teams, to hear your that. teams have never won. <laughs> what I'm saying. Like – you're it's, a six-year guy, and you're, none of your teams have ever won. It doesn't matter. Yo, the NBA does not care. Back when that 05 team that Roy Williams had, North Carolina team with Raymond Felton and Sean May and Rashard McCants and stuff, Marvin Williams came off the bench. You know what pick he was in the draft? Number two. Number two came off the bench with the number two pick in the draft. They won it all. Won the whole damn thing. It don't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Do what it takes for the team to be successful. Ronnie Terry, damn their attitude. If they have an attitude about it, then sit their ass down, man. Like, sit their ass down. That's just, that, that's Bush League. I ain't, I ain't trying to hear that at all. Kendall Weaver should be starting. Brock Cunningham should be starting. But they're not going to be. Why? We have no idea. There's really no answer for it. RT says, I want to get more offense going, this and that. Like, we know that Kendall Weaver and Brock are going to be fine coming off the bench, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, man. Start those guys so you can light the fire and set the tone for the game. Because you you don't want to be playing catch up. Like, that's new. You don't want to be playing catch up. You know, set the tone early, first four minutes, and then spread those minutes out as the game goes along and see who has the hot hand or not. But, yeah, I think Rodney Terry is doing this team a disservice by not starting guys that, in my opinion, should be starting. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think you've got to be true to what you've been preaching. you got to be true to the guys who've at least given their all – to deliver on what you've been asking. And that is defense, defense, defense. I mean, I even said to Dylan DeZu today, I'm like, okay, you know, there are people calling Texas a dangerous team. When Texas is dangerous and playing at its best, what is Texas? And he's like, it's when all five of us are locked in defensively. Okay. Well then where's Brock and Kendall Weaver? <laughs> Because those dudes will sell out for defense, whether or not their shot is going. But they create extra possessions. They create juice. And it's like it's like we say, when you go for it on fourth down and you fail, it's more momentum for the other team than missing a field goal because your offense and the defense and their defense are out on the field and their defense just – you know, impose their will on you, it's debilitating. And when you've got guys flying around, you know, getting offensive rebounds, creating energy, it, first of all, it gets everyone on the team to play better defense. Second of all, it creates momentum building scoring opportunities, fast breaks, dunks, stuff that's debilitating to the other team. Answer baskets is what it creates. Yeah. I.T. Horton's never created an answer basket in his life. And Dylan Mitchell is, you don't even know he's there. That's what's so sad. It's like, I mean, I, I see him on that lob dunk, you know, every every game there's a beautiful 
lob dunk to Dylan Mitchell and it looks beautiful and it bends the rim and everything you want. That's it. It's the only time. I don't see him ever making a, well, okay. I mean, he will hit a jumper every now and then. Yeah. And, and he'll, he'll get some steals and stuff, but it's just not consistent. We haven't seen a breakaway steal in a minute. No, we haven't seen it in a minute. But. And he was remember when he was trying to bring the ball up the floor? Oh yikes! Yeah, that those days are long gone. Yeah, I, I, I mean you could easily argue that Brock Cunningham and Kendall Weaver better offensive players than It Horton and Dylan Mitchell. Also, like Brock Cunningham's ability. Go look at the Texas the Tech win. That was the season changing win at Texas Tech. For sure. And go see who did what in that game. Yeah. It was Kendall Weaver and it was Brock Cunningham till yeah. Brock got ejected. Yeah, I I completely agree. I mean, as at the end of the day, as long as those two guys are finishing games, you know, yes, you have to have a feel for it if Dylan Mitchell is having a great game offensively and defensively, depending on where Brock is at or Kendall Weaver, or whatever. Let him finish the game again. It's just you have to have a good feel for it. Like you, you, you should know <laughs> who should be finishing games and who shouldn't. And then you got to play. It gets, sometimes you wait too long, and the momentum is yeah. is turned, and Dylan Dazoo's out with foul trouble, and there's not like Kendall Weaver's chance to impose his will on the game is gone. And that's what I felt like in the K State game. It was like, you know, I don't get it. I just don't get it, but we'll see. I mean, if Tyrese Hunter can show back up again and and Max and Dylan DeZoo are going to do what they can do, but, yeah, I mean, I cringe. Ay, 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 the IT Horton factor. And I'm not trying to dog the guy, but, <laughs> I mean, you don't – you don't – I don't trust you as far as I can throw you to play any kind of defense or be any kind of spark – for the team. The guy gives you no energy. Even when he's going off, he gives you no energy. Like, I don't know, dude. Yeah. He's the weirdest basketball player I've ever seen. <laughs> he's the he schlep odd rock. He's the schlep rock of basketball. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, again, he has a pretty form, man. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. His, no, his shooting shoot. mechanics are top tier. But here's the thing, Zay. I'm I'm going right. To the, uh, I'm just pulling it up real quick because his numbers, his shooting numbers are not great. No. Like, it's weird. I mean, we're going to start this guy. He's not shooting 40% from two. And he's, you know, 36% shooting 36% from three when you've shot thir the third most threes on the team. That's not good. Like, Dylan DeZoo has shot 78 threes and he's shooting 50%. IT Horton has shot 92 threes and he's shooting 36%. I mean, I don't know what IT Horton gives me. I really don't. Yeah. So um, I mean, I know he needs to play minutes, but now, now he doesn't need to play minutes. Now he doesn't need to play minutes because we're okay, you got to march. This is when Mike Krzyzewski plays seven guys. Yeah. You know, I mean, I need my bench to be a little longer in January and February. But in March, no, no. I need the guys who are going to go play some D, get me some possessions, set up my stars, set up Dylan DeZoo, set up Max. We'll see if Tyrese Hunter decides to join the party again. But... Yeah, I don't get it, man. We'll see. We'll see. Now, the women, I love their draw. Oh, hell I mean, yeah. First of all, hey. Yeah, I called Ollie that. Pop. I called that Ollie one, Pop. baby. I knew it. Ali Pop to the Texas women, number one seed. I don't know how you lost to Oklahoma twice, but, hey, oh, you got blown out by Iowa State. You didn't have to play them again. Um. They're a five seed. OU, the OU women are a five seed. Yeah, that's tough. They're the Big 12 regular season champs, yeah. and they're a 
five seed. Yep. Like but they had some horrible losses early in the year. Yep. Hope they have fun with South Carolina in that Sweet 16. Have fun with that. <laughs> if they make it. If they make I mean, it. Texas, Texas got the best bracket. I mean, look, Stanford has got serious bigs. Like, that. Yeah, they got that, that blonde girl. Look like yeah, Barbie. Brink, she looks like a like a swimsuit model and she'll cut your throat that brink girl yeah because texas played her in uh vegas two years ago and that girl just carved texas up yeah like she's she's legit and you know but texas texas should win i mean texas has the bigs to defend her she's not she's not as thick as ioka lee She's just really skilled and she's really a good defender. Like she will yeah, she's, block. she's probably the best shot blocker in the nation. Oh, she will pack your stuff. And and so look, Texas, they should get to the regional final and play Stanford. And I'll take my chances at that point. Yeah. Yeah. That... That's they don't have anyone who can defend Madison Booker. No, no one in the nation can defend Madison Booker. You know, it's just you hope she misses shots. That's all. You hope she misses shots. But, yeah, congrats to Vic Schaefer and those Lady Horns. I mean, we've been talking about it all year long. At the end of the day, if they want to go as far as they could go, it depends on their backcourt. Shaylee Gonzalez and Shay Hawley knocking down shots from the outside. Cause Shay's yeah. been great. She has I've been good. Been, I mean, she saved their butts in the K-State game because you and I have talked about how Madison Booker will try to do too much late in game. She did against OU. She 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 only hit one of her last 10 shots against OU. And Vic needed to be like, hey, let's run some stuff for Deanna Gaston. And, you know, and he didn't. Then against K-State, that game was starting to slip away. Booker was trying to stop the bleeding herself. And thank God. Shay Holly was like, hey, I'm a senior. Let me help you out. And she steps up and hits because Shaylee Gonzalez, even when she's been on late in games, she hasn't been. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, I I think they're, you know, a really solid tandem. And and Shay Holly's gonna come back next year for her COVID year. And um, and Shaylee Gonzalez, you know, had a ACL season ending injury at BYU. It's her sixth year. And she talks about how, you know, she wasn't going to be okay with losing to Iowa State in the Big 12 tournament and then losing at home to Louisville in the round of 32 last year. So that team looks like it's got some real fire to do something special. And, and they are special. Yeah. But, you know, I'm I'm I like their draw. I do. Yeah, so do I. I mean, you know, Shaylee Gonzalez, one thing about playing in Vic Schaefer's system, you better be in shape. And I think, you know, during this time of the year, when you're clocking in 35 plus minutes and you're playing that ferocious defense that you play, sometimes the shots that you take, especially for Shaylee Gonzalez, who most of her shots come from the outside, those legs start to give out a little bit. Yeah. So I think she's dealing with that. And if you think about Shay Holly, she don't get tired. Like that girl, her stamina, she don't get tired at all, which I think that, you know, you see those final minutes of a game, her knocking down shots, it makes a lot of sense. So I think if Madison Booker is getting all the attention and she's having one of those games where you're doing too much, I think Vic Schaefer should run some stuff for Shea Holly, which he did in that Kansas State game. You think about that sideline out-of-bounds play to put them up by five. I mean, yeah. Go to number 10 because she's going to prove that, hey, they forget about her a lot due to – They do. Uh, they totally forgot more. about her. Oh, no yeah. One, they're they're going to forget. No that. You do not go in the scouting report for that offense looking to stop Shea Holly. Like, you'll live with that. You'll live with the shots Ab that Shea Holly gets. Absolutely. Again, Madison Booker, she's so tough. Aaliyah Moore and Taylor Jones, they're high low game. You got to worry about that. And then when Deanna Gaston comes in, you got to worry about her being a part of that high low game also. So Shea Holly is an afterthought. But her shot, like that arc, 
She has a pretty jumper, man. If she can knock down a few threes a game, then that takes the horns to a whole nother level. So, yeah, they should yeah, be. That was her roll. only three. That was her only three yeah. in the K State game, and she hit it. Yeah, that, that's the thing. Like, she's such a good defender. That, that doesn't have to be her role. Like, uh, she could give you a little bit of points, too. And, again, run in plays for her. Have, you know, okay, Madison Booker, we know that when you drive to the land, you're going to draw two. So make sure you have Shea Holly on that same side so she can make that easy pass and she can knock down that shot. Just little things like that. And Hey, you know, how do we get Jacalenga, Mwenintanda some more minutes? I'm worried she's going to transfer. I mean, she's so – She's got a chance. She's not going to transfer. What do you mean? How do you not buy into what Vic Schaefer's doing with the lady oh, I know. He, has, uh, he has coming in? You got to buy in. Roy Harmon coming back next year? Come on. Dude, she's like she's like Tayshawn Prince, man. She's got that, Tayshawn Prince. She's got that length. I mean, yeah. she's a nightmare defender on the perimeter. I, she gets, a little, I, she gets a little rushed. A little rushed, right. but she just needs more. She needs more minutes, and she needs to know her coach believes in her. And you know, I think she's going to be. I think she has a chance to be a really good player. I do too. I do too. She'll knock down the three. She doesn't yeah. mind getting dirty inside and getting boards and putbacks and stuff. Again, if Shay, excuse me, Shaylee Gonzalez is struggling. You throw her in there. Yeah. You you, you throw her in there. Yeah, right. because she can get to the bucket. I mean, right. The problem is kind of like Dylan DeSue with the men's, Madison Booker can't get in the foul trouble, especially right. when it, things get tough. You right. know, no, they could be they fine. Have. They could be fine the first two rounds of Madison Booker getting in the foul trouble and still win. But after that, especially Utah, Utah got a Polynesian girl. Yo, man, she she's like a lighter uh, version of homegirl from Iowa State. Big girl, Ooh, Audie Brooks. Yeah, she's 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 she weighs a little bit less. I don't know her name. Polynesian girl though. She's nice. She and she she's quicker, better stamina, so she can play the full forty. Yo, man, that that don't sleep on that matchup. Utah, I expect Utah to make it out, and if they face the horns in that Sweet Sixteen. That ain't gonna be no easy battle up there in Portland. Oh, yeah. Alisa Peely. Lisa Peely, what's she? What's her numbers? Oh yeah, she's twenty point eight points, six point five boards. Ooh, and yeah, she is man. built like Barkley. <laughs> Yo, they can't both be built like Barkley. <laughs> well, she's she, okay. She's a little smaller version. A little smaller, yeah, yeah, man. Of, of uh, body crooks. Yeah, yo, she could go. That that's that's no easy matchup. Now they gotta win their game. I don't know who that four matchup was, but yeah, man, it's gonna be fun. This is uh this is what this week's all about. You you fill out your bracket yet? What's going on? You look no, at I, it. I, I've, I've been scrambling all over the place. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will. Yeah, they gotta play. Uh, Utah's gotta play against Zaga, and. Uh, if Texas, you know, handles business against Alabama, Florida State, yeah, you're right. That's a that's a decent matchup, and that they're not at home for those games. Yeah. So, and by the way, everybody listening to us, go to our TSU bracket challenge. We got it down YouTube link. We got it on our socials. Check it out. Enter your bracket. You could win different prizes. I already filled mine out. Got my final four. Got my national champion. Got my upsets. I have zero confidence. But, hey, if you had confidence, then, then I don't think you're really telling the truth. Because Okay, Chris Bennett says, how far do you have both Texas teams advancing? I don't like the draw for the men at all. Tennessee. What? Dude, Tennessee plays bad in March, except when Rick Barnes is playing against Texas. Um, come on. Then his teams light it up. Like that, they did Tennessee a favor because Barnes will actually have some fire about that game. That's a bad please, man. Barnes gonna be Barnes. 
they're going to tighten up. It might be against Texas, so that means you're going to tighten up even more. You hey. know? And Rodney Terry, who who knows Rick Barnes more than Rodney Terry? Come on now. That's an advantage no. RT. I know that, you know, Rick Barnes, future Hall of Famer and stuff, and RT is still making his way. But, hey, he was on that bitch right beside him. He knows the pros. 11 years. 11 years. That's a long time. That's a long time. You get to know somebody inside and out. Know what they favorite meal is. Exactly. Yeah. Know what they favorite food is, which cars they like, what they do in their free time. True. They favorite porn star, probably. You know a lot of stuff in 11 years. You learn a lot. Hell yeah. I like that draw. True. I like that draw. Give me that. Weak okay. ass Midwest division. That was it's weak. It is weak. I got Creighton oh, yeah. making it out. Yeah. No, like, I agree. I, I got Creighton making it out. I don't got Texas beating Tennessee in my bracket. <laughs> That's one of those win-wins for me. Like if Texas loses, expected it. If Texas wins, hooray. Love it. But, Texas is in the same region as a number one seed that lost to a 16 last year. Yeah. Like Matt Painter, does he get to the NCAA tournament and just turn to stone or what? Some saying some guys get tight. I've got a buddy of mine who went to Purdue and he had tickets to the final four last year. Like he was set to go and they lost to fairly Dickinson. <laughs> <laughs> they lost to a 16. I was like, dude, I don't know what to say. Like, you need a hug because he's just every year that they've had Zach Eady. Purdue's been like number one at some point in the season. Yeah. Like the fourth straight year, Purdue's been number one for extended periods of time in the regular season. Yeah. And- I mean, yeah, sometimes you just get tight, but this is the year that they make it past the first round. They should. Like, look, Zach Eady is so dominant, 25 points, 12 rebounds, basically. And then Raiden Smith, everything's on him. Like, he's the X factor for that team. And I do not like that he tweaked his leg in the Big Ten tournament. That's not good at all. He did not look himself in their last game against Wisconsin, which they lost. But Wisconsin, they're a solid ball club. But this is a team that shoots, you know, one of the best three-point shots in the nation. I think they're second in the nation when it comes to three-point percentage and efficiency. So, yeah, I I got them losing to Creighton, too. Like, I I don't trust them going too far. Well, Creighton – Creighton has size. They got dudes who can shoot the three with size. Yo, Shireman, Cobra. Oh, Shireman. They got that other shoulders, white dude, Hammerstein or whatever. I mean, that dude, that dude went like 14 of 14 against Texas last or two years ago, whatever Beard was still the coach. Was oh, you mean Cobra? Yeah. The big man? Yeah. 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 That guy's so technical and fundamental. No. You, if you have guys that can just create their own shot, like with the shot clock's going down in this tournament, oh, you could go so far. Like we all know it's good guard play, but what does good guard play really mean? Like that means when the offense doesn't work anymore because you're so heavily scouted that they know exactly what you're going to run, can your guy beat his man one-on-one straight up? Why do you think right. that you my team when Kimba Walker was so deadly? No one could stop Kimba. He was beating his man every single time. Either Korean or Khalid El Amin. Yeah, Khalid El Amin, who had Rip Hamilton oh. on the side of him. Talk about great teams. That Calhoun squad, 99, that team was so cold beating Duke in that national championship game, which Duke was loaded. Duke was loaded. Alaskan Assassin. Elton Brand, Corey Maggette, Battier, Duke was loaded. They weren't supposed to win that game. And Calhoun got him. Calhoun, by the way, Calhoun, we always talk about Dean Smith and John Wooden and Coach K and Roy Williams. Calhoun needs to be a part of that crew. Three national championships. Oh, yeah. Like all those guys, all those teams had solid players, but – 
they weren't really like crazy good. Like he's like the development that they had, that 04 team, Mecca Okafer and Ben Gordon and you know, Charlie Villanueva, and I just mentioned Kimball Walker and Jeremy Land on that 2011 squad. Shabazz Napier was a freshman, and he was killing. Like, Jim Calhoun was amazing. He was absolutely an amazing coach. And then UConn won a national yeah. championship with Ali. Yeah, and I don't know how they did that. Like, where, I don't know where Kevin Ali is. I think he's in the where, association. Yeah, where's, where's Kevin Ali now? I think he's in the league as an assistant. I, I think he's in the league because they did him dirty a few years later. They got rid of him quick, which was the right move. Dan Hurley is clearly the right guy, you know, winning it last year. And I, I hate picking them to win it all because it's so much chalk because, you know, it's too easy to pick the number one overall seed, but they don't have a weakness. No. I don't, I, I got, I was, I've been trying to figure out, man, UConn's got to have a weakness somewhere. I don't see it. I, I don't see it. Like, do they have great guards? Yep. And Spencer and Newton, great guards. Do they have a big man that you can throw the ball down low and take over the game with? Yep. They have that in Donovan Klingon. Do they have great role players? Like, their role player is the lottery pick. You know what their I'm role saying? Player is a lottery pick. <laughs> their, role, their role player is a lottery pick. Castle, that dude's going to be a lottery pick. Freshman. You know what Castle. I'm saying? Like, it's nothing. It, it's it's going to be a lottery pick. Yeah. They got old Caravan. He'll knock down shots from the outside. You can't help on him. He was one of their best players. Oh, Contraband? Last year. Oh, Contraband. That dude is nasty. Contraband. <laughs> that dude is nasty. Yeah. That, I, which Sal, Sal said he got Creighton cutting the nets down. I mean, hey, why not? The bracket. I mean, I don't know. Marquette, how far you got Marquette going? How far you got Shaka? Uh, you know, I was telling BK yesterday for the selection show, if Shaka loses early, I can't knock him too much because Tyler Kolick, I believe in him so much. I think Tyler Kolick is one of the best players in the nation, and him being hurt a little bit, that's a problem. So... Gosh, where do I have my Marquette going? Yeah, I got them going to the Sweet 16, losing to Kentucky, which, you know, that would suck for Shaka. But, again, it's all rides on the health of Tyler Kolick. Like, they didn't have him in the Big Tw uh, excuse me, a Big East championship game against UConn, and it definitely showed. But, yeah, he's that Southpaw point guard, uh, one of the top five point guards in the nation. Again, you need great guard play by this time. I like Cam Jones, but he's not the true point. And, yeah, again, he's not healthy. Kolek and Shaka, you might see them getting bounced really early, but I got them losing Sweet 16 against Calipari in them. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I uh, I don't trust Shaka as far as I can throw him. Come on, man. And I do have Creighton beating Tennessee. Yeah. yeah. That's a bad matchup for Tennessee. Not good. There's just – there's not many teams with that kind of length. Now, the game that would be awesome would be Iowa State against Creighton because Iowa State's got length on the perimeter that can defend. Like in the Final Four? Or just yeah, in the – wherever they would meet. Dude, Iowa State just beat Houston by 20. I was like, is this really happening? Yeah. I mean, they just they just pulled away. Yo, your boy Kelvin Sampson. Sampson went Rick Barnes on us. He went Rick Barnes. I heard his pregame interview, you know, in the back by the locker room and stuff. The dude said, I mean, I we lose this game. Doesn't mean much. We got a lot of ahead of us, real stuff ahead of us. I was like, oh, these fools going to get blasted. Once I heard that, I was like, yo, these dudes going to get blasted because I was. Let me get to Bet US. Let me get to Bet US, baby. Let me click on that link right there. I was saying Hilton South, T Mobile Center. Nah, man, that adrenaline that they played with because of those fans, which, look. Say what you want about UConn. I still have them winning that game. If Iowa State makes it to that Elite Eight, UConn's going to get everything they want. Everything they want. And for Iowa State, you got Kenneth Gilbert, 
solid player. Taman Lipsy, one of the best point guards in the nation. It all rides on Mom Chilovich, the freshman. Mom Chilovich. Mom Chilovich. That dude. And Rodney is- Terry got beat in recruiting by Iowa State. Well, come on. He had no chance. The dude's like a Minnesota kid. He had no chance. He wasn't trying to come to Texas. He needed the snow. He needed the weirdness. Mom Chilovich is nasty. He is nasty. He was killing the Cougars. Killing them. He had a step back on Juwan Roberts. Well, Juwan Roberts ain't no punk. He's a good defender. He had a step back on him, and I was like, yo, man, this guy might be an NBA player. Was that before Roberts got hurt? Yeah. Which that, Robert- that, that you don't like that if you're which I got Houston playing in the championship, but they scare me a little bit. They really do because if LJ Cryer has a bad shooting game, they're beatable. I watched them go down last year against Miami. I was in Kansas City for that game, and Miami had awesome length because they had the uh, the Wood Woodard whoever the kid was who went. 14 of 14 against Texas. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, whatever, Omir, Norchad Omir, they had some length. And with Texas not having Dylan DeZoo, they had no chance. But they they could defend Houston and Cryer and – or whatever, not Cryer. Um, Shed and uh, – Sasser. Sasser couldn't – they couldn't hit. And then they started turning on each other. Yeah. I was like, oh, no. It's not good. The, the vice group's defensive team is starting to get a little finger pointy over here. Yeah, which LJ Cryer and Jamal Shedd will not turn on each other. Those guys are roommates. They've known each other since they were in the third grade. Like, they're not going to turn on each other. They got a really good bond. But it's all on LJ Cryer. Like, you know what Jamal Shedd's going to bring. You know what he's going to bring. L.J. Cryer, the games that Houston loses are the games that he struggles. You know? So that's why Texas had him on the ropes. And L.J. Cryer was decent that game, but he wasn't great. Went back at the mood a few months ago. So, you know, Jawan Roberts. I I do too. And T.J. Otzelberger, man, that dude is – he gets every drop out of his teams, man. Yeah. I mean – they know their roles. They play together. They're connected. They, I mean, If they want to go to the Final Four and beat UConn, they need Tame and Lipsy to score. Like they, I know he's a pure point guard and he wants to pass first and, you know, he's defensive oriented. But if they want to go far, obviously Momchilovich has to be big like he was against Houston. You know Kenneth Gilbert, you know he's going to score an attack. And I like Jones coming off the bench. That dude, he gives me Jordan Poole vibes just because he's an instant scorer. But Taman Lipsy, if he's looking for a shot when he was hitting step backs and, you know, driving the lane like he was against U of H and he's knocking down that three, it takes the Cyclones to a whole new level. And, yeah, that's – Get your popcorn ready. If that's an Elite Eight matchup to go to the Final Four, UConn and Iowa State, that's one of the best games I think you're going to see because both of those teams could easily win it, you know, if they win that game. I agree. All right, let's get a couple of mentions in here real quick. Apple Leasing getting you into the car you really want to be driving. I mean, I know that sounds kind of like, well, yeah. Well, some of you are not driving cars you want to be driving. You're driving around in cars you can't stand. That is no way to go through life. Not in Austin, Texas, where you are going to be in traffic. Now, here's the deal. Some of you are like me. Always buying used cars. So you don't pay the future trade-in value, which is the single biggest markup in a new or used car. Well, guess what? Now you can get into a new car and not pay for the future trade-in value of that car. because. Apple leasing, you're only paying for the car while you're driving it. And you're paying for the part that's under warranty and brand new. It's it's incredible. There's nothing like Apple leasing. You're not going to find it in Dallas, Houston. It's an Austin original. And it is the answer. You deserve to be in a new car. And a car is a depreciating asset. You buy it, it starts dropping in value. It's not a great investment. So you might as well lease. So that you're in a car, under warranty, brand new, you're loving it, 
And then two, three years in, you want to change, make and model a car? No problem. If you had a bad leasing experience in the past, probably because you leased from a dealership, they're not going to let you out of your contract. Real simple. Apple leasing. 346-9977. Visit appleleasing.com. Tell them Chip Brown sent you. And Brain Vault, the mouth guard that is changing the game. Proven, patented to reduce the effects of concussion developed right here in Austin by Austin's dentist, Dr. Greg Eckert, Dr. U-E-C-K-E-R-T. And look, your competitor, you want them to play hard, but you want them to play safe. So whether you've got a lacrosse player, a flag football player, basketball player, cheerleader, they need to protect not only their choppers, but their noggin. The brain vault mouth guard is the answer. Go to brainvault.com to set up a fitting and audiovisual consultations when you're ready, kids, to get the big screen of your dreams. Tom McKay has got you covered. Bring you the best price on big screen, surround sound, surveillance, new lighting, electronic shades. All you got to do is call 255-8678. You don't need to go shopping or borrow a truck or punch holes in your drywall. Let Tom and his crew bring everything to you and take care of you. They've done it for me, three different houses. They've done it at some of your favorite restaurants, audio visual consultations, avconsultations.com. And it is Monday. So it is your new March Madness headquarters, cover three. Because look, you want to watch the playing games tomorrow night? Get to cover three. Set up shop in front of the big screens. Enjoy some high-end food. Hang out with the buddies. Cover three on Anderson Lane, cover three in Round Rock, cover three, cover two at 183 in Lake Creek. Your NCA March Madness headquarters, cover three. All right, Zay. Spring football starts tomorrow. Texas yeah. Come on, come on. You kidding me? And we've been uh, sort of counting it down, doing different position inventories, but today I'm just going to ask you point blank. What player or players, two or three maybe, are you most excited to see this spring come April 20th when the orange-white game comes around and they give you some vanilla, you know, but still, who are the players you're excited to see either a returning veteran or a newcomer? Um, on the offensive side, uh, I think a guy that we don't talk about enough, and that's Amari Nyblack. I think Amari Nyblack could step into that role that JT Sanders was this past year and have a big-time season. I mean, he obviously saw that in transferring from Alabama to Texas. He saw how versatile JT Sanders was in Steve Sarkeesian's offense. And Amari Nyblack, he might not be as big as JT Sanders or doesn't have those measurements. I mean, you remember JT Sanders' hand size at the combine? That dude's hands are massive. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I don't know if Amari Nyblack is that Big of a you know physical specimen, but we know he has absolute burners, and I thought he was the third best tight end last year in all of college football. So I'm excited to see him on the offensive side. Defensively, Alfred Collins. Alfred Collins, man. I mean, think about just the shoes that he's stepping into, you know, filling in for guys that might be picked in the first round. We know Byron Murphy's probably going to be a first round guy, and Travondre Sweat was the Outland Award winner. So those are some big shoes to fill. And Alfred Collins coming back for his fifth year, being the big time five star he was coming out of Cedar Creek. I mean, hey, this is the contract year, bro. This is the time that you and Kenny Baker get in the lab, and hopefully Kenny Baker, who has a lot of pressure coming on him, you know, coming off of Bo Davis leaving to LSU, hopefully he could get him right, and Alfred Collins could have a big-time season because we know the interior defensive line, that's the biggest what-if coming into the 2024 year. So I'm going to be looking at Alfred Collins on the defensive side and Amari Nyblack on the offensive side. I like it. I like it. Um, How about you? Yeah, I like I like the Amari Nyblack um, mention because I agree. I think he's he's that was a rare um, pull in the transfer portal when you talk about a guy who fits exactly what Steve Sarkeesian wants to do. 
I'm just going to, I'm fascinated to see you've got all this talent in the receiver room. Two years ago, they had two receivers, mm. Xavier Worthy and Jordan Whittington. That's it. I mean, Casey Kane was the third receiver. He had eight receptions. Last year, three receivers. This year, you know, Isaiah Bond, Matthew Golden, um, Silas Bolden when he gets here, but John T. Cook, Ryan Wingo. It's like, okay, and you've got Amari Nye Black. So you play, he loves, you know, we know Steve Sarkeesian, second most important position in his offense is tight end because he uses those guys for the motions, the shifts that help the quarterback determine if the defense is in man or zone. So is he going to go two tight ends? Because if he goes one tight end, Gunnar Helm is the more complete tight end, the blocking tight end. He's got to be on the field. He's. It's going to come down to like Jonte Cook or Ryan Wingo as the fourth receiver or, you know, probably, or Nye Black being on the field unless Sarkeesian starts to rotate guys like golden and Ryan Wingo at the same position niblet and John T. cook and Silas Bolden, you know, Isaiah bond or Isaiah bond and John T. cook. I mean, they're all going to be cross trained, but I'm fascinated about that. So I'm also fascinated about cam williams because with uh christian jones now preparing for the nfl draft next month it's cam williams time i mean he's part of that 20 2022 monster offensive line class with calvin banks dj campbell cole hudson connor robertson um nato yumizolo and and cam williams it's his turn it's his time he Showed well. He had the one start against K-State. He actually did better in his pass protection than he did in his run blocking in that game. But when he gets his hands on you, you're through. And they need him. I mean, it's it's time. So I'm looking at him. Defensively, I'm looking at a bunch of dudes because you've got some interesting stuff going on where Jody Barron's going to play some corner. And I think that's to light a fire under Terrence Brooks. I think you're, you know, Malik Muhammad set, but Jody Barron and Terrence like outside Brooks. corner. Yeah. So who would be playing that slot spot? Jalen Gilbo. They feel like he is. <laughs> they, they feel like he is back. From Yo, the I told you. We talked about this. I was like, watch out for Jalen Gilbo because that freshman year showed so much promise before he got hurt with that ankle injury. And last season, I don't think he had that bounce back right, whether no, he it was didn't physically trust him. or mentally. Yeah, I think it was mentally more than anything. Now another year, healthy. That's what I'm talking about. The Port Arthur kid. Let's see how he goes, man. Let's see what he yeah. can do. Because that game where John A. Barron against Houston was not supposed to play, Jalen Gilbo wasn't bad. It's just everybody else was getting eaten up, like Jaron Thompson and Keaton Crawford. So they had to the play. Yeah, the safeties got torched. So they torched. had to play John A. Barron. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It wasn't on Jalen Gilbo being bad. It was on no safety. So, yeah, let number three roll. And, hey, Terrence Brooks, bro, if you ain't cutting it right now, Sorry, there's just too much talent, and Terrence Joseph and Blake Gideon are already on that shopping block a little bit. Like, they can't afford to be bullshitting with, you know, trying to test players because they like them. Nah, damn that. Put in whoever's ready. If you have to move Jale Barron over and slide in Jalen Gilbo, so be it. I'm with it. Yeah, and you can also move Jade to safety. Now, I know – it, it, all of it depends on Gilbo and Austin Jordan, who are your, you know, you got Baron, you got Jalen Gilbo, you got Austin Jordan. I like Austin Jordan too. I mean, he's he's fine. Um, and and now we got to see what Warren Roberson's all about at corner because he's 
physical and fast as hell? Does he know what he's doing? Because if he does, watch out. I mean, this dude is, he's, he can fly and he's thick and he'll hit, but is he, does he know what he's doing? I mean, can he play fast? Can he, does he have closing speed? Does he, you know, is he vulnerable to the, you know, the double moves and all that stuff, but he's fascinating. You know, Kobe Black, um, 6'2 corner. Can't wait to see what he looks like tomorrow at practice. Um, and then, you know, just in the secondary period, you've got Xavier Filsimi, who's sort of been the winner of the early enrollee winter conditioning award. And, and Jelani McDonald, the dude who looks like, an NFL player right now. I mean, he's 6'2", 205, cut out of stone, and Yo, can. That's a big secondary, man. Yeah. That's a yeah. big secondary. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. like it. Bill yeah. Simi's six foot, six you know, one? Six foot one, yeah. 190. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah so and at linebacker, you know, who's who's – Lining up next to Anthony Hill. Because you got a bunch of dudes trying to get there. David Benda, Kendrick Blackshire, Leonga LaFau. I mean, it's a uh, – and Mo, Mo Blackwell, who's put on, you know, some weight and is leading. I mean, I'm hearing his – he's stepping up and saying, hey, I'm a senior. I'm ready, which is great news because the kid is such a good athlete. He will hit you. Yeah, you will turn your lights out. So, yeah, yeah. we don't even talk about Gavin Holmes. I know, like, and Gavin Gavin Holmes, Holmes. Gavin Holmes. It's like, dude, now's your now's your chance. You know, I mean, guy can run. Guy can run. Yeah, and this this should be he should be, you know, smelling red meat right now because he's a senior. And this is his his chance. So he didn't he didn't grade out poorly last year. No. He's you know, just play with confidence. Let's see what you got, because he's uh he can fly. Yeah. I, I really hope that Steve Sarkeesian and Chris Jackson can figure something out with this wide receiver group to where there's some type of rotation. You know, I, I just think it'd be beneficial for everybody to keep guys fresh and keep guys engaged and stuff. Cause that running wide receiver room is too talented to have guys sitting around. And I know you like to put them on your special teams. If you're Jeff Banks, like that means something too, but still like if I'm Quinn Ewers, the more the merrier. <laughs> like it's just, let's see, like don't get stuck with your core group. I mean, if you absolutely have to, Find three guys that you can trust because all the other guys just aren't ready, then fine. So be it. Do what's best for the team. But if you can, if guys are – if there's a lot of parity there and it's not much of a drop-off and guys know exactly what they're doing, then reward them. Reward them. Right. Like you should have a wide receiver room where everybody wants everybody to eat. You know what I'm saying? Like you want that rock, paper, scissors vibe that you had at Alabama with Ruggs and Judy and, you know, Devontae Smith and Jalen Waddle. Like you want that. You know what I'm saying? I get those guys went at their turn too, but those guys, they were blowing teams out enough that everybody was getting reps. Like I want that this year. Like, yes, the schedule is the SEC schedule, but have some blowout games to where everybody's getting in earlier than they did this past year where there were so many slobber knockers to where you were basically tied with Wyoming and going into the fourth quarter, like those things. Nah, man, let everybody eat, figure out some type of rotation that works. And let's see what we can do with that. But this past season, as good as Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Wordy and Jordan Winnington and JT Sanders were like, you talked about it, Chip. Like, hey, can we throw Isaiah Nay or a bow every once in a while? Like, Casey can. Can we get them a look? You know, Jontae Cook got in just a teeny bit, just a teeny bit, where we got a little smidge of what the DeSoto kid could do. So I, I, I want it to be spread out a little more, and hopefully we can see some of that here in the 2024 season. Yeah, because you 
you look at, and I'm looking up the snaps that the receivers played last year, and granted, great shape, although how sad is it that Jordan Whittington is suddenly popping tires and um, hamstring injury? The guy was healthy all year long, and now his entire NFL draft situation is coming down to pro day um on wednesday so um well shout out to quinn ewers for throwing on pro day yeah well that shout out, yeah shout out to that. that's good for that, helps, that that gives the nfl an early look at him mm -hmm. and that's uh that's not a bad thing hey if i was arch i'd throw too oh yeah why not Hey, shit. But now we know what happens if Arch throws. It's going to be filmed. Everybody going to talk about how pretty of a ball it is. Now we got a quarterback. Hey, battle. hey, hey. Don't be stirring stuff up. Let me hey, tell I'm you about this. I'm talking about national media. You and oh, I, I know. know what's really popping, what's really going on. But you know how national media get that dude in Nowheresville, Massachusetts, or whatever, is going to be like, oh, damn, this guy, Arch Manning, look at that arm. Quarterback battle. Random journalist. Oh, we got a quarterback battle in Austin. Arch Manning's all right, all right. Day. It looks good. You know what I'm saying? We know how they get. My man, Perse Hilton. All right. So listen to these snaps for the receivers last year. A.D. Mitchell had 888 snaps. That's a ton of snaps, by the way. Like only offensive linemen have more snaps. Um. In fact, that's exactly right. The only players ahead of A.D. Mitchell for snaps are four offensive linemen. <laughs> Xavier Worthy had 833 snaps. Jordan Winnington, 557. Jatavian Sanders, 742. So, like, you can give some of those 888 or 833 snaps to someone else just sprinkle yeah i mean jordan whittington 557 snaps he he got 300 less snaps than uh than mitchell and worthy yeah can you sprinkle it a little bit a little bit like change personnel or something you know yeah. go more 10 personnel or 11 like <laughs> get more wide receivers out there and because JT Sanders, I loved him. One of the best tight ends in Texas history. He whiffed on a lot of stuff that you had him in on, on some blocks that you could have maybe given to somebody else. You Especially know? after that ankle injury. Oh, man. Yeah. But, yeah. No, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. We got the start of spring football tomorrow and then pro day. On Wednesday, and then what? The women are playing on Thursday. Men playing Thursday. Men playing men, Thursday. Men are playing Thursday. Women are playing Friday. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Men are playing Thursday. Women are playing Friday. And Texas baseball is. Woo. It's been tough. It's been tough. <laughs> wow. This might be just one of those years, man. Yeah. You know. Well, it's just uh, you don't want to have it be one of those years when uh, the head coach takes over the pitching. Mm. But they'll play Air Force tomorrow and Wednesday. Tomorrow night, you got a 630 uh, start time at the dish against Air Force. And then Wednesday, you get a four o'clock start at the dish against air force. And then you've got a home series this weekend against Baylor. You've got to win that. Oh, good Lord. Baylor has been not very good since Steve Rodriguez left. You cannot lose that series. I'm just telling you. Mm. So yeah, you know what I'm saying? All right, let's, uh, let's work our way to the, to the commentary uh, real quick though 
Salt Traders Coastal Cooking, baby. Listen, if you love oysters, if you love oysters, like you love raw oysters, this is your spot. Best selection of raw oysters anywhere in Austin, Texas. Salt Traders Coastal Cooking. Our man, Jack Gilmore. This is his seafood restaurant. Uh, the, the sister companion to Jack Allen's Kitchen. The scallops are the best uh, I've ever had. And the snapper, the salmon, but the oysters. I mean, if you love oysters, dollar oysters, dollar raw oysters during happy hour, 3.30 to 6.30, all night happy hour on Monday. So go get your fill of oysters at Salt Traders Coastal Cooking right there at Zilker uh, up at Round Rock in uh, Old Settlers. Get it on. It's all traditional coastal cooking. All right. Zay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you on my college campus visit this weekend. All right, let's go. I've been wanting to hear about that. So the uh the incredible Maggie Brown, who is like a music theater. Uh, unbelievable, you know, has written a couple of musicals. One of the musicals that, that she wrote, she really composed all the music for, was performed last night at the University of Michigan um, because the person she co-wrote it with is a freshman at Michigan. And guess who the person was introducing the show? Ooh. Natasha Rodriguez, A-Rod's daughter. Wow. And... I'm sitting there going, and it's a who's who of some of the best, you know, acting, theater talent. Michigan has 3,000 kids apply and 24 get in. Damn. It is that intense. It is that uh, impressive. But my daughter, who's never really given two flips about sports, even she was impressed with the big house. Like we rolled up to Michigan stadium and she's like, Whoa, this place. I'm like, yeah, welcome. Welcome to, uh, welcome. Cause she wants to go to Michigan. I mean, there's no, there's no doubt. And, um, so it was, it was really cool seeing her, uh, kind of light up. She's like, I want to get, I want to go here and I want to get student tickets to the game. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, they just won the national championship. Your uh, your timing's impeccable. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. It was cold. It snowed a little bit, so that's good too because she's got to see that you're gonna get full blown winter yeah. up there. January, February, it can get rough. You're like looking outside; it's nothing but gray and slush. But uh, yeah, they fired Juwan Howard right while we were there. It was uh, Michigan basketball. But, uh, yeah, it was it was cool. And um, and kudos to all those kids. Um, you know, Anderson Zoll, who went to McCallum High School, um, super talented kid. Uh, there's some other kids up there um, from Austin. But – it um, it was a it was a cool weekend, and Maggie Brown, who many people have you know known, she had open heart surgery when she was two and a half. She is rolling, so um, so proud of Mags. She's she's doing it. She's doing it her way. So, um, but I did catch all the you know watch the Texas K State game, watched all the selection stuff yesterday, and. Uh, kept an eye on Texas baseball. We'll talk about that some other point. But yeah, uh, yeah, we have to talk about that. But yeah, man, I'm glad that she got to visit the big house and go up there to Michigan. Any uh, like nostalgia feels for you being a Michigan native and stuff that you could influence her on, or you know, show her this and that. Like obviously, you know, different hidden spots that others might not. You know, obviously a big reason why she wants to go there is because family is from there. So yeah. what, like, you know, rabbit well, 
this is you take her. Yeah, the the best hamburger in the world is at Frida Bertita, which is in Ann Arbor. Um, it's it's Cuban burgers, and I can't even really like that doesn't do it justice. But it is it is the best burger you've ever had in your life. So. And I know people are like, oh, come on, man. Yeah, man. Best burger you ever. You can't, you know, one burger to the next. It's it's crazy. There's a line out the door every day for this place. Damn. And it's and it moves because people, you know, they get in, they get out, they 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 know how to get people through. But um, so I took her there, she was blown away. Um, and then you know, the the old stomping grounds for me were really around the football stadium. But I mean, when I was a kid, they didn't have those big, um, you know, suites that they've built. And the thing about Michigan stadium, like when you roll up to the university of Texas campus or you're driving down I 35, you see that stadium rising, you know, a hundred feet in the air and it's unmistakable. And that's the way it is on a lot of campuses. You know, Kyle Field, you name it, uh, Neyland Stadium. At Michigan, it's a bowl in the ground. If Before they built those suites, you couldn't even see the football stadium. You like, you roll right up to it and you're like, huh? You walk in and it goes down. Mm-hmm. Like they dug a massive hole in the ground to build that stadium. But it's it's kind of like Moody. Like you, they went 60 feet in the ground to make sure that it didn't obstruct the view of the Capitol because that's, that's an ordinance in Austin. You cannot block the view of the Capitol from, from that uh, vantage point from the, from I-35. So it, uh, it, people freak out, you know, now they see those big suites rise up. So you, you see where the stadium, but back in the day, You'd roll up to it and you'd be like, where's the football stadium? And then you're like, oh, we're here. And you just walk in and then go straight down. It's it's really uh, – it is a cool place. If you've never been to Michigan Stadium, everyone talks about it's the quietest 111,000 you'll ever hear because it is a bowl. So it it's not stacked right on top of the field like a lot of the, the stadiums. Um, so the sound kind of goes up and out, but it is a cool, it is a cool place to to check out because it's massive. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of Texas fans will have their first time there this season yeah. when the horns go up there. Yeah, and they should go. They should be making all their plans to get up there because a, it's going to be beautiful. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. Spring, summer, fall, winter sucks, but. <clears throat> Spring, summer, fall, great. It's kind of too bad that game's not a little later, like in October where you get the color change, of the leaves, but it'll be beautiful. It's great, and it's crazy on that campus. I mean, for St. Patrick's Day on Saturday, every student house we drove by was out in the yard playing beer pong. Every really? single one. Every single one. With the, with the snow? No, the snow, it was mild. Mild. Oh. Yeah, no, the snow no. melted. The snow melted in February. So what were what was the temperature then? Well, it was like freezing at night, and then it would get up to like fifty. Now Saturday, it was cold. Okay, it didn't. It got up to like thirty six. Oh hell no! Oh, yeah, and it's windy, and the wind kills you because that that makes it feels like twenty four. You know. But yeah. All right, let's get to the uh to the right call. Yes, sir. Let's get it. Before that, though, shout out to Covert BK. Been doing it for over a hundred years, and they've been doing it at a high 
level. Get out of that pinto, man. Get out of that hoopty. You don't want that. You don't want that check engine light coming on. Get you something new or pre-owned at Covert B Cave. Seven terrific brands to choose from. Cadillac, GMC, Buick, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram. CovertBCave.com. Go check that out to see all your latest specials and inventory. Nobody beats a Covert deal. Not now, not ever. All right, Chip. Well, for the right call today, I am going to go through my bracket with the people, with the people listening to us right now here on TSU, here on Chip and Zay. You are going to find out who I have in my final four, who I have for my champion and which upsets I have. And hey, don't take my word for it. If your bracket is toe up because you said, you know what, Zay Collier, they say he's the basketball guru and he knows all this shit about basketball. He don't know a goddamn thing. No, 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 no. Don't put that on me. Make your own decisions. You are your own man or woman or whatever gender you are. You know, there's a ton nowadays. Hey, you're your own person. You do it on your own. I don't even know what I'm doing. This is one of the hardest things to predict. So have you ever won? Have you ever won a bracket? Oh yeah, oh yeah, family bracket. I won it last year. So yeah, we'll see how it goes this year. I'm not one of those guys. Don't be one of those individuals that fills out like three or four brackets and changes it up. Don't don't do that. Come on, that's Bush League. Trust your bracket, even though it's very difficult. Stick with one. Try to stick with one. It makes it more fun. Don't be like, oh, one bracket I picked Tennessee and the other bracket I picked Crate. Don't be that person. All right. Please do not be that person. In six of my brackets. <laughs> yeah, please do not be that person. We got our bracket up at Texas Sports Unfiltered. You can catch it here on the YouTube link, or you could go to any of our socials like our Twitter. It's pinned up there and enter in the Texas Sports Unfiltered bracket sweepstakes. We got different gifts and prizes for people who win or get close to winning. But yeah, Chip, let's start in the di most difficult region, the East. UConn versus Stetson. That's obvious. UConn, come on. That's too easy. And then the difficult 8-9. It's always a flip of the coin. I'm going to go off of experience here, FAU versus Northwestern. I'm picking FAU just because those guys were in the Final Four last year. They got a lot of those same guys back. I'm going to go with FAU. 512, San Diego State versus UAB. I like UAB, but San Diego State, kind of like what I said with FAU going to the championship game last year, the Final Four. Got a lot of those same guys that have been here and done that. I like uh, San Diego State. Auburn versus Yale. Auburn won the SEC championship. Bruce Pearl crying and shit. They look good, though. <laughs> Auburn looks really good. They're a team that's pretty scary in this very tough East. BYU Duquesne. This is a tough one. This is a tough one. Watch Duquesne in the Atlantic 10 championship. They look good. BYU, those big 12 teams, you know, battle tested. Absolutely battle tested. But BYU, they rely so much on the three-point shot. And if that's not clicking for them, are they going to be able to get those easy points? I mean, they got Triori coming off the bench, African-looking brothers, around 6'6", six, six big, who gave the Longhorns work. He's solid, but does BYU have enough? I'm taking BYU in that game, but that's also one of those coin flip ones. I would not be mad at you if you took Duquesne. Illinois versus Moorhead State. Illinois, man. Brad Underwood's squad, they looked really good in the Big Ten tournament. Won that thing. Terrence Shannon Jr., he might be 25 years old, but he's figured it out. You know, playing under Chris Beard all those years at Texas Tech, then transferring to uh, Illinois, you kind of figured, man, this guy's too talented to be this inconsistent. The dude's averaging 23 points this year. He has figured it out. He's the type of player that could take you to the Final Four. Washington State versus Drake. I got Washington State. And then Iowa State versus South Dakota. I got Iowa State. So, yeah, you got any questions on that? Like it? Dislike it? Anything that you would? Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on BYU. They're they're so good at home, and that home court advantage is crazy with their students and everything. They're a different team on the road. Yeah, just looking at their schedule, like what's the best road win um, that they've had? But yeah, 
That, I, I know. I got. I want to go watch Duquesne again just to make sure because I might change that. Like I, I might before the game start. Like that's one I might change just because I'm very nervous. Like again, I want to pick BYU. I want to stick with that, but. I don't know, man. Duquesne, they look good in the Atlantic 10 championship. I need to see a little bit more. But BYU, like, they they got size, too. Like, they got big guards, and they're physical, and they're fundamentally sound. It's just they rely so much on that three-point shot. And, yeah, that's, that's one of those ones that might be difficult. But moving on to the Western region, North Carolina versus Howard, most likely. North Carolina, Tom Izzo, 8-9 versus Mississippi State, Michigan State. It's hard to go against Izzo this time of the year. I mean, 26 straight appearances for the uh, for the Spartans. Like, I like Michigan State, but it's going to be tough versus North Carolina. One of my sleeper teams, St. Mary's versus Grand Canyon. St. Mary's, man, those white boys could hoop. Those white boys could hoop, man. They might not be athletic, but – them dudes, they play basketball the right way. It reminds me of them Gene Hackman Hoosiers. <laughs> Jimmy Tillman? Yeah, man. Old Jimmy. Jimmy didn't say a word, but Jimmy could knock down at least 20 shots in the road. Big, big time get for them. But, yeah, I like St. Mary's. They're one of those teams that can make some noise. Alabama versus Charleston. I got Charleston. I got Charleston. This is that 413 that I'm just, uh, Bama, you've shown a lot of inconsistencies this year. Y'all look good sometimes, and y'all can score a lot of points, but Nate Oates, this is the tournament in Charleston. I think they'll give them everything they want, so that's one of my first upsets. I got Charleston advancing in that 413 matchup. Then Wait, got- you, don't trust, you don't trust Mississippi State? No, I like Izzo. Something right. about Izzo, man. Like, he's let me down before, yeah, but Mississippi State, I think that's more of Rick Barnes looking like just straight shit during this time of the year. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, they're they're solid. And, you know, that's a flip of a coin, 8-9 game. But I'm going to go with coaching. I'm taking Tom Izzo in that one. All right, Clemson, New Mexico. New Mexico. New Mexico, man. Yo, New oh, Mexico. Conviction. Yo, yeah, New Mexico has two former NBA players' sons. This oh, yeah, man, Eddie House. Eddie House's son, Jalen House, who's an absolute baller. And then you're going to feel old on this one. Jamal Mashburn Jr. <laughs> Mash? His Mash. Kid goes, his yeah, kid goes man. to New Mexico? Yep, Jamal Mashburn Jr. Both of those guys lit it up in the Mountain West big uh, tournament and won that whole thing. I like New Mexico. They got good guard play. Baylor versus Colgate, who the Horns saw last year. Colgate will fire up those three. Scott Drew's team better be prepared. I think they will be. I got the Bears. Dayton, Nevada. This one's tough. Really tough. This is, I, I can't even give you any, you know, Consensus on this. This is just straight up McCoy. McCoy, Dayton. <laughs> like I, I'm picking Dayton. I really, there's really nothing there that shows me any separation. It's just what you feel. Like that's Dayton. That's why this tournament stuff is so difficult. And then last in the West Division, we got Arizona versus Long Beach State. Going with the Wildcats. So. Anything there that jumps at you besides the Michigan State, Mississippi State game? Like, how how much do you like Arizona? I like them, but not too much to put them in the Final Four, you know. But they they could be solid. They could be solid. Arizona wants no part of a team like Virginia. Like Virginia? Yeah, a team that's going to – Slow it down on them. They want to. Um, they want to go, man. Yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. And the South Division, Houston wins that. I'm not even going to say Longwood State. Don't even really have to say them. I mean, it's Houston. Come on now. Nebraska versus a And M. Yo, Nebraska. I was going to pick them just because they got that Japanese stuff. Curry. I like him, man. He's a lefty. He be firing that thing. But Wade Taylor. 
that dude's an absolute dog. I'm going to take the Aggies as much as that hurts. I'm not going to be petty. This isn't one of those times. Texas versus Texas A&M situations. I'm going to pick the Aggies to go play Houston in the round of 32. Wisconsin, James Madison. I like Wisconsin. They looked really good in the Big Ten tournament, beating Purdue. I'm taking them. Duke versus Vermont, going with the Blue Devils. Another upset coming up, Chip. NC State Tech. Got to have NC State, baby. Those Wolfpack, they are rolling. They got that big DJ Burns, Zach Randolph-looking brother. He is so cold. He was killing in the ACC tournament. Just old school, back you down. If you're not going to double him, then he's going to score. Now, you better double that dude. He's got good footwork, great touch. And then they got DJ Horn, who can absolutely fill it up. Yeah. That might be it for those Red Raiders, man. First round. That is a, they have a horrible, horrible run in them. If if they advance, Texas Tech somehow does, hey, that's a hell of a job for them because I, I don't see it. That's a tough draw that they got. Like it's way more difficult than Texas got. And they had a better record than Texas and was fourth in the Big 12. So yeah. Yeah. When the ACC cool. tournament winner is an 11 seed, you that's just cool. got. A bad draw. Yeah, horrible draw. So I'm picking NC State there. Kentucky versus Oakland. Going with Calipari and them. Florida State versus either Boise State or Colorado. I'm going with Boise State or Colorado. Whoever wins that game, because Florida, they had one of their uh, players like break their leg in the first three minutes of the game yesterday. Oh, yeah. Auburn. That was dark. I, stuff like that could set you back a lot and somebody always wins that first four game. And I don't think it's going to be Texas, the team that loses with Colorado state and Virginia. So it has to be either Boise state or Colorado and whichever one wins that first four game tomorrow, or Wednesday, I think they're going to beat Florida. So I got them advancing Marquette, Western Kentucky Marquette. So that rounds it out in the South and in the Midwest, where Texas is at, Purdue advances. TCU beats Utah State, going with the Big 12 there. Upset alert, 12-5. McNeese, going with McNeese. Your boy Will Wade, dirty as hell. Dirty as hell at LSU, but the dude can coach. Them boys, McNeese, they've won 30-something games this year. They've only lost three. I like that. I like that. Mark Few's team, that ain't the same Mark Few squad that he's had in recent years. They're gettable, and I think they're going to get got. So I'm taking Magnese in that 5'12". There's usually a 5'12". There it who is. Was the, who was the Texas kid, the big man with the stash and the headband? He's gone. For who? For Gonzaga. Oh, Drew Timmy. Yeah, Drew Timmy. Drew he ain't Timmy, coming yeah, through that door. door. Yeah, yeah, he ain't walking through that door anytime soon. Another upset alert, Kansas – Looked like shit against Cincinnati. Hunter Dickerson and Kevin McCuller ain't 100%. I got Stanford. Samford. I got him. I, I just, something about it. It sounds crazy, but you got to throw something in somewhere. I think Kansas could get got very early. That team, mm, Furphy ain't playing too well. That, again, Cincinnati shouldn't have blown them out the way that they did. If Hunter Dickerson and Kevin McCuller, if those guys are gimpy, Yo, self, this might be that first round exit that you've seen before. 6 11, South Carolina, 3 14, Creighton, 7 uh, 10 with Texas and Colorado State and Virginia. Got Texas and then Tennessee versus St. Peter's. I got St. Peter's. So I'm just going to skip So we because we don't have enough time. That Texas game, they're losing to Tennessee. Sorry. Yeah. That, yeah, I, I can't yeah. do it. Like, I'm not going to be a homer in that situation. I don't, I wish I could, but that Texas yeah, if you're, team. If you're wrong, you'll be happy. Yeah, if I'll be wrong, I'll be really happy. Exactly. So uh, anything else that stands out for me? I got UConn advancing to the Final Four. I think they're going to beat Illinois, which I think Illinois is going to beat Iowa State. That's going to be a tough game. I can't wait to see that. Hopefully it plays yeah. out. That's but, all right. Yeah, yeah. I, I like Iowa State. It's just, I don't know, man. I think Brad Underwood's squad just has just enough offense to dethrone them. 
but I obviously can be wrong. Iowa State, they're a really good ball club, but I got UConn winning that. They're playing in Boston and stuff. Like, come on. That's just – that's going to be basically a home game. That's an absolute joke. Then I got North Carolina – or excuse – yeah, yeah, North Carolina. North Carolina, Carolina or North. NC State? North Carolina. Okay. In the, in the West, I got North Carolina. Um, I'm sorry. Hold up. I picked St. Mary's. Excuse me. I picked St. Mary's. Yeah. North Carolina. I don't trust them either. I don't like, trust them. They got a really good starting five. After that, they're not very good. So, again, they could, you could put up a lot of chalk, but last year showed us with the transfer portal, there were no number one seeds that made the final four. Like, UConn was a number four seed. They played like a number one seed, but they're a number four seed. So Yeah, Marquette I, beat them twice in the regular season last year. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, I got <laughs> – so, wow. Man, my brackets look messed up. Okay, so my Elite Eight, I got St. Mary's versus Baylor. I'm picking Baylor. I got Baylor. Scott Drew in them. I think he could do it. I didn't like that game against Iowa State, but, again, Iowa State, that was basically a home game. I like Baylor going to the Final Four. Moving on to the South Division, I like Houston going to the Final Four and beating Kentucky in the Elite Eight. And then in the Midwest Division, I got Creighton beating Purdue to go to the Final Four. My championship is UConn versus Houston, and I got UConn going back-to-back winning the national championship. So, yeah, you know, I don't feel good about my bracket at all, but hey. Like I said earlier, if you do feel good, then you're lying to yourself and you're flat out crazy because this is the hardest thing in the world to predict. Yeah. Like, you're a liar if you say you've watched, oh, I've watched every single team in the tournament, every single game of every single team. I know how every team plays. No, come on. You're kidding yourself. You know, <laughs> like you're kidding yourself. I almost watched every championship game that was played in every conference, but. I didn't watch all of them. Like, I watched the McNeese one. They look great. They got really good guards and bigs and, def- and defense and stuff. Like, that's why that one, I think it's an upset, that 5-12 game with McNeese, you know, moving along. But, yeah, you just never know, and that's what makes it so much fun. And, oh, yeah, I did the women's too, which the women's is all chalk. All chalk. Not even close. Texas, Final Four. South Carolina Final Four, Iowa Final Four, and I put UConn in the Final Four. Other than you USC, beat, you got him beating uh, Juju. Yeah, I like Juju, man. Like, she's tough to stop. But Paige Beckers, Gino, I'm gonna go with the experience, man. Gino, he loves this time of the year. You know what I'm saying? He get them girls ready. They might not be as talented as those. Sue Bird, Tarazi, or Maya Moore years that he had when they were winning it all the time. But Paige Beckers, she's good enough to get them to the Final Four. So, yo, the women's is going to be popping. Like, women's is going to be popping. They got stars there with Juju and Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark and Madison Booker. And you mentioned Cameron Brink earlier, talking about she a swimsuit model and stuff, which she is. She is. I'll be seeing their stuff on Instagram. Yeah. Uh huh. She's going to make a lot of money. She, she already <laughs> is, but she's going she to make a lot of money that some WNBA players don't make. Cameron Brink don't got to worry about none of that. She's going to be doing some serious networking. Yeah. Yeah. She, uh, she's got some attitude too, man. I, I like watching her play. She's a, uh, her godfather is Steph Curry. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how that, I think, um, I think um, the mom, Sonya Curry and Cameron Brink's mom played volleyball together back at Virginia Tech. So they're really close. And obviously Cameron Brink being at Stanford is really close to Golden State. So, yeah. What's up, fellas? going on how y'all doing one of the best times yeah. of the year doing great yeah man oh yeah 
Oh yeah. All right, Marco, I'll, I'll, that's Spurs at the mood. I wish I was there last night. Friday night was fun to see Joker, but man, last night's game that was a, that was a, that was a hell of a win for those guys. I know the NBA season's a long one, but the way they finished that game, that's definitely gonna be got to be a confidence booster, uh, not just for Wemby, but but for the rest of those guys too. I mean, Wemby going putting on a show for the Austin fans, man. Thirty three points, fifteen boards, seven seven assists, I think, and seven blocks. <sighs> Gosh, <laughs> I yeah. mean, he was not that far off from a quadruple double. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say David Robinson had a quadruple double during his Spurs days. But yeah, if you're the Spurs, you better go after Trey Young hard this summer. Like, that's a guy, pair him with Victor Wimbinyama. I'm not saying they would win an NBA championship in year one, but that's a playoff caliber team. And Victor Wimbinyama, I don't think he's going to wait around that long. You know, he's saying all the right things now and how he's a spur and loves San Antonio and stuff, but you don't make the playoffs year after year after year or you don't get, you know, where you think you should be. You see what Kevin Durant did, Braun, guys will be quick to get out. So the Spurs, they better take advantage now of all this young talent and go make moves while they can because Victor Wimpenyama, he ain't going to wait around. Real yeah. quick, what what y'all think of Justin Fields getting traded to the Steelers for a couple of empty beer cans? <laughs> wow. Trey? We had Trey's audio. Can't hear you. Uh, <laughs> that look. That look. Yeah. That is That's it all. I, I mean, that quarterback battle is going to be interesting. Yeah, you have to think it's a battle. Russell Wilson, you got Justin Fields, and they're saying Russell's going to be the starter, and Fields will be the backup. Already, they're not going to let him battle it out. Well, I mean, they're basically saying that Wilson's going to go in as the starter. Yeah, and I think that makes sense. I mean, and you have Fields behind him, where hey, it's always a competition, even when they say a guy's going in as the starter. I mean, if Wilson looks like two years ago, Broncos Wilson, Fields is going to get his chance right away. And I think it's a good fresh start for Fields. Uh, I mean, to go to a head coach like Mike Tomlin, you know, not an offensive head coach by trade, but kind of the the demeanor, success, all of those things, you know, checks a lot of boxes for, for Fields or for anybody if you want to have a career renaissance. Yeah. I think, I think it's a great fit. And they talked about, polls talked about doing right by Fields. You got to feel like, you know, Ryan Poles, the Bears GM, could have gotten more for him than, as Chip said so eloquently, a couple of beer cans. <laughs> I mean. And don't don't disrespect the beer cans, Chip. Come on. Right. I was like, wow, a sixth round pick. Yeah. That's what Jeff Swaim went for. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it was a battle from jump. I want to promise Russell Wilson a damn thing. You better prove to me that you're serious because all the things that you hear out, off off the field, pretty toxic and pretty makes you nervous as a GM and a head coach because, again, yeah, don't bring all that prima donna, oh, I'm better than you, look at my wife, bullshit over here because Pittsburgh, that's the last place that takes that. So you better prove to me that you're that Russell Wilson that was back in the Pacific Northwest lining it up and being a perennial pro bowler before we just name you that job. Because Justin Fields, he ain't no scrub. Like, it's not like he just had an all-star cast around him to make him look great. You know, I know people like to laugh and say he's basically a running back that's playing QB. But a lot of those times, nothing was there because nobody could get open. Like, you're double in DJ Moore all the time. You ain't got no run game besides your QB. So what chance was Justin Fields really given? You know, and right? I, I, that's the thing. Like he wasn't really given the chance. And yeah, man, I Russell Wilson going to be looking over his shoulder a lot. And he should be. Trey, you guys hear me? Yeah, oh, man. Spectacular. Let's go. All right, you boys. The thing that y'all just said about Justin Fields, fuck the Bears. They're making a big mistake here. Justin Fields is going to make them pay for this one. Damn. Hey, I, I, as somebody who has no ties to either franchise, I, I, I hope he does because 
he's not exactly or he didn't exactly get the same deck that Caleb Williams or whoever they draft is going to is going to walk into and be able to deal with. I mean, the that's got to suck to see them basically treat you like shit for three years, put nothing around you, not invest in it, just completely dysfunctional franchise. Um, and then now you're on your way out. They trade you again, do right by you in the sense that they traded you to a respectable franchise with an established culture and some good weapons, good defense and all that. But then to see what they're doing for the next guys, that's, that's tough on the way out. Yeah, absolutely. All right, fellas. Hope y'all's bracket is cool. Out of here. (laughs) I'll do my bracket tomorrow. There we go. Happy birthday, Trey. Uh, it sits back. Let me see if I can get this done. Get this off my damn screen, these stupid balloons. Balloons shouldn't make you that upset, but I am a, an old man at heart, Jeff. And we now officially start another edition of the 3 to 5 show. This is yours and my second time to see one another today, and it looks like you're not wearing your work shirt right now. Oh, I'm wearing something way better. <laughs> should, we, should we show the people that are on the stream? Let's show the people. Oh, yes, sir. Pump fake Purdy NFL blitz. Look at that. Does that look like a game manager to you? That looks like an athlete to me. That looks like a bona fide badass to me. Look at that. That looks like a, I was about to say a Super Bowl quarterback. That looks like a quarterback that played in the Super Bowl. (laughs) A Super Bowl, Super Bowl participating quarterback. Yes. Yes, exactly. So maybe I'll have to wear the Jalen Hurts shirt next. So you and I met at Goodstock by Nolan Ryan a little bit earlier. Unfortunately, it was later than anticipated because we were texting yesterday. You asked me, what time do we want to meet today at Summer Moon and then go over to Goodstock? And I typed out what my answer was, which is 1045, and then completely neglected to send it. So I waited at Summer Moon for five, 10 minutes, and I said, wait a second, let me double check something here. And sure enough, I completely old man the text message response but you were nice enough to uh to run up there to uh to meet me to grab the shirt and coffees for uh for you and your lovely bride hey it happens it happens great to meet perry as well yeah, yeah good perry stock. who uh helps run the show at good stock man y'all look we're not just saying this because we know perry and he's a, a great dude good stock is a badass butcher shop in Round Rock, it's off of 79, just east of the Dell Diamond. You get past the Dell Diamond, that very next light where that Hat Creek Burger Company is. You take the left hit there if you're heading east on 79 away from Dell Diamond. And it's in that same parking lot where the summer moon is. There's a Tony season there as well. It is top quality meat, not just beef, although uh, they've got great beef. They do everything from chicken to pork. I got a couple of uh, YU strip steaks today that I will be uh, cooking at some point in the next couple of days. And every time I've gone there, one, I end up buying more than I was anticipating, but two, I am uh, myself and my family are always satisfied customers when I uh, do actually cook up whatever it is that I purchased at good stock. So I have Thursday off this week, watch a little March madness. And I decided I'm gonna go back to good stock. I'm going to get some ribeyes. I'm going to clean the grill the day before, get it ready. Cause we haven't used it in a couple months. And I'm going to, I'm going to fire up, uh, you know, some, some beers, some drinks some fire up the grill. Uh, I have a couple TVs going in the living room, watch all the March madness. Uh, this will be, this will be Jace's first year where I don't know if he's quite there yet, where he's really going to enjoy the March madness, but as impressionable as he's ever been. So I'm going to, I'm going to give him the full March madness experience and hope to show him why uh, March madness is, I think outside of, and you can't really compare it to the Super Bowl from a, or really from any standpoint, but even because, you know, the, the, the Super Bowl, the game is one day. I think the beauty of March Madness is just, you get so, you get so much bang for your buck. I mean, you Especially get all the, all the games. Yeah. Wh- whatever side you're into it, your bracket, you're into gambling, you're into just watching it. You're just a hoop head, whatever. So yeah, we're going to, we're going to have a little family time on Thursday and grill some, uh, some steaks from good stock, watch some games. So, uh, Jace is five years old now. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. So my kids were eight and six during last year's March madness, which included Texas making it to the elite eight and losing in somewhat a heartbreaking fashion 
It was last year's March Madness that let my both of my kids experience sports tears for the very first time. Because they were bawling their eyes out when Texas lost that game to Miami in the Elite Eight, getting completely fucking screwed over in the process, by the way. In the nicest uh, way possible, I mean, I, I, or I say I mean this in the nicest way possible. That's awesome. Because yeah, you, you're well, going exactly. to experience it. The tears make the the tears of agony make the tears of joy or the celebration later that much more fun as, as obviously, you know, you know, as a, as a Longhorn fan, as a Rangers fan this past year and, you know, a fan of pretty much all your teams. And I'm, I'm the same way that when they finally pull through, it's going to make it that much sweeter. You're going to draw on those, those, those tough times where you're like, man, it wasn't a foul on Brock Cunningham. Why couldn't we make a basket in the last three minutes of the game? And you're going to be like, but you know what, this time we did. And it's going to be that much sweeter. We'll see if that ever happens for Texas basketball. <laughs> I'm not holding out hope anytime well, soon. Yeah, even just making a Final Four at some point. I mean, you you know, maybe not a national championship, but yeah, because all the time Texas has made one Final Four, and that was with I know people are going to say Kevin Durant, but a guy that I would argue is the Texas basketball coat with T.J. Ford, and it's not like they were loaded with NBA ready talent. Otherwise, Royale Ivy played in the NBA. For a few years, P.J. Tucker obviously had a long NBA career. He was a sort of sixth man that season, if I'm remembering correctly. But it was, in a sense, uh, some some just dirty work backyard brawlers who had played together for uh, several seasons. And T.J. Ford was exactly what that team needed. To uh, He was the straw that stirred that drink, as they say. And it was a, a such a fun basketball team to watch all year long. And unfortunately, they got a little bit apprehensive against that Syracuse team and that 2-3 defense because they were so tall down low. Once they figured out to start attacking the middle of that zone defense, it turns into a what-could-have-been situation had they figured that out a little bit earlier on. But even still, it is the best basketball season for Texas Longhorn Hoops in my lifetime. And yeah. I actually asked, I interviewed Chris Del Conte a little bit earlier, Jeff. I'll be uh, playing that interview tomorrow during my show with Kevin. Uh, it'll happen somewhere around 350, 355. Awesome. But I asked him if there are plans to erect a TJ Ford statue somewhere around the Moody Center. I think that'd be fair. I, I mean, you, you you mentioned, with all due respect to KD, that TJ is the GOAT. And it's it really is no offense to KD, but what you accomplish as a team, too. Like, that matters. And that is no offense at all. It's taking nothing away from Kevin Durant. He had a unbelievably you know productive and historic freshman season one season with texas but what what tj did is take texas to its only final four in the modern era he took texas to the only final four in a 64 team bracket the other other final fours were 1943 and 1947 and as i've said uh in you know regard to kd all due respect all due respect to the fellas that were getting it done in 43 and 47. But for you to be, in TJ's case, the only player to, to take Texas to a Final Four in the modern era, yeah, and, and do what he did, too, the way he did it is, yeah. You know who might agree with that take? Kevin Durant. Right, big, right, yeah. Big, man, he's a, that's a big reason why KD ended up at Texas. But it's not, yeah, because it's not a, a, all about what you ended up doing in the NBA. Like, And obviously, KD has a ton of love for Texas. And likewise, I mean... KD's brand and his success in the NBA and his generosity with the program since he had that success in the NBA still is has helped them leaps and bounds. So yeah, they're, they're, they're both Longhorn legends in their own right. But if you had to put one over the other, you know, go with the guy that took you to the final four. It's I don't think that's controversial. So as we were transitioning from the last show to this one, you did hold up a bracket. I could not see. Was that bracket completely empty? Yes. Yes, I, I did the the printable bracket. Okay. So I just I figured, uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of maybe this is a sign of old age now as well. You know, another sign for me as I reach my my thirties, I like to just see it all in one place. Sounds like something my dad would say. It's like to just like to see it, see it all in front of me. You know, see all, all four regions, see the path, the matchups. So that's why I printed it out. I also like to write out my winners on a bracket versus selecting from a computer and then printing out that version of the bracket. It also, yeah, it makes me feel a little bit nostalgic too because 
this is what we would do growing up. I mean, you know, my dad would print out the brackets at work and bring them back on Monday or, or hell, we'd probably even print them out on, on Sunday when the selection show came down. And inevitably I'd have like an 11 seed USC team winning the national championship that never happened. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's always fun to actually write it out. And another thing too, it makes me actually remember easier, which teams I picked. Cause I don't know if you're that way too, where if you actually write it out, I think there's probably psychological data that backs that up that when you hand write it out, you know, you, you remember it more, but I do that for, you know, a big, big interview with somebody or something like that. I'll write out my notes and my questions or topics that I want to touch on. But yeah, it helps me do that later because Trey, I don't know where you fall on this. This is something I wanted to talk about. I am a one bracket guy. Yep. A one bracket guy. So that if I pick something, if I pick the, you know, oh, my seeds are cut off over here on this side. You know, if I pick McNeese over Gonzaga and I'm, and I'm going to take a victory lap about it, I can't have four other brackets that dispute that. And I'm going to, I'm going to go in an old man rant here. No issue with multiple brackets if it's like a game theory type thing or it's a DraftKings deal and, and you're, you're just trying to win money. If your sole reason is just trying to win money and it's a data-driven decision and you're like, hey, let me fill out 60 brackets. Like I do that sometimes with not 60, but I do it with golf lineups in DFS. And I just try to pick one that can win me a, a big pot. If you're doing that, that's fine. But then don't go to the water cooler and be telling everybody that you picked the 15 over the two in one of your brackets. Or if you're going to do that, don't tell people you had multiple brackets. I or, don't know where you're at yeah, on that. Tell people, tell people you had multiple brackets. I picked I picked the 15 over the two in one of my eight brackets. Oh, I was basically just telling people that if you are going to say that, just don't just leave out that extra part where you're like, I also had seven other brackets. No, I think you need to tell people so that it's less impressive. You're trying to sound impressive. That's not that impressive. You've got eight brackets. True. I was, trying to, I was just trying to give people an out. Oh, I appreciate you trying to look out for the people. Fuck the people. <laughs> I'm not looking out for the people today. I'm a one bracket guy too for that exact okay. reason. Like I have a hard time. It's two different friend groups. So I'm like, all right, I'll deal with the second fantasy football team. I don't even like having a second fantasy football team because inevitably – I am having to root for and against the same players throughout the course of the year. That's just annoying to me. The amount of the amount of stuff we see eye to eye on is is is, is great, which makes it even better when we do then disagree on something. It's 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 great conversation. I'm the same way with fantasy football. I finally had to get out of the work league, the college buddies league, and I said I'm doing one league. It's going to be the league that I started with my buddies when we were. I want to say maybe even like doing it on paper. I can't even remember the first year. I think we were in seventh or eighth grade, which again, for me was probably 16 years ago now. Like it was very early fantasy football and it's essentially the same core group of guys. I mean, we've shuffled a couple dudes in and out here as they've, you know, fallen out of love with fantasy football or whatever their decisions about. But that's what I do. I do my one league, my one bracket, but then fantasy football, one league. Cause it gets, I mean, we all have like our, you know, we're in the same picks league, Trey, the, the pick eight against the spread league. Then you're just rooting for like a million other things. Like you'll be watching the end of a game and everything's just conflicting against each other. You'll be like, I have Raheem Mostert, but like I bet the Broncos and they're playing the Broncos in my, you know, my pick eight league. But then like I'm facing the Broncos defense and it becomes just a whole cluster F. Yeah. That's uh, that's a problem. It is. And I used to do four or five leagues myself. And I got to the point where I'm, I'm just like, I can't do this anymore. Like I can't be rooting for and against a lot of the same guys each and every week. That's just, it's too much chaos. And fantasy sports does make watching random games more fun, but you can cross that threshold pretty quickly to where it becomes just more annoying than anything else. By the way, speaking of friends who end up dropping out of long time leagues, isn't it always that a little bit of a sad thing? And you've gone through this now in a couple of your leagues, as you mentioned, with a, a friend group and your work, work group. Like, you know, we sh shed a little bit of a sports tear anytime somebody says, you know what, that's it. I'm done with fantasy football together. I can't do this anymore. I just want to ask that person, is you okay? Is everything all right? Do we need to have a, a different sort of conversation? Do we need to do a wellness check on you during football season? I've actually had a couple of situations where 
the friend quits the league and then once back in a year or two later and it's like well shit dude now you're on the wait list we're not going to mm-hmm. add a team to this league or add two teams to this league this league is at 12 teams right now that's the optimal number of teams now you're going to have to wait for somebody else to make the poor decision that you did two years ago i gotta be honest though i have been the guy that has threatened to leave even the main league before based on stupid rule changes that negatively impacted me they basically made a rule change because of the success that i had with the legacy keeper rule so i picked mahomes in the last pick in the draft and there was no like some leagues do it where you can keep him forever but you have to give up a round of value so if you got him in the 16th then the next year you keep him it's in the 15th so on down the line well this was a league where there was no rule until they implemented a four-year max keeper rule. Conveniently, Trey, after I picked Patrick Mahomes with the last pick in the draft and then kept him. So I did throw a little hissy fit about that. Yeah, I did throw – because that's BS, man. I did throw a little hissy fit and threatened to leave. They knew I was never going to leave. I got outvoted on the rule, so I guess that's that's a supposed democracy right there. Didn't work out for me. What do you think about leagues that don't have kickers? Because my main league right. decided no more kickers this last season. And I thought I would have more of an issue with it. I'm completely fine with that. I don't need a kicker scoring 18 fucking points and beating me. To- totally fine with it. Yeah, I don't I don't give a shit to watch football to hope that the kicker I have in fantasy makes a 47-yarder. Or hopefully he breaks a record and I get a... Three, he he makes a three point field goal, but I get five and a half for it because it was from fifty five plus. Like, I don't care about all that. I'm also I'm fine getting rid of the defenses too, or adding in something specific where we've talked about this in our league where you maybe have specific players. Like every person drafts three defensive players, and we make the draft twenty rounds. Like we've talked about things like that to at least where you're like, okay, I I have three defensive players, and it's like Micah Parsons you know, TJ Watt and oh, somebody else who like racks up a bunch of picks or um, Deron Bland. Uh. <laughs> you just said you to get into a salary cap league. I don't oh. do football anymore, but I do salary cap. The leagues are the most competitive and most fair. I've heard that from numerous people now and I'd be intrigued, but I'm also at my cap for leagues. I'm at two and that's one too many. I've, I've seen leagues like that that he's talking about where they are you're given like an allotment, maybe not like it's a normal draft, but then you're given a salary cap or an allotment for the waiver wire because that's something that a lot of leagues run into is, and I know they do the waiver claims in different ways based on how many moves you made, but you get the guys that just kind of game the system on the waiver wire, which I don't have a huge problem with because that's part of it. Like I should just be smarter and do a better job of that, but at least it forces you to not to not have guys that are just firing away on every single waiver claim when a guy comes up. Yep. Oh, well, we uh, somehow ended up on the subject <laughs> of fantasy football. Oh, yeah, as a result of us talking about only filling out one bracket, I'm like, how the hell did we get there? I, I was thinking that same thing too, but yeah, I mean, hey, it's strategies. Strategies are similar. I this my old man ran about the single bracket is what's what the spurred this so I'll, I'll take the blame yeah and i'm to a point now too and i hate to admit this but i know so little about college basketball that even filling out a single bracket is somewhat of a waste of time like i'll fill out that bracket and after the first round i'm like oh three of my final four teams are gone i've only got two elite eight teams left uh, i don't really need to pay attention to this anymore yeah i've just turned into the smart ass where i look at it and i go all oh, the eight nine game against michigan state and mississippi state yeah MSU's going to win. That's a lock. Just a horrible dad joke. That's pretty, pretty much that's pretty much where I've gone. Um, but it's it's more and more difficult now, I think, with with the men's game, especially yeah. to follow a lot of these teams. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, Texas's little bottom right corner of the bracket with a potential Rick Barnes matchup. But even with them, like they have a couple of seniors like Zakai Ziegler. Or I don't know if he's a senior yet, but he's been around for a while. They have a couple guys like that that have that have been around for a minute. But then, like, they also have Dalton Connect. If Dalton Connect wasn't the most high-profile mid-major transfer that's now averaging twenty points for a 
you know, a high major team, then I probably wouldn't even know who he is. So half the teams on here have guys like that, that we didn't even hear about until a week ago, like NC state. I didn't know who DJ Burns was until I started, you know, it started popping up all over my feed and they won five games in five days in the ACC tournament. And now they're in. God, so, five games in five days. That is insane. I think that's what Virginia Tech did a couple years ago when Texas played them in Milwaukee in the first round in that what would have been a – was that a 7-10? That was a 7-10 game. Another 7 Beard's game. first year or was that during Shaka Smart's time? Yeah, that was Beard's first year. And then they beat that Virginia Tech team in the first round and then lost to Purdue in the second round. And I believe that was when they lost to St. Peter's after that the next week maybe mm. or in the sweet 16 i feel like even if you win five games in five days that you are set up to lose that very next game that's a, just a lot of basketball and it seems like you'll be a little bit off kilter taking not quite a week off after that so like when i'm filling out my bracket i'm probably gonna have them losing in the first round yeah and even if I mean, those picks are pretty – like, everyone talks about picking the first-round upsets. It's more about picking – like, it's more about fading a few of the big teams, not necessarily about picking exactly when they'll lose. And, and you only get, like, what, one point, two points in most of these for a first-round win. So unless you pick the 12 that goes all the way to the Elite Eight and you had them winning all those games, you're not making up that much ground on everybody else. Nope. It's just about – keeping your final four intact for as long as possible, or even your elite eight, when those games start actually winning you more points in the bracket, or it's about deciding like, Hey, I'm going to pick a couple upsets. And it's not necessarily that I think like I'm throwing one out there. Arizona is going to lose to long beach state, but it's more that I just don't think they're going to make the final four or make the elite eight. So I'm just going to bet them to bounce early. And then maybe I'll get lucky and be the only guy that picked the 15 over the two. Because it seems like every year now, especially with the extra parity, even more than there already was in college basketball, and as we were just talking about, the less it seems like we know about a lot of these teams year to year with the portal, that you see a 16 over a 1. I mean, I think it's only happened, what, like two times now? It happened last year with Fairleigh Dickinson beat Purdue, and then obviously the UMBC. Um, but, yeah, you see that. Just feels like you see those a little bit more, the 14 over the three. That's why a lot of Texas fans were so nervous last year. Again, they were fine against Colgate, but like 14 could beat a three. We've seen 15 over two happen a number of times. Shit, we've seen 16 over one twice now. But it just, I don't have data to back this up, but it feels like it, it's just happened a little bit more as we've entered this portal era. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it definitely is. And by the way, that's a bad thing for college basketball. When your best teams are losing to 16 yeah. seeds, I know it's exciting in the moment. That's actually a bad thing for the health of the sport. I barely remember what happened in the final four last year. Like it, it was great that Florida Atlantic and San Diego state were there, but at the end of the day, those were probably what two of the easiest games that UConn played exactly. in their tournament run. Like that's not great for the sport. That is anti what the college football playoff did last year, by the way, with the Florida state team, that a team whose body of work suggested that they should be in the playoff. Playoff committee said, no, you're actually not one of the four best teams anymore. They found themselves on the outside looking in. They got pounded in their bowl game. Meanwhile, the three college football playoff games were all pretty darn exciting. I know the Michigan-Washington game got away from the Huskies, but even that one was good going was, into the fourth quarter. Yeah, that was an exciting football game still, yeah. especially with some of the, the, the big plays. And you, and you felt for a 75%, basically three-quarters of the game that Washington had a chance there. Yeah, I think there's a there's a fine line in the NCAA tournament with the upsets. Like it's cool to have a couple, maybe two or three double digit seeds a year in there, maybe one or two in the Sweet 16. But I'm fine if it's just that. I mean, I I want to watch the best teams play, <laughs> and the upsets are fun here and there. They make fun stories, but they also inevitably at some point down the line make for a shitty game make for a game that when we get further down the tournament and there's fewer games and there's more eyes on individual games, unlike in the first couple of rounds when people are just flipping around or have 
three different TVs on three different games and they're all in mute. You know, everyone's watching this one game. It's a standalone game in a lot of cases. And then it ends up being a total dud. Right. So what do you think about Texas as a seven seed facing the winner of Virginia and Colorado State a playing game happening tomorrow night in Dayton? I think the seven seed was the way of the committee bumping Texas up more than they probably deserved. Cause I thought after that abysmal second half performance and one and done exit in the big 12 tournament, I thought they were for sure going to be an eight or a nine. I mean, they beat the projections. They were projected as a nine after that by Lenardi. Um, so they even jumped that by two. Then I think the committee's way of saying, Hey, okay, well, we're going to give you the seven seed. And also they want to set up the potential Barnes, Terry, UT, UT, matchup in the second round, which well, I'm sure we'll get to in a minute. But I think they said, okay, well, we're going to give you less time to prepare for an individual opponent now. And that's why they gave them the, the 10 seed play in game. So they'll play the winner of Virginia, Colorado state. And again, I think that's going to get a little bit overblown because Texas is going to come out and they're going to have, I mean, Rodney said they're going to have really physical practices uh, today. They probably already had one. And then again, tomorrow, So, yeah, they're not going to be able to be on the court for more than one day going through game plan for a specific team. But there's so many coaches and support folks on these staffs at at the level that Texas is at, at at the high major level to where there's guys advanced scouting, multiple people advanced scouting both of these teams. And then you'll get to also watch that team play. So. I think it kind of makes sense why they got the they're going to get the play in winner because it's a bit of a preparation disadvantage, I guess, if you had to say that, or if you had to pick one side or the other. Um, and then the well, other at, at the, disadvantage, if you look at what play in winners have done that next round, yes. BK pointed this out earlier, and I knew a version of this existed, but 11 of 12 play in game winners have gone on to win that round of 64 matchup. Yikes. Yeah, because you're, which actually makes sense. It's a lot of times what we see in the MLB playoffs with, with the wild card teams, where playing, playing that high stakes, you know, in this case, survive an advanced single elimination or what they moved it to an MLB now, even a three game series, playing that is, I mean, you're, in this case, I know they call it a play in game. You're playing an NCAA tournament game, like you're playing a ten seed. Yeah, Texas is better than those ten seeds. Like they have a better resume. You would think they're a better team on paper, but it's not like you're playing a team that's that much better or worse either way. You're playing a true NCAA tournament game. And if you win that, the confidence that you now take and the rhythm that you now take into the next game versus a Texas team where, again, two sides to everything. One side is the rest. Get to Sue healthy, get all these guys healthy. But then the rust, it's always the classic rest versus rust. We do it. We do it in baseball, like I just said, with the teams that get the bye. We do it in football with the team, you know, the teams in the AFC and the NFC, the the one seed that gets the week off, rest first rust, and we see it play out different ways. Um, but yeah, there's I, I'm kind of fascinated by just how many different ways there is there are to look at this matchup and whether or not it benefits Texas. I think it. Look, they're a better team. They're better than both those teams. They have two two guys with a decent amount of NCAA tournament experience that are two of the better players in college basketball. And that's what I was saying Friday about why I feel like this team can potentially make a sweet 16 run because they have those two guys. And we haven't really seen Acemas and DeSue both totally click in the same game in a long time. So if you can, I don't even think they need that to beat whichever 10 seed they face. They'll need that to beat Tennessee, but it's not like that's crazy that, that that could happen. So I don't, I don't know how you feel about, a lot, a lot, a lot to unpack there. I think that people who are talking too much about Texas knocking off Rick Barnes in Tennessee in the second round are getting the cart way in front of the horse. The Virginia matchup worries me because good defensive teams have really limited Max Acemas. You just play really tight on him. They play physically. They deny the basketball, and he just doesn't have easy shots. And that has been a big reason why he struggled down the stretch like he did. And so DeSue will get his, or you think that he'll get his. Maybe if you know if he's much less than 100%, maybe there's a little bit of an issue there. But if Max Acemas doesn't get going, then all of a sudden you're relying on Tyrese Hunter and some of these other guys to get it figured out or to keep it figured out for a given game. And I just I don't have confidence that that can happen. 
And can Texas beat Tennessee in the second round if they get there? Sure they can. If things go right for them. But I also still this still see this team, in spite of that Baylor game, having a hard time against good competition and gritty defensive teams. And so uh, at this point, considering the 11 of 12 for play-in teams in that next round, I'm going in with very low expectations when Texas plays on Thursday afternoon. And That's if they win that game, then they've met, I think, a realistic preseason or heading into postseason expectation of winning one tournament game. And if they can beat Tennessee or if <clears throat> Tennessee loses in that first round, if they beat that next opponent, that's an overachieving season right there, which is going to be a hard pill for uh, those Longhorn fans who are not crazy about Rodney Terry. That's going to be a tough pill to swallow because I think Rodney Terry has already avoided any sort of hot seat scenario next season by making it to the tournament. Certainly if they win that first round game, but uh, Rodney Terry's not going anywhere including after next season, unless the season goes terribly, which I don't expect it to be because Rodney Terry is a good X's and O's coach who is finding his footing as a guy who has to reconstruct a roster every off season on top of being dealt a little bit of a shitty hand by losing his two five-star freshmen who both decided to go pro instead of playing in college a month after last season ended. Another thing about Rodney Terry that I don't know if I've pointed out that kind of goes against what a lot of the Rodney Terry haters along the way like to say, like, look, would he have gotten this job had he not been on the staff and Chris Beard left for whatever reason, you know, at some point, no, he wouldn't have been the guy that they picked, but everyone loves to pick apart his coaching resume. He coached at Fresno state. That's not a basketball blue blood by any means. That's not like going and coaching at, you know, Gonzaga or, or St. Mary's or somewhere like that. Like, I think they've been to maybe, maybe been to one NCAA tournament or two NCAA tournaments in the last 25 years. So it's not like he was taking over a blue blood program there. And he had some good seasons, not something like dusty Bay's doing at Florida Atlantic, where you're going to, you're going to go, Oh, we got to go get this guy. I mean, he took Florida Atlantic to a final four. Sure. He never did anything like that, but he was a very respectable coach at, at that level for almost a decade at that school and had a decent amount of success. And yeah, what was happening at UTEP wasn't exactly, you know, exciting anybody to the max, but I don't know the details behind his departure, what was going on there. And he left to, you know, come back to Texas. So sure. Nobody thought it was going to play out this way, but I do think it's important to clarify a little bit when people are like, Oh, I never even had any great success as a head coach before. Well, yeah, he didn't exactly take over at Gonzaga guys. Yeah, I'm looking at his Fresno State record right now. His first year, they were 11 and 19, but in the four or five seasons that followed, they finished with 20 plus wins in those four seasons. The exception was a 15 and 17 season in 2014 15, but you mentioned that one NCAA appearance. That was with Rodney Terry at the helm. In 2015 16, they went 25 and 10, 13 and 5 in the Mountain West, finished second in the conference, and did end up losing in the round of 64 and he was hired away from Fresno by UTEP and wasn't great there. Eight and 21 that first year, 17 and 15 that second year and 12 and 12 in that third season before he jets for Austin to join Chris Beard's staff. But I think that's a great point that you just made. It's not like Rodney Terry was experiencing losing season after losing season in his previous head coaching stops. Actually the opposite is true especially at Fresno. They have, I mean, Fresno state has six NCAA tournament appearances since 1980 when they moved up to the division one level. And I grew up in California. I grew up in Los Angeles where a lot of people, you know, they, they go recruit guys in California in Southern California. That's where Fresno state would go and some other places too, maybe even to Texas, but you would go to these big places, these big Metro areas to recruit kids, to recruit the diamonds in the rough, try to find those guys. Cause you're a mid-major program. No one talks about Fresno State basketball. It's not even like San Diego State, where San Diego State, even when I was growing up, was a solid destination. I mean, my high school played Kawhi Leonard when he was growing up in Riverside, and Kawhi ends up at San Diego State. Was a guy that, for whatever reason, didn't get the offers from all the Blue Bloods, 
but he goes to San Diego State and develops into, you know, what he's developed now with the help of of his time there. So, yeah, Fresno State again, just to close out that point. Not not exactly the, uh, you know, Duke of the mid majors in in Southern Cal or in California. It's in Central California. But yeah, I think uh, it's it's been you know seeing that seven seed's got to be pretty tough, Trey for. For some of these Rodney Terry haters, some of these guys that were just ready to ready to send the guy back to back to El Paso or back to the mid majors or <laughs> wherever the hell, back to Rick. Ready to they were ready to send him back to Rick Barnes to to go be an assistant at Tennessee, and now and now he might beat Rick Barnes in the second round. Long way to go, I know. Long way to go, but yeah, it's 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 just it's always interesting to see in in hindsight later on what what ends up happening but i'll say we were both we were both on that train of just let's just just settle down a little bit let's just everybody let this team figure it out no one ever thought they were going to turn into a one seed no one even thought they were going to turn into a one seed at the beginning of the season so for them to come out of all that all that noise that one and three big 12 start with the seven seed i mean you've got to be pretty happy now again don't completely shit the bed coming up in the NCAA tournament that could skew some things in the way people look at it. Cause that is, that is what you're judged by at the end of the season. That's why it's what you're judged by in this, in this sport. If they make an elite eight run again, no one even remember any of that early in the season. <laughs> They're just going to remember they went to back to back elite eights. I don't know That's if I'm right. predicting that by the way. That is correct. So you texted this before the show, and I think it's worth us talking about. I wanted to express my viewpoint on this today. I know I did so via Twitter last night. There are a number of teams who declined the NIT invitations they were given after not making this year's NCAA tournament. Teams like St. John's, Pitt, Memphis, Ole Miss. Oh, wow, Chris Beard didn't make the tournament this year. Didn't realize that until right now. Indiana and Oklahoma. I thought he was the greatest. I thought he was the next Coach K, though. Yeah, they were supposed to (laughs) compete for an SEC championship and maybe a national championship. Maybe not this year, perhaps next year. But they missed the tournament altogether, which is a a bit of a surprise. And all those teams in the IIT came calling, said, you know what? We're good, guys. Thanks, though. And there were some pundits who were upset and critical of those teams saying no to the NIT. But I have no issues with that. You fell short of that season goal, which is making it to the real tourney, the NCAA tourney, March Madness. The NIT is an also-ran tournament. It is a participation trophy tournament, and if you had higher aspirations and realized that you guys are a little bit bummed to fall short of that goal and it's been a long season, it's been a grind, you fought hard and you didn't quite make it there, it's okay to let the season come to an end. Yeah, I know you're losing out on another week or two's worth of practices, and more competitive games, but let's let the mid-majors fight for that NIT championship. Indiana doesn't need to play in the NIT. Oklahoma doesn't need to either. St. John's, maybe argue St. John's might uh, might get a little bit of value from the NIT, but clearly Rick Pitino didn't want any part of that deal. The NIT is a part of what's wrong with college basketball rights now, and that is way too many teams getting to take part in the postseason even those who did not play well enough to deserve another opportunity in March, albeit in that consolation tournament. How low is the CBI going to have to stoop to get That's some teams? Sure this thing, year? Because if so, I don't even know. That's a good point. That might not, that might not be a thing anymore, or they may have rebranded and changed the name. I'm not sure, huh. but I, I agree with you, Trey. I mean, and I think it's, it's case by case right now. And what we have to look at is the landscape of the sport right now. If you're one of these teams that whether you're a Rick Pitino who just missed the tournament and took over at St. John's and you called out basically your entire roster for being slow and not being great at basketball. Well, even though they outperformed and they elevated and to their credit, they took what I thought was an unnecessary um, slight that got personal from their coach directly to the media, which I thought was kind of bullshit, but look, it worked out. It worked out and they, they, they played really well down the stretch, but clearly the bulk of that team is not the core that Rick Pitino wants to build around. And this is why it's a case by case decision. Let's say that were the opposite. And 
there were eight guys in the core of this year's team at St. John's or Beard's team at Ole Miss. And those guys both said, you know what? All eight of you are coming back or six of the eight of you are coming back. And I want all of you to come back that can come back. Then that might make sense to say, hey, let's get the extra practices. Let's get the extra team building time together. Um, let's get the competition on the court together. Because as much as it is a participation trophy tournament, it still can't hurt if you have that same core and those are guys that you want to be part of your program moving forward to play and to get more experience with the lights, with referees on national television. I mean, those are still NIT games that they, they play those on ESPN and ESPN too. But if you don't want those guys around and that's not who you want to build around, then you need to get going. You need to go get, go rally some NIL money, go, go hit up the collective, go start pounding the pavement in the portal have your exit meetings before other teams are having their exit meetings to tell guys, Hey, and I know people don't like to hear this, but this is going to be said to quite a few guys. You probably should transfer. I don't think, I don't see a path to playing time for you here. We are going to recruit over you. And guess what? That's the real world. That, that is, that is the real world. We've all, we've all been in situations where, you know, if, you, if you've been in just the job industry long enough, we're, People have, they've picked somebody over you. Like it happens. It's part of life. And that's what a lot of these coaches are going to do. So going to the NIT and playing with a team that largely is going to look completely different the next season doesn't really do them a lot of good. They're just making a business decision to say, Hey, going and focusing on the recruiting, the roster building, and maybe drumming up, like I said, some more money from collectives and donors, that's going to be more valuable for them than going and playing in the NIT. And ultimately it's pretty simple. That's what it, that's what it comes down to. That's I haven't heard it on the record, but I'm sure when it does come out, they'll say, they'll say as much that that was the reason behind it was to, Hey, if we're not going to play for the whole thing, then we want to get a head start on putting ourselves in a better position to do that next year. That's a great point. Do you know who the one seeds are in this year's NIT? I mean, well, you said Oklahoma declined, so they would have been. Ooh, Pittsburgh? Did they accept? Pitt did not accept. No, they declined. Okay, they're another one that didn't accept. Villanova is a one seed, and they've obviously won championships recently. So Villanova is not too good for the NIT, apparently. Yeah, and they and look, I don't claim to know their roster. They may really like the team they have. They may say, "Hey, this is a team that." We're going to largely run it back with next year and then add a couple pieces here or there. Um, unfortunately, I I couldn't name any of the other one seeds. Indiana State, Seton Hall, and Wake Forest. Indiana State. Um, that's a mid-major, to your point a second ago. That makes sense. And we got robbed. The people got robbed of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The people got robbed of Larry Nerd. Was that his other nickname? Rob, Robbie Avila. What what was the first nickname? Cream Abdul Jabbar. Cream Abdul Jabbar. Okay, all right. I was I was a yeah that one's questionable. I was a bigger fan of Larry Nerd. Yeah, Larry Nerd fits a little bit more versus Cream Abdul Jabbar. Yeah, though I was kind of surprised how many of those nicknames kind of blew up, like with national college basketball pundits and stuff. I was like. In, I don't have any issue with them, but in today's day and age, those are a few that, that could be questionable, maybe. And, you know? Yeah, but... I mean, straight up calling this guy a nerd, saying he looks like a nerd? Like, I, I mean, I again, no issue with it. I'm just, I'm just saying, based on the world that I've... Or we've all lived in over the last couple of years. And, and... The tide has actually swung pretty far in the other direction now, believe it or not. Right. And I had this conversation, I forget if it was with BK or Kevin, but my own kids let me know because we talk about things. And so they let me know that kids are using the word gay as like a slur again. Uh, and, and the R word too. Uh, see, those two, I'm fine. I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm on the side that I think those are all right being retired. All right, being retired. I think it just depends on the circumstance. I think that uh, I, I personally don't say, I don't call people or things gay. Uh, I will use the other one, but it's only directed at people who are okay with that word being used. Like, 
Uh, let let me think of a good example for you. Oh, okay. Here we go. Um, the most ardent Trump supporters who believe everything is a conspiracy. How do these retards not think that Trump is a part of the conspiracy? Something like that, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you've got to be okay with that word being used for me to consider using that word with you. Oh, that's fair. I mean, I, in private, especially in private conversation. I mean, I think that probably goes for a lot of things. It just depends. <laughs> Although this isn't a private conversation. Right well, this now. is a very public conversation. That's why I, I am for the not... record. I am, I am not offended by that, nor am I endorsing the use of the word. Though. Well, what I told my kids, what I told my kids is like, guys, I know that some of your classmates are using those words. Find better words. Those words are, those words are for, uh, for simps as the kids say, uh, find better words. Find better ways to describe things. Find better ways to have conversations versus just demeaning somebody or something with a word that uh, may be considered offensive by some. I do struggle, though, because there is one term from the 90s. I don't know if this existed when you were a kid that really accurately described what was going on with the given situation. And I'll use the, the politically correct way to say that in modern times. Special needs strength doesn't have the ring to it that the other term did, but I don't want my kids saying the other term necessarily. So how do I go about properly explaining what's going on there? Cause there was a kid in my kids, um, martial arts class who was clearly dealing with something that I needed to warn them. Be careful. This kid has a special sort of strength. But special needs strength doesn't uh, provide a proper label so you're there. Describing that. What's that? Oh, you you froze for a second. You, so you you said the uh, that you you know explained that in a different way to them, in a more PC way, maybe to them. No, I just didn't give them any warning altogether. I was oh. too afraid to try and broach the subject. It was like I can't. Special needs strength doesn't give a proper description, but I'm not going to say the other terms. So I just ran from the conversation. I cowered. That that's one thing that I've realized in uh, in uh, stepdadhood that you that I, I like it makes me wonder how my parents came up with good answers for almost everything. At least that's how I remember it. Because you know the you know the gif where the guy's going. I can't remember who it is, but he's going like ah, like he's like I'm gonna say I'm gonna say some I'm gonna say someone oh uh, like that's how I am like maybe half the time when Jace asked me about something, even if it's, even if it's not something like that, it could just be like asking why, why is this? Why is that? He's at that phase. And in my head, I'm like, Holy shit. I have no idea what to say right now. One of my kids, my daughter, who's a really good reader. We were at a sushi restaurant. This would have been like a year ago. And on the back of the shirt, it's like sushi, love sex and something else and she said what is sex she's like what does sex mean or what is sex hmm. and justine love her to death but she struggles with word economy sometimes especially in pressure situations so she just starts going she just starts going into it like it's when a man and a man or a man and a woman or a man and a man or a woman and a woman or they and a the, the and a z and a she and a that and i'm like hold on hold on just take a breath a little a little word salad to it's try to a, it's a mature way that people sometimes show love for one another oh. that you are years away from really properly understanding that's a great answer well it's just like my uh calvin we were driving past a graveyard and this this was also about a year ago and we're driving and he's always asked deep questions he's always had a fascination fascination with death which is Slightly concerning, but it's also healthy too to wonder about these things, to ask questions. We're driving past this graveyard and he said, where do we go when we die? And this is a scenario where I start hemming and hawing. I'm like, well, it just depends on this religion thinks this, this religion thinks this, this religion thinks this. And he's like, well, where, where does the body go though? And I'm like, oh, you were asking a simple question and I made it way too complicated. And so I'm like, well, it depends. What, how, how do you, what do you want to happen? to your body if you die suddenly and god forbid that were to happen it would ruin all of our lives but what would you want to happen and he's like i'd want you i'd want to be cremated and turned into a tree he said all right cremated, okay 
into into a tree it is that's a very how are you only six right now that's a more mature answer than i think i would be capable of giving yeah he's well beyond what i could was able to comprehend even on that topic at nine my grandpa passed away and god bless my dad trying to explain to me what we were doing with the ashes like the cremation process i was i was not uh i mean i was handling it well in terms of like understanding what happened to him and death and that kind of stuff. But the actual cremation part, I was, I was not handling well. And this is a great point by double D parenthood is humbling and you have to explain things to your kids. Great. Yes. Well said there, double D. Do you remember? Oh man, (laughs) we're in a weird place now. I apologize, but this is what we do. Do you remember the first dead body you ever saw? I don't off the top of my head, but I have seen, you know, I've been to funerals where it's an open casket, I guess is what right. they call it, right? Yeah, open caskets were always weird to me because they've got makeup on and they're dressed like in their nice Sunday yeah. clothes. I honestly, that may only be a one time in my life, actually. So you've only seen one dead body then? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it definitely is. I'm not like scarred by it or anything where I'm like, oh, I remember that exactly. First dead body I ever saw was my grandmother's body after she passed away. And I was 29 years old and it was sad. She had dealt with a number of different illnesses, including cancer for a long time and outlived the doctor's estimates by years, literal years. And so when the end came, it was time, but it was still very sad. And so between myself and my cousins and, Uh, My mom and her siblings and my grandfather, like we were rotating who would be in Houston hanging out at the house because she was in hospice at this point. And uh, eventually it happened and I was in the house when it happened. And so uh, after she passed away, it was strangely romantic. My grandfather was in there with the hospice nurse helping to change the bedding and actually had her in his arms, like pulling her up when she took her final breath. Um, But after that happens, somebody has to come get the body, right? And so we had to wait for the, um, is it the mortician? I forget who it is who comes and gets the body. But the person who comes and gets the body does that. And it's late, it's overnight. It's like one or two in the morning. Well, they eventually come and they get the body ready to go. And so we're all kind of standing in there in in a line, like between where their bedroom was and where the door is, where they're going to be exiting the house. And they, they they're wheeling her body out as they're about to take her to, um, take her to the car to then take her to the morgue. And they stop for a second to let us say our goodbyes. And this is embarrassing, dude. I had a Larry David moment while I'm saying goodbye to my grandmother who has just passed away. Cause I lean down and I give her a kiss on the forehead, but her eyes are slightly open. And you know how in movies, when you see eyes slightly open, you just, you just do the quick like fingers on the eye on the eyelid thing, get them to close all together. Well, I'm like, I want her to look as at peace as possible. And so like, I give her the kiss on the forehead. I see the eyes and I just like really, really gently put the eyes down. The eyes pop back open and I'm like, shit at this point, I'm like, fuck. These eyelids need to stay closed. So I did it again. Held it like one Mississippi, two Miss. Yeah, I three Mississippi, my my grandmother's eyelids, to try and keep them closed. Release. That is an LD moment. Open back up again. I'm like, I don't know what to do at this point. So I just kind of like backed up and said, I love you, grandma, and let them wheel her body out, unfortunately. I don't mean to laugh at that, but. Uh, no, you, you should. Yeah, I mean, that's, okay, okay. I'm telling the story because it's ridiculous and it's <laughs> badly me. Permission to laugh at your at your curb uh, side plot there. Yeah, literally one of the, I would argue, the three or four most important people in my life dying. Like, I can't even say goodbye to the body properly. I have to get obsessed with some unimportant detail. But it was important to me. I wanted to see her look as a piece of possible, okay? Uh, man, we have run the gamut. We just closed out the, out, closed out the first hour with quite the, uh, quite the conversation there. Bang. Let's talk a little NFL now. Easy transition there. (laughs) 
because uh, there were some uh, some moves made over the weekend, one involving the Cowboys and a guy who's been on the roster for a long time who no longer will be. Tyron Smith heading to the New York Jets, so the Cowboys will officially be looking for a new left tackle. Not a complete shock, and I thought this is something that they should have been on the lookout for the last couple of years. Even though Tyron was much healthier this most recent season, it's only a matter of time before he's hurt and having to miss a huge chunk of the year once again. So perhaps the Cowboys will be in the market for a left tackle because they didn't do it in free agency. But in the draft coming up next month, they will be looking within those first couple of draft picks for that next great left tackle. Yeah, and I think you just reach a certain point with NFL roster building where you can only pay so many guys. I mean, we talk about this a bunch with the Cowboys where – you know, you, you're paying Dak. That now that now limits your margin for error on certain draft picks and free agency hits. Like you, you have to you have to hit at a much higher rate, which Cowboys have done in the draft largely, hit really well with finding guys. You know, I know Micah Parsons wasn't a late round pick, but he was a steal at what, you know, in the early teens when they drafted him for, you know, as productive as he's been. So um, yeah, this is you know, one where kind of kind of makes sense. And at that age and the injury history that you mentioned going years back that maybe they, they just didn't think it was worth it to bring him in on the deal that, that he wanted. And I did see today that the Cowboys, they, they reworked their, uh, or sources say they reworked their contract with, with Dak to reduce the salary cap hit um, as he heads into the final year of his deal. So so they didn't uh, add any years to the deal. They just reworked that final year to where they owe less this next season and will still owe him money in the years that follow. Yeah, it says a $5 million roster bonus has been converted into a signing bonus to reduce the 2024 cap hit by $4 million ah. to just over $55 million. The Cowboys can create more salary cap relief with an extension for Prescott, who is coming off a wild card loss at home to Green Bay that dropped his playoff record to 2-5. and five. <laughs> Nice little... That's a little tidbit they threw in there at the end. Leighton Van Der Esch, <laughs> that was retired, by the way, to credit. Leighton Van Der Esch retired today also, uh, medically induced retirement. He wanted to keep playing, but his body is just not going to allow him to. So it's uh, probably been a net negative of an offseason for the Cowboys up to this point. Not that you expected to get Van Der Esch back, but losing Tyron Smith, there's a void at left tackle now. Dak... Uh, agreeing to rework his contract to provide some more room under that salary cap is a big deal. I'm just looking at this now on ESPN.com. I didn't realize Austin Eckler is now a member of the Washington Commanders. I still think he's got some juice left as he uh, leaves the Chargers for the other coast. And I guess we'll sh we shall uh, we shall see. He's going to have a rookie quarterback handing the football off, so he uh, will likely uh, receive a little bit more work at least early on. Well, he doesn't have Brandon Staley as his head coach anymore, so I think that automatically adds at least 50% to his production percentage there. That's a big deal. The other big news, and I'd say the biggest news from this weekend, is the Chicago Bears finally found a partner for trading Justin Fields away, which assures that they will be selecting Caleb Williams with that number one overall pick. They sent him off to the Pittsburgh Steelers, who just signed Russell Wilson last week for a sixth round draft pick that turns into a fourth round draft pick. If Justin Fields plays more than half the offensive snaps for the Steelers in 2024 Steelers may have just absolutely swindled the bears who unfortunately for them had no more trade market for Justin Fields after guys started settling on their new teams, guys like Kirk Cousins with the Falcons, of course, and teams also not necessarily having a need for a potential franchise quarterback, which is what uh, Justin Fields fashions himself as, even if the Bears are giving up on him now, as they seem to be ramping up their desire to be much better as a football team with some of the offseason acquisitions that they've uh, gotten through trade and free agency over the last week plus. And I got to say, when I heard Bears GM Ryan Pohl say that he was going to do right by Justin Fields. I had the same reaction. You just had the eye roll right there, but I got to say if, if truly doing right by him would have been keeping him and then giving him a chance with this team, them finally investing, you know, a really a full, a full investment into P 
pieces around their quarterback. I know they gave him DJ Moore last year and threw him in there, and, and that was a nice piece. And their offensive line is actually solid. But they were not truly putting Justin Fields in a good position to, to succeed the last couple of years while he was there. Um, but for as possible as – you know, in the best possible way, I would say Ryan Poles actually followed through on that because he – I'm sure could have gotten more than the six round pick with the conditional, with the conditional bump up that you mentioned, depending on how many snaps he plays, but now going to going to Pittsburgh, that's a great situation. And I think I was, I was pretty hard on Pittsburgh the last year or two, because I was just getting really sick of the Mike Tomlin's never had a losing season. That, that whole thing almost became like, like a bit in a way it was like, yeah, he hasn't had a losing season but I don't think he's won a playoff game in seven or eight years. Like if you're just going nine and eight every year, who cares if you're either not making the playoffs or you're not even competitive when you get there. So this actually, I think puts them in a situation where they have two guys on completely opposite ends of their careers. Russell trying to show that he's got a little bit left in the tank and maybe can get a a one final contract. And then you have Justin Fields, who's a young quarterback trying to prove that he can be something in this league. And I think that level of competition with the Steelers culture and what Mike Tomlin brings to the table, his demeanor as a head coach and, you know, those two guys and their, their skill sets. I think that's a great situation right there. If you're not going to spend big on a guy and go get a Kirk cousins, like the Falcons did who, you know, may not give you the highest ceiling, but the floor isn't going to be, you know, super low. You're not, you're not going to completely bust with, with Kirk cousins there. Um, if you had got, gone out and gotten him. So they didn't go that route, and they're clearly not going back to the draft route. So I can't really think of a better way that they could have boosted their quarterback room with two guys that you know are going to – I know they say Russell Wilson's the starter, but if he doesn't play well early on, that job's going right to Justin Fields to see what he can do. And, heck, he may even be able to beat him out in camp. And now you have two guys who hopefully a fresh start is beneficial for both of them. And maybe they bring out the best in each other. Yeah, if I'm the Steelers, as soon as Justin Fields has a grasp on the offense, he's my starting quarterback. I don't care if we are having to give up a fourth rounder. And by the way, if he's not playing that well, if he's sucking through a month of the season, you can go back to Russell Wilson and ensure that you still have that fourth round pick and you're only giving up a sixth rounder too. But the Steelers, this isn't quite the issue that Justin Fields was dealing with in Chicago but they just got rid of Deontay Johnson. You look at their wide receivers right now, maybe they're planning on going for one of those talented wideouts with a first or second round pick, but they've got George Pickens. I don't want to say a bunch of scrubs because Van Jefferson is on the roster too, but he's a three, he's a three or four on a really good receiving core. Exactly. He's more of a gadget guy than anything else. Denzel Mims is on the roster now. They don't have a great group of wide receivers. Yeah. Uh, Friar Muth, is a good tight end option for them. But just like in Chicago, even last year, like he had Cole Komet and he had DJ Moore and he showed market improvement, actually having one competent wide receiver to get to throw the football to, but they are devoid of good wide receivers right now on that team. Other than George Pickens, who is also a guy who's been called out for not being mentally engaged, uh, 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 engaged at times during games. And let's not forget who his offensive coordinator is too, <laughs> Arthur Smith. So yeah, good luck with all that, guys. Yeah, Arthur Smith, who didn't want Justin Fields just a couple of years ago when Fields was coming out of college, and oh, I didn't remember was that. Was he on the record as saying he didn't like Justin Fields? Well, I don't know if he's on the record saying he didn't like him, but I'm I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering that correctly, they they had a chance to take him or could have made it happen when they made it clear that they were moving on from, from Matt Ryan. Well, the good news about that, Jeff, is we don't have a recent history of Arthur Smith conducting himself like a light, like a whiny little bitch when he's not getting his way. Oh wait, that, that happened last year with Bijan <laughs> Robinson and he used Bijan as a decoy until he was essentially forced to start using him like he was capable of. And that's a guy who was a badass with the ball in his hands. Yeah. Well, I think you would just hope that this situation, this new scenery and this new dynamic where he's not the head coach and not going to be dealing with the front office as much as maybe better for Arthur Smith, because I mean, he got on the radar as Tennessee's offensive coordinator because he put together some pretty good seasons. I know he had Derrick Henry, 
But he, his quarterback was Ryan Tannehill on a pretty expensive contract. Let so. me go ahead and help you out here. He was the beneficiary of Derrick Henry oh. having some of the most dominant seasons in the history of uh, this sport at the running back position and got to utilize Tannehill off of play action like 85% of the time. So Ryan Tannehill's job was much easier as a result too. Yeah, was Arthur Smith calling those plays so he gets a little bit of credit? Yes, but Arthur Smith is not that good of an offensive play caller either. We've seen that we've seen that with Atlanta these last few years too. And he's got some talent with Pittsburgh. I would argue that he's better off giving Jalen Warren more carries than Najee Harris, but it's uh it's gonna be an uphill battle for that franchise. And will Mike Tomlin ultimately lose his job as a result? No, he'll somehow figure out a way to go 500 or better and sneak his way into the playoffs and lose in the first, uh, first or second round again. But uh, this is not going to be a uh, team that's competing for Super Bowls anytime soon. We never had a losing season. <sighs> I was getting you know so enough Pittsburgh that. fans who love Mike Tomlin, the human. And also admit that Mike Tomlin, the football coach, it's maybe time to move on from him. And look, I overall, I would say I'm a I'm a Mike T fan. Like I, like I've mentioned the word demeanor twice now. I like I like the way he coaches. I like his demeanor. I could see how he's a guy that people want to be around. That you would want as a leader running your your football team, your football operations. But yeah, at a certain point, you've either got to commit to investing and giving him a team that he can win a championship with or i guess just be okay with this and clearly they've they've been okay with it the last couple of years i mean they're trying to do something now but they're really like three years too late on this whole kind of reshaping everything and and i think the steelers some of it reeks a little bit of almost cockiness in a way of like the, the kenny pickett pick where they're like oh well let's go get the pit guy later in the first round and it'll all work out because we're the Steelers. And because like our organizational culture is so amazing that, you know, we'll just turn this guy into a championship quarterback. Cause that's just like what we do. Like we did it with big Ben, you know, we, we found, we found Tomlin gave him his first big opportunity and look, it's, it's worked out. But also if you look over the course of their history, the Steelers, they don't fire quarter or they don't fire coaches. No. Like, I mean, they've had probably what? I mean, we could look it up, but probably three head coaches in the last – is that all time? Maybe. Or three head coaches in the last 30 years, 40 years maybe? Since they entered the NFL, weren't they one of the AFL teams? So I think as an NFL team, they've had three coaches. Chuck Knoll, Bill Cower, and Mike Tomlin. Yeah. So there, there's going to have to be something serious that goes down for them to them to get rid of him then. You know, looking at the, had a, had that similar reputation up to a point, the Dallas Cowboys. Eventually, you have to evolve and and recognize that even though the guy, the guy being Mike Tomlin, did help you win a Super Bowl, he may not be the guy for the next ten years, and that's okay. That doesn't make you any less of a franchise. It just means you might be able to find the actual dude who can make you a Super Bowl contender year in and year out. Yeah, you know who. Uh, you know who got a ton of shit for basically doing what Mike Tomlin's been doing the last seven years? Ooh. Mike McCarthy. Oh, yeah. Shit, McCarthy. Again, not totally know. the same because he had Aaron Rodgers, so not totally the same. But, you know, they weren't getting any further than than, than they were year after year after year once they won. Oh, the you're Super saying Bowl. McCarthy and Green Bay. Yeah, you know who else is in that category? Sean Payton. Both those guys were actually better in the postseason than Mike Tomlin's been, though, too. And, yes, both guys had better quarterbacks than what Tomlin has been dealing with with the end of the Ben Roethlisberger era and the shit show that has been the last few years at QB. Yeah, I'm not. I'll, I'll, I'll spare. I'll spare the folks another Sean Payton rant. We'll have plenty of plenty more opportunities to do that down the line again. Yes, we will. He's <laughs> back in the league as a head coach. Running guys off left and right. Yep. Always somebody else's fault, Trey. Always somebody else's fault. Never Sean Payton's fault. Oh, no. Get that man another hurricane. Oh, wait, he's not in New Orleans anymore. Yep. The same the same coaches that want accountability from everybody else don't want to uh, practice what they preach a lot of times. Yeah. All right, here I go. All right, I'm getting, I'm getting going. I'm getting going. We got to move on. I'm looking at other headlines right now, and... 
Anything top of mind for you as I scour? NFL related or just anything? Anything. I'll go on my uh I'll go on my Scotty. Scotty Scheffler. Won't call it a rant, but let's hear this because you're much more dialed in on the golf side of things than I am. What's going on with Scotty Scheffler? He's dominant right now. He is unbelievably locked in. Made the putter switch a couple of weeks ago after the only thing keeping Scotty from I'm not kidding, winning five tournaments to this point this year, still three weeks before the Masters, is how bad he was putting for the first part of this year. He was essentially finishing top 10 in every tournament, first in strokes gained ball striking, strokes gained approach, strokes gained tee to green, and then he would be like 140th in putting every week. Something just completely outrageous. Guy was uncharacteristically missing three, four, five foot putts, like putts that you might see a couple times a tournament, but you won't see a guy in contention in the top 10 missing those. Well, he, he makes the putter switch and now he's won an elevated event and what people regard as the fifth major, the players championship yesterday. And he won the players yesterday with, you know, a, like not even a mid tournament, flare up in his neck where he almost withdrew on Friday and Saturday could stop Scotty. He hasn't shot over par in a PGA tour round since August of last year. Oh my God. August of last year, last season. I know he didn't win a major, but last season he finished. I think he only finished outside of the top 12, three times all of last year. So you hate to kind of throw out the, tiger-esque run but we've seen it during tiger's heyday a couple guys that have gone on stretches that have come close or matched obviously no one will match the you know longevity of dominance that tiger had that just that just won't ever happen again scotty would have to he's been number one in the world for 44 straight weeks to match what tiger did he would have to stay number one in the world for 11 more years Oh my gosh. 11 more years. And Scotty told a funny story yesterday in the post game winners press conference about when he played with tiger, saw tiger last, like, or at some point, maybe it was right when Scotty took over number one in the world. And he's like, Hey, Scotty, congrats on number one in the world. Uh, now do it again for 12 more years. And tiger's kind of become famous over the years for giving guys grief about little things like that, like having fun and, being a good mentor and support system for the new guys coming up, but then also being like, yeah, you jackasses will never be anything like me. Hey, why do you think golf is so much guiltier? This is a conversation Kevin and I were having last week. Golf is so guilty of tabbing the next Tiger Woods more so than any other sport and saying next Brady or next MJ or next Gretzky. Why, why is golf love to try and crown a player who's been good for a stretch of time, the next Tiger Woods, because that is a huge cross to bear. And by the way, Tiger Woods has shown us in the recent past and also through biographies that have come out on him, it takes a level of dedication. Also being psychotic. Pretty fucking lonely and miserable and psychotic yeah. at the same time too. And so for... Jordan Spieth and anybody else who has gotten that label, even if temporarily, I have no issues with them not turning into the next Tiger Woods because it actually means they get to enjoy the fruits of their labor a little bit. Well, the easy answer to that question is no other sport has been as reliant on one single player for its popularity and for its peak. I mean, I don't want to say golf is nothing without Tiger because obviously the you know, the work and success that Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas had really brought it into the mainstream. And I mean, Arnold Palmer, especially, but Jack too, with the way that Jack won. And I wasn't around then, but from what it seems like when Tiger came on, it was even different because the purses were getting so much bigger and bigger. And Tiger is responsible too for, for taking golf into really into the 21st century and creating it into it is into what it is now where it's become mainstream. Like, you know, you're not a golf fan. You're a huge sports fan, but you're not a golf fan. So you probably only saw that Scotty won the players. But what Tiger's done is kind of, I mean, people have talked about this for years, like kind of made golf cool. Like, you know, I mean, 
young, young African-American guy that had that swagger. Like he was different in basically every single way than all these other guys. I mean, he was ethnically different from a background standpoint. You know, he didn't look like a country club golfer. He wasn't a country club golfer growing up. So I think he brought the sport onto, onto the scene and, and kind of, I mean, even guys like, like Tony Finau in the first season of full swing talked a bunch about that, where he, he talked about, you know, he's Tony Finau, I, I think is Samoan, I'm pretty sure. But he said, there was finally a guy on tour that looked like me, you know, and then VJ Singh, I guess, in, in a way too. But you know, it was just a very, like, white sport. <laughs> and then maybe a little bit of, of the European flavor. So Tiger changed things in that sense. And then also, even those kind of things aside, he, you know, changed the change it from a dominant standpoint where as much as we start to root against these dynasties, whether it's the Patriots or the Lakers or the Spurs in their heyday, I mean, you name it in any sport, the Yankees at one point, we, we still watch, we love to hate those dynasties. And it's not that people love to hate tiger, but we're fascinated by dominance. We're drawn to dominance and to sustain success like that. You want to turn on the TV and you either one want to see can tiger win all four majors this year. Or can somebody actually beat this guy? So whatever side of the fence you you land on and how interested you are or not interested, like if you're going to get into it, you're going to fall on one side or the other. Like I'm going to root for Tiger or I'm going to root for somebody to finally beat this freaking guy. Just like we did with the Patriots. Just like we did with the Spurs and people did with the Lakers. It's funny how polarizing he was in his prime and how beloved Phil Mickelson was at that same time, Jeff. Mm-hmm. And flip oh, now. <laughs> exactly. That's what I was about to say all these years later because Tiger has had to really uh, make peace with the fact that he made a lot of mistakes and he's owned a lot of those mistakes too. Phil Mickelson has turned into somebody who is just a complete scumbag the entire time. Yeah. And then, I mean, then for Tiger too, like he, he basically created this next generation of golfer. That's why the back end of, yeah, exactly. Michael C says right there, Tiger made me want to learn golf. I mean, for me, I, I'm not going to totally say that because my dad was into it and I, he probably, I probably would have gotten into it regardless, but Tiger made me a golf nut. Like he took me from golf was just something that I would do with my dad. And, you know, we went to a little public course and played the nine hole, you know, Muni beater track and we're hitting golf balls off mats and, you know, that kind of stuff. We weren't doing country club golf. And even for me, like, you know, Tiger was more of that vibe. Like Tiger grew up going to courses and learning the game on uh, places like that. But yeah, he made me, he made me want to be a fan of the sport to actually watch it. He made golf must see TV. And then the back end of his career, when he, you know, not just when he won the masters in 19, but even after when he got into his mid to late thirties, he started beating the generation of golfers that he essentially created and shaped like to have that career arc and obviously all the personal stuff in between that he's overcome. It's, you know, polarizing, like you said, is is the perfect word. So I think the whole, uh, all that just went on and on about with tiger just shows that there will never be anybody like him again. Cause as much as we like Scotty, even if he dominates like this at this level for four years, which will be really difficult to sustain, he just doesn't have the same magnetism. Like Scotty's great. He's a he's a great dude. From everything I've heard, like he's an absolutely salt of the earth person. But he's not he, he's must see TV because of the way he's playing, but he doesn't bring that extra element to it where it's like like the flair. Um and I, I think that's that's what's been the most difficult part for golf to find. And you've got to just accept that I don't think we're ever going to have that again. Like if you want to, if you want to get into golf then you should just embrace that it's going to look pretty similar to the way it looks now. Who do you think is the guy who is closest in terms of the flair necessary to draw people's attention like Tiger did? Cause there's a couple of names that come to mind for me that were also at one point labeled the potential next Tiger Woods. I throw throw them at me who you were talking about or who you're thinking of. Dustin Johnson. But even he's not that interesting. But he yeah, had a little got, there's the fucking rumors about shit and him being with Paulina Gretzky and True. He plays a brash game. The other one is Brooks. 
Kepka, yeah. Those, the, those again, those are the two that came to mind. They probably don't fit the bill like they would need to, but that, that's like the. This is how difficult it is for golf because even if you get the play, you need the persona or the interest in the person to go along with it too. And those guys come the closest of anyone. Yeah. And it sounds stupid to say, but like, it is so hard to win a golf tournament. You don't get a, you don't get a win for, you know, even finishing top five or anything like that. Like you, you are one person trying to be in most cases, a field of over a hundred other golfers, even in these elevated events where they've shrank the field, you're still trying to beat 80 other golfers that are all the best in the world. Like to me, that's the insane part of golf. Even Scotty as dominant as he's been. He has eight wins now in the last two years. He won his first event, the Phoenix open two years ago, and then won it match play right after that. And he has eight wins total since then. But you know, but like also didn't win a major last year. Like that's just how freaking hard this is, but he was right up there for pretty much all of them. And I just say, I really think the over par round is, is insane. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for giving me a couple of minutes to touch on that. And just, you know, the kind of dominance that Scotty's had, cause this was, this was back-to-back wins at the players. He's the first player in the history of the players 50 years now to defend. He's one of only seven guys to win it twice tiger on that list as well, wow. but that no other guy, even tiger went back to back years at the players is pretty crazy. He won back to back weeks. Cause he won, he won the Arnold Palmer invitational last week. Um, and then it was a historic win for the UT golf program too. It was their 100. It was the 100th PGA tour win by a former longhorn. Oh, wow. So, you know, cool little, some cool little nuggets there. Ignorant statement by me, but a hundred seems uh, that, that surprises me that it's only a hundred. Well, you know, they're not Stanford where they can claim what 83 or 80 something from tiger. Yeah. So it's, it's Ben Crenshaw and Tom kite have both won 19. They're tied at the top. Hmm. Spieth has won 13. Jordan. Um, uh, I see. Yeah, Jordan speed, obviously won 13. And then she Justin Leonard. Back. Yeah, I was going to say Justin Leonard somewhere on that list, but he faded pretty. Talk about a guy who I don't know if he was ever considered the next Tiger Woods, but he got to a point of content where I believe he's on the senior tour now. No, uh, Leonard playing sporadically. Yeah. Oh, he's in the booth. Oh, Justin Leonard's not even playing anymore. No, no, no. He's uh, he's been on on with NBC Golf for a minute now. Oh, interesting. How does he do uh, as a broadcaster? I I enjoy him. Yeah. Maybe try and get him on the show before the next major, before the Masters. I'd love to talk golf with any, anybody that knows more about golf than I do. <laughs> Which even as a golf fan, it's it's one of those sports where it's, man, it's hard to really follow it. It's got to be similar to what, I don't know if we have any NASCAR fans or F1 fans. It's got to be pretty similar to that. But even with golf, there's just so many guys. So many guys in a field every week. But yeah, I was I was pretty fired up about the about Scotty's win, even though Trey, I had Wyndham Clark who finished second, and I don't know if you saw. Did you see what happened? No. So Scotty in the clubhouse at twenty under. Wyndham needs to birdie eighteen to force a playoff. He, yeah, Google it right now. He lips out a putt for birdie that would have forced the playoff with Scotty. So he still was going to have to beat Scotty in the playoff. But it was one of the more brutal lip outs that you'll ever see, especially given the circumstances and what the putt meant. But he just hit it, hit it to the left side of the hole with a little too much speed. And it it essentially went about halfway in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I'm just gonna warn you right now. Don't just search lip out on Twitter. It very quickly turns <laughs> into porn. And uh, gay porn too at that. Not calling it, oh. it is gay, but it's yeah. I fuck okay. What the fuck just happened I, here? I thought that was your reaction I, to the lip out. Need to that. I needed to type in his name. How do you spell Wyndham? Uh, w y n d h a m. Yeah, if you just put his name in there, it'll come up. Wyndham Clark. Yeah. Golly, Twitter, get it together, man. <laughs> God, that was just, oh, I thought you were just, I thought you just felt that bad for me that that was your reaction that I lost a chance to win a big bet on a guy going to a playoff. No, I just saw a different sort of lip out. Oh it was not pretty. 
Very hairy, as a matter of fact. Oh my god, we might we might need to move on. Yeah. All right. Oh my gosh, it did that full one eighty. Holy it, cow! It did the whole yeah. It did the one eighty where it basically goes more than halfway into the hole at some point and then pops out. Don't don't Google that now. Don't don't Google pop out. <laughs> <laughs> don't Google halfway into the hole and pops out. <laughs> oh man. Well, should we uh, should we move on to a little more a little more Longhorn, a little more Longhorn conversation of the football variety, which I know a lot of our listeners here would probably wouldn't care if we did that for an entire two hours. Um, Spring football kicking off tomorrow. Unsurprisingly, you and I are on the same page here because that's where I was about to transition to once I was able to erase that horrific uh, image from my memory. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There's something wrong with it being just happening on Twitter. Yes. I was say, more- you know what? It's okay if you don't want to see it too. That is okay. Exactly. So You're Longhorn valid. football is about to uh, get spring practice going. We're all excited about that because that means that uh, we're about a month away until a glorified practice that we call the orange white game that is televised on Longhorn network for one more year. We get to see all the hard work these guys are going to put in over the next month. And for you, someone who is an alumnus of this school, who you're, you're an alumnus of Texas, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, who you know are, what? I'm actually honored people. that you said it. Like what is the, uh, what is the, the most important storyline for you right now heading into spring practice? Uh, first, I, I, I got to say, I'm honored you said it like that because it means that I'm I'm doing a decent job of being unbiased as I cover my alma mater, which is well, yeah, which is which is an important part of it. Definitely my role at the at, at the main gig. That's definitely obviously a key key component of that. Um, but I think as far as storylines going into spring and I think the the fun but frustrating part of spring is we're never really going to get that many great answers on this stuff, but at least we get a chance to get kind of a glimpse into it. Sark will talk tomorrow and, you know, some players will talk Thursday and throughout camp we'll get, you know, whatever they're willing to share with us. Um, but it, for me, it's got to be some of the positions where they're replacing a ton of guys and we're finally going to get to see some of these receivers that we've talked a lot about actually on the field. Now the, the media window that's, that's open is about 15 to 20 minutes. And it's usually just kind of, some drills and stretching, I would say, excuse me, routes on air is about the extent of, of what we'll get to watch at the receiver position, but you'll still just kind of get to see, I, I, to me, there's value in seeing the guys in the uniform, seeing how they're moving around. I mean, especially if any given guy might be coming off of an injury, which I don't know if that's the case for any of these guys, but um, yeah, excited to see and hear moving forward about the receiver position. Cause like we've talked about a couple times, it will be really interesting to see how Sark approaches the rotation or maybe lack of rotation at receiver and, and how he goes about, you know, deciding that competition because at at the receiver position last year, even going into camp, there essentially was no position battle there. Maybe for the backup, maybe for the Jonte cook fourth spot where it's like, Hey, you're going to catch 12 passes or whatever he caught this year and, and see, 7% 7% of the snaps, but everyone knew Xavier Worthy was going to come in as your number one receiver, at least of the guys returning. A.D. Mitchell was not going to have to compete for a job if he was healthy. And Jordan Whittington was your third possession guy there. And then Jatavion Sanders was your starting tight end. Like there was no if, ands, or buts about any of that, as long as the guys were healthy, which they were for most of the season. So yeah, now seeing how Isaiah Bond fits in, Matthew Golden fits in, um, which one of these young receivers, whether it's guys that were on the team last year as true freshmen, Jonte Cook, Ryan Niblett, DeAndre Moore, or Ryan Wingo this year, a true freshman who I think you could see get a decent amount of reps early because he's he's a physical, just all around, I would say, just kind of your grade A All-American receiver um, from what, what I've seen from him, you know, kind of 6'2", I think 210-ish, and a guy who can who can do it all. There's really nothing that he can't do. He's not a specialty guy. So basically just name seven guys that, you know, Sark's going to have to whittle down to probably three or four or five guys that are going to play the most out of all those. Yeah, I think the receiver room is the most intriguing storyline for me too. And that, that whole thing gets a whole lot easier 
with returning four or five offensive linemen and Quinn Ewers as your starting quarterback. So there's talent in that room, obviously. It's about those guys all gelling. And Quinn's going to have to find that new number one guy this year, whether that is Isaiah Bond or maybe it's Jonte Cook because those two guys have uh, been playing throw and catch for uh, two off seasons now or Matthew Golden or, or somebody else on that roster. It'll be uh, interesting to see who those top three or four guys are because it was, as we've seen throughout Steve Sarkeesian's time as a play caller, he doesn't like wide receiver rotations. He will use four guys if he has good four guys. If he has three guys that he trusts, those are the three guys that get like 90 to 95% of the reps at wide receiver. Yeah, that's been the case for him at least the entire time that he's that he's been at Texas. But the entire time he's, yeah, but the entire time he's been here, and again, to your point about going back to Alabama, it's been pretty obvious that that was going to be the case. Like he had obvious choices. There, he wasn't, there were, there was no selection. And of course, coaches will say all the time when there's position battles that they want the decision to be made for them. They don't really want there to even be a decision. They want it to be, hey, this guy is so good. We can't take him off off the field. And he said that, I mean, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he essentially said that about all three of those receivers last year when he would occasionally get asked about a lack of rotation and why Jonte Cook or DeAndre Moore, some of these other guys we heard a lot about weren't getting a couple more snaps. And Sark basically said, what do you, what do you want me to do? Take Xavier Worthy off the field? What do we do? Take A.D. Mitchell or Jordan Whittington off the field? And when you say it like that, you're like, oh yeah, as complicated as this stuff can be sometimes, it's pretty damn simple. You have three guys who are clear far and away the best players. So they're going to play. But one thing that I think bodes really well for Texas, not taking a step back this year. And I bring this up because I had a buddy, uh, one of my best friends from UT who follows the team, but he's not into like, he knows probably, he could probably name 15 guys on the team. He can't name like basically the whole roster. Like, like we can. And he's like, well, so there's, we're talking the other day. He goes, so there's going to be a drop off, right? I mean, went to the playoff and then lost all those guys. You know, you mentioned sweat and the receivers, all these guys. And I was like, I actually don't expect a huge drop off. Now they might go nine and three their first year in the SEC with a tough schedule, but that could get them in the playoff given the respect for the SEC and what their resume would look like at nine and three or 10 and two. But I told him the main reason that I don't think they're going to fall far is because Sark's done a great job these last two off seasons of kind of just moving and depth and development are a huge part in this, that they deserve credit for the whole staff there. Every time there's a question mark, it's like, well, what was a question mark last year? Isn't it? We just moved that to a strength now. So if it was running back going into last season, that actually ended up becoming a strength, but then receiver, you were set at receiver. So now receiver is a bit of a question mark. Won't even call it a weakness. It's just got to see how it plays out. Well, now running back looks awesome with what we saw from CJ Baxter and Jaden blue, like both those guys healthy. That's awesome. And we talk all the time about this, about them building this team the right way through the trenches. They returned four or five starters on the offensive line and the guy they replaced. It's no offense to Christian Jones. I think you said the other day, you believe he can have a, a long successful NFL career. He'll probably be a late round pick, but you're also not sitting there going, Oh my gosh, how are they going to replace Christian Jones? You're going, look at that left tackle. Look at that left tackle. That dude's Kelvin Banks has started for two years now. And these other guys on the offensive line have gotten good reps too. And they've now most of them started for a year. So you're replacing one starter and it'll probably be Cam Williams. And he's a guy that's played a little bit too. And you also maybe, you know, maybe Brandon Banks is so good. They think maybe he's the next, uh, or Brandon, um, God, I'm blanking on his name, but the offensive lineman from Brandon, what? Brandon Baker, I believe. Brandon Baker. Yeah. That's a Banks is Kelvin, obviously. But yeah, maybe you, maybe that guy's so good, almost like Kelvin was his first year where you can't keep him off the field. So anyway, I was just explaining to my buddy that, you know, going into spring ball and even into next season, I'm like, I actually, I'm, I'm not that worried about this team for the first time in a long time. <laughs> Look, Christian Jones was a very important component to that offensive line last year, like literally grading out higher than any other offensive lineman throughout much of the season, Kelvin Banks included. So 
and uh, a great leader to diminish that loss. And it is a little bit up in the air right now as to who ends up replacing him, whether it's Hayden Connor kicking outside him Williams, who apparently needs to lose some weight. Hopefully he gets it together. Cause that's been a running narrative for him. Even going back to his final couple months at Duncanville, that that was going to be an uphill battle for him all the time. Like talk to Justin Wells on the midday show a little bit earlier. The hope is that he takes a cue from Tavondre sweat last year and some guys like that who really dedicated themselves once they got to spring ball and made sure that they were in tip top shape for that next season because it had the potential not only help the football team but to serve as a huge payday for those guys at the end of said season but if cam williams ain't there just yet mentally and physically as a result there are guys who are going to be breathing down his neck including brandon baker who i am personally very excited about he is a apparently a bull he is somebody who soaks up information and he is ready to go even as a true freshman who did enroll early at the start of this semester. Well, and you mentioned, you know, a guy like Christian Jones and his development to Vondre Sweat and Byron Murphy on the offensive line. Let's remember one thing. These were not even surefire early round NFL draft picks going into last season. Byron Murphy had gotten a lot of hype and had a lot of potential but these guys had not shown it consistently and they were, I think both respectively going into their, what their fourth or fifth year with the program. So now what their success on the field and when they get drafted and all the things that happen after you have success on the field from an individual and team standpoint, now for Sark to continue that development, they're recruiting well, but they also are building trust and building a reputation, whether it's with the guys on the current roster or guys in recruiting, and they can sit there and say, well, now, and whether they even have to say this, there's a blueprint that now exists for guys at multiple positions to be developed and become NFL draft picks, or there's a path to playing time, even if you don't, even if you're not a Kelvin Banks or a Xavier Worthy who comes in and plays right away and makes an immediate impact as a true freshman. The blueprint is there, and that means the hope is there now too. And I think that stuff just permeates throughout a building, throughout a locker room and, and gives guys a path to say, Hey, well, look, T sweat did it here. Here's what he did. Whether that's an Alfred Collins who comes in with kind of a similar narrative around him as sweat did last year. And as Murphy did a guy that we've talked about for years now as having a ton of potential decides to come back. And maybe this is the year that he can put it together consistently and he can have that motor, you know, more snaps than not. And he can be a guy that, that you can count on and can be in the conversation to now go from maybe he would have gotten drafted purely off potential and uh, who knows, maybe interviewing. Well, you know, he's a, he's a great dude, but now he can come back and, and hopefully put up a, I'm not going to hold a guy to the Tavondre sweat or Byron Murphy standard. That's a pretty high standard, but to have a really productive, consistent season, for however many games Texas ends up playing. So the, you know, it's out there and these guys can see what it looks like. I think that's how you start building momentum within a program year in and year out to where you get to that point of, Hey, so-and-so is leaving. We got a guy coming up right behind him. He may not be as experienced, but the experience is just going to be in different parts of the roster year in and year out. Agreed with that. Taking a small break from the Texas football talk to let you know that we have some breaking NFL news involving your Vegas Raiders. Oh, I need a sip of water. This should be good. Are you ready for your replacement for Josh Jacobs at running back this next season? Let's hear it. Alexander Madison, former Minnesota Viking. Now a member of the Raiders, according to Bleacher Report. Now, Madison is only 25 years old. He's got a lot of speed, and he understands how to get into the end zone, too. 17 touchdowns in five seasons with the Vikings, and a lot of that was with Dalvin Cook as the team's primary running back. It was a bit of an underwhelming year for Alexander Madison, but I like the potential here for your guys. Yeah, I mean, I was being a little dramatic sliding in the seat there, but I I just I was a huge Josh Jacobs fan. I, I was a fan of his story, but, and then obviously more than anything, his, his production, but yeah, Madison's shown that even if he's not going to be a full on featured back that, you know, he, he can be really good. I and mean, he was, he was awesome next to Dalvin cook in that backfield for a couple of years. 
only 25 years old. That's that's key too. I would have guessed based on how long I've been hearing his name that he was way older than that. Like, I mean, not way older, but maybe if you had said 28 or 29, that that wouldn't have surprised me. But who knows? The Raiders might be might be in the mix for a for a running back in mid to late round. They they got they got too many needs to take somebody that early at running back. There's also nobody I don't think worth it in this draft. Are they maybe a little link to Byron Murphy in mock drafts. I haven't seen a mock in a few days. Yeah, that I don't know if they would take him. I don't know if where they're slotted in the draft and where Murphy's expected to go. And now after getting Christian Wilkins and oh, paying, right. paying pretty big money for him in the middle to pair, you know, next to Crosby, who's on the outside, obviously. I, did, I don't know if Byron Murphy would make a ton of sense for them. I mean, obviously, I'm sure they love him in the second or third round, but he's going to go in the first. So getting back to the Longhorn conversation now, um, the secondary is going to be a fascinating position group to keep an eye on and to learn about through insider reports over the next month or so because it's going to have a pretty different look to it. Even though there are some familiar faces, the important thing here is that there is a lot more competition at pretty much every group. And also the found money that is Jade Barron returning for one more season here in Austin, a guy who up to a point was uh, the most valuable member of your secondary and one of the most valuable guys on the team. Got hurt prior to that Houston game and things were a little bit off kilter after that. But Jade Barron having one more season in Austin is enormous at that nickel position and beyond. That's another guy that, and I'd say the same thing about David Benda. You're not expecting David Benda to win the butt kiss award. And I know Jade Barron, you know, he had that video where he was with Michael Huff and took the Jersey and the passing of the torch or whatever. Like, I don't know if I'm going to bet on Jade Barron to win the Thorpe award, but he has, he has that ability to at least be in the mix. I think we've seen that. So wait, is um, Barron going to be number seven this year? Um, I don't, let, let me, let me double check that. But I feel like there was a, his video when he decided to come back, Huff was in the video. Oh. Hold on, I'm standby. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling it up right now. Um, but anyway, he, those are two guys that what they bring on the field production wise is incredibly valuable, but those are, I know people get tired of hearing it. I even get tired of hearing it sometimes too, but it's true in these cases, those are culture guys for all the guys that you lost. Those are culture perpetuators, guys that push it forward. Them staying here for another season can just help move this thing along. And, and Benda even touched on that a little bit about coming back that that was a big reason for him. You know, obviously he didn't have an obvious NFL um, NFL future, but yep, Jade Barron's going to wear number seven. Sorry, I took a oh, second. Oh, to love that. Huff's my favorite that. defensive player of all time, so I think Jade is up to the task. And I, I know they've been close. I mean, we obviously all know that Huff stayed really close to the program, and um, you know he's mentored a lot of these guys. Which I mean, can you imagine a better guy to mentor you as a Texas defensive back? And there's a lot of other really yeah. good options on that list too, guys that Huff played with and that came before and after him. But he 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 might be the best of the best out of those guys. Um, but yeah, back to back to Baron. That's huge, like you said, from a competition standpoint, from a continuing the culture and implementing that and making sure that that doesn't fall off just because you lost a bunch of guys that were doing that work. That's massive, and it's part of probably the number one unit that if you made if you made everybody made Longhorn Nation pick out one weakness on last year's team, it could be the secondary. Like I think basically everyone would would point to that secondary. Um so you know you hope that with the addition of Makuba another year for Manny Muhammad on the outside to develop into a you know maybe a shutdown corner. Terrence Brooks going into his junior year, you know, the ups and downs that he had playing as a freshman and a sophomore last year that, that maybe he can take a big step forward. So yeah, Jade's Jade is a huge, I mean, he checks every box of what you would want for a guy. Is like, I almost hate calling him a locker room guy. Cause I don't want to diminish his productivity and ability on the field, but he is a great locker room guy too. A fantastic leader and a guy that, that other guys want to follow and be around. He was one of what five guys who were representing the Longhorns in Arlington for media days last year. What he's looked at is an important guy in the locker room. I completely agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Sarks 
just raved multiple times about what Jade means to the team from a tangible on the field productivity standpoint and an intangible leadership standpoint. Hey, do you want to see what the Houston Texans new uniforms look like? Let's see it. Let's see We've got I eight minutes know. left. Let's let's That's close the, out a Monday on a strong note. They look like the Atlanta Falcons now, apparently. Yeah, that blue is really dark, huh? That is close to black, and it's those it's that weird font for the numbers now that gets really confusing when you're watching on television because the three bends over. So the three is gonna start looking like a nine. And <laughs> yeah, because a little bit like an eight, too. Yeah. yeah, yeah I think no, I'm, Houston Texans, new uniforms. Those are pretty clean. Yeah, they look Wait, clean. I'm 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 gonna go kind of kind of old man. Like what what's so different about those? Is it the font? I was gonna ask that question if you didn't. It's the <laughs> like, font, yeah. The font. Yeah, like I know the trim looks a little different. The font's different. The font is more annoying now. How about that? Great. A couple old guys talking uniforms here. <laughs> Let me see if the the, uh, the road unis are available. No, we just somebody leaked the uniforms. They weren't supposed to get out there just yet, according to the internet. So, are are you a uniform guy, Trey? Uh, uniforms are all right. I'm glad my team, my college team, doesn't change their uniform look every other game. Like I, I'm glad we have a classic uniform that our AD is on the record as saying we're not messing with that. We're not going black jerseys or anything. If we're just strictly from a college standpoint here, but you could throw a couple NFL teams in. Like I'll throw the Raiders in there too in this, but definitely college. I'm in the camp of there's probably i don't know the number but a select few just simply iconic tried and true football uniforms that are built into the fabric of the sport the pageantry of the sport it's the texas uniform i mean i think even the road uniform the this is stormtrooper is even higher on that list than the the burn orange jersey with the white pants at home yeah i think usc's Cardinal jerseys 100% with the gold pants are on there. A little biased, but I think people would agree with that. Um, I, I think Penn State's uniforms are on that list too. Michigan and Ohio State. I mean, basically all the – pretty much most of the Blue Blood programs. And then after that, if you don't have something that's just so historic and been around forever that is classic – and timeless, then I don't really care like what you do with the uniforms. Like people get all hot and bothered with Oregon. I'm like, great. They don't have that tradition that these other programs have. And they got Phil Knight and Nike. Dude, light it up. That is, light it up. is having a bunch of goofy ass uniforms. Baylor too, by the way. Right. But the same thing. They don't have one uniform. Where everyone's like, oh, that green and gold. Like yeah. can't, can't have college football without the green and gold of the Baylor Bears. Like, no. So have fun with it. And and build your own tradition moving forward. Like that's Oregon's tradition now. Like even in 20, 30, 40 years, like our kids later on, even our grandkids will probably still be having that conversation about college football, man, Oregon, they're known for their crazy ass uniforms. You know who could afford to mix it up a little bit more LSU. Their uniforms do nothing for me. Yeah. The God, when they wear like purple and the purple and the gold, like in a weird way, well, no, I I shouldn't say that, because we. But when you have two colors, like with what SC does, with two bold but different colors that contrast, but they contrast, but in a complementary way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like those two just look so good together. Like I even think Oklahoma State, not classic and timeless, but that black and orange, I, I'm a fan of the way that looks together. But yeah, sometimes like the, the two round. What's that? I said, yeah, it's like it's Halloween year year round. Yeah, I think I think that's a good look. Those colors just complement each other really well. And I think the I purple like and gold complement each other. I don't other. like that pylon orange. Yeah. Got to go with a better orange, in my opinion. But hey, that's uh, just my opinion. That's why I love talking about these things because we all think a little bit differently. Other classic uniforms, by the way, even though you don't like them, you admit you you know it's a classic uniform. Notre Dame. Alabama, Clemson. No, I mean a nice uniform, but I'm not going to say it's classic. I don't think so either. You know whose colors 
huge fan of. Well, I was just talking about those colors that are different but complement each other. Florida. Yeah, the blue and the orange. I agree. That's like, a sharp blue. the same shade of orange as Oklahoma State, but I think I like the blue and the orange more than the orange and the black. I'm a, I'm a yeah, fan of both. It has classic uniforms. Yeah. Uh, anything but UCLA's powder blue, I guess. Uh, that's my final take. At a certain point, those were probably considered classic uniforms, but yeah, I, I could I could nah, take they, it or leave it with those. They they do look pretty nice. Like that's one of my favorite uniform games is when SC and UCLA play, and they both wear the full home unis. It's a it's a UCLA nice wears the blue and UC, USC wears the red. Yeah. yeah, and like together on the same field, knowing what that game means, the battle for LA, like that's that's a pretty nice uniform game. Indeed it is. Uh, any final thoughts on Texas spring ball before we're done for the day? No, I think we touched on all the, all the big storylines. I mean, it, it's never going to be totally quiet with Arch as the backup, but it's, you know, for those of us that actually are local and like you and I are, and all of our wonderful listeners that even if they're not local to Austin, they, they follow on a daily basis. Like there's, there's nothing to talk about at quarterback. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's Quinn's development and that's obviously always going to be a story, but Quinn did the bulk of his huge development going into last year and credit to him for that. Now it's going to be more of kind of just honing his craft and more of continuing what he did last year and then building on the little things and, you know, tightening up maybe the fundamentals and the mechanics and even becoming an even better leader than I think he grew into last year, which in fairness, I, at times, almost all the time, likely didn't give him enough credit for. So, you know, always going to be talk around the quarterback at Texas and people are going to be asking a ton about Arch and what Sark thinks of his development there. And this will, this will be a big off season and a big spring for, for Arch too, because now he goes in and doesn't have to worry about Malik. Not that he was worried about, Oh, I'm never going to beat out Malik Murphy, but he doesn't have to worry about snaps now. Like you're the, you're the second guy. So you're going to get all the second team reps and then you're going to get even whatever their percentages of the first team reps. So I think his development's going to be fun to watch, even if we don't get to see a lot of it. Like you said, it'll be following a lot of our our awesome friends at you know all the insider sites for Texas do a great job, and and I don't think we're just saying that. Whether it's inside Texas, twenty four seven sports, you know, all all the sites do a great job. Orange Bloods. Uh, Shouts to all of our friends there who will be uh, sourcing the hell out of their sources to to get us even more than than we can just see and hear from what they let us see. <laughs> Thank you all for making us sound smarter than we actually are on these things. Uh, Jeff, great show as always. Thank you. Yeah, awesome and glad I glad we got to make this happen. This won't be the last time I I wear this on a TSU show. I would hope not. For Jeff Barker and everybody else here at Texas Sports Unfiltered, I am Trey Elling. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Please do click that thumbs up button. If you liked any part of today's live broadcast, subscribe to the channel via YouTube and download our free app by searching Texas Sports Unfiltered in your app store. For Jeff and everybody else here at the channel, we will talk to you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Starting with Bucky and BK, I believe live from CODA. In the meantime, have yourselves a great rest of the evening and welcome.